Good morning, everyone. I declare open this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will begin its examination of the budget estimates for 2020-21 for the parliamentary departments, the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio, the Finance portfolio and the Cross portfolio Indigenous matters. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure that budget estimates 2020-21 hearings are conducted in a safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. The committee has before a program listing agencies and outcomes relating to matters which senators have given notice. The committee has fixed 4 December 2020 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. The committee's proceedings today will begin with the parliamentary departments, followed by agencies of the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio as listed on today's program. Tomorrow, the committee will continue its examination of the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio. On Wednesday and Thursday, the committee will examine the department and the agencies of the finance portfolio. Finally, the committee will examine the National Indigenous Australians Agency, other Indigenous agencies and the Department of Health on Friday at the cross-portfolio Indigenous Matters hearings. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the Parliament or its committees unless the Parliament has expressly provided otherwise. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of 13 May 2009 specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. The Senate has resolved also that an officer of a Department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I remind everyone that in the hearing room to switch off your mobile phone or other devices or to turn them to silent. Officers are requested to keep their opening statements brief or seek to incorporate longer statements into Hansard. Just briefly before I ask for um, opening statements, just to reflect on the um, unusual circumstances in which this estimates is being held. Uh, there are a number of public health requirements uh, imposed on us uh, as the operation of the committee this week, including the capacity of this room. Uh, we've been advised that no more than 30 people should be in this room at, this, at any one time. Uh, I'm very reluctant to restrict the participation, particularly of senators or the media in this process. And so what we might do in order to facilitate the proper participation of both senators and the media uh, throughout this week is as necessary, ask public servants to leave the room to keep us under that 30 person cap. Um, most of the time that won't be necessary. I don't imagine that we will be full, at full capacity most of the time, but occasionally that might be required. So I just ask uh, particularly public servants to work with the secretariat if they're asked uh, to briefly go back into the overflow room next door. And I also ask uh, senators and witnesses to help us as far as possible to stick to the program as agreed, because we will be having senators uh, and witnesses joining us remotely by, by video conference. That's gonna be technically challenging at the best of times, but it'll be even more challenging if we're completely off our scheduled program. So I ask for senators who always behave very well on such things and witnesses who always oblige to be even more obliging uh, in this round of estimates. Uh, Mr. President, welcome. Uh, would you like to make an I'd opening statement? I'd like to make a brief statement if I could. Um, I'd like to commence by recognising the work of all the staff of the Department of the Senate under the leadership of the clerk for their efforts in supporting, in particular myself, but also all senators, in ensuring the operation of the work of the Senate and its committees throughout this year. This has required flexibility, ingenuity, 
determination in some cases, and cooperation across departments and agencies in an often rapidly evolving and unpredictable environment. Just as the Senate itself has continued to meet, importantly so has all the work of the Senate committees and the joint committees that are administered by the Senate. In a period where Parliament has not been able to meet as scheduled, the role of these committees is more critical than ever and, in my opinion, has once again demonstrated the unique and critical role played by the Senate in our parliamentary system. None of this could happen without their dedication to that role and supporting all senators in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr Pye and officers of the department, do you wish to make an opening statement? Um, I will make a very brief opening statement, Please. if I could, Chair, just following on from the, the President's comments there. Um, the the uh, budget estimates um, round of hearings every year is, is one of the largest logistical exercises for um, my staff, the staff of the Department of Parliamentary Services, for you and your staff as well, um, uh, Chair, and, and staff of other senators. Um, it's made even more of a logistical exercise this time around because we are at the same time a, a, as running the full two-week program also essentially running four 14-hour-a-day simultaneous video conferences. Um, this means that on top of our normal committee staff and secretariat staff, we have staff from across um, the entirety of the Senate Department pitching in on hotlines and to help uh, coordinate witnesses and um, I uh, really appreciate their help in uh, enabling that to happen. Thank you in advance, and I hope the fortnight goes very smoothly from that point of view. Um, Senator Ayres, are you seeking the call? Thanks, Chair. Um, and I'd <coughs> also um, add my thanks for, uh, for what's been a challenging, a challenging 2020. I think, uh, Mr President, in March of this year, in additional estimates, which seems like a very, very yeah, long time ago. It does. Um, in, in relation to the MOU with the AFP, you indicated that it was your ambition to, it was your aspiration to have the renegotiation completed this year. Could you give the committee an update on the progress of, that, of those negotiations? So, yes. Um, what happened after that was there was a, an informal working group formed comprised of um, a handful of senators and members. Uh, it doesn't have any official status, but it was a, a sounding board for the speaker and I. Um, we prepared a paper uh, in conjunction with the deputy clerk, Jackie Morris, um, and that has been communicated to the relevant agencies. Um, and I might ask, because I think it would be fair to allow Deputy Clark to answer some questions. I did inform a couple of senators I was working with on this last week, but I haven't finished all my phone calls about where we, where we have got up to. Thanks, Ms. Thanks, Ms. Morris. Hey. Good morning. Jackie Morris, Deputy Clark. Uh, Senator, so as the President said, uh, that paper went to officials uh, in the Attorney General's Department of Home Affairs and the AFP on the 23rd of September and the latest advice I had from them last week is that they're working on preparing a response to the principles that have been put to them as a basis for proceeding with negotiations. I wouldn't want to describe it as a log of claims in an industrial sense, but it does represent uh, the aspirations, I think, of people in, that have been expressed through various Senate committee reports over a couple of years as these issues have come forward. And is it likely um, you, you've got any views about the timetable for them coming back to us? We coming don't back yet, to you? Do we? No, we don't have uh, we don't have a specific timetable yet. Okay. So, having it done this year, I have always said that, it, given the events of this year, which were you know um, challenging, not only for departments, but also for us in finding um, the capacity to finalise our position. Um, it's always been an aspiration. I have absolutely no doubt it will be resolved um, before any prospect of a federal poll. Uh, I think this year I've always thought it's a touch aspirational, um, given the events since February, March. Uh, but we are working very, well, we're working as hard as we can towards it. Um, but we are also, you know, to a certain extent, dependent upon feedback but I don't have any criticism of the speed at which we've had feedback thus far at all, to be fair, of the agencies. Okay. There is an appreciation of the gravity of the situation, in my view. And, and that's the that, that 23rd of September is the first 
that they have got a sort of proposition from... It was the first time we'd given them a substantial paper, I suppose. There's been some engagement, but that's There's the... been discussions, but that's, the, that's where we put in. We decided to, uh, shall we say, try and define the scope of mm. what we thought the renegotiation should include. Uh, some of that involved deliberation uh, of not making it too wide and not trying to solve every problem. As I've highlighted here before, um, issues about privilege also involve state agencies, not just Cornwall agencies. They also involve more than just the Australian Federal Police. So we have we tried to make sure it was both achievable this year, and I think it could be if we got a quick response and we could respond quickly, um, but that it would not be delayed by making it so wide that we tried to make the perfect the enemy of a good resolution. Okay, thank you. I've, I've got some questions about the budget allocation. Um, the Department of Senate received a total appropriation of $25.8 million, which an increase of 2.3 in 1920. Was that increase expected? Uh, Richard Pike, Clark of the Senate. Y yes, it was, um, Senator. Um, the President took to the Appropriations and Staffing Committee uh, early this year a proposal for additional funding for uh, standalone secretariat support for select committees um, in the order of 2.24, yes. I think it was, million. And uh, the, the uh, government agreed to provide that as one-off supplementation for this year. It's in recognition of the fact that the Senate Department is uh, supporting 13 separate select committees, or has so far this parliament. There are 11 concurrent at the moment. Um, that's more than twice the number of select committees that we've, we've averaged in the uh, previous parliament. It's possible to um, support select committees using our existing secretariat staff when there's only a handful of them up and running, and, and particularly if they're brief and um, and uh, not too uh, extensive in their scope, but as I think you know, there's there's been some very uh, some, some very controversial topics referred to select committees for lengthy um, lengthy inquiries. Uh, that being the case, it's impossible to support those committees using our existing secretariat staff without undermining the work of the uh, the regular committee system. So, so is I, just to put it in context, yes. um, and I make no judgment on the size of the number of the committees. That's a matter for the Senate. Mm -hmm. But when I started here in my first term between 2008 um, and 2011, there was an informal understanding at that point that there would be there were to be no more than three select committees. That was an informal understanding, and one would be resolved before another one would be established. So, the scale of the work that the Department of the Senate is being asked to do has grown substantially. And that that 2.3 million dollar increase set out, I think, in the papers on page three, the portfolio budget statement on page yep. three. Is, so is 100% of that being deployed to the additional committee, committee load? Committee support, yes. OK. Um, and that's entirely for the Senate, or does some of that go to shared committees? It's it's for the four committees that are supported by the Senate. Um, we support uh, two joint select committees and five um, other joint committees on top of the legislation references committees, et cetera, that we support for the Senate. And and will it, will it be apportioned between committees? Is, will, it, will it be allocated to specific committees? It, it's likely to be allocated to specific committees. What I think we'll do is, as um, I've suggested, set up um, a couple of secretariats that just look after a couple of select committees each. At the moment, we have a secretariat that might be uh, looking after a pair of legislation and references committees, and will also take on the work of, of one or two select committees from time to time. Um, we'll have a look at which of the committees, uh, and we have been we have been working towards this for a little while, Senator. Um, have a look at which of the committees are the most um, demanding. In, uh, in their requirements and uh, allocate the resources there. So there's a general allocation, um, but there's no f formal distribution of that, and 100% of it goes to the to the, to um, the committee additional office. committee load. Yeah. But there's no formal allocation between the committees at this stage, and and some thinking about. Uh, um, 
a, a secretariat to deal with select committees? Yes. That's, that's right. I mean, we had a new select committee set up last uh, in the last sitting week. We had uh, the Aboriginal Flags Select Committee wrap up last week. Um, so it's very difficult to... Uh, part of the problem is that it's not the normal committee system, so it's very difficult to predict where the... Um, where the work and workload is going to be. And some of that's We're trying to be a little bit, um, a, a little bit flexible with that, Senator. Well, there won't be much travel in that, mostly staffing. Um, I, there's not very much committee travel at the moment, as you would expect, um, and the expectation is that that will be for um, to to employ secretariat staff. Uh, no IT support or information management for the committees in that allocation. Uh, not from that allocation, no. Um, Obviously, uh, support for uh, broadcasting and uh, Hansard comes from the uh, DPS budget. On um, the Senate and COVID-19, can Mr. President, can you or or the clerk, can you explain the collaboration between the Department of Senate and DPS um, that's enabled the video conferencing facilities to be uh, used for? Committee okay. proceedings? Oh, yeah, so we can do it at two ends. We can do it in DPS, but what I'll do is I was going to let the clerk and the usher explain they've done it at more detailed level with yeah. essentially reporting to me and oversight by me and the speaker with DPS. I'll, I'll start if that's okay, Senator. So um, back in March and April, uh, some work was done to um, really uh, undertake some proof of concept work to see whether the video conferencing technology that we're using, well, we're not quite using today, but it's potentially uh, potentially going to be switched on in a little while, um, whether that technology could be adapted to use in uh, the chambers. So some proof of, proof of concept work was actually done in the week or so after the standalone sitting day on the 23rd of March. Um, then, of course, the Senate, uh, Senate and the House both came for, a, a, um, I guess, a physical uh, meeting in April, and again, hearings were scheduled again. Sorry, sittings were scheduled again from May and June. So that sort of proof of concept work was tucked away until uh, the um, actual demand for the use of it in the uh, in the chambers was um, uh, was realised, which uh, was at the time that the sittings of the 24th and following week of August were um, put aside. Um, we also did some work to look at what procedural changes will be necessary in order to um, facilitate remote participation and there was a procedure committee report that followed a, a couple of virtual meetings of that committee to recommend some rules that could be adopted from time to time by the Senate as it, um, as it uh, thought appropriate. Um, we did some uh, testing, obviously, of, of those systems, both at that original proof of concept phase and again through um, late July and August in order to be ready for, um, for the sittings, uh, I think it was the sittings of the 24th of August, sorry, I misspoke before, sittings of the 24th of August where we started, um, started yes. using them. Um, DPS obviously uh, provides the, uh, the, the infrastructure, um, takes senators through the process for signing on and that sort of thing. We provide support uh, in the Senate Department for senators using this by um, having a hotline, by providing procedural support to senators and by helping to coordinate things like uh, speaking lists and, and that sort of thing so that um, people are broadly aware when, when senators are likely to be wanting to use the system. It's an easier go in the House of Reps. You, you have to put up your hand a long time before you, you get on a speaker's list. But in the Senate, as you know, it's a much more, much more of a movable feast. There's a few senators here, Senator Waters, who, uh, who use, the, uh, use the system in the first fortnight. And you could probably have a chat during the morning tea as to how successful it was from that end. So there's all this work gone on. Um, is there additional costs for the Department of Senate? Or is it all born, or, or all of the costs borne by DPS? Um, all of the costs are, are borne by DPS for the purchase of the additional systems, additional licences, expansion, which they've undertaken recently, of the uh, number of people who can be uh, remoted in. So, that it, as I understand it, we now have the capacity for up to 200 people to remote into any one meeting, which um, could be useful this week. 
um, whereas it was 25, I think, early on in the uh, in the use of the system. But yes, all of those costs, the IT costs, broadcasting costs, are, are borne by DPS. One of the big costs for them is going to be um, staffing the use of video conferencing for the long hours this fortnight, for the long hours that the Senate sits when the Senate needs to use it. Um, but in terms of cost for the Department of Senate, there's probably some minor staffing costs for additional overtime for staff supporting the hotlines yeah. and that sort of thing. But, but otherwise, the physical infrastructure and, and uh, other support costs are all with DPS. I think, Clark, you said in, on, in the annual report that remote participation is likely to, you know, not, notwithstanding the, the length of the COVID-19 restrictions, remote participation is likely to remain a feature of, or, or more of a feature of Senate committees. Um, that's my expectation. In, in the future, is it what's what? Uh, just ask what evaluation and planning has been done to provide for this, and has there been a process of, you know, for want of a better description, trying to work out what's working and what's not, and uh, and how's that how's that process going? Yeah, do you mean uh, technically, or do you mean sort of in what I'll call a more um, uh, uh, theoretical role of how the committees are functioning. I suppose, the, yeah, to be fair, the first question is about more te te technically well, we how, how is, DPS, and, and, and then, se and then yeah. secondly, uh, uh, how is, um, you know, what's what's the evaluation at your end being, uh, Mr. President, of the um, of the oper of the remote operations? So I might say, um, with the technical stuff, we can deal with all that costs mm. and those other things with Tartan Parliamentary Services, and I've got some information there. Um, personally, I would say that the place for that to be done is effectively the procedure committee, because it's not really necessarily a matter for department staff to say, how do you think it's working? In the end, it is a matter for the Senate to determine um, remote participation. We, we do that at the start now of every sitting fortnight. It hasn't been you know, put in place on a permanent basis. Um, can I say my experience is that the Department of Finance is going to save a lot of money. There's going to be a lot of people, particularly from Perth and North Queensland, who aren't going to get on planes as often for committee hearings. Um, I think it will dramatically change committee hearings more rapidly than it will the Senate itself. Um, and whether or not it does become a more permanent feature of the Senate sitting as a chamber as opposed to the committees, where I think it is widely accepted and eminently sensible, um, that's really a matter for the Senate. Uh, the Procedure Committee is looking at it uh, every after every fortnight because we actually have to renew or make a recommendation for the Senate to renew the remote sitting arrangements we currently have in place. Um, so if we were to do that, we would do that at the commencement of the next sitting for a week on November 9, I think it is. The, the other places, um, Senator, that this is being reviewed, um, there's a, a committee called the Chairs Committee, which is chaired by the Chair of Committees. You may have been to a meeting of it uh, in recent weeks, um, which is looking, uh, which was specifically thinking about how this sitting fortnight would, uh, would run and talking mm. about... Um, uh, the, the participation of, of senators and witnesses uh, remotely. Um, I think that that is a, a good forum for feedback from senators to us. We also have um, a meeting of secretaries, committee secretaries, uh, looked after by the clerk assistant committees, um, from uh, pretty uh, pretty frequently at the moment, including uh, some virtual uh, virtual meetings, which is a new thing for us. Um, and they, um, they, they are talking about the logistical challenges that um, do come into play when we're trying to manage uh, more and more hearings with more and more, not just witnesses remotely, which is something we're quite used to, but senators and witnesses remotely um, at, at the same time. Um, so there's lots of conversations going on about what the experience of our staff has been um, in those situations. And uh, we've had frequent meetings between um, our senior committee staff and DPS, ICT and broadcasting staff about uh, logistical arrangements, what's working and what isn't. So uh, we'll continue to review that through those forums. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, Chair. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Senator Innes. Senator Waters, are you seeking the call? I'll just check if there are other senators who are seeking the call, just for management of time. Senator Scar is? Okay. Senator Waters and then Senator Scar. Thanks, Chair. Hi, folks. Thank you very much for um, all of the work that you do to keep the Senate ticking over, and in particular the work that you've done this year to keep us all safe and to ensure our democracy has continued, albeit in a slightly more uh, uh, 
virtual way than, than we're used to. So first of all, thanks for all your work. Um, I do have some questions about the uh, resourcing for committees. Um, Senator Ayres has covered off on the purpose for that additional funding, namely that it's going to be for standalone select committee secretariat support. So can I just uh, clarify, is there any new resourcing for what I view as the current under-resourcing of committees? Um, not specifically, Senator, but the fact that we can move some of the support for select committees to standalone sec secretariats is intended to ensure that um, we, we have more uh, secretariat staff from the normal mm. legislation and references committees available to support those committees. Mm. A as you know, the, uh, the, the demand for the work of these committees is, is not in, in my hands or the hands of, of my officers, but in, in the hands of uh, you and your colleagues uh, around the, the chamber. Um, my predecessors always used to land on the idea that uh, senators' time, of course, is a, a finite resource and that uh, you know, there, there, there comes a natural point at which senators decide to stop referring things to committees because they don't have the time to, mm. to give um, the, the um, inquiries that are put forward the attention that they require. Mm. Um, but we do our best to make sure that uh, we can support everything that the Senate decides to um, put forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have any uh, figures to hand of the costs of particular inquiries, and I'm interested in particular in the select family law inquiry. I don't have up-to-date figures on, on that, Senator. I think you might have asked, placed yes. a question on notice about that a little while back, and we did provide an answer then. I'd be happy to okay. update that Okay, would you, could you update that? Story. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm interested in the, the cost to date of that inquiry, the joint family law select inquiry, also into the um, water quality inquiry into the Great Barrier Reef under the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee. And also there was a, um, a finance and public admin inquiry into family violence that didn't actually hold any hearings. Mm. Um, I think that was Sorry, just a um, correction. Senator... It wasn't a finance and public admin inquiry. I think it was another committee. Okay. It was um, Rex's reference. Yeah, I can't remember which committee it was. It was, it was, it was, it was okay. the legal and constitutional. Constitutional Affairs Con Committee, I think so. Okay. Well, in any case, that's the one that I'm referring to. So if I could get an estimate, um, if you're the appropriate person to take that on. Of I, the I'd be happy to, to have a look at what we can provide, Senator. Um, <coughs> it, it's easier to provide a figure for a standalone committee in lots of ways than for a single Reference. inquiry yes. within the, the work of um, a defined committee, the, uh, a different committee, mm. though, because... Um, as you know, very often yeah. you're dealing with multiple um, multiple matters in a particular mm. um, a particular mm. um, hearing or, or mm. sorry set of, set of hearings for which there might be one travel cost. Yes, that sort of understand. Thing. But we can we can well, certainly see what an, we can put forward. Estimated apportionment um, to the best of your ability. Thank see you. See what we can do, Senator. Um, since the amendment to the standing orders to reduce the number of formal motions that can be uh, moved each day, has the department observed any? Uh, reduced cost or increased procedural workload? What, have you noticed any impacts flowing from that decision as yet? Um, not as yet, Senator. I, I think that there are um, anecdotally fewer notices given each day. So to the extent that uh, there, there might be some slight additional costs in in terms of managing the, the procedural aspects of that um, that order, um, we don't have to receive and format and publish so many notices mm. each day. But it's very difficult to use this year as um, a, a particularly good test of these things because, as you know, um, the, we've had a very stop-start, very odd sort of a year and we would, um, you know, we would come back after a break and everybody would have, have wanted to, to put down their, their markers on a couple of different issues. So we had days where we had, you know, 35, 40 notices given and that's quite unusual. Mm. It's not something that we would expect as a normal run of the mill. Let's get back to run of the mill, that'd be nice. Um, but, but an ordinary sitting period wouldn't mm. usually see that level of activity. So it's difficult to, to um, really say with any certainty what the effect mm. might be. Okay. But we can keep an eye on that. Thank you. Have you been tracking the amount of time that that 
part of the program has taken under these new rules versus the amount of time it used to take, noting what you just said about the peaks and troughs that have occurred? We, we are keeping some statistics on that, um, which we would normally publish in our um, as a statistical summary at the end of the year, and we can we can provide something to you on that if you'd like. Thank so, you. Yes, I'd, I'd I, like I, that. I, I can add, just looking at the diary and the time I have to reserve for chairing divisions, it has become it was growing rapidly. I mean, we were hitting, to be honest, a regular hour and on occasions breaking 90 minutes. Now, part of that, I think, as the clerk said, was pent up because it wasn't sitting, but there was clearly a lot more motions being put without debate. So without making a judgment on it, I can tell you that you know, in terms of sitting in the chair and running it and the time I had to set aside to do it, there's less, there is less time. I don't have to block out two hours as often as I used to. Mm. So are you comparing that with previous years I'm or just the backlog during the, the reduced be honest, sittings? It's both. I mean, I've done this job now for three years um, and I used to run, be the deputy manager and have to do it for the government um, prior to that. Um, I think it's a combination of both. There has been some obviously some pent up, uh, you know, well, we haven't been here for a while. There's mm. more matters that backlog. people have submitted over the time. Um, and that would... That was particularly magnified because we had a couple of one-day sittings, I think, which meant mm. notices were being lodged and then be dealt with when the parliament mm. next sat. But I also think it is, again, I'm not making a judgment, but it, it, it's a pretty simple observation that there were an increasing number of motions being put without debate. Mm. Um, I assume for the purpose of uh, having the Senate address an issue without debating it, um, because that was the the, the, the wish of people who felt they didn't have as much time to put debate time before the Senate. So I think one could say that it was fairly both. The lack, uh, mm. in, un, irregular sittings, but also an intention to see more matters re resolved in the Senate, that, or addressed by the Senate through that part of the business. Mm. Can I ask just on that point, before I move on to my final uh, question, was there consideration given to reducing the bells from four minutes to one minute in that part of the program? as? in my view, a far more effective time-saving measure that didn't limit the ability of senators to put issues so I can, to vote? I can do a one-minute bill, um, and you'll no notice that I have occasionally um, insisted upon it, um, but I do view, um, in the normal business, a pre-COVID, um, when the clock went past various times that the whips had pairs in operation, which is a, a courtesy the chamber offers, if one of the whips said it was 4.35, their pairing sheet had changed on the half hour um, and asked for a four minute bell to allow senior people to come back from whether it be a, a committee meeting, a cabinet meeting, a shadow cabinet meeting, I think that was a reasonable request. We then went to a series of one minute bells. Um, that has not been possible during the COVID period because of the sheer amount of pairing. Mm. And what has made it more complex, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the whips, is that, as I understand it, there has been a courtesy extended to the crossbench by both major parties with the whips, because everyone's had people who are absent. And that has made the, the, tear, the pairing tally sheets much more complex and simply not able to do within one minute. And that's why we're having lots of four minute bells now. I might finally say that I also try, when ordering the business, to put to order it in such a way that divisions are held towards the end to manage the time as much as possible. Mm. But with COVID and the 15 or more pairs that have been in place and the courtesies extended to the crossbench by the major parties, uh, the one minute bell has simply not been a prospect at the moment. And I'm looking at one of the whips present who's indicating I'm not mm. wrong, at least. <laughs> Okay, so is it under active consideration for post-COVID times, if there ever is such a thing, um, for those bell arrangements to be addressed rather than the restrictions on numbers the of The chair can motions? insist. I mean, I can insist upon it. Um, and I, quite frankly, oh, I think both whips will say I'm pretty firm on doing that when we were having 90 minutes of debate. But if we go past one of the times where they ask, a whip asks for a four minute bell to allow new pairing arrangements to be mm. put in place from four o'clock or 4.30 or five o'clock, I don't think that's an unreasonable request if we've got the bells constantly going for an hour. And that's the way it did work up until COVID. I did actually insist and Hansard will reflect, I regularly announced senators should remain in the chamber mm. for imminent divisions. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, and just one final uh, question. Is there any, and perhaps this is for DPS, but is there any, uh, planning to keep the remote parliament facilities in operation um, for next year? The facilities are there. Um, we can ask DPS about their licence arrangements. I don't imagine them going anywhere. Um, as the clerk said, the determination of access to it is really a matter for the procedure committee, um, of which I'm a member, but I'm not the chair. The deputy president is the chair. 
Okay, so is that under consideration to continue on post-COVID again? I can, can I speak for me personally? My personal position is the arrangements we have in place are uh, for the Chamber. I think the committee arrangements I'm strongly in favour of. For the Chamber are appropriate, my personal views, and shall remain in place. I, however, am also, for numerous reasons that we probably don't have time to go into today, not in favour of a parliament being coming one that people can remote into at will and have the um, uh, same rights and privileges by not turning up as they would to turn up. And I think, to be honest, um, there are good reasons why some people should be able to participate remotely, and I think we should facilitate that. I think it's made the place stronger during this period. But there's also some elements of, um, you know, some of the things we see in social media, to be honest, when you don't see people to their face and um, you don't actually interact with people and spend time with them, I think that's one of the reasons that some elements of social media get a little bit more toxic than they need to be. Um, part of a parliament, historically, is assembly, and I think that part should not be dismissed um, lightly, is my personal view, mm -hmm. but I cannot speak on behalf of the rest of the committee or the government. Okay. And just finally, um, in the usage of the facilities, initially it was quite patchy and the link dropped out, um, pixelation. Can we go into that with DPS because I've got some updates on that? But I think that the technical side of it is, unless the uh, clerk has a, something to say, the technical side of it, is, DPS, um, is, it? D, is DPS, but I have got some material on but how I, many times it dropped out. If, if I could jump in, I, I understand that um, uh, the... the um, Signals were essentially going over public internet in the um, first few sitting weeks, mm -hmm. and that um, there's now an optic fibre, I think, from the um, ah. from the vendor through to the uh, through, through to the parliament, which I think is in place this week. So we'll see how it goes. Does that mean that the internet fibre to the chamber? Does that mean that the internet in the chamber will actually work? Because um, that's, that's yet another bug. That there. is a different matter, but again, it's for DPS. That's, okay. a, yeah, that's, that, that's a Wi-Fi matter. I've got updates on that. Trust me. Okay. I can't, and I can't use it in my office, so um, I, I, I live it. Um, can I say that, um, yeah, there's a constant period of up, process of upgrade we can go into with DPS, but you know, the system given, um, in my view, has been remarkably stable, and if um, because we asked people to use it at their offices, mm. that actually was a great deal. When you've had committee problems, uh, it's usually been someone doing it from an iPad mm. on a 3 or 4G connection or a witness coming in. There have not been many problems from offices. Where there have been, um, I have reported to the Staffing, Security and Appropriations Committee of the Senate about some of those matters. Okay. All right, I'll take it up with TPS. Thank you both. Okay, thank you, Senator Waters. I'll go to Senator Scar and then Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, following up from the comments from uh, Senator Ayres and Senator Waters, I too congratulate the, the department on the wonderful job you all do, uh, especially during this difficult year. It's just been outstanding. I think you're an outstanding team. That's from my uh, from my perspective. Uh, I'd like to first. I'd just like to follow up a question that uh, Senator Waters put on notice in relation to the cost of Senate select committees. If I could add to the list, please, the cost of a Senate select committee that was established, chaired by Senate, then Senator Di Natale in relation to jobs in the regions, which reported in uh, December last year. If I could uh, add that to your list, Mr Pye, to We'll, we'll uh, take that on notice, Senator Scott. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, my second uh, area of questions is in relation to, I've been comparing the Senate to the House of Representatives dangerous in, terms of, uh, in terms of the budget papers. <laughs> so this is uh, obviously a very dangerous thing to do. But um, I note uh, on page 41 of uh, budget papers number four, there's a, a column which refers to external revenue that the Department of the, the Senate refer, uh, receives. So I was just interested to know what are the sources of external revenue, apart from senators losing their lapel pins <laughs> and having to buy another one. Well, you buy a copy of Odge's Senate practice, I think, if you want to. Senator? John? Uh, John Beckley, Usher to Blackrod. Uh, thank you, Senator. So uh, external revenue would be, it's, a lot of it is in relation to conferences and lectures that we hold, those sort of small amounts, which obviously have dropped off quite a bit in COVID times. Some of the other revenue in there is an accounting adjustment for resources received free of charge. So we do have to recognise the revenue then also the matching expense for that. So it offsets completely and doesn't actually flow in or out. So things such as the rent we get provided for free by DPS in the building, we have to recognise what that value would be. Right. Um, and also our audit costs from the ANAO and the like as well. 
Okay. And then the only other difference that, uh, that stood out to me in the budget papers was the Department of the House of Representatives has an allocation op under administered operating, uh, whereas the Department of the Senate doesn't have anything categorised to that extent or in that nature. I was just interested in the difference. Perhaps yeah, if you know. I'm not aware of what the administered funding is that the, the House of Reps have, but we don't have any administered funding, which is programs which are administered on behalf of the government using a separate bucket of money that you can't use for other purpose apart from that purpose, but we don't have any of that source of funding. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Some questions I asked back on the 26th of February 2018. I'm sure you'll all be able to cast your mind back to that. Really simple one. Uh, at that point in time, I, I mentioned, and it was to Mr. Stefanik, uh, uh, the fact that New Zealand broadcasts its parliament on television, on a television channel, as opposed to on the web, which is what we've done here. Uh, it was just a light discussion. I just wonder whether or not the, the Senate uh, and or um, in your capacity uh, talking with the, the speaker, whether or not that's, has there been any further consideration as to that? Um, New Zealand has the benefit of only having one chamber. We wouldn't have to have an argument. And um, no public broadcaster. Uh, <laughs> sorry? And no public broadcaster. <laughs> um, and so, no, look, I'll be honest, there's been no, no discussions. In the course of this year, I have to admit, I don't remember that, although I'm not saying it didn't happen. It has been. A, a, <laughs> sure. I was sitting down last night thinking, what have I forgotten over the last few months? <laughs> That's obviously one of them. No, there hasn't been any um, consideration of that. Sorry. All right. Any intention at all to con consider that, even to look at the option of how we might uh, um, um, extend the reach of the parliament in terms of uh, reaching into people's houses with, you know, with democracy? Well, we'd need, just thinking out loud, you'd need spectrum and broadcasting access, mm. um, neither of which would be inexpensive. Um, spectrum goes for a fair, fair bit these days when the government conducts auctions. Um, look, realistically, um, when you look at the numbers about broadcast television um, and the numbers of streaming uh, and the future of what I might call narrowcasting and broadcasting, um, I would suggest that you'd have to think very carefully about putting serious money into using classic broadcast spectrum rather than making sure that more and more people could access the stream that you put up. I mean, that would be my instinct mm. because I don't know a TV, a broadcast TV network that's, you know, rolling in viewers rushing in the door at the moment. They seem to be managing the opposite. Yeah, just uh, with, with your significant influence over the Minister for Communications, I thought uh, <laughs> you might be able to get a good price for the, for the Senate and the House. But uh, Look, it's not being considered. I honestly doubt it will be considered. We, the, a, lot of, a lot of effort gets put into making sure the online facilities there is, a, is accessible. Um, and you know, I know, for example, there were a couple of issues last week we can discuss about the, a certain petition that had some public prominence. Uh, but I don't, in all honesty, imagine there being a, you know, a P span or a C span or an S span um, yeah. in the foreseeable future. Do we keep track of uh, hits or the amount of streaming that's occurring uh, to, from the Senate uh, to the outside? We world? can ask DPS, actually. They, right. they, if, I might if, do that. If we can, they'll, they'll have it. I'm sure they have something. All right. The, the, the only other line of question I've had, uh, Mr President, is relates to um, uh, actually a I raised this in the chamber back in on the um, on the 31st of uh, of August. Uh, you might recall we were debating an FOI bill, and I stood in the chamber talking about documents that I hadn't that the, the Senate had been unable to obtain via uh, orders for productions of document. Uh, yet I had managed to obtain under under FOI. Has there been any discussion about about that? Do you have any views on on what privately some senators have uh, have raised with me uh, the fact that we that the Senate seems unable to get documents that a citizen can under FOI laws? If you um, search the Hansard, you'll find me asking, making a similar point. I think from the chair next to Senator Ayres many years ago. So my personal views haven't changed from that, um, but. I'll let the clerk is a great uh, formulation um, around the, the balance of power in the Senate in the sense of, um, you know, we 
there can be orders for production of documents, but it's not something that is resolved in a legal sense. I think it's resolved in a political sense in the Senate. Um, I personally find the inconsistency between being able to get a document by FOI and one from a return to order quite problematic. I said so in opposition. I should say the same thing when I'm on the other side of the chair, and I, I still hold that view. But there's been no discussion about, um, as far as I'm aware, at least with me, about a resolution to it. I mean, that the Senate resolves on returns to water all the time. The, um, the, the government guidelines for official witnesses appearing before um, Senate committees, which is, as I say, it's a government, government document, was last updated in, I think, 2015, um, specifically says that the uh, requirement for accountability to the parliament may be greater than the requirement for accountability under the FOI Act. So things should go the other way. Mm -hmm. Things should be more accessible through orders for production of documents to the, the parliament or um, in, in responses to um, questions here, here at estimates and in other committees than through the FOI process. So, you know, it's a, uh, all other things being equal, that should be the, the, the way that these things um, operate. But in relation to the particular matter that uh, you were discussing at the end of August, my uh, broad recollection is that uh, the Minister said, well, that's because of it, it, the reason it became accessible through the FOI process is um, through the affluxion of time. It was no longer so sensitive that it needed to be, needed to be kept away. Um, I think that having a more effective process of um, making sure that um, public interest immunity claims are still being um, maintained by governments and when they no longer have to be maintained for governments to be putting the material forward to um, the Senate and its committees in relation to Senate orders and, and committee requirements would be a, a useful thing to do. So, so an example of one of the uh, four or five that I laid out was Cabinet in Confidence, which after 30 years I would accept that as a reasonable response, but uh, you know, a claim of Cabinet in Confidence under FOI was found to be uh, a, a, um, an erroneous um, attempt at a claim. I just wonder, um, you know, people looking at the Senate, uh, and, and they do watch, they do see um, what it is we're doing, uh, whether it undermines the public's confidence in, in the, the Senate as a, an oversight body, if it doesn't seem to be exercised. And, and I, this is not really, in some sense, not directed at you. It's the fault of senators uh, that not, not uh, enforcing or pushing back. Uh, but do you hold a concern that uh, the, the public may may well be looking at, at our role in oversight and thinking we're a bit of a wet lettuce leaf. Uh, I, I don't know if I hold a concern in that sense, Senator, more than just thinking that, um, you know, the Senate has some pretty strong powers for requiring information. And it may be that sometimes they're used in a bit of a scattergun way. Um, one of the problems is if you have more and more and more orders for documents, there are only a handful of them that you would expect the Senate really to get behind and really seek to, to enforce where non-compliance comes along. And we've got to recognise that there's lots of compliance as well. But um, if what's happening is, uh, you know, a, a, a government, any government finds out that they can avoid scrutiny with impunity on, you know, a handful of things, it makes it easier to... Um, uh, avoid scrutiny on the next issue and the next issue. So I, I think senators need to be um, uh, judicious about when they decide that the, the Senate's powers really do need to be brought to bear on some of these issues. But uh, as you say, it's a matter for senators and a majority in the Senate to decide whether and when to enforce these things. Okay, thank you, Clark. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Smith and Sarah Sullivan, quickly. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Clark, just in regards to the comments you made to Senator Patrick in, to, in regards to the public interest immunity claim, so, your, so um, if I heard your response correctly, there might be two perspectives. One is that a claim is made at a point in time, and the other is that a claim is made as a continuous mm -hmm. claim. Um, could you just expand on those two? different perspectives? Um, sure, Senator. So, um, the, the, as I recall um, the, the circumstance that Senator Patrick was, was referring to, um, he'd s documents were sought under, um, uh, through an order for production documents a, a year or so ago, 18, 18 months ago, 
um, and then they were um, received through an FOI process much more recently. Um, when the Minister came before the Senate, um, as required by the Senate to make an explanation of it, his, um, his explanation included that uh, the documents had been reasonably sensitive a year or so ago, and they're not so sensitive now. Mm -hmm. um, th that often would happen, you would expect, in things like freedom of information, um, where this, or, or where the Senate's uh, seeking legal advice and a legal case might be on foot when that um, case is over, then maybe it, it can be provided. Certainly in commercial, uh, commercial confidentiality, we've seen that um, quite frequently, where uh, you know, figures that are sought early on in a um, uh, negotiation process uh, are too sensitive to be uh, provided, but further down the track, that sensitivity falls away. So that's that's the issue I was referring to. Yeah, thank you, uh, Senator Sullivan. I have a question in relation to broadcasting. Is that for your DPS? DPS. Depending on what it is, but well, sort of in line with uh, the question that uh, Senator Patrick was asking earlier. With regards to looking numbers at, of people and things. No, looking at the, um, the the mediums of broadcast. That's sort of thing. So you you spoke about narrow casting versus oh, broadcast. That's sort of feels very DPS to me. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I'll, I'll wait. Thank okay. you. If there are no further questions for the Department of Senate, I thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence here this morning. And the committee will now move to the Parliamentary Budget Office. Thank you. Thank you. I welcome the Acting Parliamentary Budget Officer, Ms Linda Ward, and Officers of the Parliamentary Budget Office. I thank the PBO for providing updated information on PBO activity, which has been circulated to the committee. Uh, Ms Ward, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, I don't. Can thank I you. say something briefly? You may, Mr President. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to commence by thanking all the staff of the Parliamentary Budget Office for their efforts and their flexibility throughout this year. As well as the general challenges faced by all parliamentary staff, the pandemic has slowed down the recruitment process for a new Parliamentary Budget Officer. As I've outlined previously, the Speaker and I engaged the Parliamentary Service Commissioner to coordinate a process that reflected those undertaken previously, comprising a panel to shortlist and make recommendations for interview to the presiding officers. The process is now almost complete and we hope to make an announcement within, within days. I would particularly like to thank Linda Ward and Colin Brown who have acted in this role over the period um, that has been somewhat extended. Thank you. Uh, I know Senator Patrick is seeking the call. Are any other senators seeking the call for the PBO? Senator Ayres? I'll go to Senator Ayres first and then Senator Patrick. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Ms Ward and your colleagues. Um, will the PBO be doing a medium-term analysis of the budget? We will. Um, it's one of our regular reports. Uh, it was delayed this year due to the timing of the budget, but mm. yeah, work is currently underway and I expect it to be published in the coming months. So published before the end of the year? Or? Yes. Okay. And is the... Um, have you done any work on determining dollar figures for the budget deficit, the level of gross and net debt? So, uh, not in relation to the budget. Um, you might be aware that we published um, medium-term fiscal scenarios mm. uh, earlier this year that showed the impact of COVID-19 on a number of aggregates, including net debt, but that's the extent of our published analysis at this point. Has there been any work done, or do you have a view about when the budget would next get back into surplus? Uh, no, that's not an area that we've analysed at this point or um, 
or rather we're, uh, we haven't published anything on, in that space. So you haven't published anything on that. Is there any work being done on that question? So we, um, as I said, we've got uh, our medium term projections work underway, which focuses on the next decade. We also have a report that we expect to be published um, again before the end of the year on fiscal sustainability, which provides will provide a framework for, for thinking about issues to do with, with um, the longer term sustainability of the budget position. And, and does that work on the next decade show net debt, or show us getting back into surplus over the course of the decade? So that work is still underway, so... And it, it doesn't show when net debt would be zero or when gross debt would begin to be paid off? It will show um, what the, the likely trajectory is for net debt over the next decade. Um, but as I said, that, that work is still underway. It's still, still under, it hasn't been completed yet? Uh, I mean, well, the, the budget was only released yeah. on the 6th of October. So, so what, why has the PBO got a debt calculator on the website? The Public Debt Interest Calculator, we mm. published that on Friday. That's a tool to provide the general public and parliamentarians with a way of understanding the interest cost associated with specific policy proposals. It is the, based on the same calculator that we're using costings um, and also uh, used for the post-election report. So it allows, for example, a parliamentarian to receive a, a PBO costing and to, to insert the, the, the figures from that costing to determine how much, and it, to get an estimate of how much interest might be associated with that Proposal. And is that, is that something that um, was an internal initiative of the Parliamentary Budget Office? That's correct. So it was developed um, prior, prior to this budget? Oh, it's, yes, certainly. It's, it's been up, that work has been underway for quite some time. Um, it just reached completion last week. And, we're and, and how, long's it been, how long has that process been going um, for? I would I can't recall the exact timing, but I would, it was started earlier this year. Um, and it, Pri it prior is to March? A, a, Sorry, prior to March? Um, it was, I'm not sure if the specific work was underway, but the discussions had been happening for some time within the PBO um, prior to March. Um, it was uh, one of the, the, the projects that we identified as, as being valuable coming out of our um, post-election work last year. Okay, thank you. Um, will, will the pandemic and the policies in the budget, including the hiring subsidy only for those under 35, and investment in industries with more men than women workers, will that hasten the age and gender trends in those receiving job seeker? Um, I can't really comment on how specific proposals will affect uh, job seeker recipients into the future. We, we published a report just prior to budget on job seekers showing the underlying trends affecting um, job seeker recipient numbers and how we expect um, that to affect expenditure on job seeker into the future. Um, and our, our finding that was that based on some of the, the shifts that have occurred over the last three decades in that um, recipient group, we, we think it's likely that there will be um, a greater expenditure on job seeker than we had previously projected in our, our own medium term projections report. Uh, but we are still doing the detailed analysis of how that will flow through into the, um, the projections that we publish with the, the report later this year. But will, will, for example, the hiring subsidy for those under 35, will that mean that that cohort of older women on JobSeeker will increase? I haven't done the analysis at, at all to look at whether um, that... that I, that would change the, the trend already underway in respect to older women? So we see older women uh, increase, the, 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 that cohort increasing, but you haven't, haven't done any work on whether, whether the government's new 
policy proposition outlined in the budget will, will accentuate that trend? No, our report was published prior to budget uh, and, and as I said, all our um, work looking at um, the medium term projections report is still underway. So one of the, the elements of that will be to, to project um, what, the, what the outlook is for all um, major expenditure programs, including Job Seeker. And can you tell me in that report the the cohort of people over 60 who are on Job Seeker, how many are likely to stay on the payment until the age pension age? Um, I might ask Miss Smith to come to the table. She may have that Thank specific um, figure to hand. Good morning, Good morning. Senator, your question was about how many of the existing women aged over 65 would remain on Job Seeker. So it's a, a, the, the number of people who are 60 and over on Job Seeker who are likely to, to stay on Job Seeker all the way through to, to the age pension. Senator, we wouldn't have those specific figures. Our report does illustrate that. Um, older aged cohorts are likely to remain on job seeker for a longer period of time and indeed um, they're the highest age group who've been on the payment for five years or more. And do, do you have anything to the the the, the government's policy proposition the the under 35 incentives that that will make that trend worse won't it? Uh, as Ms Ward said, we haven't analysed the impacts of that specific proposal to date. But as a matter, it's, it's hard to see, Ms Ward, any other result flowing from that policy, isn't it? So, it's, I guess as, a, as a, in a general statement, underlying trends affecting older women are likely to, to continue and be in a, in a way unaffected by a measure that targets women outside of that. Um. But if the policy measures are directed towards men and women under a particular age, that, that group of women over 60, the group, group of men and women are, are over the age of 60 are likely to, the, the, those trends that you've described in the report and have described today are, are not going to improve, they're going to get worse for that group, aren't they? The, I guess for, from our, our perspective, we would see the, tr the same trend continuing um, based on the analysis we've done to date. Um, and has the PBO modelled or measured the propensity of Social Security recipients, um, particularly those on unemployment payments, to spend? Particularly, no. it, you know, relative to um, higher income, um, to higher income earners? That, that would be more in the, the realm of economic analysis, which is outside of our mandate. So you don't, um, you don't, there's no, no work being done about uh, the, whether there's a higher propensity to spend of low income earners or recipients of job seeker. Um, so as I said, the only, um, the only, time in which we would consider that that um, question would be in the, the course of a, a costing or budget analysis request that, that involved a behavioural response. Um, so, so a response to high income tax cuts or an increase in unemployment payments? Those could be examples, but I'm not able to comment on what specific work. Um, but you haven't been asked to do that work? All of our costing and budget analysis work is confidential unless um, the requester allows us to, to talk publicly about it. Um, and we haven't released anything publicly. In that okay, so the report indicates that the trend of people being stuck on the job seeker payment for longer will continue. What, what is driving that? Sorry, could you so, Sorry, I was probably too fast. The, your, your, the, um, your report indicates that the trend of people being stuck on the job seeker payment for longer will continue. 
what's what's driving that uh, increasing length of um, I'm not sure what quite the right term is the, the increasing length of time that people are stuck on the job seeker payment um, so so part of it is um, the the age demographics and um, and also capacity to work. Uh, there's an increasing proportion who are exempt from mutual obligation activity. Miss mm. Smith may wish to add. Uh, so, Senator, to elaborate. Um, there, we did identify that there's an increasing share of recipients um, who aren't subject to um, the full mutual obligation requirements, um, and that's risen from about 10% in around 2007 to around 40% around now. Um, it's likely that um, some of that is due to policy changes from successive governments in the social work, other social welfare payments. And that, that the increases in um, the, the, the increasing length of people being on JobKeeper, has there been any work done on what cost to the budget and to the economy are, are associated with that increasing duration in terms of you know, mental health outcomes, other health outcomes, productivity, uh, access to housing, that, that range of questions? So our analysis consistent with our mandate is focused on, on the the fiscal policy elements associated with that payment. Um, and as I said, in our medium term projections report, we will look then at, at how we expect um, those underlying trends to flow through to, to the budget cost over the medium term. So there will be work about you know, the, the, the increasing, increasing unemployment, increasing duration of unemployment and, that, and the impact of that on you know, mental health, for example, on, on Commonwealth no, expenditures that would, that's in that's outside of our mandate. I had some good questions about um, about the appointment of the new parliamentary budget yep. officer, um, pre President. But you neatly anticipated that I've got we would some have we would on. have questions about that. Is there anything else you can tell us about that? Uh, what would you like? I, I've got some rough outline of costs. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, you, you're uh, always one step ahead of me. No, no. It's just we, we, to be <laughs> honest, we were hoping to be able to get it out before today. Uh, yes. Obviously, there's some consultation. Um, and we need to um, inform some people before we make a public announcement. We just, um, it, I hope it will be this week. Um, so recruitment managing and scribing costs um, to be reimbursed to the APSC, act, in this case acting as the Parliamentary Service Commissioner, will be just over $5,000. And the advertising costs, we did run a second round because yeah, the first round sort of got lost in, in, in the months of March and April, mm. come to just under $30,000 and they'll be reimbursed to the APSC, in this case acting as the, because the joint appointment, Peter Wilcott is also the Parliamentary Service Commissioner, but acts in a separate statutory capacity to the presiding officers. And how many applications were received? I don't have that information on me. It would have been over a dozen, uh, the exact, but I can take on notice how many were Thank received. You. Yep. I don't have any further questions, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you Senator. Yes, Senator Patrick. Uh, yes. Thank you. I just want to go to, um, Ms Ward, I want to talk to you about a PBS request, and it's a request that I've made, and I'm giving you permission to talk about it, uh, just, um, just for the benefits of others listening. Um, it's a request to uh, have one graph produced, and that is a, f a graph of uh, defence acquisition costs as a function of time. But instead of coming from defence, it's... Uh, 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 I've asked the PBO to look at it from a project's perspective, so we look at what the project managers of each of the individual projects think, simply aggregate what they think, uh, and then present that information to, uh, uh, to myself. Um, that request has been uh, a long, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a long-standing request now, and, and you know, I'll declare I have talked to you about this in private. Can you just advise me what the difficulties are in respect of the request that I've made? What, what, what's the problem that the PBS is encountering in, um, in not being able to respond to that request? The, the difficulties that the PBO is having or yeah. the defence? Yeah. Well, 
obviously you, you, you approach these things and, and uh, um, this is not in any way disparaging against you because you've done some other excellent work for me. Uh, just uh, in this particular instance, you're, the PBO is taking quite a significant amount of time uh, and it appears on the face of it that you're unable to complete the request. So um, I will talk, talk about the request, uh, seeing you, you've authorised me to do so. Um, what, one of the, uh, the uh, as you'd be aware, we rely on um, government agencies to provide information and models to support our work. Um, and I would start by saying that we get very good cooperation from government agencies in doing that. Um, but there, is, there are provisions in the memorandum of understanding that we have in place um, with all government agencies that allow them to indicate where information is confidential. Um, and in this case, there, there are some components of the, the information that we would require to, to complete um, your request that um, have been uh, are confidential and um, are unable to, for, we are unable to disclose those. Um, there are t and and there are times when we, re we receive confidential information from government agencies, and we we have the capacity to do so. But in those occasions, we would only use that information to complete a request if we could do so in a way that didn't reveal the underlying confidential data. In this case. Um, we don't have the full information in order to complete the request. Um, um, but, but I am satisfied that we've had good engagement from the agency. Right. Good engagement's nice, but if it doesn't fulfil the objective, which is to complete the work, um, uh, th then one would argue that it's, uh, um, you know, the engagement is a means to an end, not the ends itself. Um, uh, is it fair to say that the, what I'm asking for, that being a, a X, on the x-axis time, as in years, each for each year, and an aggregate of total requirements of expenditure, to be would, would you consider that to be confidential? I think our assessment is that it would be difficult for us to provide the the data that you've requested in a way that we'd be satisfied the underlying confidential data couldn't be determined. Uh, but Mr Brown may wish to add to that. Uh, Senator, um, we can really only go by what we are advised by the department as well. So under our act, if they advise us that mm. it is confidential, um, then we don't have any grounds to contest that. And there is apparently sensitivity in the time profile of the expenditure. But there is a public domain time profile. The, this document, I can actually go to the integrated investment plan and get access to what I would consider to be a smoothed uh, diagram. And I just want to get to the truth of what the what, what the project managers think. I mean, if if uh, if I if I said that the entire expenditure uh, on defence acquisitions this year was 10.2 billion dollars. How could that in any way reveal anything that is confidential, commercially sensitive, military sensitive? Can you perhaps elaborate? If you're concerned about what you're going to release to me might, ha might be confidential, can you explain that? Well, we do rely, as Mr Brown said, we do rely on the agency as well to advise us on the security classification of that information. Sure, so just to be very clear, the output uh, which is a, one graph, that's all I'm seeking, with aggregate information. I'm just trying to na um, narrow down where the, where the problem lies. Either you say that's sensitive and, and it couldn't be produced. Alternatively, uh, Defence is saying the input data is sensitive. I'm just trying to establish which of those two is it. So I think it's both, that both the, the data required to to perform the calculation and the, the, the final result is, is classified as confidential. Are you asking for any information about military systems, what they do, how they perform, or are you simply asking for cost information as a function of time? 
Mr Brown may wish to answer um, a specific... We're asking for purely the cost information over time. So, so can I say, Patrick, is sure. it possible, just as a layperson without your sure. background in this, though, it would strike me that it is possible that even if you wanted this, um, sorry, aggregated information over time, yeah. that an assertion that that could be reverse engineered to provide more information that was currently in the public domain for security reasons would be possible. That it could mean something more to um, people who knew how to effectively analyse what might be more specific spending over time there, there are by project. There are 30 projects yep. on the major projects list. Uh, and if I said to you, um, the total expenditure for, for that project, those projects this year was $10.2 billion. I put it to you, you could not reverse engineer anything out of that. No, maybe not out of that, but is it possible that that becomes a tool by which other information that is available, that that can help do that with that other information? There is a public domain version. Yeah. I, I put it to you, it's a smoothed version. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. Yeah. Is that is the smoothing then potentially I'll, part of the... I'll tell you why I want the information to, to, just, to, to give yeah. you an understanding is because what happens is project managers will will work out how they want to spend the money and that may involve a peak at some point in time. And the numbers that defence spend uh, are deficit breaking, although it's pretty hard to do that um, now, but uh, uh, yeah, they, they can change surpluses to deficits. Um, the, uh, and, and, and so what happens is a project may then be instructed to delay progress. Yeah, okay. appreciate and, that. Yeah. And I just want to get a sense of um, or accelerate progress. Or accelerate. To bring forward I agree. Either way. Um, uh, that, that's why I find the smooth version very difficult to believe because it just doesn't, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't sit well with me, with my project manager, manager experience. Um, the point I'm trying to get to here is defence. I don't have a criticism of the work that the PBO does. I'm trying to get to the relationship between defence and the PBO, whereby defence will, will not pass information that, is only, uh, that only involves cost information as a function of the time and the, maybe the name of the project, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you were passed that information, uh, you would never reveal that to and couldn't be compelled to, do, to reveal that information to anyone, could you? Your Act uh, prevents So that. any confidential information sitting with us, that's right, remains confidential. Um, we can't be compelled to provide it to someone. Else. How many other circumstances have you encountered this year where you've not been able to grant it, to conduct, carry out a request because an, uh, an agency has not um, provided you or refused to provide you with information? Um, I don't have the specific numbers. I, th I think there would be very few. Can you take that on notice? Take on and can you detail the department uh, which is not providing that information and the, and the purported reason for not providing that to you for, for each of those instances? So I don't want to go into the request itself. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that, that's the, the details that are private to members and uh, indeed to, your, to the office yourself. Um, so in this instance, it is the Department of Defence and they're refusing to provide you with simple cost information as a function of time, perhaps the name of the project. You know, there's nothing in the request that requires you to understand anything about military capability, anything about um, what the capability would be used for, anything that would a normal person would say, well, you know, that, that, that might involve some sensitivities. It's just financial information. We have received information to the extent that they felt able to provide it to us, but yeah. it's not sufficient to undertake the costing in form. How, 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 how um, firm are you in pushing back? Uh, we've, we've had extensive discussions with Defence. Uh, Mr Brown can talk yeah. to the, the details of those um, to, to try and explore options for us to be able to uh, gain access to the information and, and to understand the the underlying reason for the information not being provided to us. Mr Brown, the uh, nature yes. of those discussions? We have had discussions with Defence about the information that's requested and what we can be provided. And we have certainly pushed um, the department to try and get greater disclosure. Um, but the information, so we have received, um, I think, 
you know, information to the fullest extent that they feel they can provide us. Okay. And what were the reasons or the harms stated? Uh, so, the, so in in saying to you, we can't give this information. It uh, would would cause harm. What, what are the reasons they're giving you in respect of uh, the non provision of information? Um, they range across. There are a number of potential reasons why a department could withhold information from us. So just in uh, relation in the to these of, discussions, yep. I want to know the specifics of these discussions. So, um, if, yep, sorry. Uh, yeah, it could. It, it ranges across the um, potential for um, national security implications, um, potential for disclosing commercial information, which is confidential, and um, then there's cabinet confidentiality as well. But that's not stuff that uh, you're going to pass on to, to me as the, re as the re requester, is it? Um, in terms of the detailed li you know, um, item by item expenditures, no, we wouldn't be passing that mm. across. It would be an aggregate. And but do, you, do you have people with security clearances in your office? Yes. So uh, presumably there's two requirements. You need to have a clearance and a need to know. Um, ha have you talked that through with the department to say, actually, we, ha we are cleared, we can hold this information, it will not leave this office, it will be uh, 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 restricted? We have had discussions along those lines, yes. And I'm just trying to get to the nub of why Defence think, thinks numbers associated with projects could in any way be classified or harmful to national security. Um, in your discussions with them? I think national security is one potential ground, but there are others as well. Yeah, so. I'm trying to drill down into mm. national security. People, I think, to be fair, that, that like, yeah. it, it, I'm always, it, sure. it, it's always difficult to ask officials to report on the concerns of others. I think mm. like, they are, they, they've been flagged. I think it's fair to say that mm. need, that should be pursued with defence as to what they've said, rather than asking these people to report what they've been said in the first instance. Well, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask them what defence told them. Well, I what, think what was communicated just, to them by defence? Uh, in, in general terms... Because I will ask I mean, defence as well. I know, but in general terms, I think it's fair, always fair in the first instance to give mm. the person you're asking rather than go for the hearsay. Sure. And I, I don't think there's really anything further we could add in terms of the discussions we've had with defence. Um, that would go to, to a, high, a greater well, level of detail. OK, it goes to the efficacy of the debate. It goes to your your ability to actually do your job. If you, if you just sit there and say, yeah, I'll accept that, rather than push back a little bit, then actually it creates a really bad precedence moving forward to for fair, anyone I, who to makes be, a To be request. fair, I don't think that's what the officials have suggested. I've heard them talk well, about ongoing dialogue and discussion. Sure. I'm trying to understand how much pushback, whether, you, whether you've just accepted that some piece of information is, is, uh, uh, has been claimed by defence to be uh, sensitive, and that's the end of the story. You just said, okay, I won't, I won't push further. Yeah. So both the memorandum of understanding we have with gov government agencies and our legislation, which has specific powers in relation to um, the post-election re report, both of those allow, have provisions that allow for agencies to indicate that information is protected and to um, request that we not release it. Uh, I understand, I understand that, reason. and my question goes to how often you then inquire, or how you go about inquiring and testing those claims, or you simply don't. Any department can just say, sorry, it's sensitive, PBO stops doing its work. Uh, so it's, it's not correct to say that we just take um, their first response as, as, a, as a final mm. response. We do, as Mr Brown said, have discussions with whichever agency is involved to understand the reasons okay. and, and be satisfied that there are... And that's my point. So you've got an understanding of the reasons. I'm trying to understand... I'd like you to communicate those to me. I'd like you to tell me what those reasons are, not just that it's national security. You've done a bit of pushing back. What were the exact reasons for the, for the uh, defence to deny you access to information required to fulfil a reasonable request? Senator Patrick, you have asked that question a couple of times sure. now, and I think the PBO is trying to assist you as best they sure. can within the constraints that they operate in. As the President suggested, you've got the opportunity to pursue this with the department themselves, uh, and, who are and the ones who com communicated this to the PBO. They're the best place, I think, to ask that sure. question. Respectfully, Chair, 
Um, Ms Ward just told me that they s try to seek an understanding of, of why uh, information is not passed on. Sure. And and Senator Patrick, I'll let you go for 15 minutes completely uninterrupted on this issue, sure. but given that you've now come back to this same question four or five times by my count, let's let the PBO have perhaps one more go um, at responding to that question, but I think it's, well, it's I, only I, fair you pursue the Department Can I suggest defense. respectfully to my the colleagues at the PBO, I mean, I appreciate you would like an answer from them before you go to defence. Yeah. Um, I think with respect, defence should be given the answer, opportunity to answer first, and these officials, should, you've given your answer a few times, they may be able to provide you with further um, information on notice, given that I appreciate the specific words that are used here are something that might be of specific interest to you, and so I think we should give the officials the chance to interrogate their own records and have a specific set okay. of words reported to you. All right, if, we, if, we, if you'd take that on notice, as the President suggested, I'd be happy with that. Thank you, Just Chair. Just so I can thank perfectly you. accurately reflect right. the interactions. Right. Thank you, Mr President. That's very helpful. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. Are there other Senators who wish to ask questions to the PBO? Uh, if not, I thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence here this morning. Um, the committee will now go to our scheduled break and we'll return at 10.45 a.m. Uh, with the Department of Public Services. We will come back to you. Good morning. Uh, I welcome Mr Robert Stefanik, Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services, Dr Diane Herriot, Parliamentary Librarian and officers from the department. I thank DPS for providing the information pursuant to the committee's recommendations in the DPS inquiry, which has been circulated to the committee. Uh, I know, Mr President, you flagged you had an opening statement at this point. I'll just check Mr Stefanik or Dr Herriot whether you have opening statements. Uh, no, I do not. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr President. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the extensive efforts by the department and its staff during the unprecedented events this year. It seems like an eon ago, but the smoke had barely cleared from the summer bushfires and the clean-up completed from Canberra's extraordinarily intense hailstorm, hailstorm when DPS had to turn its attention to COVID-19. Throughout this year, DPS has taken a lead role in working with other parliamentary departments to ensure that the parliament could continue its work throughout the pandemic. On the 6th of March, the department formally activated its continuity control group under its business continuity framework and subsequently established a COVID task force on the 20th of March to lead and implement a coordinated response at Parliament House. In my view, it has been critical to demonstrate that Parliament and its work in various fora continue throughout the pandemic, and we have successfully done that. DPS worked closely with myself, the Speaker, and other parliamentary departments to adapt to critical functions. Despite the extensive and evolving challenges, particularly the unique risk of people travelling from across the country, the Australian Parliament met on 23 March, 8 April, 12 to 14 May, 10 to 18 June and 24 August to 3 September. In conjunction with its parliamentary department counterparts, DPS implemented best practice hygiene measures, communicated pandemic related changes and maintained high levels of flexibility to adapt to new situations and requirements as they have arisen, sometimes quite rapidly. For example, when the medical advice recommended the use of masks for the August and indeed current sitting periods, a team of around 2,500 people worked for several days to prepare approximately 5,500 face mask kits for parliamentarians, staff and building occupants. With the immediate prospect uh, earlier in the year, with the immediate prospect that many more users of our computer network might need to self-isolate and access the IT system remotely, and then the rapid expansion of more general remote work needs, the DPS ICT staff worked around the clock to not only meet the technological demands of rapidly supporting parliamentarians and their staff into remote working environments, while themselves professionally and privately being impacted by the situation. The ICT remote access system had been developed years ago to support ad hoc use and did not have the capacity to support potentially 5,000 remote access users. In record time, the team set about planning, designing and implementing a temporary solution to urgently increase capacity to meet needs, while at the same time also working to deliver a long-term scalable solution that was subsequently successfully implemented. I should mention the 2020 service desk um, was inundated with requests for remote access as users across the network transitioned rapidly to remote working. This small team handled up to 730 contacts per day at the peak of this transition. I think DPS should also be commended for its efforts to rapidly expand video conferencing capabilities in conjunction with the parliamentary departments. Between the 1st of April and the 30th of September this year, 362 committee hearings totalling 1188 hours have been conducted. 
Of these hearings, the majority had committee members and witnesses participate remotely using either video conference or teleconference facilities to engage in the important work that committees perform. I would add that this work is particularly critical to, Senate, to the Senate and to Senators. The feedback received by the Speaker and I confirms that participants are generally satisfied with the video conferencing system's operation and support. Minor challenges were expected and, in my view, have been handled effectively. Of course, the initial closure of the building to the public meant some public-facing staff could not perform their normal duties. I'd like to acknowledge the 55 DPS staff who, across various functions, were redeployed to Services Australia to support the government's pandemic response. To support this effort, the Speaker and I agreed to a satellite processing centre being established within Parliament House, providing additional space for Services Australia and enabling seconded staff to attend their normal place of work while undertaking this assistance. Finally, on the subject of COVID-19, I want to acknowledge the wonderful job of all the people who have kept Parliament House clean this year. The significance of hygiene and cleaning has never been clearer than during this pandemic. The 21st of October marks Thank You Cleaner Day, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the hardworking men and women who keep our workspaces safe and hygienic day after day. A role sometimes wrong, wrongly taken for granted, but in this new world is even more critical to a safe workspace and eventually again, a destination for hundreds of thousands of visitors. Now some brief upgrades if I could on the capital works. The kitchens upgrade. Reduced building occupancy during the year presented the opportunity to accelerate a number of important infrastructure improvements led by DPS. One of the most significant was the completion of an upgrade to outdated um, catering facilities. This project provided the basis for increased efficiency and capacity for each of the six kitchens at Parliament House and represents the most significant upgrade of these facilities since the building opened over 30 years ago. The upgrade has been particularly necessary for the staff dining room, the CAF, which now processes more than a quarter of a million transactions per year. The works are underpinned by two primary elements, a complete redesign of kitchen layouts and the replacement of obsolete energy and efficient equipment with contemporary equipment that is consistent across all kitchens. Critically, in addition to this, these changes ensure compliance with food safety and work health and safety requirements. As with most large and complex projects, once construction commenced, it became obvious there was a need and opportunity to remediate some important infrastructure, and these activities were rolled into the project scope. For the members and guests' dining kitchen, this was the replacement of a drainage network of cast iron piping enclosed in the ceiling of the Great Hall. I have a section of it here if you'd like to see it, but it's not particularly conducive to tabling at a committee meeting. For the members and guests' dining kitchen, um, sorry, this, this network was found to be almost completely blocked, and I will be tabling some photos of the pipe blockages that were discovered. The replacement of 80 linear meet metres of pipes has avoided what was an inevitable breakage and consequent flooding that would have damaged the Great Hall beneath it, hopefully not at an actual event, but it would have damaged the parquetry flooring and the irreplaceable Great Hall tapestry one of the largest tapestries in the world created by Arthur Boyd and manufactured by the Victorian Tapestry Workshop. The second major infrastructure issue addressed was the waterproofing on the flooring of Queen's Terrace Cafe. The works revealed there was actually no waterproofing applied on the main slab, and this of course had to be addressed. In doing so, in excess of 29 tonnes of sand and cement was hand mixed on site. Both these issues were not anticipated in the project scoping, but were addressed by the project team. It was achieved against a tight project schedule with an immovable delivery date driven by the timing of the federal budget and the then expected need for the availability of the Great Hall, which was met. The refurbished Queen's Terrace Cafe is due to reopen at the end of this month, and that will also reinstate the original design intent of that space. All project elements have been delivered on time and within budget. Now to some issues that are regularly raised with me. Mobile telephone upgrade. At this stage, while there are some delays to the delivery of equipment, the mobile reception upgrade remains scheduled for completion at the end of this year. And as I said earlier, one of the reasons for the slight delay was our insistence that it be 5G compatible and not simply a fortune spent upgrading it to 4G. Wi-Fi, which I know Senator Waters mentioned earlier. Over the last two years, capacity for Wi-Fi has been expanded um, and coverage across the building. However, some factors have particularly impacted on the quality and reliability of service. As building occupants have returned to the workplace, some remote working places have come with them. For example, there are now unprecedented levels compared to a year ago, use of video conferencing and calling platforms and other new data services that can run on Wi-Fi, as, such as Microsoft Teams, Zoom, WebEx, and including some that we don't allow on our hard network, such as Zoom. 
If connected to Wi-Fi, these services collectively impact on the core availability of bandwidth. DPS is actively working on both short and long-term solutions. Um, Wi-Fi specialists have been engaged to advise on solutions to improve service quality. A longer-term project is underway to upgrade core infrastructure to provide a stable and reliable platform for the future. I recognise this does not provide immediate resolution, but this is recognised as a high priority and not just because, as I said earlier, I can't use it in my own office. Finally, cyber security upgrades continue. As I have said previously, these are matters for which each of us has to take responsibility, as well as network and, network and infrastructure issues at a management level. The Speaker and myself have recently written to, to Senators and members about the coming phase of changes that will have excuse me, some impact on users, but that we have deemed on advice are necessary. So please check your inboxes and your intros. I also just now like to table the sixth annual presiding officer's statement regarding the condition of Parliament House, and I thank the committee for its indulgence. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for that very comprehensive update. And I think I probably safely say I'm speaking for all members of the committee and all senators when I um, add my thanks to your appreciation to DPS and all its employees for the way in which they've kept this building safe and operating during this very difficult period. Um, touch wood, it is a remarkable achievement given the way in which people come from all around the country um, to meet here uh, and in the way we do and then go home again, that there's been no transmission uh, in this building during that period. And that's in no small part to all the people that you thanked and recognised, Mr. President. So um, thank you for doing that. Um, I'm going to take the Chair's prerogative to um, kick off with some questions. Um, Mr Sevenick, these questions are about the granting of passes to the building to members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Um, and please excuse a bit of a preamble because I want to have you to have the full context of my questions before you answer them. Um, th there was an incident in Parliament House uh, at the Prime Minister's uh, press conference in his courtyard on the 26th of June, uh, where a member of the Xinhua News Agency and a number of guests that they appeared to have signed in uh, came to the press conference and filmed other journalists uh, who work here in Parliament House. Now, I know security at, uh, in the uh, Prime Minister's courtyard is a matter for the AFP, not DPS, so I'm not asking you about that. But um, this has raised concern uh, among a number of building occupants about access to the building. So what I want to understand with you is the process by which those passes are granted and how that happens. Um, and I should say, in doing so, I'm not making any, casting any aspersions about the Parliamentary Press Gallery who, and the committee, who I understand have a role. I've discussed it with the President and the Secretary of that committee, and um, from my discussions with them, it's clear they very diligently fulfil their role. Uh, but I just want to understand um, the process here. So, so, so for, for, to you, Mr Stephanie, how does a uh, member of the Press Gallery come to get a pass to enter the building? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fairly simple process. The um, pass office uh, operated by DPS receives the, the application uh, and the application for the individual pass is sponsored by uh, the President of the Press Gallery. Yep. And so uh, assessment about whether that person meets the necessary criteria to um, qualify for that pass is effectively done by the Press Gallery Committee? That's correct. Um, so in effect, Parliament has outsourced to a third party decisions about who should have access to, to the building. Uh, I, look, I, to be fair, um, this is going into areas of policy, not just yeah, administration. I, I want to come to you at the end, Mr but President. I, I, wouldn't, I would not use those terms. Um, I would say the Parliament um, has granted some autonomy to a press gallery, or well, the officers of the Parliament, but it's long-standing practice, officers of the press gallery to determine which uh, members of the press gaining access is what I would describe it as. I would yeah. not use your terms. Sure, and, and I do have some policy questions which I want to come to at the end to you, Mr President, because there are, as you say, real questions of policy here that have nothing to do with DPS or mm. indeed uh, the, the press gallery, but are really matter for us as politicians. Um, so we'll come to you on that. But just, just so we're clear on the process, um, Mr Stefanik, uh, a, for an ordinary pass to be granted for a member of parliament staff or to a lobbyist, um, there is some involvement either with DPS or a, a elected politician in deciding the merits of that person um, being granted access to the building. That's right, isn't it? Um, yes, that's correct. Um, so that with sponsored passes, for example, um, it requires uh, an existing pass holder with policy rights uh, to sponsor uh, another individual um, for the issue of a pass, an unescorted pass to them. 
So in, in that way, either the parliament uh, or the government has control over every other pass holder that's granted access to the building, with the exception of uh, journalists. A member of parliament, um, yes. in the sense of you or any other member of parliament has the right to put someone up for a sponsored pass, not yep. the parliament, I suppose I'd say, a member of. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll come to the policy issues at the end there, because there's obviously there might be a very good reason why you wouldn't want members of parliament to control which journalists have access to the building, but I'll, I'll come to that. So a, a press gallery pass holder is entitled to uh, roam around the building unescorted, isn't that correct? Uh, that's correct, Jane. Yep. And they're also entitled to sign in guests on the same basis as another pass holder. That's correct. Not, all, not, all, not all pass holders have that right, um, but press gallery members do. And to be honest, that reflects the fact you can go down to the Senate entrance most days and you'll see them signing in people to go up to a studio at the ABC or Sky or something like that. Exactly. And I'm, and I'm not contesting that that's yep. an appropriate um, right for them to have, but I just want to establish these facts. Uh, and there's no limit on the number of people that they can sign in at any one time? Yeah, there is a number at one time. I, okay. Off the top of my head, I can't tell you, but I can get that for you. But there are, there are numerical limits. Yeah, um, I'm getting that information for you, okay. and, and is there any criteria for a pass holder to decide who they should sign in as a guest, or is it just up to their own judgment about <coughs> what's, what's wise to do? Or are they given any guidance about that? Well, we've given guidance over the sitting period, for example. We've asked senators and members to only sign in people for essential business, but we leave the judgment of what is essential to each senator and member. There has historically been, if anything, a great resistance by senators and members having their prerogatives over who can be signed access into the building, um, having that in any way restricted by the presiding officers or by the government or by policy. Mm. So in the end, when it comes to signing people in, it is generally um, in the um, hands of the senator or member. In or in case. this case, a member of the press gallery. Yep. 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 So the, the, the reason I ask these questions is that um, Xinhua News Agency is, a, is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. It's a state-run news agency from a one-party state, an, an authoritarian state. And um, my questions could apply equally to any other news agency of a foreign government that is an authoritarian government. Um, Russia Today's access to the building would have just be as much interest to me as Xinhua. Um, but I mean, this was a news agency founded in 1931 by the Chinese Communist Party. It was originally called uh, the Red China News Agency. Its president is on the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we now know that on that day, the 26th of June, we didn't know this at the time, but that two members of the Xinhua News Agency were raided by ASIO in connection with a foreign interference investigation. Um, in the United States, they've been declared um, a foreign mission uh, and, and banned, and I'm not necessarily advocating any of those things here in Australia, but um, I think it should be of interest to parliamentarians the basis on which people such as these are, are given access to the building and the rights that they have in this building. Um, what assistance is provided to the press gallery committee to make the, their assessments about the legitimacy of anyone applying? Do they have um, I, any access to research, any assistance? Well, I, well, I would be reluctant for politicians to be interfering with the determination of a press gallery um, decision yeah, that, about what constitutes a journalist. Whether I, I not, share your concern. Whether, whether or not they engage with agencies that have that expertise, I can't speak to. Yeah, I, I share your concern about that, Mr President. And I, as I said, I, I want to come to that discussion in a minute. But just to, to establish the facts, um, does the Press Gallery Committee have access to, in any formal way, need, any resources to assist them to make these assessments? You'll need to speak to the Press... Uh, from DPS, um, I, I have... The, the presiding officers have discussions hmm. um, on a number of management issues, some of which aren't disclosed publicly with respect to the Press Gallery. In the past, that has include um, those who hold licences, which is the term used here for a leaseholder of the press gallery and therefore a member of the press gallery. Um, because not all pass holders have an office. Um, if you, you, can have an access, you can have a press gallery pass, a yellow media pass, without being a licence holder with office space on the second floor. Um, but there are discussions. There are no DPS provided resources. Whether or not they seek them from elsewhere, I uh, have those discussions, I do not know. Yeah, but as you would know, Mr President, I can't ask questions to the Press Gallery Committee. They don't appear here. And in this instance, DPS has, in my terminology, I know you don't agree with it, but I think effectively outsourced to a third party. No, don't say DPS. No, no, let's be honest. No, let's take a step back. Let's not say DPS. Let's say it's been long-standing practice reflecting the will of parliamentarians for the Press Gallery to determine its own membership and access to the building. Mm. And that's not DPS's issue. That's yep. an issue the Parliament, including myself, and presiding officers have made over many, many decades. Now, the consequence of that may be, as you describe it, in this new world, but it is not a conscious decision of DPS to outsource. It has been a long-standing 
view that the Parliament has allowed the press gallery to determine its own membership. Mm. And, and just on that, do, do you know the history of it, when that decision was made? Do anyone from DPS know the history of when that was decided? Um, I, my best guess, and if I'm wrong, I'll, um, I'll, I'll make a couple of phone calls to people I know who have been here a long time um, and predate the building. My best guess is that it actually predates this building yep. because the facilities and the arrangement in this building are, are somewhat unique. Uh, in the sense of studios and everything, effectively being a broadcast centre. It's not common in Westminster in the US where a lot of those facilities are off-site. Mm. Um, and for reasons that MPs themselves, including myself, have been very, very um, strongly um, defending, we have refused to zone this building to acquire the carrying of passes or have pass checks mm. of senators and members going through various parts of it. We've tried to maintain the private and the public areas of the building so as not to be starting to lock senators and members else out where. It is impractical mm. if senators and members don't have to carry their pass to require others to carry to effectively have to swipe in and out of, say, more sensitive areas of the building. Sure. So I'll check and I'll come back if it's different, but I believe that predates the opening of this building at the very least. Yeah. Thank you. If, if you could come back on notice, that would be interesting because, as you hinted, I think times have changed a little bit and we're, we're now living in the era of state-sponsored disinformation campaigns and there have been credible accusations that state uh, media journalists have been involved in covert espionage activities all around the world. Uh, and so the basis on which the parliament, as you say, has decided to allow a, a pretty much unfettered access to this building to um, people who might pose a risk in that respect, I think is absolutely worthy of the parliament's cons consideration. Um, but as you say, there are, are important policy issues here, Mr. President. I, I agree with what I suspect your view is, or what you've kind of hinted your view is, that it would be inappropriate for politicians to decide which journalists had access to the building. It's very easy to imagine how that could be used capriciously and inappropriately to punish you know, people who are critical. Uh, and indeed, I'd suggest, just as you've outlined, there are those examples you mentioned. There are also lots of examples of politicians using uh, a, a well-intentioned power to restrict uh, free media um, and scrutiny. So I suppose, in the end, it's a, it's a balance of, of, of risk. Um, but I'd suggest that um, inertia um, and, I, um, and long-standing practice to change that is a very substantial change. Mm. So it's not a conscious decision, the, the events of exactly. what happened. It exactly. is a reflection of long-standing practice. And, and that's why I'm raising it, because I think it should be a conscious consideration of the parliament. And I think we should be clear, you know, we're not talking about the Associated Press here. Uh, these are very different operations. But how do you, how do you to, to, to be honest? What's the criteria? I mean, yeah. the press gallery has its own criteria. This is, um, we can critique an existing situation. I'll be honest, I fear the idea that any politician can decide who has access to the building, although that's less important than it once was because of streaming and other things mm -hmm. I appreciate. Um, we've closed the building to the public for weeks now on the mm -hmm. basis that they can all watch and hear these hearings. Yeah. So the question then is, what is the criteria by which politicians should be making a decision about who is um, entitled to a press pass? At the moment, the press gallery, and has, has an internal process, allows who is, they set their criteria and people are fitted or they don't. Yeah, yeah um, I'm conscious of the time. I know that other yeah. senators have many questions, so I, I won't persist with this too long, but um, I'm not proposing that politicians should decide. What I am asking is, should a more robust process be put in place, which ensures that the press gallery committee or whoever it is that makes that decision has access to sufficient resources to make this decision but because they are making a decision on behalf of all of the building To be honest, occupants. the resources aren't the, we could, the resources, it's the criteria that are the issue, not the resources. Because in the end, you could apply all the resources, but it doesn't make it, only makes you know more about the existing applicant in the end. And the criteria are pretty broad if you look at it. Mm. So the question then is, um, you really are arguing, I'd suggest, that you, you want reconsideration of the criteria given recent developments that you put forward. Also, now that is Well, but the point is, unless you change the criteria, it doesn't really matter if you know extra stuff about well, them, if they still meet the criteria. Yeah, well, except I think that the members of the Press Gallery Committee, certainly from my conversation with them, are very sincere and very diligent about their yep. role, but they don't have access to anything other than their own um, intuition uh, in deciding whether someone should be granted or not. And well, I agree the criteria is important, but it's not just well, criteria. Well, you know, with all due respect, I don't think that's actually just the issue because I know other members of it say it's not their job to determine what constitutes a, a journalist. So I don't think it's fair to say there is a consensus. Uh, it is a difficult situation, I agree. Um, and there have been discussions with the Press Gallery Committee after that incident. Um, to what, are, what can we learn from it to ensure something like that does not happen again. Conscious it's in a part of the building that you know, we aren't 
um, don't have the same authority over. Um, but I come at this from a, um, from a view that uh, there needs to be a strong argument for, there may well be one, but then a clear articulation of what any change should be. And it's not just about resources. If you're going to change who has access to the building, you're changing the criteria. I agree. I agree. All right, Mr. Stephen, do you have an answer for that question you took on notice about the number of people that can be signed in? Um, I'm still trying to get that, Sen uh, okay. Sen uh, Chair, so I'll take that on notice and I'll provide that yeah. to you. Okay. Um, yeah, can, I, can I commend it to your consideration, Mr. President, as a custodian of the building along with the Speaker? Um, because not to put too fine a point on it, but particularly in this age where parliamentarians are in this building often without staff, um, our uh, offices are unoccupied um, for large parts of the day, um, and for uh, people who have the ability to freely roam around the building, sign in any guests that they wish uh, who may have a connection to a foreign um, state uh, agency, I think is a real concern to a lot of building participants. And may I say, if anyone's got any suggestions for change, I'm happy to, happy to think about them on the basis that um, I, am, I would be reluctant to impose something upon the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery. Um, I don't think it's a matter of resources. I think we'd have to consider uh, the test. There are lots of historical examples of people who are journalists who have provided information to uh, a state they may have been a citizen of. Um, and if you if anyone is, you've now got access to the EAC system, which means it's very easy to open and close your office. You don't need to take your keys with you. You just carry your wallet or your phone. Um, and there should not be, in my view, um, uh, material that is sort of being left around that is so sensitive that it would provoke such concern. And quite frankly, the security in the building is pretty good. The, I, I haven't heard an example in recent times of someone genuinely concerned that people are wandering in and out of their office looking at documents. Um, this was a concerning example. I'm not trying to dismiss it, but I'm also falling back on my sort of long-held First Amendment beliefs that um, the greater fear is actually of um, liberal democracies uh, copying the trends of those that, we've, that, that we are concerned about and limiting a free press. I always err on the side of that. But I share your concerns on that, um, but I've taken enough time this morning. Uh, would any other senators like to follow up on this question before I, uh, Senator Kitching is indicating? Senator Kitching. Thank you. Um, that was a very non-technical version of raising my hand. Could I just ask, uh, Mr President, in terms of, obviously there are restrictions around, you know, for example, where, um, you know, media can take photographs, for example. So, Thankfully, they're not able to take a photograph at Aussies, for example. Um, what I'm wondering is if there are journalists who are taking photographs of other journalists, uh, is that perhaps may not be anything in writing, but wouldn't there be a convention around journalists not doing that? And I, I know that obviously inadvertently sometimes the cameras pan to the press gallery in in a in a doorstop or uh, in a in press conferences, but it's not the deliberate what seemed to be the deliberate taking of photographs of journalists. And I wonder if there is some under the agreement that the Parliament has with the press gallery and the the, the committee of the press gallery whether there's also some understandings about that as well about. Um, you know, where it's not inadvertent or part of the usual activity, but rather, um, rather, you know, the deliberate taking of photographs. Well, I suppose, firstly, if putting aside this one instance, which I think you, you, you and Senator Patterson have raised quite legitimate concerns about, it was um, something that had not occurred before, and um, there have been discussions to do our best to ensure it doesn't happen again. Um, the media rules are about areas where you can take photos. And all senators and members are aware of those areas, and every so often um, we have to discipline, warn or something, uh, someone for breaching those rules, or call a colleague and suggest that they um, uh, take down a post that is not compliant with the rules. Um, I'm not aware of any particular rule that would say you can't take a photo of journalists, and I might say if I did, I can, only, I can imagine some of my colleagues might say, well, they're taking photos of me in the courtyard. Why can't I take photos of them? Because any rules we have apply to everyone equally. Now, I suppose, could we have a rule that journalists can't take photos of other journalists? Um, 
to be fair, when you turn on Sky or ABC24, you often see the camera turn to the journalists asking questions. And, so I just have and to... And that's the point. I, yeah, I raise... The, I do... I understand that. And that's why I raise it, is I understand that. But normally that's an inadvertent panning of a camera. And you do see... I mean, you see it every day, it happens, but not where someone is deliberately taking a photograph of... Oh. I, look, this was different, I agree, but I disagree. I mean, I can see, if I turn to Sky or ABC24, I see an intentional... Sorry, I'm looking weirdly because you're only on the screen behind me, Senator Kitching, so I'm sort of talking to a, a, a blank crest, crest, coat of arms at the moment. Um, so, um, but no, if you turn on ABC24 or Sky, you'll regularly see not inadvertent, but intentional use of the camera to people asking questions. So... Um, I would see this as something that is difficult to make a rule about because I do not think the press gallery would like me to amend the media rules saying you can't, you can only film the subject of a press conference. We changed the rules in the Senate to say you, you can now film the chamber rather than only have to take a photo of the person on their feet with the call. Um, but what happened then was different and I think the press gallery has taken steps to you know, ensure that that sort of event doesn't happen again. Well, well I, I do trust the uh, members of the fourth estate. So, and I, I, assume, I know that a lot of them have taken it very seriously. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Um, any further on this matter before we just go to other matters? No, if not, then uh, Senator Ayres. I think Senator Kitching has some questions for DPS. Okay, <laughs> then Senator Kitching. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your opening statement. Now, could I firstly go to the subject of the inquiry uh, that the Senate agreed to um, a little while ago? Um, could I just ask, Mr Stefanik, have you sent any emails or messages to DPS staff about the current inquiry into the operation and management of DPS? Uh, Senator, I can recall at least uh, one email that I have sent out. Uh, when the inquiry was um, brought to my attention uh, to advise uh, DPS staff that uh, there was an inquiry on foot. Um, are you able to provide copies of that? Uh, yes, I can, Senator. Thank you. Um, do you use any encrypted message platforms? Uh, I use a number of um, messaging platforms. Which ones do you use? Uh, I use um, the native Apple uh, messages, uh, WhatsApp and Signal. Okay. Um, so, your, so your messages don't disappear? Well, I think that... So what depend on which messages and what platform and what what um well uh, i think so he so yeah can i mr president the secretary has said and has given what i am going to assume is an exhaustive list so the apple iMessage, for example uh or text message whatsapp and signal and on those platforms, messages don't disappear. So I'm just on, on some of them, Actually, on some of them, I think, I think on, on some of them, you, they can, you, it depends on the settings you apply mm. and whether you delete I've, them. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, app, application, other applications where they don't, where they, as soon as you send it, it disappears. No, but like, I know it depends on the settings of some of these applications, whether they disappear or not. You, the, I'm not sure. I, well, I think on WhatsApp you can... You well, can, as we know yeah. from uh, leadership challenges, sometimes WhatsApp doesn't disappear. No, no, I agree. And can be yep. Yeah, some of them don't, some of them do. Yeah. So, and I, I think you can keep your signal messages as well. Depends so on you set up the app. Yeah. Mr Stefanik, well, in Mr Stefanik's case, do his message messages disappear? Um, you can set, um, mm. I understand, um, both on WhatsApp and Signal for messages to disappear if you wish. 
So, I think so they need do you? Be, I think you need to be more specific. Not asking about, I'm not asking about the setting. I'm asking Mr. Stephanie, do his. Yeah, but sorry, Senator a, Kitching, you're asking a very broad brush question, which is almost impossible to say. Well, do in all cases Mr. your Stephanie, messages store, or do in all cases your messages disappear? And with respect to the official, does Mr. Does Mr. Stephanie have his settings uh, set to? They're being deleted. I think the question should be: Does Mr. Stefanich have all the messages he sends, or, do, or has he, do, or have some or all been deleted? I mean, it's because it, I, I, I don't want people to art, to be artificially or inadvertently tripped up by later all well, that statement. You know, some aren't there, some aren't. Are you are you keeping your messages, Mr. Stefanich? In some cases, I do. In some cases, I delete, Senator. And what are the cases in which you delete? Uh, there can be all sorts of reasons. Would you like to list some? Uh, no, I don't have any specific. Um, I don't have anything specific in mind, Senator. So it's ad hoc. Well, hang on. We didn't didn't say that again. When we're going to these very, very overarching questions, in all honesty, it's very difficult for officials to say or to have words inserted in their mouth. He said that he, some, and he, ha, some have, some haven't. I think that's a statement of fact. He shouldn't necessarily be, um, have a word in, a term inserted like ad hoc. Well, I'm just asking because I've asked under, you know, what circumstances would Mr Stefanik delete messages or have an application uh, or a platform set to delete, and in which, so I've asked for a, what kind of circumstances would they be, and there seems to be no circumstances, or no sort of, Mr. Stephanie has. Hang on. Let, let's be blunt. After, every, after every, every, one year, every Saturday after one has... year, does Mr. Stephanie delete his messages? Is it a time limit? Is it particular messages? from a particular person. Does every senator what, who uses various messaging platforms have a set of criteria off the top of their head about which messages they keep and which messages they don't? I mean, if you're asking about, I, I, about I mean, a particular I, period or a particular incident or a particular platform or a particular event, I think that would be of more assistance because then people can give specific thought to specific issues. But everyone around this building uses different apps, and I doubt any of them could actually decide on what criteria off the top of their head covering every single platform they decide to keep, store, delete, archive or otherwise. Can I ask a, uh, a supplementary? Um, Mr Stefanik, what, what do you understand your obligations are in respect of communications that you make in your role as the secretary? So um, there are normally obligations in respect of preserving uh, communications around your role. Can you just describe what you think your obligations are? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, yes, yeah, certainly anything that would be um, uh, of a description as a decision, uh, I would consider as an official record uh, and I would retain that. And is that from guidance that's been given to you by the Public Service Commission or somebody else in respect of uh, messages, because I, I know it under FOI, for example, it's quite quite uh, you can get access to text messages. Mm. Mm. Well, that that uh, DPS as a general rule is not subject to that particular. No, I understand yeah. that, but but the so principle that. is that when Mr. Stefanik is uh, working for the department, yep. uh, that he should keep diligent records, and and actually that the records belong not to him but to the Commonwealth. So the. In, in the va vast majority of instances, um, decisions that are made by me are documented uh, more formally. Um, so they will be in an email, um, which is registered in our records management system, uh, or uh, in a formal brief um, that would require my signature. Um, so I'm not really going to decisions of that nature. I'm talking about general communications uh, with your staff, with other departments, with other secretaries, uh, and so forth, um, do you do you view those as Commonwealth records, or, or they are personal for you to choose whether to delete or not? Um, I, I would say that when there is um, a quick discussions, for example, if a person cannot be reached by phone, 
uh, and a message is an easier way of communicating, uh, I would not necessarily uh, consider that uh, personally a, a record uh, on the basis that if I were making a phone conversation, that would not be uh, a record for the purposes of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah. On this question of the... Sorry, sorry. sorry oh. Senator Kitchen, your colleague Senator Carter has had a quick follow-up. It's, it's a follow-up. In terms of the, this inquiry into the parliamentary <coughs> services, uh, it's been put to me by some parliamentary staff that they're not able to give um, proper advice to the inquiry because of their concerns for retribution within the senior management of your department. Now, we all know the standing orders uh, prohibit penalties being imposed upon witnesses before inquiries. But given that uh, senior management has the capacity to alter rosters, and provide overtime approvals and other forms of uh, reward, what assurances can you give parliamentary staff that do want to contribute to the inquiry that there won't be retribution should they provide advice that's not favourable to the senior management? Firstly, can I insert myself yes. here? Because I was involved in the last DPS inquiry that had to have a session off-site to facilitate the mm. provision of confidential information. Um, that was two secretaries ago. Um, the Speaker and I um, have discussed a number of matters, and I'm, um, I do not have any doubt that the protection of parliamentary privilege is paramount in the secretary and senior staff mind. Um, and just as people can make the, an assertion, I think we need to be careful not to have such an assertion made as if there is any legitimacy to that. A fear that some may have may not necessarily be based on a genuine uh, prospect of retribution. That would be utterly inappropriate. Uh, myself and the speaker have communicated that to senior staff. I'm confident senior staff completely understand that. But can I also make the point that this building is a unique place to manage, and I have equated it to a student union before, because there are um, there is an ability for staff in this building to raise what I might call management grievances in a way that in another workplace they cannot. Now that does not mean that there are not special requirements of this building, because there are. The security requirements and the privilege requirements of all of you make it a very different workplace to a department down the road. But I do not think that without any evidence that could be put to the committee without me knowing of someone saying, I have been or have been threatened or I have a realistic fear of that we should be throwing around the potential abuse of privilege willy nilly. It has, there has been a risk of it happening before. It has been an effort of, I think, four presidents and three speakers since to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mr. President, I'd have no uh, doubt as to your intentions. Absolutely no doubt whatsoever. I want to emphasise that. But there is a genuine concern, given what people have put to me, and, I, and that's why I asked the question, yep. what reassurance can you give staff that there is appropriate protection for witnesses? I can, if someone came to a colleague like yourself or another member and you wanted to come to me, name redacted to protect a person's privacy with any legitimate, well-founded fear or an event that involved some sort of retribution for performance in a parliamentary committee um, and evidence of parliamentary committee, then I think you would all know that my reaction to that would be severe and rapid. Um, that will not be tolerated. But I haven't yet heard nor seen an example that concerns me. Mm. I did years ago, to be honest. Mm. Senator Kitchen, you still continue your questions? Um, yes, I've just got a few more questions on this matter. Um, could I ask, um, Ms. Bethanik, are you in, given your responses to Senator Patrick's questions, are you in any text groups in which you discussed estimates or particular senators? Because I would say so that I, they I would, are. I would say that the secretary is. That you would be. The secretary has messaged myself and the speaker on occasions. We have to have, as we have joint management responsibility of a number of issues that oh, do occasionally come up. We, the, the, the secretary uh, and I do talk about yes. that. But this is in relation to the inquiry and in relation to, I don't mean with presiding officers, Mr. President, I mean internal in the senior management okay. team. I just, thought I'd yes. I just wanted to confess there is that, there no, is no, a discussion no, I don't mean with that. myself, I mean the speaker and the secretary. 
Yeah. In yes, I would like to know if there are any WhatsApp groups, Mr. Or, or Signal or text groups, um, because they're the list of platforms you've given us. Uh, as and I pre, I'm going to presume it's an exhaustive list, and whether the, on those groups you have discussed estimates, the inquiry, senators, particular senators, um, and uh, with whom have you had those? Who's on the text? Who's on the group? And to what what do the discussions pertain? Because given your responses to Senator Patrick, that would involve work, and they should be kept. And also, I will say, though, that the Secretary would be within his right to say that there are some things that, um, if they're about internal management of the department, um, you can make a legitimate claim that they're not necessarily for estimates. Not every single email sent within the department no. um, falls within the scope of something that a senator can have a right to ask to be published in the public domain. No, and I'm asking, yeah. I'm not asking about email. No, no, the same with, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm asking about um, platforms that might be encrypted where there's a work group, uh, a senior, let's say the senior management team, and they've had discussions about, I'm particularly interested in the inquiry and I'm particularly interested in any discussions they've had on that platform in relation to senators. Mr Stefanik? Um, I can't recall, uh, but I don't believe that I've had any discussions regarding the inquiry uh, on any platform. And what about estimates? Well, we've, we've spoken about it, I know that. Yeah. Uh, Senator, I've, I've been um, Secretary of DPS for nearly five years now. Um, there's been lots of communication about estimates in that time. I couldn't uh, draw on any particular examples. In, okay, in the senior management team? So on the WhatsApp group, you've got a senior management team, for example, WhatsApp or Signal group. Or maybe maybe you do it by text. I, I mean, I won't limit you. I, I, but I think, to be honest, whether the format's irrelevant if the, the, the fact that senior management might be discussing estimates um, I, in I person over message or over email is not in any way surprising. The format is not irrelevant because the format, if it's an encrypted platform, and my understanding is there is a WhatsApp group and it has been discussing both the, and I'm particularly interested in the inquiry, but I'm also interested in estimates. And I also understand there's been discussion about particular senators. If there's, so um, I'm, but, but like, my I'm point is that if, know, whether it's encrypted or not, it's irrelevant because if, if there was an email discussion amongst senior management about preparation for estimates or an inquiry, unless it pertained to some sort of breach of privilege or whatever, I mean, um, the idea that the well, Senate well, committee, uh, sorry, that, let me finish. The idea, that, the idea that a Senate committee is going to start trawling the, um, and saying we've got access to every single communication whether it's encrypted, SMS or email, between senior management about preparing for estimates just on a, on a trawling basis rather than saying we're concerned about a specific issue, this is the one we're looking at, is going to make the place unmanageable. Can I ask the same question of Ms Saunders? Ms Saunders, are you on a... What platforms, for, for a start, what platforms do you use? Uh, Senator, I also uh, use uh, WhatsApp. Signal and the normal messaging. The iMessage or text group, or whatever. Yes. Yep. And do you have a group, are you on a group, a senior management group, on those platforms? No. You're not on any of those platforms. You're not on a on a text group, for example, with Mr. Stefanik and other people in the senior management team. I can't recall a, a specific group, Senator, um, but we do text and we do message. There are other um, information groups, for example, building information. No, I'm not talking and, about that. Yes, no, but I, I'd, I'd have to go back and have a look, Senator, but there's not a, well, is your, a group messaging, also, there's not a message group that we, we consistently use that I can um, recall. Senator Kishik, I just want to jump in here just for, strictly for time management yeah. purposes, because I know, I suspect, I know Senator Waters... I'm going to leave Sen it Sorry. there. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to leave that there. 
And then I, I do want to go to, on to another topic. Well, just though, before you Chair. do, just just so, so I can just manage the committee's time here, I know Senator Waters, Senator Patrick and Senator Scar have questions. There may be others who have questions as well. And we, we were due to move to the National Bushfire Recovery Agency at 11.45. I think that's now not very realistic and we can push that back a bit. Um, but I just ask you to um, be mindful of the committee's time in your uh, follow-up questions. <laughs> Okay, and, and I'll, I'll assume that both Mr Stefanik and Ms Saunders are going to take on notice and might choose to glance down at their phones and see if they're on any messaging groups. But um, can I go to Mr Stefanik and ask you just about your, uh, your current term of appointment expires on the 13th of December uh, this year, so in a couple of two months approximately. Uh, in, um, can I just ask, I'm just going to ask just quickly, um, do you, in the media release that then went out in November 2015 from the then presiding officers, Senator Parry and Mr Smith, they were in the media release it said they were confident that Mr Stefanik would provide exceptional leadership for DPS as it continues to improve its performance in response to recent reviews. Has Mr Stefanik provided exceptional leadership? You're asking me? Well, I, um, yes. that, that, those words, sorry, I thought you were asking Senator, um, Mr Stefanich then about sorry. himself. Well, um, I, might ask I think DPS, well, like... having taken over in November 2017, um, so two years into that appointment, and having been on this committee and involved in other DPS inquiries, um, DPS has come an extraordinarily long way. I think the management challenge of this building is unique. I wouldn't work in management in this building for a lot of danger money because, can I honestly say, it is hard to manage because of the um, unique nature of this building. That has some genuinely unique sides, which is the fact that everyone has to understand the role of parliamentary privilege and even people being seen going into and out of offices can be a matter of confidentiality. It's can, it cannot be subject to the same sort of gossip or information or indeed transparency as other places to protect the privacy of senators. But I'll also say that I have seen from, on multiple occasions, um, I think a different standard applied to the management of this building when it comes to staff exercising grievances via an estimates process, which makes it harder to manage than it should be. And sometimes those cases come to naught. We have had a number of senior managers um, have basically, in my view, been drummed out of the building uh, on, and, that, and with a significant impact on their health over, over my time in this job. And I don't think that we understand how difficult it is to manage a building whereby any employee with a grievance, whether legitimate or not, can run to a senator and have it aired in the public domain. And I think we need to keep that in mind. So in my view, while it has a way to go, when we look at how DPS handled getting thousands of people on remotely in the space of a month this year, uh, bushfires that had smoke setting off alarms in buildings around Canberra, and they managed to get, when everyone else was after them, filters to make this place safe, um, to make one of the more challenging workplaces in the country because we come from all around the buildings safe, and at the same time maintain our freedom around the building. And through all of that, and through a number of the challenges, I have not seen a legitimate privilege issue pop up with respect to DPS now in a, a bit of time, and there were quite a few a couple of years ago. So nothing's perfect, but I think it has come a long way, um, and the reform process continues. And I might also add there's been the substantial capital works catch-up program, um, and some difficulties have been encountered there, but no one's perfect, but it is a lot better than it was. So I just took another couple of questions, just in relation to the ANAO audits of the department, one third of those have been conducted under this secretary. Uh, so I would, you know, and I, in fact, it's, I, I'll refer to you know, notice number 1706 uh, in relation to the ANAO audits there have been a th about a third of the audits of this department have been conducted under this secretary. Do you want to comment on that? And, and I guess what I would ask you, have you either, have the, you as a presiding officer, so either you or Mr Smith, have you had to raise aspects of the department's performance with Mr Stefanik? We, we do on a regular basis as part of our regular meetings and oversight. I, I would say we and do so I, regularly. 
Mr. Stefanik, are you seeking a renewal? Uh, yes, I am, Senator. Right. Okay. Thank you. Now, can I go to another topic? Um, sorry, is, sorry, Senator. Then, can I um, can I just clarify yes. that is um, sure. Uh, whether whether I seek a renewal or not is uh, inconsequential. Um, the matter is the decision for uh, both the president uh, and the speaker. Yes. Okay, thank you. Senator Kitching, I'm yeah, going to... concerned about time. Uh, your colleagues on the committee are can also I keen. I know. I just really need to just... Can I just ask a couple of questions about the, my perennial favourite, um, the connectivity in the building, and I take note of the President's statement, which does address some of the questions I was going to ask. Um, you, you, certainly, I, you certainly may, Senator Kitching, but just be aware that you know there is an ambition from all right. Senators, including your colleagues, to get to the Bushfire Recovery okay. Agency okay. in a timely way. Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Um, now, I'm going to refer to a number of questions on notice. So, firstly, questions on no question on notice 1856 where I asked about, has the department been involved with replacing or upgrading antennas at Parliament House in connection with the connectivity upgrades? If so, and how, is it, how has it been involved and what has it done to date? Now, I was told that in not only that one, but also in estimates on the 21st of October 2019, and question on notice 1655, which uh, was dated the 18th of June 2020, and I'll, maybe I'll just go to that one firstly. In the response, it said Telstra requested a system redesign due to fast-moving developments with 5G technology. But that's not really accurate, is it, Mr Stefanik? Because when 5G is deployed in Australia, it won't be carrying voice calls. That's still going to be on 3G and 4G. The, the system redesign... Um, was with the intent of it being 5G ready. So it's not, um, you won't be able to immediately make 5G calls with it. Um, there would still be an additional amount of well, work no to do. One, at, at this stage. Nowhere in Australia will you be able to use 5G. Well, 5G because hasn't. In Australia, it won't carry voice calls. Senator Kitching, I made the point when we, the, one of the reasons for the delay of this, as I've said before, is that I was particularly keen to ensure the equipment was not obsolete with 5G, that it was, in lay terms, I think, upgradable. Um, we didn't want to install a bunch of antennas that would have to be pulled out. Um, so it's not, it, it's upgradable rather than is actually 5G. My words have, have, have inadvertently conveyed. Otherwise, I've always tried to say that was the reason for the delay. Mm. Well, in the response to the question on notice, it says Telstra requested a system redesign due to fast moving developments with 5G technology. But in fact, the, the system redesign, the first system, the first design was scrapped, wasn't it? I don't know if that's the best term. Or um, I'm not across the technology, Senator. I can take that on where's notice. Mr. Stin where's, where's Mr. Stinziani? Well, so what, are you asking, can, just as we can clarify the question, what? because Let there's me, some, there, yeah, just yes. to clarify the question. So there were two designs. There was an earlier design of the antenna system, and that was scrapped. Oh, and I what I want to know, yeah, yes. why was it scrapped? And did it get an ASD? Was it scrapped because ASD wouldn't approve the wouldn't give it a security clearance? Well, can I say, um, without going into some of the discussions, um, it was a firm decision of the speaker and I that we would seek approval from relevant agencies for the equipment that was being installed. And I think everyone understand what I mean by saying that. It doesn't. It applies to quite a whole range of equipment. So. Whether or not it was an iterative process or whether it was scrapped, can I say, Senator Kitching, that requirement was a specific decision that we took. It wasn't an unintended consequence, if that is the way that it could be described. It, and I distinctly remember handwriting that note. Okay, so it was, um, can I just read you something from Telstra? where it says the DA, DAS upgrade does not include 5G. It is not correct to attribute the completion date of this project to the inclusion of 5G. No, but I think I said earlier, Senator Kitching, that, that there was 
The delay of the was project was to ensure it was upgradable, that the equipment was compatible. Yeah, I didn't say, if I, if I said 5G, I was wrong. I've always said it was to ensure the system could be upgraded. Yeah, and what I'm saying to you is that the, there was a, a design of the antenna, which DPS had done, no, we didn't do it, did and we? then that design was scrapped. And what I want to know from Mr Stefanik, and if he has to take this on notice, I will be, I mean, I will be flabbergasted, not that I really should be, but I, but I will be, because I understand that the ASD didn't give it a security clearance. This is the antenna for the Australian Kitching, Parliament. Before, right, before we go to Senator... There's a number of issues. Before we had Senator a number Kitching, of security and I'm, I'm issues. Not, there's emotive language being used here, OK? And let, let's go to the facts. No, I made not. it clear earlier. The requirement for approval of agencies was an explicit decision. It is not an accident. It's not something was designed and then they went, oops. It was an explicit decision to seek it and to ensure we did not have, in a couple of years, someone go, oops, should that really be their moment? So, but, again... But is it the, this is, I'm not talking about you, Mr President. I'm talking no, about... Again, the, I'm not... But, DPS did the quan. No, but hang on. DPS in a quan... Let's take the emotive language out of it and find out... Was, was the design changed yeah. and on what basis? Both Mr President and Senator Kitching. So I'm going to refer Order, you Senator to Kitching, no Senator Kitching, I, I can mute you here now, thanks to your um, absence from the building, so please be careful. <laughs> oh, don't do that, Chair. Um, don't but in all seriousness, given that we are doing this over video, it would really assist if there's not talking over each other. It's hard enough as it is, so no, no, please um, pause okay. and take a breath. Can I just refer then specifically to question on notice number 1655? and particularly to question two, which is during supplementary budget estimates on the 21st of October, 2019, the chief information officer informed the Senate committee that the program was already behind schedule by four months. So I asked, A, what caused the delay of four months? B, who caused and or contributed to the delay? C, how many other delays have there been in this project? And D, what caused and or contributed to, these, to those delays? Response, Telstra requested a system redesign due to fast moving developments with 5G technology. That is not accurate from Telstra's own words. So what I wanna know is I will put this question and I would like the department to come back with some accurate information because that is not true from what Telstra itself has said. Well, I think Mr Stinziani has some, um, well, or, or, has a different version of events, and I'll let him go ahead. Anthony Stinziani. Okay, remember, Telstra's listening to this. <clears throat> yeah. But thank you. Indeed. Anthony Stinziani, Chief Information Officer. Um, the original design of the mobile antenna system was, was undertaken by Telstra. We had that original design um, reviewed by the ASD, and so from a security perspective, it was put in place. The second design was on the advice of 5G, and this is this is a year or so ago, 5G technology was moving very quickly, it still is moving very quickly, and the advice was we should undertake a redesign in order to make the pathway to 5G easier. So it's not 5G, flick the switch and it's on, it's a pathway to 5G. And that was on Telstra's advice. Um, we had, we, I, I, saw, I saw the public statement that was made by Telstra at the time and we've since corrected that with Telstra. I don't know whether they've corrected that on the record or not, but I can guarantee you that that actually took place, that we, we did undertake that redesign on Telstra's advice. We now have a new design in place that's going to give us a better and a quicker pathway to 5G. And that was accepted um, as a, a reason for a delay rather than an excuse for a delay. And the first delay was a decision that the presiding officers took because I was keen to not spend all this money and have a non-upgradable system. Um, so in relation, so where Telstra says the distributed antenna system is does not include 5G and it is not correct to attribute the completion date of this project to the inclusion of 5G, um, you're saying that Telstra's 
No, we're inaccurate. Saying, in no, no. What Stint, Mr Stinziani said is we're not including 5G. It's, an, it's a system that we want to have a pathway to make sure it's not obsolete when 5G equipment becomes available and every senator Sorry. says, why, do, why can't I get 5G in the building? Um, it, 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 it's not, and if I have been imprecise in my words, again, I apologise, I've always tried to say it's about an upgradable system. It's not about 5G tomorrow. When we go live. I really need to share the call around here. There are like three yeah, other yeah, senators waiting. I'm, I'm, we are I'm already put, over time I'm for this witness. Some, I'm going to put some questions on notice, Chair, but the other thing I would ask is, my understanding is that the ASD did not give a security clearance for the first design and that's why it was scrapped. But I'll ask that on notice and I would expect a response back in, good, in a timely manner. Thanks, Senator Kitchen. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Um, I really just wanted to know of the uh, 117.8 million, which includes capital funding um, for DPS for uh, video conferencing, does that countenance continuing on virtual parliament um, next year and onwards? Um, so, um, the 117 million um, Senator is over the forward estimates is for um, a, a number of measures. Um, so video conferencing is is one of the measures within that. Um, did, did you want me to provide some detail? Or? No, my question was, does it include an intention to continue virtual parliament on after next year? Uh, it uh, intends to provide for the technology uh, and improve technology into um, the next year, including an expansion uh, of the technology into uh, all the committee rooms. And I think it's fair to say, to go to your question earlier, Senator Waters, yes. DPS's role is to provide the facility if the chambers choose to utilise it and how they choose to utilise it. So the facility will be there. I see. The intention or the decision to use it remains. Is up to Pali. Yep. Okay, all right. I regret now waiting such a long time to ask that question. Oh, Thank sorry. you very much for your time. Um, I'm afraid I have another committee to go to. I was interested in your comments about connectivity in the chamber. Um, so perhaps if you wouldn't mind providing that on notice, whoever's the relevant we person can, for that. But I we can talk to about that to in a your different committee. As well. I'm sure someone Thanks. else will ask. Thanks anyway. Thank you for your patience, <laughs> Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Patrick. Thank you, Chair. I just want to go to a, uh, uh, the uh, um, DPS tender 15050, which is a security upgrade, electronic security systems upgrade contract. Um, I don't know who can help in relation to that, who I should direct questions to. I'll start maybe with you and then... Yeah, ask your question, Senator. We'll... Okay, so my understanding is that uh, the department uh, embarked on a security upgrade uh, but, uh, as a result of a 2014 security upgrade implementation, implementation plan being brought into effect. Um, the, the tender took place um, and it was awarded to BAE and a contract was initially let for 22 million, just slightly over. Um, you're familiar with that project? I'm not going uh, yes, I places. Am, Senator. Okay. Um, shortly thereafter, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Xenophon and, uh, or then Senator Xenophon and Senator Wong asked some questions about an increase in, in so the size of the contract. It went from 30, 22 million to 31 million in, a, in the space of a very short time. And their frust, their, or their concern was, and I, it's a legitimate concern, is if you go into a contract or into a tender process, you receive a tender response um, uh, that you, know, you really shouldn't get a scope change unless someone's done the wrong thing in a tender. Uh, what's the current value of that contract? Um, I'll, um, I might be able to get the um, Chief Finance Officer to get some um, detail on the, val on the current value. Um, what I can tell you, Senator, um, um, while we'll wait for well, this. Well, okay, Mr. I was trying to suggest it might be uh, $60 million now. We've gone from a project of $22 million, somehow has blown out to $60 million. That's something even Defence couldn't do. I'm just wondering how this has happened. So there was a number of components that led to the increase in scope. Uh, one of those was effectively a doubling of the amount of doors uh, that were being uh, enabled with access control, uh, which I believe was the single most costly uh, increase in, in that scope. Um, so, 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 so just tell me out, I mean, this is an increase of $40 million 
I could add up the number of doors in this place and um, it couldn't possibly be uh, explained that $40 million increase. Um, Sorry, I interrupted. I'll let you continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, each door... Um, um, I, I guess I'm really cautious about how much detail I get into, Senator. Well, this is oversight, and, uh, and actually, you know, you can understand a concern that a project that is let for $22 million... I mean, the fact that the number of doors double tells me that someone made a really big mistake in the tendering process. You, you fire off tenders, people respond to them, uh, and what looks like ha has happened here is BAE has won the contract uh, and then done what is a standard tactic in industry, which is to, to uh, creep the scope. Sorry, I'm just getting because I didn't have the sure. picture off the top of my head. Yep, sorry. So, so um, what my concern is here is we've got a tw uh, you've, you've conducted a tender, you've had people respond to that tender. Uh, honestly and fairly offering a solution and BAE wins the contract and then they do what is a standard tactic. They simply uh, string the project out, getting contract amendment after contract amendment after contract amendment. That's, that, that's really problematic from a, a due process perspective. Can I add one, one of the reasons for the extension, I can't speak mm. to the number, um, the I I impact of it. But one of the reasons for the extension of this is, so I inherited this part of this um, related to the EAC system in the building mm. in 2017. We only just signed it off. And the objective originally was to have it all signed off and approved by the end of 2017. And there were, in my view, entirely legitimate concerns about privilege and the control of data that actually delayed that. That undoubtedly would represent some cost because I was very conscious of that when we did it. Um, and I think they were legitimate concerns, at which point I represented the Senate in ensuring we're addressed. And we only dealt with that in the last couple of months. Finalize, sorry, finalised that in the mm. last couple of months after a couple of years of work. But this, is, this has gone three times the cost. You know, uh, the, in, in actual fact, it appears what's happened here is you've gone to tender for a $22 million contract uh, and then simply gone with limited tenders or just sole source tendering thereafter to the value of $40 million twice the value of the original uh, contract. How do, we, how do we know that taxpayers are getting good value for money? Uh, I presume these are simply just extensions of, co of, of a contract? Um, this is a gravy train. Um, I, I wouldn't call it a, um, a gravy train, Senator. So, so during the course, um, certainly during the planning of, uh, of the security upgrade project, uh, there was a task force uh, that was chaired by the presiding officers uh, that had representatives uh, on it from the security and intelligence agencies, uh, as well as DPS um, and our capital projects uh, representatives. Um, during the course, th this is a vast building uh, and it is complex and... But that is known at the point of tender. D don't pretend that, you, that this is not, these are not facts that are known when you tendered. Uh, well, some of them came to light after the tender, um, and that, that was the issue. So but three, t you know, uh, we end up with going from $22 million to $40, mil $40 million of extra things that you hadn't considered? I mean, what, this, is, this is like buying a, 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 you know, a boat and then realising you've got to buy a land cruiser and a trailer. You know, it, it, it just looks like you haven't done your due diligence. Uh, I don't think that that is the case at all. When the tender was conducted, there was um, provision in there uh, because there were unknown components of what needed to be delivered. So the tender I included a, a big black hole that people could fill in over time? Well, every contract has scope for variations. Oh, I understand that every contract has contract amendments. That, that's clear. But no one expects a contract amendment or ultimately to blow out to, to you know, to, you know from, from $20 million to $60 million. That is gravy train stuff. Can, can, you, can you please provide to the committee um, the scope of work at the start of the, the project and uh, how we've gone from $20 million to $60 million? I mean, how does that affect your budgeting uh, in terms of uh, you know, forward planning. You've clearly consumed 
$40 million more of what could have been used for other things in, in the blowout in this contract. How, how, does that, how does the planning work for that? You just expect the parliament to, to appropriate more money? Uh, no, the, the whole project was managed within the appropriation received by DPS. Okay, so can you talk to me about the, the appropriation? How you got, uh, how you went to a contract with a 20, for $20 million, uh, you're, you're telling me at that point in time you had budget approval for 60? See, I understand this, uh, this, this, this thing that governments do where they say, no, no, it's within the approved budget because you've uh, crept and crept and crept. But this is Potemkin Village stuff. Um, Senator, I know that doesn't assist you. Um, a lot of those decisions were made prior to my tenure, so I, I, I genuinely. No, you've been here for five years. You. Uh, you just said that before, and you are the person ask, um, being, answering the questions from Senator Wong and Senator Xenophon. Um, I, I was Senator. Um, as, as I mentioned to you, there was a task force that was assembled uh, in the early stages. You have to remember, DPS's role was to deliver a project. Um, the scope of it. Uh, and the requirements were on advice of the security intelligence agencies through the task force. Can you can you put on uh, just to take this on notice and uh, to help you chair? Can you please provide on notice what your original appropriation sought was, what the uh, tender value uh, was from the winning tenderer, and then every uh, approval you've sought thereafter and the scope change associated with that uh, with that and any reasons as to why at some point in time you didn't recognise that with such a significant expenditure, maybe it was time to go and look at other, um, at, at, at uh, competing, rather than just simply handing out money to one contract. And BAE, I might point out, $6 billion of turnover, not a cent pay, paid in tax, not exactly a, a good corporate uh, entity. You know, uh, I wonder how people sometimes think about uh, People's, you know, companies' tax records when they award these things, but, but can you please, on notice, provide me with a full, or provide the committee with uh, a full audit trail of, of each decision made in terms of uh, appropriation requests uh, and uh, um, uh, contract amendments. I'll take that on hand. Thank time. you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, I know Senator Scar has some questions for DPS. Uh, just checking for management time. Any other senators have further questions for DPS? You do? Senator Rez? Okay, we'll go um, Senator Scar, then Senator Rez, and then we'll move to the Bushfire Recovery Agency. Uh, Senator Scar. Thank you very much. I want to change tack a little. Uh, I was really impressed with the opening statement in relation to the redeployment of staff from DPS to Services Australia, and I think the figure was 55. I'm, I think I took that down. Uh, correctly. I, I was just wondering, uh, Mr Stefanik, if you can provide us more background with respect to how that occurred practically, because from my perspective it goes to uh, a very healthy culture in the, in the department that they are prepared, members of the staff are prepared to be redeployed to meet the, uh, the crisis that we face. So could you give us more details as to how that occurred practically and what feedback you've received potentially from the staff members had the opportunity to be redeployed? Um, yeah, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I, perhaps I might start, and um, uh, Ms Saunders led uh, that process, so I'll, I'll, I'll let her um, uh, colour in the lines. Uh, essentially, when a decision was made to close the building to the public, uh, we have um, uh, public-facing staff um, that, for example, are visitor services staff, or as we refer to our guides, um, uh, all of a sudden, a key part of their role um, wasn't able to be performed. Uh, with the closure as well, there was part of the security function, the public facing function, for example, part, um, processing people through the main entrance. Um, that wasn't uh, required, um, so there was staff available there uh, as well. So they were the two predominant groups uh, that, that had uh, availability in their time. Um, around that time, uh, the Australian Public Service Commission uh, was uh, indicating uh, an interest in agencies um, putting forward lists of staff that may be uh, available uh, for secondment to Services Australia. And uh, we immediately uh, turned to look at our available workforce to see how we could um, manage that. 
Um, but I might, at that point, um, throw to Ms Saunders, who might be able to um, provide some extra detail. Uh, yes, Senator. So, Kate Saunders, Deputy Secretary. Um, so, we were working closely with um, the whole of government um, group that was set up to uh, work on things and collaborate on, um, I guess, issues that had come to bear, like having um, a need for a surge capacity across government, as well as some areas having staff that were um, whilst everyone's essential, not in roles that were considered as critical at the time. So um, DPS um, was actually able to put forward 100, around 100 staff, and of those, um, 55 um, were redeployed to Services Australia um, at very, very short notice. Um, it was a fantastic indictment on the culture of DPS. Um, and staff embraced the new challenges, and um, and we had um, you know the extraordinary examples of people who were working in roles completely unrelated to the role that they were performing for Services Australia, where so they what were. Would, so just to draw this into life, what would yes. be an example of uh, someone going from from a particular role with DPS into a totally different role at Services Australia? Uh, yes, so um, so we had staff from our security functions, so security officers who had never processed claims before, um, had had never worked in administrative government functions, who were now processing claims on behalf of Services Australia. Um, they were also extraordinarily successful. So um, after a brief training period, um, they were able to um, learn that new capability um, very quickly and actually became one of the um, leading groups of processes. So not that there was any competition. Um, yes, yes. Well, the, the whole group. And, and they were actually processing up to 200 claims a day. Um, it was it was fantastic for the staff as well as See, they across the community. So they process politicians. Must be easier to <laughs> process claims. You don't have to answer that. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so the staff felt that um, that they were also making an extraordinary contribution yeah. to the community, um, and they have now have this skill and this broader experience that um, we're working to continue to utilise. Oh, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, and one last important thing is this, the claims were processed here. So we worked very closely with Services Australia to establish a satellite processing centre that actually operated out of our, um, I guess, spare function rooms that were no longer needed at that time. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think that's terrific, and I agree with Ms Saunders. I think it goes to the, the culture of DPS, and it's a very positive reflection. Uh, my next um, question, or my last area of questioning, is just in relation to these horrendous pipes uh, that were uncovered as part of the, uh, the capital works. And um, during the lunch break, I'm probably going to call my plumber and ask him to go through <laughs> my piping uh, at home. But does this, uh, Mr. Stefani, does it does it lead to questions about the quality of of other drainage piping? around the building, so not just the piping related to the, the kitchen areas in particular, but if there was this um, issue with the piping uh, associated with the kitchens, uh, does it lead to a question as to whether or not some work needs to be done to do some reconnaissance on the standard of other piping mm -hmm. through the whole complex? Um, it, it's a very incisive question, Senator. Um, that, that is absolutely a concern. Um, these. Um, as we've been refurbishing these kitchens, we've found, um, I guess we call them latent conditions, things like locked pipes, um, or in the case of the Queen's Terrace um, Cafe, there wasn't actually waterproofing membrane no. underneath, um, so that work had to be rectified as well. Um, but there is a massive network of pipes in the building. Um, iron was used quite heavily, um, uh, particularly for drainage and, and for water processing. And obviously, we know iron is subject to corrosion, and depending on what people were tossing down the drains, for example, harsh cleaning chemicals, that has a corrosive effect. Memorandums. Uh, as well, yeah, that's right. Lots Draft of paper. cabinet lists. Um, so um, uh, there is a project uh, underway now to scope out um, the next stage, I guess, of looking at that network of plumbing, uh, which may result um, in, a, in a new policy proposal at some point um, to, to replace more sections of it. Okay, thank you. 
Senator Ayres. I'll give you a straight chair. I'm, I'm very happy to uh, move on to the next subject. Thank okay. you Senator very Kitching much. Senator Kitching just advised she has one further question. Uh, Senator Kitching. I'm putting myself back on. Thank you very much, Chair. And Ms Saunders, could, just one question. How would you describe the culture in the security branch since the appointment of the current Director of Security Operations? Senator, I, I think it's positive. I have an example. I have an email that I received from um, the security operations room team leader um, on the 24th of September, which I would be happy to table. I have his permission. Um, and it goes really goes to the heart of your question. He said, this year alone, the feedback I have received from my team in regards to um, the director's work ethic and support for the PSOR has been exceptional. Um, I've noticed within my team the morale is lifted. Broden always makes himself available to all staff, etc. As an, a manager, he's enabled me with the tools and infrastructure to effectively run an operations room to best suit the needs of the house. Um, it, it goes on, so I'm, I'm happy to table that. Thank you, Chair. I did promise you one, questions, but one question only, um, but we, we might table some other uh, documents as well and that probably don't um, have the same glowing uh, attribution that Ms Saunders has just said, but also we have the inquiry, so we'll be going, I guess we'll go there as well. So thank you. Thanks, Senator Kitching. The committee can uh, consider that uh, request to table when you provide those documents. Um, that concludes the examination of the parliamentary departments. I thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence here this morning, including you, Mr. President. Um, we'll now uh, have a brief suspension uh, so we can move to the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio, beginning with the Bushfire Recovery Agency and uh, Senator Selger is joining us. We'll now resume and I welcome uh, Senator Seselja, Assistant Minister of Finance, uh, representing the Prime Minister, and uh, Mr Andrew Colvin, coordinator of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency and your other officers. Um, Senator Seselja, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, I don't, Chair. Uh, Mr Colvin, do you wish to make an opening uh, statement? Chair, yes, I would. Like Please. To. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair, committee members. Andrew Colvin, uh, National Coordinator of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. Thank you for the opportunity to make a brief opening statement and for your ongoing interest in our work. On behalf of all members of the NBRA, let me pay my respects to the families and friends of 33 people who tragically, tragically lost their lives in the 2019-20 bushfire season and the thousands of people who lost homes, property, livestock and possessions or who may have suffered the residual effects of smoke or simply the grief and trauma that comes with such a large fire event. We are keenly aware that the first anniversaries of the tragic loss are upon bushfire affected communities at the moment and anxieties are rising as the 2020-21 bushfire season progresses. For those struggling, help is available. The health and wellbeing of these communities continues to be one of the greatest concerns. One of the most damaging impacts of last year's summer of fires is seen by so few, but is debilitating for so many and help of course is available. But equally, I and the NBRA team continue to be inspired by the willingness of ordinary Australians who have gone through so much to step forward and talk to us about their health and wellbeing concerns. The fact that we can talk about it means we can identify it and address it. From what I have observed, the Australian community has come a long way in terms of recognising and speaking up about mental health in particular. Chair, recovery is happening. It happens at different paces and in different ways, but it is happening. When the NBRA was established, the government announced an initial allocation of $2 billion for us to do our work. This was in addition to the support, both in funding and on the ground support, that the Commonwealth was already committed to. To the 31st of August, $1.2 billion has been spent from the National Bushfire Recovery Fund. I know that government has allocated more than the initial $2 billion and I expect that these figures will continue to rise. When combined with Commonwealth funding through disaster recovery payments, allowances and other DRFA commitments, Around 1.8 billion from the Commonwealth is already on the ground working to support the communities. But I do have a note of caution that recovery takes time. We are just over 12 months from the beginning of the fires and only eight months past the end. The journey is a very long one. 
As the NBRA, led by the communities, is pivoting from relief to recovery, we have held true to the principles I outlined when we began this journey. We are locally informed, we listen and adapt, and then we listen again. We are focused on the ease of support, or ease of access to support. We have in the front of our minds the long-term benefit for communities, and we are working closely with our stakeholders and partners. As part of this pivot to longer-term recovery, there is a lot of effort at the moment on local economic recovery. But while economic recovery is crucial, we should not see recovery as being narrowly defined. We are focused across all lines of recovery, economic, social, environmental and infrastructure. The Commonwealth Government has made significant investments across these lines of recovery and we continue to monitor their implementation closely. Our partnerships with state and local government is crucial to this success. We cannot lose sight of the reality that recovery is so much more than the immediate relief efforts that have dominated the conversation to date. It is about what will make the community stronger, more resilient and benefit them over a much longer period. There is ample academic evidence to tell us this, but it has been our own observations that reinforces that we must take a long-term view. Individuals and communities travel very different paths to recovery. There is no one size fit all, fits all. But a common refrain we hear is to ask that we make sure that support is available long after general interest may have subsided. That is why we've taken the time to listen, to adapt and then listen again. In the NBRA, we have an individual or community centric approach to our work. We listen to what is working and what isn't. If we can shape and influence change, then we will do that. It's important to us that our efforts are not just about the formal Commonwealth role, where we can help victims through measures available across other government programs, through non-government partners, through philanthropic efforts, through local community connections, then that is what we will do. One of our largest efforts has been as the collaborator and connector of efforts in support of individuals and communities. So while we all can agree that 2020 has been a difficult year and that COVID-19 has rightly consumed a lot of our attention, I trust that this is an opportunity to remind everyone of the devastating bushfires that impacted so many last summer. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr Colvin. Uh, before I hand the call to uh, Labor Senators, just for the management of your time and other witnesses who are waiting to appear, uh, we're a bit behind schedule and it, therefore we think it'll be necessary to call you back after lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, lunch is scheduled for 1.15 and we're scheduled to return at 2.15. So you'll be back there for some time afterwards. But our general ambition is to try and catch up to where we plan to be by later this afternoon. Uh, Senator Ayres or Senator Watt? Thank Senator you, Watt. Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Mr Colvin. And all of your team. Um, I know uh, you're all working hard and as you say there's lots of people still dealing with recovery. It's a difficult process for people so thanks for what you and your team are doing and thanks again for the ongoing briefings you've been providing to the opposition. Thanks sir. Um, just to start with some sort of general questions about spending. So are you able to give us an update on the overall amount of money that's now been spent as opposed to committed from the Bushfire Recovery Fund. Uh, I can, Senator, and I'll ask my colleague uh, Rena Brinsma to, to support me here with more detail. But uh, there are 30 separate initiatives being delivered via the National Bushfire Recovery Fund. Almost half of that fund relates to demand-driven programs, uh, so that support is available for those people who need it. 1.2 billion has been spent from the fund to 31st of August 2020, and that's the the date that we are reporting to at the moment. Uh, this money has been spent by both the Commonwealth and state and territory governments. Uh, the Commonwealth will then reimburse the states for help uh, that they deliver on our behalf. The government has used other existing disaster support, including disaster recovery payments and allowances, to provide an additional 640 million to bushfire affected communities, um, which takes us to the figure I said before, 1.8 billion from Australian taxpayers is being used in the communities at the moment. 1.2 of that is from the fund. Okay, thanks. So you say that as of the 31st of, October, of August, August. $1.2 billion from the $2 billion fund has been spent? Correct. Why is it then that if we look at the budget papers for your agency, we see that as of for the 2019-20 for the year that only $867.5 million has been spent. Uh, so, Senator, I'll, I'll defer to my deputy, but I would imagine that that difference would be a date of reporting difference. So that would be the financial year to 
30th of June, and we're reporting figures to the 31st of August. Uh, Rena Brensma, Deputy Coordinator, National Bushfire Recovery Agency. Um, it may also reflect the fact that some of the programs that we deliver, we deliver through the disaster recovery funding arrangements. Um, and in, within those arrangements, the states and territories have about 12 months after they've incurred and paid for an expense to actually seek reimbursement from the Commonwealth. So that's a long-standing program where the um, MBRA will actually um, make a commitment and payment to the states, and it can take between 12 and 24 months for the states to actually seek a reimbursement. So you'll see that flow through, even though the states have spent the money. Yeah, that, thank you. That's, I wondered if this might be part of the issue, and I recognise we're, we're talking about slightly different reporting dates, 30th of June as opposed to 31st of August, and there might be a bit of a discrepancy there. But it is the case that a substantial chunk of... So you say $1.2 billion has been spent. The budget papers tell us it's only 867.5. So that's a difference of, what, about $340 million? Yeah. And a substantial chunk of that is uh, money that you expect to reimburse to the states, whether it be for debris cleanup or other activities, yeah. but has not yet been paid to the states. Yes, yeah, so the way that we describe spent on our website um, is we don't necessarily differentiate whether it's the Commonwealth or the states that have spent the money. Um, at 31st of August, 706, 717.6 million was spent directly from the Commonwealth. And then a further 471.8 million we know has been spent by the states, but we're going through that reconciliation process. So can you just give me those figures again? So as of, as of the 31st of August, Seven, how much has been paid by the... 717.6 million in direct expenditure, 471.8 million that has been spent by the states and is subject to our reimbursement. And that's where we get the 1.2 billion spent. 471.8 million yes, for the states. Yeah. Okay, so isn't it a bit dishonest to say that the fund has spent $1.2 billion when actually it's only spent 717.6 million? I accept that you, you will be spending more, but shouldn't we just be upfront with people and say what's actually been spent? Senator, I disagree. I think what the communities and the individuals are interested in is the money that they have been provided or the organisations that have been given the money. Um, in, in my travels, I'm yet to have someone ask me what the accounting treatment is behind the money that is in their account. They are interested that the money has been given to them. I understand what you're saying, but they are, that is, a, that is an, a, an accrual or, or a um, reconciliation that will occur between Treasury departments. Uh, money has made it to the pockets of individuals on the basis of commitments made by the Commonwealth and measures agreed by the Commonwealth. Okay, so the, fact, the facts are though that, so you say $1.2 billion has been spent from the $2 billion fund, Correct. but as of the 31st of August, if we're looking at what the Commonwealth has actually paid out, it's $717 million. Yeah, when, if you look at our website, we do say very clearly that when we say spent, it's either spent directly by the Commonwealth or it's spent by the states. Mm. So um, on, on our behalf. On our behalf. Mm. And so uh, that, as um, uh, the coordinator was saying, when we're communicating to a mass audience, um, they're interested, they're not interested necessarily in which level of government has spent the money. Um, it has actually been spent or on the 471.8, it's going through the reimbursement mm. process. Mm. Um, yeah. But I, I mean, I do think though, and I like you have met many bushfire victims in different mm. regions of the country. And I do think my experience is that people do want to be given accurate information um, and, and not misled mm. as to what has happened, what's coming. So the fact is that we have a $2 billion fund. Your website says that you've spent $1.2 billion, but in fact, as of the 31st of August, the Commonwealth had spent $717 million. So the website does say the definition of spent is spent either by the Commonwealth or the state. So it is clear sure. on the website. But if yeah. we're looking at what the Commonwealth has spent, it's 717 million. Yeah. 
Right. Well, Senator, Senator, but I disagree that um, I, I don't agree with your characterisation that we've been misleading in that. And, and uh, it's not a question um, in all the travels that I've had into communities. It's not a question that comes to me. They want to know that the commitments that the Commonwealth has made is, are flowing and uh, I can guarantee that they are. Mm. I, OK. I am certainly very interested in making sure that claims that are made by the federal government or its agencies are accurate and are not misleading people. And I think it's fair to say that this government has a reputation for overclaiming, and then when you look at the fine print, not quite so much as being delivered. And what we now know is that, in fact, the Commonwealth has actually spent $717 million from its fund rather than $1.2 billion, with the rest is yet to come. Well, it's not yet to come. Senator well, it hasn't been paid well, by you, the Commonwealth, now, has it? You're now mischaracterising it completely, and it's been explained to you. Um, the money has been delivered. Uh, in some cases, by the states. In some cases, it's been delivered by the states, in some cases, directly by the Commonwealth. But either way, it is effectively uh, a drawdown on those funds that have been allocated by the Commonwealth. It's, but, you, you, okay. you're, you're, you're quibbling over accounting treatments as to whether it goes out from the states and is then reimbursed or goes out directly from the No, no, what I'm doing well is holding you. your government to account for the claims that it makes. And I know you don't like that, but that's what But the money is being delivered. And that's how much money has been delivered and it's been explained Okay, put it exactly another way. Has the, Commonwealth, has the Commonwealth spent the $471.8 million that the states have spent? Has the Commonwealth spent that money? No, we say the states have spent that money. Correct. But so the states have spent that money, yeah. not but, the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth will spend it so I just don't understand why you wouldn't be straight with people and say, we've spent $717.6 million rather than inflating the figure to $1.2 billion when we've, being the Commonwealth, haven't spent that money. It matters, to be honest with people. It's not inflating the figure. And that it is. It's can, inflating can, it by $471.8 million. We can get Mr Colvin or other officials to explain it to you again, but it's clearly not. I don't, I don't need to be explained. It's crystal well, clear to me. you seem to, to not me. understand it. No, I absolutely understand it. And I'm sorry that you're being caught out. There's no... The, the website the, says... The, 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 the officials have been crystal clear as to exactly how they've characterised it every step along the way. And you've tried to claim that they're doing something that's misleading. They've rejected that right the quote, because they have made it very, very clear how this money is being delivered. The quote from the Bushfire Recovery Agency's website is, we've spent $1.2 billion from the National Bushfire Recovery Fund so far. We've is the agency, is the Commonwealth. It's not the states. There's a second sentence after that on the website that says, we either have delivered it directly or we have, the states have delivered it on our behalf. But why wouldn't, again, why wouldn't you just be honest with people and say, we've spent $717.6 million? Why has it got to be inflated to a better, higher figure? Is that to make the government look good, Minister? You've, you've, so you've, you've just taken, you've just had Ms Bruinsma uh, explain to you. So you've taken one part of a quote to try and claim that it's misleading. And when you, when you read the second line of it, it says exactly what's going on. And then you're trying to you're trying to make out that that is somehow uh, being misleading. It's, the, like, the, I'm sorry, budget... it's, it's an embarrassing effort to try and make something of the fact. What's that we've embarrassing? Deli we've delivered 1.2 billion dollars. Some of it's been done through the states. That's been explained to you uh, now in chapter and verse, and it is also on the website. And you decide to selectively quote that in order to try and make a case. Well, I would say that what's embarrassing is this government's habit of claiming things and having big figures out there that they actually don't deliver. And we've got another example of it here, involving bushfire recovery funding. No, we don't. Is there, could there be a more question. Sorry, dishonest Senator version? I want to jump in, but just to clarify one question. Mr Colvin, in your experience in dealing with survivors of the bushfire, do they care terribly much whether they receive the cheque via a state government or the federal government? Is that something that concerns them greatly? So, Chair, in, in, in my extensive travels and discussions, there's never been a question asked of me. They want to ensure that where we have said that we will deliver grants for small business grants for prime producers, that they are being delivered, and, and they are. So machinery of, machinery of government delivery mechanisms isn't the top issue that they raise with you when you're um, visiting them? No, Chair. Funny about that. OK. Sorry, do, Senator Watt. Do they, in my experience, they do care, though, 
that this government has repeatedly made claims around recovery that have not been delivered. You have, you ha we've talked about this. You have received complaints from bushfire victims that they're not getting the support that they were promised. Uh, no, Senator, I wouldn't characterise it that way. I have received a number of represent representations from community members of how do they access certain grants and are they eligible for grants, but that's a very different proposition to what you're putting to us now. I mean, my, my job is to make sure that the measures the government uh, have endorsed are being implemented, uh, where the Commonwealth has said it will make funds available, that those funds are being made available, and, and I don't believe we've been misleading in saying that we have done that. Can we go through, line by line, the different programs that have been funded from the fund and get an up-to-date figure on what's actually been spent, please? And I'm, I'm probably only interested for the current purposes in payments from the fund. I, I've heard what you said, that there's a range of other disaster recovery payments outside the fund, but let's just focus on the fund. I've got the, I've got the um, update that you provided on your website as of the 31st of August. Okay, oh. no, you go. You go. Yeah. Um, yes, I can go through. There's 30 uh, measures, so we'll walk through them. So the first one, uh, and I'll go through the order that it appears on our website, is the disaster recovery of funding arrangements, including debris cleanup. Uh, that one at the moment we're tracking at 445.9 million. We make it clear in our um, Senate estimates uh, questions on notice that that is actually one of the ones that is subject to reimbursement to, put to the states. So that that's what what your website says is allocated 445 four, sorry 445.9. That doesn't mean that you've spent that amount no, because you're waiting on the states to bill you. Yeah, so the states have completed the debris cleanup program. So the states are in the process of invoicing us. The money has been spent on the debris cleanup program. We are just to re yet to receive the invoice. Do you, do you have a figure, figure for us as to how much the Commonwealth has paid to the states under this program? No, as I said, that takes about, it's the DRFA arrangements, the states need to provide an audited claim. So we will get an audited claim uh, the financial year after the expenditure occurs. And usually the payment goes out about 24 months after, but the states have actually paid out the money and completed the program. So the Department of Finance tracks the expenditure so that it's clear that that's where the money is coming from. So it could actually be up to 24 months before the Commonwealth pays the states for these, for these amounts? Under the disaster recovery funding oh, arrangements, that's a very long-standing um, uh, arrangement through because the states, as uh, the coordinator said, it's a treasury to treasury payment okay. reimbursement. Uh, and now, Senator, I, I might add, we have asked the states to, to move quicker than that. We have actually asked the states for what prepayments can be made in, in anticipation, mm. but the arrangements have two year window. Mm. I understand it might take a couple of years before all the money's paid, but you must have a reasonably recent figure as to how much has actually been paid. Uh, so we invite the states and encourage the states to ask for advance payments. Uh, so in some cases, if the states feel that it's going to be difficult for them to pay out the money, they can seek an advance payment from the Commonwealth. Um, they have sought some advance payments from us. I don't have the figures with me at the moment about what the advance payments are, but we could take that on Yeah, notice. could you come back to us on notice and tell us how much has actually been paid by the Commonwealth, whether it be advance payments or after the event yep. payments? And, and I should have checked, the figures that you're giving us now for each of the sub-programs, they're current? To 31st August. Okay, yeah. so they're actually the figures that are on the web. You don't have anything more current than what's on the website? No, no that's, okay. it, that's right. So okay. we do a monthly reporting and reconciliation process, so the 31st of August is the most up-to-date figures. Okay, in that, in that case, it, it may not be necessary for me to get, get you to go through it line by line, because I've got that, just so I can check that I have got the right figures. Um, just to give you a couple of examples. 62 million for immediate bushfire assistance to local governments. Yes. Website says 62 allocated, 62 spent. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Um, for mental health of Australians affected by bushfires, allocated 53.4, spent 20.6. Yes, correct. that's so that, correct. Okay, yeah, I'll, yeah. I won't bother going through them all, but that's the current figures. Um, are you able to give us an update on the number of people who have been approved for the disaster recovery payment and the total cost of that? I think we'll have that, Senator. And I might get similar figures for the disaster recovery allowance too, please. <clears throat> Chair, can I just, being near this committee today, how do you 
how do you circulate the call? The call? Oh, I'm, I'm very um, uh, deferential to opposition senators. Um, Senator Watt, you'd be pleased to know. So um, if you could give an indication to me how much time you think you need, I will want to rotate the call to other senators uh, yeah. to have an opportunity before the lunch break. I've, I've probably, and lunch break is 1.15? Yes. Yeah, I've I've probably got enough questions to take us through to lunch to the lunch break, but I'm happy for you to hand the call over to someone. Yeah, I think else I think I'll point. certainly need to rotate the call by then. Why don't you yep. let me know when a natural break in your sure. questions is, and I'll do Sounds that. good. Thank you. Uh, so, Senator, in relation to the disaster recovery allowance, applications closed across all states on the 12th of August with respect to the 1920 bushfire event. Uh, 3,058 disaster recovery allowances were granted. And disaster recovery payments. Uh, applications closed across all states other than Queensland on the 4th of August uh, with respect to the fire event 1920. Uh, they'll close in Queensland in February next year. And I have a number of a, a dollar figure. I don't have the number of actual payments. Uh, it was two hundred thirty-six million eight hundred sixty-two thousand seven hundred was paid out. This back to school, yeah. Um, and do you have uh, figures as to the number of people who've been rejected? So for the DRP, uh, we had when I say we, the Commonwealth, because this was uh, obviously a Services Australia program. There was two two hundred twenty-eight thousand. 361 claims received. There was 206,202 claims granted. That's for DRP. For the allowance, DRA, 4,964 were received. 3,058 were granted. Okay. I might get you to table any of those figures, if that's possible? Um, Even afterwards is okay. Yep, okay. Yep. Um, can I just focus in then on one of the programs being funded by, from the Bushfire Recovery Fund, and this is the $448.5 million Local Re Economic, Economic recovery, recovery and Complementary Projects Fund. Yes. And that, am I right in thinking that that funding is basically to support local economic recovery in bushfire affected regions? Uh, in, in a general sense, Senator, yes, that's correct. Okay. And the most recent figures we have on that one, uh, so $448.5 million was allocated, and how much has actually been spent? So 448 was allocated, 350 million of which was uh, for Direct local engagement, local economic recovery with states. 98 was uh, for what we are calling complementary projects to, to look at what gaps we think might be emerging as we go along. Uh, that program came on to, into effect on the 1st of July, and we do have updated figures from what you will have seen on the website, Senator, and I'm going to ask Major General Hawking to answer that. Good afternoon, Major General Andrew Hocking. So the, the, the latest figures in answer to you, your question, um, 1st of July, as the coordinator said, uh, the money became available. Um, the first project was approved on the 15th of July. Um, and with effect today, there's been 86 projects approved for Commonwealth co-funding to a total of $108.6 million of Commonwealth money, which percentage-wise against the 350 uh, for the Local Economic Recovery Fund is about 31 per cent, Senator, which is about what we'd expect at this time in recovery. And how much of that approved funding has actually now been spent? I don't have that figure, Senator. That is all the states. Have. There's a range of projects, both big and small, that have been approved for co-funding. Uh, some of those projects were shovel-ready projects, others uh, have a longer time to develop and implement. And Senator, each state is, has a slightly different uh, approach to this, as you would imagine, but um, to your point of actually spent, um, some of these projects will extend over many years and that will all be subject to contract and negotiation with builders, suppliers. Uh, so it's not a matter of the Commonwealth to pay all the money 
in, in one hit up the front. That will be mm. negotiated with the states and whoever's providing the service. Mm. Would you be able to table those projects that have been approved for funding? I don't think that's been released previously, has it? But they haven't been announced at this stage, Senator, as soon as they're announced. Well, we know how important an announcement is. Can't well, get in the way of an announcement. Can we, Minister? Announcements are important. Very important. Senator, I might say announcements are important because that's the agreement we have with the states that we will be announcing them with the states when the states are ready to announce because mm -hmm. they are delivering much of the program. So, the so of those projects that have been approved for funding, just remind me how many have been announced to date. The exact, I think Six. it's. One in fact, South Australia. I can, I can tell you exactly That's the desalination plan, is it? The desalination plan of Kangaroo Island. So it's seven, uh, 12 projects have been announced to date. Okay, with more to come. Correct. Okay, but again, the most, so the most recent figures we have for the local economic recovery funds are that $448.5 million has been allocated and $9.9 .9 million has been spent. Allocated over the future estimates, and 9.9 .9 million has been spent. That um, has publicly been announced to this right. point. So so far, only two percent of these funds for local recovery have actually been spent. Well, Senator, I think um, the Major General just outlined that 31 percent has well, been. Well, they've been agreed. approved, yep. but I'm focusing on spending that's been spent. So, at, as at this point. Only 2 per cent of the $448.5 million for local economic recovery has actually been spent. Well, has actually been announced. The, the profile of how it will be spent will depend on the contracts that the states enter into with well, the service Well, I'm, I'm going off your website. So your website says allocated $448.5 million, spent $9.9 .9 million. And I'm just reflecting, Senator, that you have a, a different view of how we are defining spent, but that is the way that we well, have allocated. Not, your website, it's your yeah, words. and spent. I think we've, we've explained what we mean by that. So yes, in answer to your question, yes. Okay, which is 2% has been spent. That we have put on our website and publicly announced, but as Major General Hawking just said, um, the figure is considerably higher than that. Um, and Minister, this, this announcement about the local economic recovery, that was made on May the 11th, obviously in the middle of the Eden Monero by-election campaign. Was it more important to just get this big announcement out than actually now spend the money? No. Then why has only 2% been spent? Well, Mr Colvin has actually just given you um, updated figures, uh, so I don't accept your characterisation. You say you've spent, the Commonwealth has spent more than the 2% that the agency's website says it's well, spent? I can go back to Mr Colvin and he can explain to you uh, the various, various parts that have been allocated. So we've got a $2 billion fund that the Commonwealth has only really spent $717 million, but it says it's spent $1.2 billion. Well, we've, and now do, we've do got we go $448.5 million for local economic recovery, where we've only spent $9.9 .9 million. Chair, Chair if can I can you just interject, I've, because... I've, if, I've got my I mean, question. Yeah, well, I, you do, what, but... To be fair, but, I think you put a proposition the Minister's and, and not so respond to. I'll interject just with you, Chair, because um, given we spend a fair bit of time going over this, if he's going to sort of make false assertions well, what's based, false? On, based on information that's already been explained to him in chapter and verse, then I suspect it'll take a while because I'll, we'll go back to officials. What's uh, false? And then, well, I can I can go back and, and they can explain to you again in chapter and verse how much of that money uh, has been delivered. We, we went back well, and forth on you're this. You're now making, you're now making an assertion uh, based on your particular interpretation, which has been pretty thoroughly explained to you. But if you want to keep repeating that, then we'll, we, we can go back each time and, and you know go through those numbers. Well. I don't think there's anything false in anything I'm saying. We've already heard that the Commonwealth has spent $717.6 million from its fund rather than $1.2 billion. And now there's a local economic recovery fund worth $448.5 million where the website says spent $9.9 .9 million. And you've, just asked, and, you've just, and you've just had Major General Hocking 
uh, explain to you additional information. Which yeah, he, you, you he's talking to be about ignoring. things that have been approved. Senator, or, or Senator and Minister, um, the appropriate place to debate these matters is the chamber, not this committee. This is a, a place to ask questions. Um, can I ask you to return to those, Senator Watt? Um, because I see that Senator Rice has since joined us on video, and I know she has some questions for this area, and I know coalition senators have some questions too. Okay, I might just round out questions on this this particular fund, local economic recovery. Um, the, I understand that the eligibility criteria for the New South Wales local economic recovery uh, program was announced on the 15th of October. Uh, right, I think. if that was the 15th, Senator, yes. Uh, and Minister Little Proud's media release says that uh, businesses and communities in bushfire impacted regions have access to a new fund for local infrastructure and initiatives that will drive economic and social recovery, strengthen morale and help communities get back on their feet through the $250 million Bushfire Local Economic Recovery Fund co-funded by the New South Wales and Australian governments. That, am I right that that is the same funding that was announced back in May? The 250 is the allocation of the 448 to New South Wales. Yes. So there's actually not a, there's not a new fund that was announced on the 15th of October. It's re-announcing the same funds and the amounts of them that are available for New South Wales. So it's announcing the, the New South Wales process to access the money that was announced in May. Okay. So the, the only money that's available for local economic recovery, whether it be in New South Wales or anywhere else, is the 448.5 that was announced back in May. That is one of many programs that will enable local economic recovery, but on this program, that is, the, they are talking about the same program. Okay, and the, yes, so there's not not a further new fund, as the minister says, that's been created for New South Wales. It's New South Wales portion it's, it's of It's part that of the fund. 448 local economic recovery measure that the government announced. And New South Wales has actually announced they're, they're matching that funding as well. So the New South Wales component um, had to go through their government. Okay. Is matched. So and I guess the figure is larger. What the, what the New South Wales community can access is larger than what was announced by the Commonwealth government because it's now matched by the New South yep. Wales government. Yeah. How much of that 250 is it? 125 million each from the state and the federal government. Uh, it's essentially on a 50-50 basis. Yes. Okay. So about 125 million of the 448.5 is going to go to New South Wales. Uh, you, uh, Senator, the figure for New South Wales is for the Commonwealth. Uh, Two hundred and seventy million dollars, all up. Sorry, could you say that's that again? Sorry, right, right, So, for the Commonwealth um, contribution to New South Wales is two hundred and seventy million. The state contribution will be two hundred and seventy million, uh, totalling for New South Wales five hundred and forty million, and they are essentially uh, their mechanism is twofold. Before you go into that, how does that? I thought we were talking about 250 million in total had gone to New South Wales. So, Senator, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll step it back because it's, it is complicated. 448 million was announced by the government of Commonwealth funds for local economic recovery across the four affected jurisdictions. Yep. Although it can extend beyond that in certain circumstances. 350 of that is for these programs that we're talking about now. Complementary, a complementary program of 98 million is, is being held at the moment. Of that 350 of Commonwealth contribution, um, 270 has been allocated to New South Wales, of which New South Wales has also committed 270. Okay. So, Senator, sorry. so where did, how does the minister get to a $250 million local economic recovery fund in New South Wales? So, Senator, um, New South Wales is applying their program in two ways. One is the uh, Bushfire Local Economic Recovery Fund, as you've just discussed. Uh, the remaining uh, portion of their 270 Commonwealth money um, is for regional uh, type projects, which draws from uh, their normal regional development process. But of course, that has been recast with a bushfire lens. Um, and that then picks up the priority projects right. out of that regional process. So 448.5 million in total for lo local economic recovery funds from the Commonwealth. Correct. Um, that's divided into 350 for programs and the balance 98 or whatever it is. Yes, 98. 
for other stuff. Mm -hmm. Of that 350, 270 has gone to New South Wales, Correct. matched by the New South Wales government. Correct. And of the total of 540 million, 250 is being used for the New South Wales Bushfire Local Economic Recovery Fund. So, Senator, I, I understand your point. Your, your, your question is about the difference between 270 and 250. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take on notice. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's the Minister's release, not yep. my release. Sure. Um, I'll take on notice what, where the difference of 250 to 270 is, but we've just explained to you what the breakdown is from our perspective. Okay. And, and how was it determined that of that 350 million, 270 would go to New South Wales? That's obviously a, a very sizeable proportion. It, it is, um, and I don't think it will surprise people that New South Wales suffered the largest impacts from the fires. Yep. So this was part of a very lengthy um, consultation process with all the jurisdictions based on impact. Uh, and that's that's where that division landed effectively. Okay. Can you maybe if you could come back to us on notice with any further criteria? I mean, it sounded like there was a percentage used, or and how that percentage was arrived at. Yeah, there's a range of criteria across how we how we measure impact across local yep. government areas. Um, it's not consistent across the country how impact is measured. Yep. Uh, so there's a lot of science in this. Um, but there's also an element of working with states and territories to make sure we think we've got the balance and proportionality right. Um, I'll come back to the committee with a firmer answer if, if we can give you specific criteria, but I just caution the Senator that it varies across the jurisdictions quite widely. Okay. And what's the timeline for the local economic recovery funding in New South Wales? Well, for all of the local economic recovery funding, it is it is phased over the out years, so it goes out to the financial year 2022-23. Um, we are working very hard with our partners, and particularly in New South Wales, because we would like to see announcements and lock-in projects that support the community as quickly as possible. So applications have now been opened? They have been opened, yes. Uh, and when are they closing? Uh, check. Senator for New South Wales, I'll just check my documentation. So for their bushfire local economic recovery program, which is the $250 million out of the 540, um, 27th of October applications open, um, and then they have a, a thorough assessment panel uh, from there. And I don't. I don't we have don't have a closing date. Dates. Okay. So we'll we'll take that on notice and check. If and when do you expect communities can expect to receive funding rolling into their communities? under well, this program? So, Senator, um, as, as I said, the New South Wales program is partially from the Bushfire Local Economic Recovery Program and partially from their regional economic development process. <coughs> for New South Wales, uh, as their, their figure at the moment, uh, is 74 projects have been approved uh, by uh, the MBRA, 95 million Commonwealth money, uh, so some of those pro projects will start being funded and rolled out. But uh, hang on, applications have only just been opened, haven't they? So there's... In fact, they haven't yet been opened. Senator, there's two parts to the New South Wales process. One is the local bushfire local economic recovery program, and the other is the regional economic development process, in which bushfire-related projects and the priority projects have been identified from them. So the, the projects that have been approved are in that second limb, the regional economic development, or whatever the exact terminology is. Yep. So let's just focus on the 250, 270, whatever the figure is. Just a time warning, Senator. Sure. I've got to yep. share the call. Um, the local economic recovery fund. So that's, that's the bit where applications are opened on the 27th of October. And just on that, Senator, I'm advised they close on the 11th of December. Okay, they'll close on the 11th of December. When do we... My understanding is that within the New South Wales government document that's been the program guidelines, it's talking about funding rolling out by about April next year. Does that sound right? Senator, as soon as New South Wales have prioritised the applications and made decisions on them, uh, then they w we are available and they would uh, nominate those to MBRA for co-funding approval, providing it meets the guidelines. Do you think it's acceptable that bushfire communities are having to wait until April next year, which is potentially 18 months after they experience the bushfires, before they start receiving some of the money 
for local economic recovery that was promised back in May? So, Senator, as mentioned, that's just part of the local economic recovery program. It's a pretty big part, 250 million or 270 million, it whichever is, it is. It's a very big part, as is the other part of the New South Wales program that comes from the regional development process. And as mentioned, 74 projects have been approved uh, for co-funding already, 95 or 90, yeah, 95 million of Commonwealth money. Uh, so that should start rolling out very quickly. But none of them are being funded under New South Wales' share of this funding that was announced in May? Yep. Yes, Senator. yes, Senator, they are. Well, you're going to come back to me with how these different figures line up and... Yep. Well, I mean, Senator, what we, what we read out to you is how the figures line up. What I will come back to you is uh, you are quoting to me from a media release from the Minister. I want to just confirm my understanding of what the Minister was, the $250 million figure he used there as opposed to the 270. Mm -hmm. Um, in answer to your question, though, I mean, there are a range of programs, including the $62 million that was provided to local government authorities who are spending that money in the communities right now, rebuilding um, walkways, uh, fixing amenities, fixing facilities as, as, they as they personally determine are necessary. Uh, as I said in the opening, recovery looks different in every community and every individual. It takes time and we're not going to rush it, we're doing it at the speed of the community to bring forward ideas. Uh, the reason we're a little bit reluctant about when will money flow, I mean, within these projects, there will be everything from, you've mentioned, I mentioned the desalination plant, that's a large infrastructure project that will take time, um, but there are also small projects such as building walkways and um, mountain bike tracks, uh, there's a range of those. So it will, it will be mixed, mm. Senator. And just, just to conclude here, is New South Wales the only state for which a share has been announced or an application process has begun? No, um, each state is doing it slightly differently. Queensland announced a grant uh, an application process some time ago, which I think is already closed. So they are considering applications from Queensland community groups, councils now. Um, South Australia are doing it slightly different. They have a very different dynamic that they're dealing with. And we are hopeful that Victoria will announce their process um, any any moment, frankly, and they're using a slightly different um, method as again, where they're using community recovery committees to bring forward the ideas. I might just, in the interest of time, get you to come back on notice how much has been allocated to each state, um, whether applications have opened, closed, how many projects approved. Um, we have all that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably as much as I need on that. Just, just on that narrow question about the difference between the 250 and the 270, you might be able to come back to us after lunch about that. That's a, it's a pretty narrow question, yeah. I would have thought. Just, just for one clarification, Chair, sure. before we Sure, and go, then I'll go to the, Senator Rice. The, um, you said, uh, Major General Hocking, that um, I think 31% had been approved but not yet announced. A figure around 31% of what the expenditure was supposed to be. Um, you're, you're saying 31% of the... Of the 1920. No, you're not talking about 31 percent of the forwards, are you? So, so the two percent is two percent of the 448 million dollars or whatever it is. It's not. It's not 31 percent of the 448 that you're talking about, is it? It's 31 percent of the 100. And no, it's it's 108 million, um, Senator. 108 million. Uh, we have approved of the 350 million that is available at the moment. So that's where your 31 percent figure comes yes. from. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Ross. Thanks, Chair. Look, I want to go to some details about the funding measures that are being used given to the forestry sector post bushfires. So, are you able to give me some details of those funding programs? Uh, Senator, yes, we can. Um, do you right. want me to go through the forestry sector programs, or is there, is there a specific one? Yep. Well, look, um, with regard to the, so there's a $40 million forestry recovery fund program. Um, so starting there, um, how many applications have you received for this program? Okay, uh, Senator, so that's the $41 million uh, forestry recovery development program. That was the competitive grants between $1 million and $5 million to allow privately owned wood processing mills that were impacted by the fires. Uh, to, we, we're particularly looking for them to adopt new technology and diversify. The program was launched on the 1st of September. 
with the guidelines published at the time. Applications opened on the 2nd of September. They closed on the 13th of October. And beyond that, um, the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment are managing that. So they would be better placed to, to give you details of the actual applications than numbers. Okay, so so you haven't got the details of how many applications you have received have been received. No, it's only just closed, Senator, the thirteenth of October. So the department will be working that through at the moment. Okay, um, and who is the decision maker for that program? Uh, that will be question. outlined. That will be outlined in, in the guidelines. The guidelines. Um, it would either be the depart a department official or the minister, but um, it's not. The, yeah, not, it's not I'm, the agency. It's not. It's not us, uh, Senator. We'll have to check. It's a good question. I can't recall off the top of my top of my head what the guideline says. We'll have to come back to you on notice with that. Okay. Who developed the guidelines? Uh, it was largely developed by the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, as the as the experts in this field. Right. Did, so, did the agency have a role in the guidelines at all? Uh, certainly the guidelines are shared with us to make sure that they're consistent with what we are seeing on the ground. I mean, our role is to report back to government and departments about what gaps and measures we feel or where community pressure points are. Um, we're not the experts and I don't have within in the agency the experts on forestry um, policy, but we would see the guidelines to make sure they're consistent with our understanding of, of the need, but they're owned by the department. So in determining that need, how much does the agency take into account both the what's in the economic interest of the local community and sort of the longer term interconnection between the economic interest and environmental issues? So Do you have a role in, in making those sorts of assessments? So Senator, we, we take the feedback from the community and we feed that into the department who has obviously a much broader and deeper knowledge of the policy environment. Uh, so essentially what we are doing is looking at it through the lens of the community and, and the representations that are made to us as a result of the bushfires. Did, did you get feedback from the community about the future of the um, native forests in the region and the need to protect those forests post-fires? Uh, so, Senator, I can only speak personally. I, I, I can't speak on behalf of every person who's been out to the community that most of the representations in this field that I have had have been about jobs and uh, the concerns of the community that uh, as a result of the bushfires, people will be out of work. Okay. Could you um, take on notice what guidance? So, so I mean, who, who did the final sign off of the guidelines? Uh, I think the guidelines were, yeah, yeah the guidelines were uh, negotiated with the department and in consultation with the states and territories as well. Because again, there's a range of forestry measures. Uh, some are delivered by the by the Commonwealth, some were delivered in partnership with the states and territories. Yeah, so okay, so it was the department that they did the final sign off, but you're saying that you you had input into the guidelines. Could you take on notice what input you had, if there was some emails or recommendations or any comments on the guidelines that the agency put forward on the basis of your consultation well, in general, no, I understand. but also yeah. on the basis of your consultation with the community? Yeah, we can take that on notice, uh, Senator, absolutely. Um, when, with that consultation with the community, how, what form did that take? Uh, it's been a range, Senator, of um, community group meetings. Uh, it's certainly been a range of uh, representations made to both myself or the, or the agency, as well as the government from members of the community, as well as privately owned processing mills. Uh, so, you know, we, we'll take, uh, we'll take our, our soundings from any way that we can get them, but largely it's through our travels and our consultation with affected communities. For instance, um, small community groups that I was a part of up in Tumbarumba, um, Batlow area, Snow Valleys, but also uh, we have received a lot of correspondence about this. Okay. Um, how has all of that consultation and the findings of those consultations been documented? Has it been documented? Well, we keep records yes. within we keep records within the agency of our of our engagement, so that we have a, a, an up to date. Um, knowledge of what the community feedback is, and this is the type of material that we feed into the department as the policy owners uh, when they're designing measures. Okay, could you take on notice, could I get copies of that documentation, please, the, the feedback from the community? 
Yeah, so uh, certainly, Senator, as it relates to forestry industry, we can provide that to you. And in that documentation, you said that there was a concern about, about jobs. Um, can you recall from that feedback from that documentation whether there's differentiation that people make between jobs in plantation forestry and jobs in native forest, native forest forestry? Uh, well, certainly, Senator, again, from my own uh, consultations and my own engagement, uh, there has been a distinction between native um, plantations and um, softwood plantations. Oh, native forestry. No, native plantations. I'm talking about native forests. Our yeah, precious na native, native forests. Sorry, Senator, I'll <laughs> make sure the words are the right words, but you know this better than I. Native forests and softwood plantations, yes. Yes, and so what's been the differentiation? Uh, Senator, it hasn't really um, extended to a a deep differentiation, differentiation other than um, discussion about the length of time it will take for regrowth and for the industry to, to recover. And has there been consideration of the fact that the vast majority of the jobs in the industry are back in the, the region, in the southeastern New South Wales region, are actually plantation-based forestry jobs rather than native forest jobs? That distinction being made? Uh, Senator, again, I don't believe that that's something that has been uh, been communicated to me in such a distinct way. But it was quite obvious to me that most of the most of the um, employment was as a result of softwood plantations. Yes. And but there's nothing in the guidelines that distinguishes between plantation forestry and native forest logging, is there? I'd have to take I'd have to take that on notice. I don't have the guideline with me, Senator. Okay. All right. And if and if you could take on notice, yes, what your input into the guidelines was. Thank you. Um, with relation to the fifteen million dollars for the forestry transport assistance, um, is what is there an agreement with New South Wales about this fund? Which one, Senator? The, the forestry transport assistance. Um. Pretty sure the answer to that question is uh, is actually yes. There, there, there is agreements with New South Wales. In fact, I think the program is being delivered with matched funding from New South Wales. Right. Is that agreement a public agree a public agreement? Uh, I'd have to take that on notice, uh, Senator. And look, and if it's not, could I request a copy of that agreement, please? It's probably a question better directed at the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, So, because it wouldn't be something that we are the decision makers or owners of whether it's a public document or not. Okay, so it's, a, again, it's, so the department will have made the agreement rather than the agency. Correct. Okay, and, and the same goes with Victoria. What's the status of the agreement with Victoria? So uh, Victoria also matching funds. I think that the Victorian guideline may not be complete as, as yet, whereas the New South Wales guideline is complete and they are, they are receiving applications at the moment. So Victoria is still processing what their arrangement will be. Right, so with, what's the status of the New South Wales fund then in terms of receiving applications? So uh, as at the 13th of October, I understand that they've received 25 applications and beyond that, I think it would be Again, as, as with before, it's a question for the, the department as to the status of those applications. Okay, and do you know then with New South Wales, has there been funds that have been dispersed from this fund? Sorry, Senator, I, you dropped out there. With, with the New South Wales one, so there have been applications, so there have been 25 applications received. Have, have there been any um, funds dispersed as yet? That would be a question better for the department as to whether they've dispersed any funds. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Okay. Um, can you... Uh, I want to move on to the $10 million for the, the salvage storage fund. Um, typically, is there an agreement with New South Wales fund? Sorry, Senator, could you say that again? There's a $10 million salvage storage fund. Yes. Yes, and I want to know what the status of that is in terms of is there an agreement with New South Wales, is there an agreement with Victoria? How, how is that fund being um, administered? So, Senator, this is the $10 million for timber storage facilities announced on the 23rd of June. Uh, again, there is... 
matched funding is the expectation from New South Wales and Victoria. Funding is going to be delivered through a partnership with New South Wales and Victoria. Um, much as with the other one, Victoria are yet to finalise their consideration of their processes for that. Uh, New South Wales have finalised and are receiving applications at the moment. Right, so when did the New South, you know, when the New South Wales applications um, are due? I don't have a date that the applications opened, but I know as of the 13th of October they'd received 17 applications. Okay. And can you tell me, again, maybe with the last two funds, whether there are specific agreements that have been signed between the Commonwealth and New South Wales and Victoria? Well, there are big guidelines, Senator, for how the, the measure and the program will be, will be rolled out. Uh, and I'd have to check with the department who administer those guidelines. But what I, no, it's not the not the guideline as, per se. It's whether there is a written agreement between New South Wales and and the Commonwealth and with Victoria and the Commonwealth about the fund. Yeah, I, I would take that to be agreement on the guidelines, Senator. But again, the department have been negotiating that, and we would have to take it on. It's it is it's a question better directed at the department. Okay. Can I just go back to um, and this is my, my final question is in terms of the you know, my uh, assessment from the Australian community is that the fate of our forests and the fact that we had three billion animals killed in the fires is something that the Australian community are very concerned about. Um, so has, that has come through in your consultation with the community. Well, certainly, uh, Senator, the community has been concerned about the environmental damage, including the loss of, of species. Uh, that, has, that is a constant that we have heard. Uh, in terms of uh, the fires themselves, there's a concern about uh, forestry management and managing the fires, and that has been a, a, a very emotional point from many of the communities I have, have been engaged with. Uh, but beyond that, Senator, uh, as I said before, the, most of the discussions, the tenor of those discussions has been about the impact on the local communities um, of the hit that the forestry mills and the forestry workers and logging companies are taking. Mm. But again, most, most of the employment and the, the economic hit is relation to plantation forests. What I want to know is whether you as an agency differentiate, given that concern of the community, about the animals that were killed and particularly you know the vast majority of those animals were in our native forests as to whether you saw fit in terms of your um, representations or your statements to differentiate between you know supporting the plantation sector and ongoing logging of our native forests that have been hit so hard and the animals that have been hit so hard by the fires well senator um i'll, I'll take on notice what our what our um, feedback to the department has been, but I, I guess I just reinforce, we're not the policy owners or, or have the policy depth of this issue. Um, we are communicating what we're hearing from the community. Yes, but given that you have hearing that from the community about their concerns about the forests, about animals, concerns about the um, looting logging, the salvage logging that is, has begun in those forests since then, I'm wondering whether that has been reflected in your um, advice to the government. Well, Senator, you're, you're putting a, a context on that that I'm not sure that I'm quite agreeing with. What I'm saying is that the community have been very concerned about the environmental impact, and I, don't, I think that's well understood across government. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Rice. Um, that takes us right to our scheduled break for lunch. I know Senator O'Sullivan has questions, and I will come to him first uh, when we return from the break. And I imagine both Senator Watt and Senator Ayres have further questions uh, who will come to after the break. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you again at 2.15. Thank you, Chair. Cheers, Minister. It will now resume its examination of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. Senator O'Sullivan, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask about the local economic recovery plans? Can you just explain to me the, the rationale of that program? Economic Recovery Senator, um, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I'll pass to Major General Hocking. Um, 
And Chair, also in, as part of the answer, we, we can probably clarify the question we took over the lunch break about the 250 million as well, if that's okay with you, Senator. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Senator, Major General, Andrew Thank Hopkins. You. Um, so in answer to your question, in terms of the design behind it, um, it was very much designed uh, to be a program that was, was bottom up in nature. You know, what is it that communities need? What is it that regions need? And not necessarily have that decision made from an office in Canberra. Yep. Um, it was designed so that it was very broad. It wasn't just economic recovery. It was human social recovery, environmental recovery, uh, and elements of infrastructure. And importantly, uh, the mechanism for funding was agreed to be done under DRFA Cat D with exemption, which allows for betterment and building things, not just replacing things. So that was the philosophy of the design that we worked through with the states. Equally part of the design was uh, to ensure that the Commonwealth funding uh, was matched by state funding so that communities got the best recovery that we could collectively muster uh, across the states and Commonwealth. I might just talk about the figures now, Senator, yeah. if you're happy for me to do that. Could I have one thing, Senator? The, the other aspect of that is um, intentionally we built in the ability for the Commonwealth to look at a national perspective. So we wanted to be able to look at the programs that were coming up from the community and through the states and find out um, to make sure that that balance and proportionality across communities, across jurisdictions, that there was to the best degree possible consistency in the way that that was being done. That was important to us. I think that's a really important part of it, Senator, that there needs to be the appropriate amount of local community projects but equally a degree of sophistication about a regional view where investing at the regional level could in benefit many communities rather than just individual. But it's a balance oh. between the two. So just unpacking the funding, as you know, it was announced $448.5 million in total, uh, Commonwealth money. 98.5 million of that is reserved for the complementary projects fund which is really principally there in time when gaps in recovery are identified to fill those gaps. The 350 million local economic recovery fund, that's 350 million of Commonwealth money. Yeah. That grosses up to 700 million, state and Commonwealth. I'll just break that down for you now. So noting we were talking about New South Wales and it might be best to do it through that lens. So out of the 350 Commonwealth apportionment for local economic recovery, 270 million of that has been allocated to New South Wales. 207? 270. 270, okay. Which grosses up to a total of $540 million state and Commonwealth contribution. So breaking that $540 million down for New South Wales, $250 million of that is under their building or their bushfire local economic recovery program. 125 Commonwealth, 125 state, 250. That leaves the remaining $290 million for New South Wales, adding up to the 540 for the more regional programs, which largely get derived through their regional development process. Right. But clearly with a bushfire lens, um, you know, what are the things that are high priority for the regions? Consulted with communities through that regional development process mm. in order to identify what those priorities are. So when we, we go back to the percentages now, so we, we have across the nation 86 projects that have been approved for Commonwealth co-funding. Um, that is 108.6 million Commonwealth dollars, uh, which is 108.6 of the 350, which is the 31 per cent. So those 86 projects, uh, I think earlier you mentioned desalination on Kangaroo Island. What, what are the other type of projects that 
they, they vary, Senator, yeah. um, hence the design of the program. Some are big, some are small. Uh, but some examples would be uh, in areas uh, in northeastern Victoria, for example, in Harrietville, a small bridge that sort of connects right. one side of the town to the other. And, and that came out of a... And that, and that was a bridge that was destroyed no, in the fire? It was, it oh, so was it's an additional... It was a bridge that that adds to economic okay. development. And, yes. that, and that's the approach that, yes. uh, that we're operationalising. It was agreed to by government um, that this is an opportunity to um, help communities not only replace things that have been impacted by fire, but achieve a better community from an infrastructure, social... Uh, and all other perspectives. So I'm very interested in the, the bottom-up approach. It seems very intuitive and, and sens um, sensible to do that. Well, did that the, the origin of that uh, process, did, was that because of community consultation? Was that what you heard? Tell us about how that initiated. So, Senator, um, very early on in this recovery, um, you know, we decided we were going to be a learning organisation uh, right from the start. Um, that led to us conducting a number of literature reviews, uh, working with um, uh, some individuals from Deloitte in the US that have been involved in Katrina and a range of other things. And look, in simple terms, one of the key parts of the literature in recovery is that communities need to have a degree of agency about their recovery. Uh -huh. um, and there are many, many stories, both in Australia and overseas, that where projects have been imposed on communities, uh, then it is fact, in fact those projects that uh, have caused further trauma as communities uh, either don't use the project and, and mourn over the waste of money, uh -huh. uh, or it just causes division in communities. So it's important to to get that balance, not all up, uh, through communities, solely villages uh, or towns, but yeah. also a regional perspective with community consultation. And so these projects come as a result of you know the interest that's, that's on the ground and the knowledge of what's needed on the ground. What involvement can a federal MP have in putting forward projects? So, Senator, um, you know, we're encouraging federal MPs who, who know their areas, uh, you know, as well as state MPs, local councils and community members, to really participate in that state uh, community consultation process. I think a great example uh, was, I, I can't recall the exact date, but I think it was the 12th of August uh, in a community called Batlow, where uh, Resilience New South Wales and MBRA in partnership um, with federal, state and local member from that area okay. um, convened and participated in a community recovery committee um, in Batlow um, where we, I guess, the, the political leaders joined the conversation, yeah. scaffolded the discussion, but ultimately helped the community determine uh, what its priorities were, which then get raised as priorities for LER funding. And with the program, what protections are in place to make sure that uh, state governments are not cost shifting, uh, you know, through this and not taking on responsibility for themselves? Senator, um, a really important part of our design to ensure that that didn't occur. Um, so we have agreed with the states a range of criteria for local economic recovery fund and one of the prerequisites for that is that it's new money, not cost shifted money. Um, so that's a simple mechanism and, and MBRA's role, as I've just described, is not to determine what the right projects are but when the projects are nominated up through communities and through the state process um, if there is other forms of suitable funding, yeah. or we're saying that it is cost shifting, then we hold the power of veto. Okay. And we, we could and have um, said, we will not co-fund that as the Commonwealth, or MBRA in this case is the decision maker, and then the states would need to go it alone on that particular project. Uh, just a couple more questions, uh, if I can. The, 
Uh, just with regards to charities and you're providing funding through charities, uh, interested in understanding, again, the rationale behind that. Um, you know, so why has the government provided so much funding through charities? Uh, you know, as opposed, I guess, the, the government themselves uh, directly administering those funds. Senator, if I may, and again, uh, Major General Hawking has, has, chairs the charity coordination group effectively. So we have, through the NBRA, um, dedicated a lot of time and effort to working with the charities. And it's undoubted that uh, the charitable services received an enormous amount of outpouring of support from the general community. As part of that, though, there was direct funding from the Commonwealth to the charitable service, which is not unusual. It often happens um, at times of crisis. And, and the reality is that they are on the ground in a way that the Commonwealth simply is That's not. It's a whole bottom-up approach. A absolutely. And, and their ability to get funding to where it is needed immediately mm. to help people clothe themselves or their children, to help with basic essentials, um, is unparalleled in my experience. And it was important that we were able to facilitate that in the, in the early stages. And um, charity, charitable services and the charitable sector I think have um, been under a lot of pressure as a result of the bushfires. We all know that. Um, it was a. I think it stretched the frameworks and the um, uh, precedents that have been set for them in a way that none of us had imagined. But we've we've had very good working relationship with them, and and they've been very responsive when we've identified needs, and they've been able to use the money that we've given them to address some of those needs. Senator, if I could just add to that as well. Um, the agency very much sees its role and it's, it's, it's been tasked with leadership and coordination mm. at the national level, uh, not just leadership of Commonwealth resources, but leadership and coordination of the nation's resources. And whilst the Commonwealth Government gave money through emergency relief funding to charities, daily there are situations where we come across people with our recovery support officers Right. that we have embedded in communities where we identified an, a need that can't quite be met appropriately by government money, whether that's state or federal. Um, and using our networks in the charity sector, there are many occasions where we've brought uh, charitable money to bear to coordinate this recovery. Sounds important. Does the, is, is there any issues of, of fraud with charities? Have people coming to them with fraudulent claims and, uh, and and is there support there for those charities to deal with it when they come up with those instances? So, Senator, the charities have pretty well worked um, systems in place and governance arrangements. Uh, of course, um, as we've seen in all government measures, uh, fraud is a risk and there are those people that will do the wrong thing. Um, our experience, again, is that the charities have a reasonably sophisticated ability to detect that, but it's not perfect. Of course, somebody can shop across a range of charitable sectors. One of the challenges uh, that we're all working very hard on is how do, how do we share information appropriately to make sure that if people are forum shopping for one or charity yeah. shopping, yeah. that that can be addressed quite quickly. But they have good mechanisms and good governance arrangements that detect this quite quickly. And are there protections in place? Uh, you know, is there transparency with those operations and how they're making decisions for the charities how yeah. they make decisions the charities put a fair do report quite often on the way they are dispersing funds uh, i think one of the lessons that we've all learned um out of the 1920 bushfire season but particularly the charities is that there is a insatiable appetite from the community for an understanding of how they are making these decisions and again we've seen the charities react quite positively to our prompting that they need to be more accountable and open about this so what sort of things are you asking them to improve uh, transparency, um, more material on their websites, uh, more public information about how they're making decisions and why they're making decisions. And uh, you know, the charities also have a difficult task. Uh, they need to be there for the long term, as we talked about at the start of, the, mm. of this hearing. So they often have a, um, a difficult balance to find sometimes. And on that question of time frame, how long would you be expecting the charities to continue to be involved in these? Uh, Black summer areas. So formally, Senator, the money from the government, there are time frames placed on when they need to, s to spend them by, but to give you uh, a, a quick snapshot, some of those funds are by um, December this year, others are by, and it's complicated, January next year, still others again um, 
uh, June next year. So there's different reporting requirements depending on what the money is, but all of them have windows. Uh, I think there's a need for the charities to find a balance between getting immediate funds out in a, in a relief sense, but retaining enough of the disbursements that, that they can be there in 12 and 18 months time when both anecdotally, but also evidence tells us that the communities are still going to be needing their support. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your answers, but also importantly, uh, the work that you're doing. It's uh, absolutely vital at this time. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, thank Senator. you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, Senator Yes. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mr. Colvin, on the 23rd of June, 2020, um, less than a fortnight, I think, before the Aid Monero by-election date, uh, the Prime Minister and the Liberal candidate for Eden Monero announced a second round of primary producer funding for bushfire victims. It included um, support for wine and grape producers, a forestry recovery development fund, uh, more storage for secure forestry products and apple grower grants. Can you, um, that announcement's now four months old, can you tell me uh, how many applications have been received for funding in each of those, each of those uh, categories? Uh, I can tell you certain information, Senator. Um, bear with me while I pull out the right details. Um, the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment are administering uh, all of those programs. I believe I'm right in saying that. So they will have the detail um, beyond what I can. Let me just get what I can for you, though. So the 31 million bushfire recovery grant for apple growers announced on the 23rd of June. This is for grants of up to 120,000 per hectare. Um, it was uh, a co-contribution required from the recipient. The program opened in Queensland on the 31st of August, South Australia on the 7th of October, New South Wales on the 7th of October. Uh, at this stage, I believe the department is still working with our state counterparts on assessing the grants. I probably can't go into too much more detail than that. So you can't tell many, in terms of apples, how many applications have been received? No, I don't have the information, Senator. The department would. Let's see. What about, um, what about in the other categories? Uh, so the wine grape, the, yep. the, the progress, so this is for smoke taint, mm. for wine producers that weren't eligible under the small business packages. Uh, ACT so, sorry, Mr. Colvin, back to apples again, sorry. Mm -hmm. when, when will we know how many applications have been received? When, when, when do these application processes that were announced four months so ago conclude? Applications close in Queensland and South Australia on the 31st of December and in New South Wales on the 15th of December. So the program is quite open and active at the moment. And, and uh, uh, applications have been approved after the application date closes or are they being dealt with and approved as they come in? Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to defer to the department for that. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Back to, no, back to wine grapes. So wine and grape, uh, this is for um, grape growers that weren't eligible for the small business uh, programs that were made available. ACT opened on the 31st of August. Victoria opened on the 8th of September. New South Wales opened on the 7th of October. South Australia opened on the 7th of October as well, so both of those were quite recent. Um, the program terminates on the 30th of June next year. Applications close in the ACT, Victoria and South Australia on the 31st of December this year, and in New South Wales on the 15th of December this year. So again, we're in, the, we're in the, an open grant window at the moment. And uh, similarly for the two forestry line items? Uh, yep. Just make sure I get the right ones. So that would be in the, uh, that I was talking to Senator Rice about earlier, the 41 million forestry recovery development fund um, announced on the 23rd of June. The program launched on the 1st of September. Um, applications opened on the 2nd of September. They closed just last week on the 13th of October, and that's all the information I have available, Senator. The department, as I said to uh, Senator Rice, will, will be able to give more detail on that. So if, I'm, if I want to know how much funding has been released for each of those programs, um, I'm not going to find out from you. I'm going to find out from... Well, I, I, that's correct, Senator, yes. Yeah. Yep. 
You, you don't have any oversight of that? Uh, Senator, our, our role is to make sure that the measures are rolling out and being implemented effectively. The actual administration of the program sits with the departments. So I don't want to, I don't want to try and answer on their behalf. You, you, so you're not able to, on notice, provide me with a... Um... Well, Senator, I think the, the correct department to deal with that will be Ag, Water and Environment, who will have the most up-to-date details. Mm. You haven't been briefed about, about that? No, no, I haven't actually, Senator. So announcements made four months ago, you're, you're not in a position, haven't been briefed on how much funding's been released for those programs? Well, Senator, uh, as I've just explained, the grants are open now. The, pro the programs are still open at the moment. So they would still be assessing grants, I'm sure. OK. Um, are you... Um, are you aware of the regional recoveries partnerships that the Deputy Prime Minister announced on 30th of September? Uh, vaguely, Senator. I'm aware of it. It's not a bushfire program per se, but we do try and keep an awareness of all programs, particularly given there's so many programs under a COVID, um, in a COVID environment, to try and maximise them for bushfire communities, but uh, I'm by no means an expert on it. Well, I, was, I was hoping you, you, you would know a bit more. The, the reason that I was hoping that is the Deputy Prime Minister, when he announced the funding, said the data available has informed the identification of these locations where the money's going to be spent. They have been selected because they are regions whose economies have experienced the brunt of natural events such as bushfires or COVID-19, drought as well, or because they create an opportunity to work closely with other levels of government to make sure those regions are well placed to contribute to national resilience and growth. Are you aware that the regions of Yirribidalla, Shoalhaven, the Snowy Valleys, the, the, the Snowy Valleys and the Bega Valley were all excluded from the program? Well, I'm aware of the, the broadly the regions that were included. Uh, I, you know, I couldn't speak to the rationale of which regions were in or which regions weren't. Were, was the agency you're responsible for coordinating the recovery effort in bushfire Bush affected place. regions? Were you asked to provide advice? Um, as to which regions should be included in the regional recovery program? Senator, I'll, I'll take advice. Uh, what, what, just while we're thinking about the answer, though, what I will say is we've made available to all our partner departments the, the material and evidence we have about regional impact. So we're very open and transparent about what we see as the impact of the bushfires across regions. That's no secret, either publicly or with our departmental colleagues. I have no doubt they used it, whether they ask us specific Well, I'm questions. not sure. Whether, whether you can know that. What I want to know is were, were, you, asked right. to, were you asked to brief them? Yeah, so right. we, would pro we provided our feedback through the Ordinary Cabinet process. The, um, the modelling that was done was not done by the MBRA um, and it did not just take into account bushfire impacts. So it was... Um, a, the, when we were seeing things, it was a, a range of different things that were going into that that were in addition to bushfire impacts. Um, as um, the coordinator said, we offer our insights and intelligence to the agencies pulling this together. Our advice would have been provided though through the budget and cabinet process. You, you, you provided that advice in, through the normal channels, but in relation to this specific program? Yes, so this, as this program went through the cabinet process, um, we were consulted and that's how we provide our feedback through the normal cabinet. So, so what regions did you advise should receive the funding? That we'd, we didn't actually advise on regions. Um, we were given visibility of the submission through the cabinet process. Um, so we had visibility that um, Kangaroo Island, for example, was in there. And so the sort of... Um, input that we gave is how we would work um, with the uh, Department of Infrastructure to make sure that any money that was going out was complementing our local economic recovery fund program uh, and wouldn't be duplicating that in those regions. But we didn't provide advice on the, uh, the analysis or the um, economic, um, econometric sort of analysis that was used to determine those regions. So you did provide advice about regions the Kangaroo Valley. The, 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 the so, so we did not provide any modelling or analysis mm. to identify the regions. When we knew that those regions had been identified, 
uh, we requested that uh, with those regions, we knew that they were also targeted for local economic recovery, as were are a lot of other regions um, affected by the bushfires. And so the work that we intend to do with infrastructure is to make sure that the money that's going out is complementing our local economic recovery fund and not duplicating or overlapping with that fund. So, so the advice you provided was general, was that, that there was no advice about specific regions that should receive funding? No, because they did separate... I'm trying to unravel yeah, this mystery yeah. that, that there is... The Deputy Prime Minister has said a very significant portion of this has been allocated in response to bushfires. Yep. And the, the Bega Valley, 465 homes destroyed, 134 severely damaged. Yurubadala, 510 homes destroyed. 274 severely damaged, Shoalhaven 285 homes, 168 damaged, and the Snowy Valleys just under 200 homes destroyed and 49 severely damaged. All of those regions entirely excluded from the regional recovery partnership. What, 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 what advice did you provide that, that ended up with a result where those regions were excluded from the program. Senator, there's 112 local government areas far broader than what you've just described that, yes. that have been triggered for disaster relief as a result of the bushfires. Uh, you would need to ask the department what, who, who designed that policy uh, and that program what they took into account. Um, Can you provide uh, correspondence that you had regarding the program? Well, Senator, um, I think it's part of the cabinet process. Part of the cabinet process, process. And, so th th that would be cabinet that. in confidence. So those severely affected areas were excluded. You provided advice. We don't get to know. We, don't, we did not provide advice on the modelling or the analysis that went into the selection of those regions. That's a matter for the Department of Infrastructure. Yeah, I'm not asking about modelling. I'm, I'm asking, you know, when, when you were asked to provide a brief, what regions did you say should get assistance from this program? And you're not able to tell me which well, regions. Senator, we were consulted as part of the cabinet process, the normal cabinet process, um, and I'm sure you understand that we can't talk about the cabinet process and what advice was provided. Just got a few more questions, Chair. Um, is the agency? Yeah, yes. No worries. Is is the agency able to provide an up to date organisational chart? Uh, I don't have one with me, but yes, we can provide it after I think it's the. On our website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that there's been some discussion about tenders. Just want to discuss one more, Mr. Colvin. There was a tender issued one week after the National Bushfire Recovery Agency was announced on 13th of January. It's uh, numbers CN three double six four zero three five dash A one. Um, it's a limited tender valued at $242,390 awarded to Peter Edward Dalrymple Crone. Can you explain the procurement process for that tender? Mm, I do have some information about that, Senator. So bear with me. So uh, I think we've, we've put some material on the record in question on notice 2063. And Peter Grone provided labour hire services to support initial development of the NBRA's reporting and analytical capabilities. A limited tender for Peter Crone services was undertaken for urgent services brought about by the unforeseen events of the Black Summer bushfires uh, in accordance with subparagraph 10.3b of the Commonwealth Procurement Rules. Peter Crone was engaged for up to a maximum of 180 days. The NBRA exercised a contract extension option with Peter Crone for up to an additional 90 days and increase, increased the maximum value contract, the maximum value to cover this additional period. So I guess, Senator, in the early um, stages of the NBRA, we identified that we would need some economic expertise and assistance. Uh, Peter Crone was, uh, well, we were supported very much by Prime Minister and Cabinet in establishing ourselves in those early stages and bringing on some of that expertise. Peter Crone was identified and um, supplied a very good service to us until uh, that ended. How, how was he identified? 
Uh, Senator, you would need to ask Prime Minister and Cabinet that. Uh, in the initial stages, they did so much of the legwork to help us stand the agency up. Um, I couldn't answer exactly how he was so identified. So it's not a tender that you were directly involved in? No, I did not. I didn't know Peter Crone. I, I, I since come to know that he's done a lot of work with government and was well known. He sure has. What, um, so you didn't receive any direction about the tender? It was Prime Minister and Cabinet who? Well, Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, assisted us with bringing Peter Crone into the organisation. I did not know him. So I understand he's been engaged until 14 June 2021. Is, is that still what's anticipated? Or are you saying he's wrapped up? 14 June 2021. No, he, he was engaged until 14 We've June. Actually, uh, the contract was terminated on the 2nd of June. Yeah, this year. So he's no longer working and with us. And it was terminated on the basis that the 180 days had been used up? Or yeah, was there we, some other we reason had, Yeah, we had... Um, no, it's actually... We, we hadn't used the 180 days, but the work that he was undertaking for us had completed um, and he had other work to go on to, so we mutually um, terminated the contract. And, and what did he do? He provided uh, a great deal of economic analysis in the initial stages of, um, of us trying to understand relative impact across the region. So he drew on, as economists do, and I'm not going to try and explain because I don't understand, but drew on a range of statistical um, data sets to help us understand what was the impact to the tourism industry, what was the impact to the agriculture sector, what was the impact um, more broadly in a particular region. And he helped us with a relative impact understanding of the, of the bushfires at a moment in time. So what was available to us at that time? Did he provide the line of questioning that I had before about the Regional Recoveries Partnership, did he assist um, your briefing of the of, um I, would, I think he would have been long gone before we saw anything to no, do with that program. No, he wasn't involved. Wasn't engaged in that. Mm. Um, So you're aware that Mr Crone was a direct appointment of Prime Minister Abbott to head the government's commission of audit in 2013? No, I wasn't actually personally aware of that. I know that he has worked with government, uh, but not the commission of audit, no, I wasn't aware of that. You, you're not aware then that the final report of the commission of audit released in 2014 recommended abolishing the disaster recovery allowance? No, I'm not aware of that, Senator. So you weren't, so you, and, and you weren't engaged in the process, so this guy just arrived. So right. you weren't aware that he had strong views about the, the disaster recovery allowance? Well, no, I certainly wasn't aware he had strong views of disaster recovery allowance. I was aware that he came highly credentialed and as a credible economic analyst, which is exactly what I needed. I wasn't aware of any role with the disaster recovery allowance or the Commission of Audit. OK, I don't have any further questions, Chair. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Are there any further questions for the National Bushfire Recovery Agency? If not, I thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence here today and all of your work getting these communities back up on their feet. Um, and the committee will now move to uh, the Office for Women. Um, we have some witnesses, I believe, joining us here in person and the minister is joining us by video conference. So it might just take a minute or two uh, to set that up. Uh, the committee will just have a so short suspension and we'll return uh, with the minister and officials. Thanks, sort of count to 20. I wonder if we can just check um, how good or bad this connection is because most of my questions are in fact to the minister rather okay. than to the officials so it would be good to know whether or not that's going to be possible. Could you please do an audio check for us minister? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, certainly happy to do that chair. Is that any better? Mm. Uh, it's moderately better but it's still not great. Um, do we have a redundancy in terms of a phone connection? I, I think minister to be on the safe side given that Senator Uh, and I welcome Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, Minister for Women, who's joining us remotely from quarantine. Uh, Ms Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary of Social Policy. Ms Catherine Hawkins, First Assistant Secretary and Officers from the Office of Women within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Officers called upon for the first time to answer a question should state their name and position for the Hansard record and witnesses should speak clearly into the microphone. Uh, Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? 
not, not in the circumstances, no, thank you, Chair. No, thank you. And for the benefit of those watching from home, we've been persisting through some technical problems which we have solved as best as we can and we will just persist. Uh, would either Ms Frame or Ms Hawkins like to make an opening statement? No, Senator. Okay. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, thanks, Minister, for persisting through your tech difficulties. It's appreciated. Um, it's been reported that the Prime Minister's office uh, has said that no one credible was critical of the budget uh, or argued that it didn't deliver for women. And that was in response to an article criticising the budget that was written by the journalist Georgie Dent. Have you contacted the Prime Minister's office to confirm if this is true? No, I haven't had a conversation of that nature with the Prime Minister's office, Senator. Why not? Senator, if I had a conversation with the Prime Minister's office about every media article produced uh, on a, a range of portfolio issues across government, um, I would be doing that every day of the week. The media are entitled to comment. Um, the uh, officers of, uh, of government who engage with the media are entitled to engage. Uh, I don't think it requires ministerial intervention. It didn't concern you that female critics of the budget were being told that they were not credible? Senator, there are numerous, countless reports about every budget every year, uh, and some of them are probably uh, reports with uh, great veracity, and some are probably reports with, uh, with, uh, with, less, with less veracity. But uh, I would suggest that uh, it doesn't require ministerial intervention to, uh, to deal with those issues. It's part of the uh, processes of, of reporting and um, differenti differentiated views. Um, that's part of a robust democracy, frankly, Senator. Mm. You're right, and every budget has critics. Irrespective of whether or not you agree with all of the critics, do you at least accept that women who have concerns or have criticised the budget publicly in terms of its response for women are credible? Senator, I don't have a, a running list of, uh, of people who have either supported or criticised uh, the budget uh, in front of me. Uh, I support um, people's freedom to make comment as, uh, as they see fit uh, on all sides. Um, go to members of the government, members of the opposition, members of the crossbenchers, members of the media, members of the parliament, uh, and professionals who are required to engage on these issues um, will do uh, what they believe is appropriate. Mm. Do you accept, uh, just as there are credible supporters of the budget providing commentary, that there are credible commentators who have concerns about the budget and its implications for women? I'm not sure it's for me to accept or not that proposition, uh, Senator. Um, as I said, there will be a vast range of commentators uh, on every budget, every um, set of propositions uh, pursued by government, no matter who is in government, frankly. Um, there'll be those who support them, there'll be those who don't. Some will be more credible than others. Uh, some reports will have greater veracity than others, and uh, it's in fact up to uh, readers. Um, and I think it's actually more challenging uh, in the days of uh, social media in some ways, but it's up to readers and listeners to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. um, a group of female commentators have created a website called CredibleWomen.com in response to the remarks that were made by your Prime Minister's office. This site has been blocked by the Parliamentary Network uh, as a malicious site, and it indicates that it is high risk for reputation. Do you have any idea why? Senator, I was not and would not expect to be aware of uh, the status of an individual website. Uh, so, no, that is, uh, that is not information uh, that I had had. Um, you say that the uh, comments in relation to credible women uh, were made. I was not party to those comments. I was, in fact, not in Australia uh, at the time of, uh, of that comment being made, but I have seen it reported. Uh, and if there is an issue in relation to a website, then I would imagine that that would be taken up through the normal uh, channels, which would be through uh, the parliamentary IT system mm. and the presiding officers. Yes, you've shown very little curiosity about the original comment and whether or not it, it actually was made or about the website. 
Do you intend to make any further investigations about how the Prime Minister's office is treating female commentators who do have credible opinions about so, the sorry, budget. Sorry to intercede sorry, here. Sorry, sorry Minister, I'm just going to intercede here very briefly. I know this is difficult over video, but um, we did just have the Department of Parliamentary Services before the committee just before, which would have been a very good place to ask a question about websites being inaccessible from Parliament House. It's with, entirely within their remit. Sure. I'm asking the Minister. OK. Minister. I answered the question. Thanks, Minister. <laughs> Um, I am, if I can move on, I'm interested in seeing, understanding how you see the role of your portfolio. Um, do you think you and the officials that work with you have a role to play in advocating for, for women's interests uh, in the policy making process? Senator, I think that uh, the office is a very important entity uh, within government, uh, and that is one of the reasons that it is located in the uh, Department of uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I know that over time uh, it has been uh, located in different parts of uh, government, including, I think, in Department of, perhaps it was called Families and Community Services, perhaps it was Social Services, I'm not sure uh, which. Uh, but yes, it certainly has, uh, has an important role to play. Uh, and it works with the large agencies of government um, the departments. It's a relatively small office and small entity. It works with those uh, in the context of, uh, of policy uh, and um, engagement on, uh, on key issues. Uh, and in this case, in relation to, uh, to the 2020 um, uh, context, has been responsible for uh, what I regard as excellent work uh, in bringing together the Women's Economic Security Statement 2020, which is, of course, a refresh of the Women's Economic Security Statement 2018. In answer to a question from the COVID committee, the Office for Women has confirmed that between March and April 2020, the Office for Women did not brief on early access to superannuation, on JobKeeper or JobSeeker in advance of government decisions on these issues. Why weren't you consulted on those issues? Chair, before, Chair, I, answer before question, I answer that question, can I just can raise I just a raise technical it? problem, which is that for some, for reason, some reason, the system keeps unmuting my iPad, the device that I'm using to view the proceedings, um, and that is making it very difficult for me to... Uh, to work here, but... Yes, thank um, you. Sorry, Minister, just before you um, go on to that answer, we, we've picked up a little bit of that with an echo on our end. Um, that may be something that broadcasting uh, can look at, at at this end. We'll see if we can investigate that while we persist. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, Senator, you have the evidence from um, Ms Hawkins in, uh, in relation to that, and I think uh, Ms Hawkins set that out uh, very well. I don't have anything to add. Well, with respect, Minister, is it not a concern to you that very significant economic decisions were being made and you were not consulted as the Minister for Women? I appreciate that you're not on ERC, but would you not have been expected to have been asked? Senator, the uh, entire government and through the departments uh, of the government uh, is expected to have within those key departments uh, the capacity and uh, the uh, role of considering the broad application of policy development on the entire population, as you would expect, as has always been the case, uh, and where it, where it is uh, appropriate for the Office for Women to engage or to be invited to engage. Uh, and um, there are a range of ways in which that uh, is done. As you saw, uh, as, well, I, I'm not sure if you were on the committee yourself, Senator, but as Senators saw, um, Ms Hawkins set that out in her, uh, in her response to the committee uh, at that COVID inquiry. Who do you think was considering the gender impacts of these policies if it was not the Office for Women? Well, Senator, I just said I would expect all departments to be considering the impacts of policy development uh, on the whole population in the process of developing policy as they do. And that would be, Senator, one of the reasons, for example, why we see uh, 1.7 million women in Australia uh, in receipt of the extremely important JobKeeper payment, which has enabled them to retain connection with their employment in the midst of what is 
uh, the most extraordinary economic impact Australia has seen in generations uh, and has enabled them to, uh, to keep that connection and hopefully to continue with that employment. Minister, you said it's your expectation that someone else would have done this work. That's not correct, Did... Senator. That is absolutely not what I've said. Uh, uh, pardon, you, you said it's your expectation that those developing these policies would have taken responsibility for undertaking analysis about impacts on the population. As the Minister for Women, did you check whether or not gender analysis was done on those key policies that your department was excluded from? Did you Senator, check whether no... gender analysis was done in relation to job seeker? Did you check in relation to job keeper? Did you check in relation to early access to super? Was anything was gender analysis undertaken? And do you know whether or not it was undertaken? So Self-evidently, Senator, um, in a situation where uh, $101 billion uh, of taxpayers' money is supporting around 3.5 million individuals in Australia as part of the JobKeeper process, and 1.7 million of those recipients are women in Australia, uh, then it is an important economic lifeline for those women. And self-evidently, in the application of the job seeker payments, Senator, which are not uh, which are not payments that are made in any gendered way whatsoever, in the application of the job seeker payments and the uh, additional payments uh, made in the context of COVID-19, they have been equally applied to women and to men, and that is the that is obviously a very important aspect of that. 46% of the recipients of job seeker and the COVID-19 payments made uh, in the context of the pandemic response um, are women, because 46% of the recipients of JobSeeker are women. Minister, you, with respect, you say that it is self-evident. My question to you was different. Did anyone do any analysis about policy design and the extent to which it met the economic needs of women, noting that women were disproportionately and differently impacted by the changes to the economy that have taken place since February. Did anyone in government do that analysis and that you are aware of? You have seen, where can I ask, in the remainder of the estimates fortnight, which department should I ask about the gender analysis that was undertaken on these measures? Senator, you should always ask the departments that are responsible for the policy measures themselves. Um, that would be um, a very normal and basic approach. JobKeeper, um, of course, uh, comes from Treasury Department. That is where um, I would ask that question. Uh, pandemic leave disaster payment, which continues to support workers uh, in Victoria and Tasmania in Western Australia, uh, in New South Wales, um, that that, que that um, question would perhaps be directed to Home Affairs. A number of the uh, um, questions that you have, though, are also re uh, relevant for the Treasury, as I said. I'm sorry, I'm absolutely hearing myself twice here. I do appreciate that the IT is very difficult for you, Minister, and I apologise for the circumstances under which we're having this conversation. Um, I will ask those agencies, have you asked them to see their analysis? Uh, Senator, I have not personally asked those agencies for their analysis, but we are always between the Office of Women, uh, speaking with those agencies, uh, between PM and C and those agencies, uh, speaking with those agencies, uh, between uh, um, my office and the Treasurer's office, uh, and the normal communication that, uh, that you would expect. Mm. Treasury told the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 that it had not modelled the impact of the COVID-19 early access to superannuation scheme on women. We know that on average women retire with around half the superannuation balances as men. Has the Office for Women done any analysis on this or asked Treasury to do so? Um, can I ask Ms Hawkins to respond to that question, please, Senator? Senator, sorry, could you repeat the exact question? Sorry. Treasury mm. told the COVID-19 committee that they did not do any analysis of the impact of the early access to super scheme on women. 
This is despite the fact that women retire with around half the superannuation balances as men on average. Did the Office for Women model the impact of that scheme on women or do any analysis of that scheme on women or did they ask Treasury to do so? So, Senator, in terms of so uh, Catherine Hawkins, First Assistant Secretary, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, in terms of the government's decision on early access to super, Senator, uh, we uh, did not advise on that uh, before uh, the, as you, as you know from our answer to the, the previous committee, the COVID committee, we didn't advise on that prior to the government making a decision. In terms of after that decision, we have been involved in, uh, in, in briefings on that issue. Uh, we have not done modelling as such, but we have been involved in, in uh, giving advice subsequently on that. So after the decision was made, somebody sought your advice? So after the decision was made, we had a look at it uh, and have provided some uh, and have provided some advice on it. To whom? Uh, we, in in the normal course of uh, events, we uh, we advise the, the minister for women in various briefings. We've given her advice on it. Just to the minister for women. So I'd have to take on notice, Senator. Anything beyond that? Uh, but Why? I, Can you not remember? Uh, we actually we, we do look at a, a very large number of things, Senator. So I'm 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 have got in front of me that we didn't give advice uh, before the decision was made. We I know that we did give advice after the decision was made. Uh, I know that uh, in the general course of uh, briefings that we provide the minister, uh, that uh, we gave uh, we did provide advice on that after the event. Uh, and anything further, I'd need to take on on notice, Senator. Yeah, yeah, to take a question on notice. Every witness is entitled to do that uh, for any reason. Minister, it sounds as though you don't have a handle on whether or not gender analysis is being undertaken on major economic decisions within government. You are the Minister for Women. If you're not advocating for that kind of analysis and Treasury is not routinely doing it, isn't it true that there is no one in the government who is taking responsibility for examining women's economic interests? No, I disagree entirely, Senator. And uh, I think, uh, as I pointed out uh, earlier, and I think as Ms Hawkins has, has pointed out uh, to this committee previously, and perhaps even to the COVID-19 committee, uh, this is uh, the Office for Women is a small part of the government. But clearly, given the, uh, the requirements across public service, uh, for the impact on the entire population to be considered in terms of policy making. Uh, and that is, uh, that is a, a, I would suggest, Senator, a basic tenant of, uh, of government's approach uh, to these matters. Um, each secretary, each department is responsible for those policy issues and those programs within their own department. Mm. Uh, the Office for Women uh, assists uh, the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Prime Minister and me uh, in the work that we do uh, on a range of issues uh, and they include, as we've discussed uh, with this committee before, um, women's leadership, uh, women's economic security, women's safety uh, and a range of other things, a range of other roles. Mm. Minister, are you an advocate for gender analysis on key economic policies within the government? Uh, yes, Senator, and it's a matter which is uh, discussed amongst members of, uh, of the government uh, uh, in the course of, uh, of normal business. Why is it then that over perhaps five years of asking questions about this within the government, I am yet to receive a response from Treasury where they say, yes, we did do that analysis? I'm still waiting to find a policy where they've undertaken gender analysis. Senator, I'm, I'm not able to respond on behalf of Treasury, and nor would you expect me to respond on behalf of Treasury. Do you advocate to Treasury then about this? Have Senator, you... there is a range of discussions, as I, I said in response to a previous question from you, across government, between departments, between the Office uh, for Women, between the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and other departments in relation to uh, the broad implications of, uh, um, of 
any policy uh, across the whole population, Senator. And frankly, one of the reasons why the initiatives uh, in the budget, whether they are around um, accelerating personal income tax cuts, uh, whether they are around a number of the other stimulus measures that are there around training, around uh, job maker hiring credits, are about making sure that the economy is stimulated so that the number of women's jobs that have come back uh, in the months since the worst impact of COVID-19 continues to increase because we know that there has been a strong resurgence in women's jobs. We want to see a lot more and that is why the policies that we took uh, to and, and announced through the budget process uh, are in place. Hmm. Minister, were you consulted about any of the policies in this budget prior to announcement, in particular the job maker wage subsidy? Senator, I'm not going to uh, speak in detail about matters that may have been the process of cabinet consultations. Okay, so you are basically telling me that the, the extent to which the Office for Women provides advice on key economic measures is now a secret because it is all the subject of cabinet consultation? Uh, no, Senator, that's not what I said. You asked me about discussions in relation to uh, particular matters and I said I wouldn't comment on those in the context of, uh, of cabinet discussions. But if you want to ask Ms Hawkins uh, in relation to the particular engagement that the Office for Women has had, uh, then she will answer to the best of her ability uh, in terms of those discussions. Have you been briefed uh, around any gender analysis of the JobMaker wage subsidy scheme? Do you mean the JobMaker hiring credit? Mm, yes. Uh, well, the expectation, Senator, is that around 450,000 positions for young Australians will be eligible to be supported through the JobMaker hiring credit. Um, my view is that this is a very important initiative to encourage employers to take on additional employees uh, Australian job seekers aged between 18 and 35. Mm. It is not a gendered initiative, Senator. It is an initiative to support the economy in the COVID recovery context. Mm. Uh, have you, you didn't answer my question though, which is, have you seen any analysis uh, to identify whether or not the design of the scheme will impact on men and women differently? Uh, Senator, I think the initiative that the Commonwealth has taken, which uh, of course has seen, uh, we'll see in the context of, uh, of this initiative, 450,000 young mm -hmm. Australians being supported into jobs, um, is in an effort to determine the most effective way to uh, in, support the economy to recover, uh, to ensure that we are skilling and reskilling all Australians and in a number of cases, particularly women for the jobs of the future. There's a number of initiatives in the Women's Economic Security Statement, which I'm sure uh, we could also point to, Senator, which are part of that process. Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no on the gender analysis for the job maker scheme. Uh, what about the taper rates of the job keeper scheme? Was there any gender analysis done on the impact that that might have on women? Senator, you would have to ask the agencies which are responsible mm. for that scheme. Have you been briefed on that analysis? Are you aware of any analysis? Senator, I haven't particularly been briefed on an analysis of that nature, no. Mm. The stage two tax cuts being brought forward, have you been uh, provided with a briefing about the gender impact of that measure? Uh, I've been provided with a briefing, Senator, which tells me that it will benefit over 11 million Australians uh, who have been fighting and, and trying their way through extraordinarily difficult circumstances in 2020. And as an initiative, I think that is a very important step by government and one which I strongly support. It's about providing that uh, one-off additional tax benefit to low and middle income earners in the 2020-21 financial year to deliver that tax relief to enable them uh, to, uh, to get through what has been a very difficult period, Senator. Uh, Minister, I asked you earlier whether you were an advocate for gender analysis in policy development, and I think you said that you were, and these were discussions that took place from time to time. We've just run through a whole series of measures recently announced in the budget for which you have not received or seen or are not aware of any gender analysis at all. Do you know whether there is a differential impact of any of these policies on women and are you interested in finding out? 
Well, Senator, I think um, as governments have uh, over many years, uh, these initiatives are focused on ensuring that we can grow the economy so Australians can create jobs, so that we can, as it says, in fact, in the, uh, in the Women's Economic Security Statement, so that we can increase economic resilience. Uh, and the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement is a part of the Job Maker Plan. It includes a range of key measures. But the commitment from government is to endeavour to assist all Australians uh, to get a job, the, all Australians who want a job to get a job. We have seen the numbers of women's jobs, uh, and that's a piece of gender analysis, Sen Senator, which I noticed that you're not particularly interested in, but we have seen the number of women's jobs uh, come back in a, uh, a positive, uh, on a positive trajectory, 61.8% since May, 276,000 women gaining employment of the 446 people who have gained employment since May. That's a very important part of this process, Senator, and one which enables women to, uh, to get back into those roles which are so important. Uh, I want to ask you about the Women's Economic Security Package. Um, why was the Women's Economic Security Statement not handed out with the budget papers in the media lockup or tabled in Parliament on Budget Day? Uh, Senator, um, the Women's Economic Security Statement, to the best of my recollection, and I stand to be corrected, it obviously was not my portfolio responsibility at the time. I don't, I don't recall if the 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement was tabled in Parliament um, as, a, as a formal document or not. Uh, I will check on that. I'm asking about the one <laughs> that was issued just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I understand that, but I'm, I'm saying I think it was treated in a similar way to the 2018 statement, but I will check on that, and if I'm wrong, right. I'll correct the record. So the Treasurer mentioned it in his uh, speech, but the document associated it with it wasn't available in the lockup. Can you explain why that is? As I understand it, Senator, I was under the impression that there were copies available in the lockup. Uh, one journalist tweeted that she had to go looking for it and she eventually found it and it had been printed out on a photocopier. Everything else was on glossy paper and ready to go. I ask again, why was the document not broadly available to the participants in the lockup? Ch Chair, if I may, uh, if I can come in, uh, Minister, if, uh, if I may. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of that in issue, Senator, we, the Women's Economic Security Statement itself is not actually a budget document. Mm -hmm. So for us in the Office for Women, we were aiming to have the glossy document ready to go when the Treasurer uh, started his budget speech on the Tuesday night. Uh, mm -hmm. So we were ready to have it on the website. We were ready to have uh, published copies. And then a decision was made uh, to assist journalists in the lockup uh, to actually give them a copy. And that is why uh, there were photocopied, uh, there were co photocopies of the WES uh, Senator. So we were aiming to give it out that night and then a decision was made to assist journalists in the lockup to give it and, and that, that's what happened. When was it decided that the Women's Economic Security Statement would be delivered with the budget, Minister? I don't recall the precise uh, date, Senator. I'll take that on notice and return to the committee. Mm. You gave an interview um, on the 4th of November indicating that the statement would be released following the budget. Who decided... Um, I, don't think it was the, I don't think it was the 4th of November. Uh, my November apologies, the 4th of October. Yes, Senator. I said I'll take the I'll take the question on notice and I'll return to the committee. Who made the decision to uh, hand it down with the budget? Was it the Treasurer or the Minister for Women? It was a decision of the government, Senator. Did you initiate that discussion, Minister Payne, or did uh, Mr. Frydenberg? It was a decision of government, Senator. I see. When the 2018 statement was formally launched, there was a press conference with the Prime Minister and the Minister for Women. Can I confirm that there has been no formal launch of the 2020 statement? Uh, I think the release of the 2020 statement, Senator, on uh, uh, coinciding with the budget um, is absolutely a uh, formal release of that document, Senator. Can you confirm that it hasn't been tabled in the Parliament? Well, Senator, I just said I would check on the uh, on whether that was 
the uh, case in 2018. I'm not sure. I don't recall, to be uh, to be clear. Uh, and uh, as you know, Senator, I was not present. Uh, in fact, I'm just trying to think of the. Uh, I was not present in the um, in the Parliament in the Budget Week, uh, given my uh, travel for which I am now speaking to you from uh, quarantine. Um, Senator McCusker, can I just, for time management purposes, check how you're going? The committee was due to go to a break at 3.30, which I've pushed back a bit. Um, obviously, we started later than we intended to with the Office for Women. Yes, I have more questions, but I, I have just a follow-up here, and then I am happy to go to a break and okay, we can and have a discussion. Okay, I know Senator Waters will have questions as well. Mm. Um, okay, why don't you finish, uh, Senator McCusker, and then we'll see where we are. Mm. Minister, this is actually my concern. The statement wasn't printed. It wasn't given to journalists on the budget night. It wasn't launched. It hasn't been tabled in the parliament. You weren't even in the country for the presentation of this document. Senator, My I concern not, is that Senator, this looks like an afterthought. There. If I could just stop you there, Senator. Are you suggesting that, uh, that I should not have been engaging in official travel on behalf of the Australian government? Because if you are, then I don't think that's a fair or appropriate suggestion, Senator. Minister, I am asking whether or not this statement was an afterthought. Absolutely it was not, not printed, Senator. it wasn't prioritised. In fact, the comprehensive nature of the government itself evidently shows you that it is so far from an afterthought that that is, uh, in fact, Senator, to those who have put a great deal of effort into its preparation, uh, that is, uh, I think, entirely unfair. You'll see that it contains a range of initiatives, uh, including initiatives that build on those from 2018 and a range of new initiatives. Uh, you'll see that its funding is uh, significantly uh, higher than the funding of the 2018 budget and endorsement and a growth of the 2018, not budget, I'm sorry, women's economic security statement, an endorsement and a growth of that women's economic security statement. And it complements the government's plans in terms of economic recovery in terms of job maker and in terms of the response to COVID-19 and in terms of um, the position of Australian women. It identifies five key priorities. It has a strategic uh, uh, focus which uh, shows you on, even in um, the very beginning of its Senator, about repairing and rebuilding women's workforce participation and further closing the gender pay gap, about greater choice and flexibilities for families to manage work and care about supporting women as leaders and positive role models, about responding to the diverse needs of women, about supporting women to be safe at home. Five key priorities. And for you to suggest, Senator, that this comprehensive women's economic security statement is an afterthought is entirely unfair. Minister, is it correct that you haven't done a single interview about the women's economic security statement or what's in the budget for women? Uh, Senator, I spoke to... Uh, ABC last week uh, in relation to a number of matters, including women's roundtables uh, that I held in uh, South Australia. Uh, the discussion on that occasion canvassed a number of, uh, of funding issues, mainly on that occasion, frankly, in relation to women's safety, but they were the questions that I was asked and they were the questions that I answered. Mm -hmm. Chair, I'm conscious that you wish to break, so we'll have a conversation. All right, just for the committee's time, time management, um, Senator Waters, how much time do you think you will need? Mm, maybe 20 minutes. Jeff. Okay. In, in that case, I think we should go to our break beforehand uh, and we'll come back to you uh, with the office for women um, because I think. The, uh, can I see other senators who have questions? 10 minutes from Senator Hughes. Yeah, we're definitely going to need to come back. Um, and I have some so the committee will take, uh, let's just take a 10 minute uh, break now. We'll return at uh, 3.50. We'll go to Senator Waters, then Senator Hughes, and uh, any more from Senator McCall. So if necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The committee will now resume and Senator Waters has the call. Thanks very much, Chair. Hi, Minister. Thanks for joining us and I hope that the audio um, will hold up okay at your end. Can, yes, I just, can I just start off by asking, do you agree that the impacts of the recent budget disproportionately affect women? The impacts of the budget? Yes. Uh, Senator, is that your view that you're putting to me? I'm asking whether you think the recent budget um, has a disproportionate impact on men by disproportionately uh, on women by disproportionately favouring men. 
Well, Senator, I think that you and I will be coming at this from a different um, direction. Uh, I think if the Commonwealth is accelerating personal income tax cuts to support low and middle income earners, then that, that is not a gendered initiative that, uh, that prioritises men over women or vice versa. Uh, it's an important initiative that enables uh, those Australians to uh, get some more support in their pockets, frankly, to get through what is a very difficult period. Uh, if we are talking about supporting business investment, the job trainer fund, the job maker hiring credit, they're not gendered initiatives, Senator. They are about stimulating the economy uh, in the context of the worst economic crisis that we have seen in generations for all Australians. Uh, in fact, as, uh, as has been said of budgets uh, before, the budgets, broadly speaking, are for all Australians. And what we have done in the context of this budget is to supplement, if you like, uh, the, uh, the efforts under uh, JobMaker uh, with the Women's Economic Security Statement. Mm. So, Minister, being um, willfully blind to existing gender inequality doesn't make it go away. Analysis of the budget shows that 0.03 per cent of the total spend on the budget is for women's economic security. There's no new money for family or domestic violence frontline uh, services. There's no money for older women who are the largest growing cohort of homeless, so there's no money for homeless services for that cohort. And the tax cuts will, by a 70% to 30% ratio, go to men. Do you still assert that the budget is not having an adverse impact on existing gender inequality? Uh, Senator, um, I strongly contend that the budget is for all Australians. The budget is about stimulating an economy and an economic recovery that responds to the crisis induced by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that requires us to stimulate the economy or to um, pursue economic recovery uh, across the board. Uh, it requires us to uh, ensure that uh, young Australians who have been impacted by the budget are able to receive the skills that they need uh, in uh, the future as they are trying to re-enter the workforce. Uh, it requires us to uh, have sought targeted focuses on a number of areas through the Women's Economic Security Statement, uh, and that is uh, part of the discussion that, uh, that obviously we have been having. Um, but driving jobs and driving economic recovery is a whole of government, whole of nation exercise. Uh, and that is what this budget is about, Senator. OK, but you're the Minister for Women. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, being blind to existing inequalities isn't Senator, being gender neutral. I reject neutral. that assertion. I reject that assertion. Uh, I reject the fact that, uh, that you would suggest anyone uh, is blind to those issues. Uh, we note clearly, uh, whether it's through the WINS economic security statement or elsewhere, uh, that we are more than acutely aware that the level at which we had uh, uh, seen women's workforce participation had reached a record high in January of this year, 61.5% that the gender pay gap had narrowed to a record low at the end of November 2019. Uh, that's a gap that had closed 3.4 percentage points since 2013. We know that since 2013, the 1.5 million jobs that were created in this country by hard-working businesses, 1.5 million jobs, 58.9% of those jobs went to Australian women. All of those are important factors that we want to make sure we can return to and exceed uh, in the context of the post-pandemic environment. So we are pleased to see those smaller green shoots. Uh, for example, the number of jobs that have been regained, jobs regained by women since May, 61.8% uh, of the jobs regained have been are held by women. 
These are obviously very difficult times, Senator. There is no question of that. Uh, but our focus is on making sure that the economic recovery benefits all Australians. Well, I dispute your suggestion about the jobs figures. In some cases, people are working for one hour and they're now being considered employed. So those figures conveniently don't address underemployment, but that's, a, that's an issue for another day. Do you, did you have any input into the leaked talking points about the budget's impact on women um, that came to light last Friday from the Prime Minister's office? Did, did you have any input into drafting those talking points? Uh, Senator, not personally, no. Right. Would that be something that you would normally have input on? Policies for women or talking points on women for the Prime Minister who then distributes them to others or is that his uh, sole bailiwick? Uh, Senator, these, um, these um, processes occur in a number of ways as they do across all governments, across all uh, systems. I'm not, uh, not specifically uh, involved in that process and, uh, and I wouldn't necessarily expect to be. Okay, so just to be clear, you don't help draft the talking points on issues in your portfolio that the Prime Minister then distributes? Me personally, Senator? Uh, no, I would not expect to. Uh, I would expect that there are conversations between officers. I would expect that there are conversations across government. Uh, and uh, I'm not, um, not sure, Senator, why you would personally be drafting those points? Well, I don't know. You're the Minister for Women, so I'm just I'm just asking. It's good to know that there's not a lot of input happening, sadly. Well, Senator, the, the Women's Economic Security Statement, the uh, uh, development uh, of that process, everything that it puts on the record in relationship uh, to uh, in relation to uh, to women to those uh, initiatives mm. uh, that build on the 2018 Women's Economic Security Yes, and what proportion statement. of the budget does that document receive? Senator, I don't understand the point of your question. 0.03%. Oh, so you're suggesting, Senator, is that your conflation? I'm sorry, I misunderstood you before. If you're suggesting that uh, the Women's Economic Security Statement represents the only initiatives in the budget uh, that have an impact on or a benefit to women, then that would be, I think, a very simplistic approach to take. Is it's this why you tell me women drive on roads? <laughs> it's quite clear in the statement, Senator, that uh, this is a, uh, a supplement, supplementary... Um, uh, I'm just trying to find the, uh, the exact uh, language, Senator. Um, supplementary to what? On it provides targeted support to create new opportunities for women. It talked about the investments which we have made since 2013, and I note you referred to, uh, to women's safety. As you're very well aware, Senator, the Commonwealth provided uh, in excess of an extra $100 million of funding in the course of this calendar year, part of it distributed in the second half of the year, to states and territories specifically in response to uh, COVID-19 women's safety issues. Uh, $130 million, in fact, plus an extra $20 million focused on both 1800 Respect and a number yes. of men's support lines so as on that, part of this response. On that, the women's safety sector have called for um, vastly more funding than was provided. They've suggested that $1 billion per year over 12 years is what's required to service the demand, and yet there was nothing in this budget and as you mentioned, there was a, a very small amount of roughly 150 million that was announced in March of this calendar year. Did either the Office for Women or you as the Minister make any forays or attempts to the Treasurer or the Prime Minister to make them aware of the size of the demand and the recommendation by the sector for a $1 billion per year for 12 years spend to keep women safe? Senator, there is strong ongoing funding, as you know, under the fourth National Action Plan. Uh, and in fact, this government has committed 
$340 million as its contribution towards the fourth action plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women uh, and Their Children. Uh, and as I said, the funding that, uh, the additional funding that we announced, $150 million, uh, has been allocated. 130 of that provided to the states and territories who support those organisations that are responding uh, on the front line. We've also, through this process, Senator, responded uh, in an initial sense to uh, the Respect at Work uh, report on sexual harassment, which is obviously a yes. fundamental in addressing women's safety and respect uh, for women. Yes. Uh, With respect, but, Minister, thank you. I, I am across the details of those earlier announcements, so forgive me for butting in, but time is limited. We don't talk about them very often, Senator, so I'm glad that you are. Um, were you made aware, uh, were you aware of the sector's calls for the quantum of $1 billion per year over 12 years as being what was needed uh, for keeping women safe. Was that a figure that you were aware of? I'm aware of a number of calls, Senator, that are made by stakeholders uh, across government um, and specifically in this area uh, from time to time on these issues. One of the reasons that we have held five meetings of the Women's Safety Minister's Council uh, this year has been about being responsive with the states and territories uh, to their needs uh, identified to the Commonwealth uh, through discussions with Minister Rustin and uh, and with me uh, in uh, in responding to these issues. Interestingly, Senator, um, in a uh, in a roundtable on women's safety that I was involved in uh, last week in South Australia, one of the participants did note that uh, that funding helped her organisation particularly respond quickly and expeditiously to. Uh, elevated levels of, uh, of uh, requests for help and support in the COVID context, uh, which I thought was very important feedback, frankly. So the feedback from the sector that they need a billion dollars a year over 12 years, did that feedback reach you or not? Um, I've said, Senator, that I receive um, feedback regularly. Those submissions are made. Um, but, Senator, in the context of, uh, of this budget, in the context of COVID-19, uh, both the contribution through the uh, Fourth National Action Plan and the contribution through the COVID-19 uh, response, which was announced uh, in March, are, are not actually contributions that I think should be ignored. Um, you, you seem to wish to, but they're not the contributions that I think should be ignored. Have you been briefed on the uh, gender analysis of the budget prepared by the National Foundation of Australian Women that was um, released, I think it was this morning? Uh, not uh, in detail, Senator. The, I must say the South Australian representative of the National Foundation of Australian Women was a participant in, uh, in one of our discussions in South Australia last week, but uh, not specifically in detail, Senator, no. OK, have the Office for Women briefed themselves on that and might they do the same to the Minister soon? Uh, Senator, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we got the email about that at around one o'clock last night. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I might say had only just logged off uh, and uh, so missed it when it came in. Uh, and uh, I have passed it to the Minister's office this morning. But as uh, uh, given that we were coming here, we have not provided uh, full briefing on that, given that we have just got it. So. OK, so you haven't done any briefing yet or you haven't done a full briefing yet? As I say, it came in at about one o'clock yes. in the morning last night. Yes. Yeah, I heard that bit, yeah. but you said you hadn't done a full briefing yet. Well, I, I passed it on. So, so this okay. morning, uh, as soon as I saw it, I, I passed it on to the minister's office to give them a heads up about the fact that this, uh, that the gender lens uh, on the budget had come through yes. from the National Foundation, uh, and uh, we will obviously take a look at it, Senator. OK. Um, is it of concern um, to you, Minister, that it's taken a, a, a not-for-profit um, women's group to undertake a gender analysis of the budget rather than the government themselves doing that work? Senator, as I said uh, in response to questions from uh, Senator McAllister, uh, the government's strong view is that this is a budget for all Australians, uh, all Australians who require support in training, in skills development, uh, in business and in enabling their businesses to survive so they are able to employ other Australians uh, through the context of, um, of the uh, economic recovery uh, from the pandemic. The budget for all Australian Senator. Minister, I am very you... pleased that we were able to release the Women's Economic Security Statement uh, as well, Senator, but that does not detract from the fact that uh, this is a budget that is directed to supporting 
uh, all Australians. Minister, do you support the resurrection of the women's budget impact statement, which we'd had for approximately 30 years prior to 2014 when Tony Abbott axed it? Um, so, Nadia, you've asked me this question before. Mm. Um, I know that there is a, a degree of, uh, of interest in it. I've actually uh, read um, through through time uh, a number of, uh, of those documents. I think they uh, vary significantly in terms of, uh, of their value. Uh, and in terms of this budget, uh, I think that the Women's Economic Security Statement uh, does uh, a better job than uh, a women's budget statement uh, in many places to summarise the, uh, the context of the budget, the circumstances in which we find ourselves, uh, and uh, the initiatives that are taken under the West itself. West itself. Okay, many um, economists and analysts have said throughout COVID that investment in early childhood education was the key to women's economic security, a view that I concur with. Um, what advocacy, if any, did the Office for Women um, or indeed the Minister do in the lead up to the budget to secure funding for early childhood education, additional funding? Uh, Senator, these are issues which are discussed regularly through um, government, um, between departments, uh, between um, uh, portfolio areas, uh, and in relation to uh, to matters such as uh, as budgets. But, Senator, I would remind you and remind the committee that this government only reformed the childcare system in 2018, uh, and our reforms which uh, have been in place for a relatively short period of time, are absolutely about providing significant financial support to Australian families and particularly lower to middle income families. Uh, we are investing at record levels in childcare. In fact, uh, providing over $9 billion a year through the childcare subsidy. And importantly, more than 70% of Australian families accessing childcare, Senator, pay no more than $5 an hour for that access, uh, for that care, and more than 20%, I think 24, if I'm not mistaken, more than 24% of families pay no more than $2 an hour, Senator. So our focus in supporting lower and middle income families results in those sorts of uh, levels of access, which we think is very, very important for those families. Uh, and for the sector. Um, Senator Waters, you're coming up to the 20 minutes you indicated okay. you needed. Could I just have maybe three more minutes and then okay. I'll wrap up? Yep. Thanks, Chair. Um, Minister, you, I'm sure you're across the fact that New South Wales is now proposing to criminalise coercive control um, after, in fact, in fact, it's a multi-partisan approach. Is there any discussion being had um, either within the Office for Women or at any other level, about a national approach to coercive control? Uh, Senator, I think uh, I've seen those announcements by uh, the New South Wales Attorney-General, which uh, I think is, uh, is an important step. Uh, the states and territories obviously have the legal levers uh, that uh, enable um, those actions to be criminalised. Uh, I think it's an important initiative on behalf of New South Wales. Uh, and it's a matter which I would expect the Attorney General's department to take the lead on, Senator. Okay, I'll take it up with them. Um, uh, just one final question. I'll put a few on notice. Um, this is to the, uh, the folk at the table here. The budget statements show expenses for the Office of Women to deliver outcome one, which is a policy advice and support outcome, declining across the Fords, starting at uh, about $26,000 in 2021 and dropping down to basically seven and a half, uh, sorry, million in 23-24. What, what's the explanation for that pretty drastic reduction in funding? Yeah, so Minister, what that, the story that that's telling is actually a huge increase in funding. So one of the uh, major measures in the Women's Economic Security Statement is a new women at work measure. Uh, it's a $50 million measure. $47.9 million of that is expanding the existing women's leadership development program. Uh, and so the, the current program sits around four or five million dollars, like one of my team could correct me. Uh, and uh, so what you're seeing there in the forwards is that there is a big injection this year, uh, given what the government uh, has been making very clear that job creation is 
the major focus for right here and right now, that in terms of the way we profiled that additional $47.9 million, that as I say, will be a, a major grant program so that we can be providing it to organisations who can boost women's uh, job opportunities, uh, that we've put a big boost in in the first year, and then basically we've profiled it across the forwards, but it's profiling that additional $47.9 million across the forwards. Okay. So can I just ask... Sorry, Margaret Thomas, the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. I uh, just wanted to uh, make a slight correction to Ms Hawkins's reference to the Women's Leadership and Development Program. For this financial year, it's $3.389 million. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So what is the level of funding for Outcome 1 in 1920? The level of funding for the whole of PMC? No, for outcome third. one in 1920. So I can compare the figures that I've got with what's happening at the minute. So uh, if I understand your question, if you're asking about what Office for Women would have had in the previous budget, so 1920 compared to here. So Ms Thomas has just, you know, I was giving you a bit of a global sense of what the existing administered funding for that Women's Leadership and Development Program is. And what did you say? Three. $3.389 million? Yes. Look, yeah. I'm less interested in that specific program. I'm sure it's meritorious. I'm interested in the money that you get to do your job got you. to advise the minister. Got you, got you. So, so the table that you were reading up before was about the administered funding. So in terms of the departmental funding, uh, the ASL for the Office for Women this year is uh, 34.5. That is an increase, Senator, from last year, where the ASL, the average staffing level for the Office for Women last year was 28.4. So that increase of 6.1 ASL is for two things. So one, it gives us a couple of additional uh, staff to manage that major uh, boost in the Women's Leadership Development Program grants program that I've just referenced. Uh, and the other uh, part of that 6.1 additional ASL is additional funding for us, given the uh, additional workload that we have. Uh, this year has been a very has been a very busy year. COVID has uh, increased the workload of the office and various other things. Right. Is the time? Thanks for that. Is the time use survey still on track to be rolled out in 2021 as previously planned? So the Australian Bureau of Statistics is progressing the time use survey, and I just might ask Mrs Thomas to give us a bit more information. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yes, Senator. I met with the Australian Bureau of Statistics last week mm -hmm. and can confirm that the time use survey is on track. Uh, they've been undertaking dress rehearsals, uh, needing to adjust the way in which they conduct the survey during COVID. Uh, and obviously they're, they're just making sure that the surveying can occur in a safe as possible way for both the surveyors and the recipients, but that is that is on track. Okay, and lastly, because thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. Actually, two quick ones, if I could. Um, Very quickly, please. Thank you. The economic statement refers to progress on facilitating the splitting of super in separation proceedings. What What is that progress? What's happening in that space, as briefly as you can? The, uh, so the, the Treasury is the responsible agency for that, for those programs. So uh, I would recommend referring those questions to Treasury about the progress. Okay, so even they though have, it's in the Women's Economic Statement, Security Statement, that, so that, that bit's was a 2018. By yeah, so it was a 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement measure, and they're in, they are in progress. Okay. Uh, but the details of which uh, the Treasury I'll take will it up be able Treasury. to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Provide. And lastly, is there any consideration, Minister, being given to whether there should be a Women's Economic Security Advisory Council um, sim similar to the Women's Safety Ministers Forum? Oh, We've just lost your that. audio, Minister. We can still see you, but we Sorry, can't hear. That's not better. that's been specifically. I, I was trying to mute the sound of an acrobatic plane, which appears to be across my, over my house. Um, the could you repeat the question? Sorry, Senator. Yes, is there any consideration being given to having a Women's Economic Security Advisory Council, um, much like we have a Women's Safety Council? Uh, no, Senator. I think that the, uh, the work that uh, is done through the uh, uh, National Cabinet process uh, and through the, uh, the various um, committees uh, and supports attached to that 
uh, takes a whole of government approach uh, to these issues. But uh, in terms of those matters which were elevated to uh, councils of the COAG, um, particularly uh, Indigenous issues and women's safety issues, uh, they are two areas where a special task force has been retained uh, following the changes to the national cabinet process. Okay, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister Payne, I'd like to ask you some questions with regards to uh, ease safety and cyber security and uh, cyber bullying, particularly around women. But I'm just a little bit concerned and maybe a little bit offended actually about some of the questioning we've just heard. So I just wondered if you could cover off a few things for me. I just wondered whether the job keeper and job seeker and job maker provisions are just for men. Uh, Senator, no. No, okay. And uh, do you know if females take up apprenticeships at all? Or is it just uh, something that males do? Look, Senator, they, uh, they most certainly do. And you'll see that a number of the initiatives in the uh, Women's Economic Security Statement, for example, those uh, related to STEM and those related to uh, the program run by the Master Builders of Australia are about encouraging uh, women and girls uh, to go into uh, areas of, uh, of work that are um, more strongly remunerated, uh, that uh, will uh, in include uh, the ability to, uh, in part, address gender pay inequality issues that, to, uh, that we see. Uh, the Master Builders program is a very interesting one mm. in relation to women in trades, uh, one which uh, I have seen uh, reported on recently, uh, and uh, we would encourage... Uh, anyone in those industries, uh, and particularly anyone with the capacity to encourage the participation of women and girls in STEM, to have a look at some of the, initi the initiatives in the Women's Economic Security Statement for exactly that reason. Mm. And how about entrepreneurs and business owners and employers? Are they only men as well? Uh, well, self-evidently not, Senator, and we have uh, a significant number of women who lead small and medium businesses mm. in this country. It's an ever-increasing number of women. One of the important aspects of the provision of uh, job keeper to, uh, to Australian businesses uh, has been to ensure that many of those businesses have been able to survive in the extraordinary times of COVID-19 and keep their workforce connected with them. As I said, 1.7 million women receiving the JobKeeper payment uh, in that context uh, so that when they are able to reopen, when they are able to, uh, to return to, uh, to business uh, in the recovery phase, those staff still have been able to survive through the process with some support from JobKeeper, uh, but also those employers are able to, uh, to bring those staff back online and make sure they can get back to work. Mm. And also when it comes to childcare, um, would the Office of Women consider or yourself consider childcare to be a women's issue or more broadly a family issue, productivity uh, issue? Well, I think the Productivity Commission uh, report made very clear that uh, childcare is an issue for for families, uh, broadly speaking, and uh, the work that uh, we have done in that reform process has particularly focused on low and middle income families uh, to ensure that the barriers to workforce participation uh, that existed for them because of the, uh, the costs of, uh, of childcare are supported through the provision of the childcare subsidy. As I said, seven, over 70% of, uh, of Australian families in receipt of the subsidy paying no more than $5 an hour for childcare and more than 20% of Australian families paying no more than $2 an hour. That level of accessibility for low and middle income families uh, is a very important precursor to their um, ability to increase their workforce participation. Mm. Thank you, Minister, and I guess uh, that might uh, help encourage others to understand that the budget was actually for all Australians, not just one gender of Australians. Uh, but as I said, I did want to just have a quick discussion with you, if I could, and I am conscious of time, around cyberbullying and the rise uh, of particularly this occurring to women and older women, and just wondered if you could outline um, any of the work that you've been undertaking in this area uh, and what sort of uh, programs have been developed to have a look at that. 
Um, thanks, Senator, and I particularly want to commend the work of uh, Julie Inman Grant, uh, the eSafety Commissioner. Her role falls within um, the portfolio of the Minister for Communications and the Arts, Minister Fletcher, but uh, she is a very, very willing supporter uh, in uh, the work that, uh, that we are doing through the Office of Women uh, and that I have done um, in a number of, uh, of instances uh, in terms of, uh, of online safety. Uh, it is about protecting Australians, um, men and women, girls and boys, uh, from online harm. There is an initiative uh, in the budget, an important initiative, Senator, uh, over $39 million uh, for the eSafety Commissioner to enable her and her team uh, to respond to what is a very sustained increase in uh, demand for their programs uh, and resources. Uh, to help them fulfil additional roles under the proposed new Online Safety Act uh, and to support Australians, particularly with a strong and effective regulatory framework that will underpin their ability to work, uh, to learn, to engage uh, online. Um, this is in addition to the, uh, the boost that the government announced in June of this year, which was a $10 million funding boost to assist the eSafety Commissioner to respond to uh, an increased demand in support for uh, for support during COVID-19. All of these, Senator, go to uh, to show what a very complex environment it is to navigate online uh, for uh, for girls and boys, uh, for women in particular who are dealing with uh, some of the most extreme uh, extremes of uh, behaviour directed at them through social media. Uh, and I think it's uh, essential that we enable those Australians uh, to access the support that the eSafety Commissioner uh, can uh, can provide. We've seen uh, a number of um, penalties uh, enhanced, developed under the Enhancing Online Safety Act, uh, and there, as I said, a number of outstanding um, reforms to online safety legislation uh, which are to come to the Parliament. Uh, the sorts of... Um, extreme behaviours that we've seen uh, demonstrated through the media recently and particularly through online dating uh, um, platforms uh, would be subject to, uh, to those as well. So uh, I know that for uh, a lot of members of parliament, both women and men, uh, that, uh, that this is uh, an issue of significant concern uh, and it is one which uh, the East Safety Commissioner with the support of the government is, uh, is doing a very good job in, uh, in addressing. Um, Ms Hawkins uh, may have more to add on that, Senator, but there are a number of the points that I would make. Thank you, Minister. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm just looking at the, the various points. I think that, uh, as, this, as the Minister has said, uh, our colleague Julie Inman Grant is doing a, an absolutely excellent job there as the eSafety Commissioner. I think uh, her work has been has been particularly important during COVID, given that we saw some pretty disturbing spikes uh, in online harm that was happening uh, that we can only surmise because so many people were were at home. Uh, as the eSafety Commissioner says that technology is used for both good and ill, uh, and definitely we saw it being used for some ill uh, during the COVID period. Uh, it, it is why during COVID, in advance of that money that the Minister said, the 39.4 mil for the eSafety Commissioner uh, that came out of this 2020-21 budget, that was in addition to uh, money that the government invested in the eSafety Commissioner during COVID. So there was that additional $10 million funding boost uh, to help the eSafety Commissioner respond to that increased demand during COVID-19. Uh, in terms of uh, the eSafety Commissioner's role, uh, they do play an important role in terms of their successful reporting and takedown mechanism so that they can be removing cyberbullying material that's aimed at children, uh, that they can be, uh, they have this reporting and takedown mechanism to remove intimate images that are shared without consent uh, and also remove prohibited and, and illegal online material. So there are, there are quite a range, as the Minister says, of, uh, of important work that the eSafety Commissioner is doing, Senator. No, thank you. And I'll hand back, Chair, in conscious Thanks, of time. Thanks, Senator Hughes. I appreciate that. Um, Senator McAllister, did you have any further questions for the Office Women? I do. Very 
quick set of questions. Yeah, it would be good if it was. So and I will on. move through it as rapidly as I can. Thank I'm just you. interested in the women's project grants um, under the 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement. Who approves those grants? Uh, Senator, if you're referring to the Women's Leadership and Development Program, um, the Minister for Women is the decision maker for those. Uh, the Office for Women conducts the relevant assessments uh, mm -hmm. in relation to the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act and the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines and then briefs the Minister accordingly. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about one particular grant that was approved on the 5th of April in 2019, just a couple of days before the federal election was called, and that is a $2.2 million grant to COSBOA. What was the purpose of that grant? Uh, Senator, again, we just have we do have so many grants. Could you just give us a little bit more information? It just it, it predated us being in the role. So could you just give us a little bit more information about which one it is? Well, I'm going with the material that's on the internet, but uh, it's under the Women's Projects Grants. It's a Women's Leadership and Development Grant. It uh, relates to Output 1.1. It was provided to COSBOA, which is the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia. It was valued at 2.2 million, and the approval date was the 5th of April 2019. Uh, yes, Senator, that was actually a, a 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement measure. Uh, it was referred to in the statement at the time as the Future Female Entrepreneurs Program. Uh, and it has subsequently had a, a name change and it is referred to as the Academy for Enterprising Girls uh, and that's what that grant refers to. I see. And why was it awarded on the eve of the election? I believe uh, we, I would have to go back and check but my understanding is it just would have been uh, a case of needing the grant to be established uh, in order for it to be executed but it was certainly uh, a Women's Economic Security 2018 measure. I see. According to the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines, grant awards need to be published on Grant Connect within 21 days of a grant agreement taking effect. That's correct? Mm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Why was this grant to COSBOA published over a year later on the 7th of September 2020? I would have to take on that on notice, Senator. Is it correct? I mean, that's the publication date on the online database. Is that correct, that that was the date it was published? Senator Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy Group. Um, none of us here at the table were actually in the office at the time. So if you will allow us, we'll take it on notice and get back to you with the specific information that you're seeking. I'd like to know if any action has been taken in a, as a result of such an extended delay between grant allocation of the grant and publication of the so That's an additional question on notice. It is an additional okay, question. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Can I ask about another grant to COSBOA for 5.5 million approved on the 2nd of October under the same program? What is this no, grant for? No, we can do this one. No, we can do it. Yeah, do you have information on that one, Senator? Yes, certainly. So this, uh, this grant, was to continue funding for the Academy for Enterprising Girls. Its funding was for the 2019-20 financial year and as part of uh, Women at Work, which was one of the uh, measures within the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement, the Academy for Enterprising Girls has received additional funding through that measure, uh, given its high impact in terms of providing uh, amazing support to young girls and women, encouraging them into STEM and entrepreneurial positions. Uh, this year alone, even with COVID, they've had 5,000 girls go through the program uh, and through Women at Work, they've received additional funding. I see. Um, and that was approved by the Minister? That's correct. Okay. What's the percentage of funding that COSBOA receives uh, under the grant program? Senator, we have to take that on notice. How does it compare to other recipients? Well, Senator, I, I really would have to take it on notice. Yeah. I am interested in the extent to which this program um, 
is being used for this organisation relative to other organisations that might apply or be interested in receiving funding. Has the um, Academy been formally evaluated? It, the program, uh, as I mentioned, was only launched at the end of last year. Uh, and so it is still too, too soon for a formal evaluation. However, certainly under the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines, uh, they are required to submit performance reports and we can confirm that they have indeed met all the relevant requirements under their performance reports uh, and certainly have also provided a lot of feedback in terms of the impact it's having in terms of young girls being able to establish uh, new businesses and come up with business ideas. Has an evaluation framework for this particular program been established? I believe it has, however I'll take that on notice just to 100% confirm, but I believe that is worked into the, the funding agreement. Can you please table the evaluation framework for this program? Can you also please table any particular, um, the specific performance metrics that are attached to both the first and the second grant that's been provided to the Academy for Enterprising Girls? Certainly we'll take that on notice, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McAllister. Uh, if there are no further questions for the Office Women, thank you very much for your attendance uh, and your evidence here today. Uh, and the committee will now move to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. I believe these witnesses are all joining us via video conference. Um, so we might just have a short suspension to assist them to uh, join the committee. Yes, Chair, they're all interstate. will now resume and I welcome via video conference the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, uh, including Ms Libby Lyons, uh, who's joined us uh, from Perth, uh, and officers who've joined us from Sydney. Um, could I ask, uh, I won't ask you to state your names and positions for the Hansard record now, we'll just do that uh, if and when questions are directed to you or when you'd like to add to an answer. Um, but Ms Lyons, I'd just like to ask if you'd wish to make an opening statement. I do, Chair. Uh, if you could keep it brief for time and technological reasons, that yep. would be most sure. appreciated. Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Libby Lyons, Director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And uh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be able to provide the committee with an update on the work of the agency. Since our last appearance, the agency, as with all workplaces, has had to rapidly adapt to new circumstances due to the COVID-19 pandemic. All agency staff moved from our Sydney CBD premises to remote working arrangements from March 2020. And although these arrangements are still largely in place with approximately 30 to 40% of staff now transitioning back to the office. The most significant challenge, however, for the period has been to ensure the successful collection of the 2019-20 data set. Under normal circumstances, Employers provide their data to the agency between 1 April and 30 May each year. Given the significant disruption that most employers were facing during this period, the agency made a number of arrangements to support employers to meet their reporting obligations and to ensure that there was minimal impact on the collection of this very important data. We were keen to ensure that the data set was sufficiently accurate and robust in size to maintain trend data. To that end, we delayed the start of the reporting period to May 1 and extended the reporting deadline from May 30 to 31 July. I'm pleased to advise the committee that despite the challenges faced by employers as a result of COVID-19, this year we have the biggest data set we have collected to date. Today, the compliance rate sits at about 98% which is just a 1% 1, 1 variation on previous years. The data collected this year is so important as it will measure the state of gender equality in the Australian private sector just prior to the impact of COVID-19. And it will provide us with an all important baseline for comparison on the impact of COVID-19 and, and the impact it may have on workplaces in the years to come. The agency is also currently finalising the analysis of this year's data ahead of its release in November this year. 
In addition to this, the agency is well progressed on the development of our new online reporting system that's due to be in place in time for reporting in April 2021. The project remains on schedule and on budget. The project team will soon commence a pilot of the system with employers who are applying for this year's employer of choice for gender equality citation. They will be the first to access and test the system. A wider pilot with a small group of employers is scheduled for later in the year with all components of the system to be verified. We're looking forward to the new system as it will improve the reporting experience for employers and also allow us to commence the collection of data from public sector organisations on a voluntary basis. The build of this new system will also allow us to include some additional voluntary data points, which will greatly improve the depth of analysis we can produce, such as gender pay gaps by location or region, as well as by age. I know many members of the committee will also be interested in this new data, and we look forward to being able to offer employers and the public an even more detailed picture of workplace gender equality. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Lyons. Uh, Senator McAllister, are you seeking the call? Uh, yes, I am. Um, Ms Lyons, I really wanted to ask you about She's Priceless. Um, it's a document that I've used a lot um, over my time in the parliament, and I find it very valuable. And you must be very proud of Wajia's contribution to the latest version. Um, in your forward, you say you hope that the insights and recommendations will play a valuable part in driving the impetus for change, and our children deserve nothing less. I wanted to talk to you th about some of the aspects in the executive summary in the main report. Do you have a copy of that um, report? I don't have it in front of me, Minister, but I can probably find it if you give me a couple of minutes. I bought you a copy, but sadly, uh, transmitting it under the current circumstances is not easy. Uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, I am in Perth and uh, it's not easy to leave Western Australia quite, quite yet. Um, if one of my team is online, could you email me a copy so that I can uh, get it up, please, on my screen? It's on its way, apparently, Senator, so give me a couple of minutes. Thanks very much. Um, and if it's any assistance, I was hoping um, to go to page 13 of the short report. Okay. I will also put um, Ms Bradenhoff on notice too, because she was very involved in the work that was done with Cheese Priceless, and so she may be able to help. Do you have it in front of you, Ms Bradenhoff? Janine? Yes. Yes. You do? Yes. Okay, well, Would you like to ask your first question while I'm waiting? <laughs> that sounds good, Ms Lyons. Let's give it a go. Um, so on page 13 yeah. of the short report, um, you know, the, the report is organised by looking at the underlying drivers of the pay gap. And on page 13, it looks at the primary underlying driver associated with care, family responsibilities and workforce participation. Um, and it lists, it, it suggests that 39% of the gender pay gap is due to these factors. Um, there is a list of ideas here or policy solutions that would affect change. They include improving work-life balance, increasing the availability of flexible work, increasing the availability of childcare or decreasing cost, enhancing availability and uptake of shared parental care, uh, reducing disincentives to participation through changes to tax, family payment and childcare support systems. Are you aware of any of those solutions being included in the budget this year, Ms Lyons? I think there are a number of initiatives in the budget that, that look to some of these issues, but if you're talking specifically to those, then there are no specific actions to my knowledge, Senator. Mm. Uh, that would be good. I mean, I think it would be useful for you to maybe reflect on it and provide on notice whether there are any of these opportunities to affect change in the new budget initiatives for this year. Um, in the longer version of the report, um, 
which you, I accept you may not have with you and we might have to ask um, one of your colleagues to answer on this one. Um, on page 13 down the bottom, it says that the government subsidy system continues to penalise families where there are two parents in full-time work. For many Australian families, this impacts more on women than men due to persistence in the gendered nature of care. More women than men work part-time, and if women increase the number of days worked, there are financial disincentives through increased tax, lost payments and out-of-pocket childcare costs. Um, does would you have any insights about the impact that this dynamic has on workforce composition and women's decision to return to work? More broadly, we do know that, um, you know, it, we've stated on the record quite publicly, Senator, that childcare, along with other things, is a barrier to women returning to the workforce, particularly after taking parental leave. So we do know that it is a benefit, but as to the actual figures, KPMG did, um, did the bulk of the work around the, um, this report, uh, Senator, and uh, pro produced the, the figures. And uh, Ms Bradenhoff, I think you worked, um, you oversaw some of that work. Did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, Libby. No, I have nothing to add to that. The report goes on to say, as the policy landscape continues to evolve, it will remain important to focus on interactions between Australian personal income tax, family payment and childcare support systems to ensure that these do not deter Australian women with young children from increasing their workforce participation. That remains true, doesn't it? I think any uh, tax system evolves over time. It has to evolve over time and it has to take into account all cohorts in the community. So the tax system evolves. We're seeing tax changes happen now uh, and, and, and they continue to evolve. We need to see all policies continue to evolve. And, uh, uh, Minister, is there anything in the budget that addresses that interaction between personal income tax, family payments and childcare support systems? Sorry, Senator, there's a, a, it is very difficult, but um, there are, uh, there's a complex, uh, sorry, let me withdraw that. There is a series of initiatives in the budget uh, that are uh, overwhelmingly focused on economic recovery in the context of, uh, of COVID 2019 uh, and what we need to do to get uh, jobs back into, uh, into business, as it were, and people into those jobs. Uh, whether it is across uh, the payment system, whether it is uh, through the income tax uh, cuts, whether it is through the very significant funding that the Commonwealth already provides in terms of childcare, uh, over $9 billion uh, in, the, uh, in the current context, as I said in response to, uh, I think, Senator Waters uh, earlier. Uh, a whole range of initiatives, Senator, around skills, around training, around um, supporting businesses to invest, uh, and create jobs. So, Senator, um, to the best of my uh, hearing uh, at the moment, uh, and endeavouring to respond. Thanks, Minister. I will leave it there because I am genuinely sympathetic about the audio problem, uh, but it might be something we can come back to at another time. Thank you. Of course. Thanks, Senator McAllister. Senator Waters. Thanks for um, persisting with the tech and, and joining us here today. Uh, Ms Lyons, you had expressed concern that COVID would set back the gender pay gap and uh, the Women's Finance Index estimates that every month of COVID pushed back the time to achieve gender pay equity by 12 months. Um, did Wajia meet with Treasury to discuss these concerns and how they could be addressed in the budget? No. Okay. Um, and do the measures set out in the budget address your concerns about the impact on the gender pay gap? I, I think, look, we constantly monitor what is happening with the gender pay gap, Senator, and I think it remains to be seen what will happen. What we have done is looked at what has happened in previous uh, economic downturns. We know what happened during the GFC, so we are continuing to monitor it. And I would have to say that there is um, a, a very big role that the private sector must play here in terms of maintaining uh, the, the gender pay gap 
um, the stability of the gender pay gap or keep driving it down even. And that is by continually monitoring their gender pay gaps in their organisations and taking action where they know they have problems. So uh, if, if every employer in Australia did that, we would continue to see the gender pay gap decline. Okay, thank you. Um, did Wajia gather or commission any data regarding the impact on women of the early access to superannuation uh, rules? Did, did we gather any data around that? Yes. No. no. Okay. Um, what were the, um, in brief, because we're, we're up against the clock, unfortunately, what were some of the key findings from the 2019-20 Wajia report that you would like to draw to our attention? Uh, we are still analysing the data from, that's been collected this year and that will be released in November, late November this year, Senator. Okay. Can and you I give can us any flavour? Any, all right. Any sort of uh, well, sneak peek flavours? It, <laughs> I'd love to be able to, but we're still analysing the data. What I can tell you is it's the largest data set to date mm -hmm. uh, and that the compliance rate pleasingly it uh, was 98% and we thank every employer for the efforts that they have made under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. Okay, um, I was going to ask about the compliance um, rate. So thanks for mentioning that it's 98%. Um, can I just ask how many actual companies does that represent that fail to meet their reporting requirements? Uh, there are, so there are a number, and again, the number changes every day because just because an employer doesn't put their report in by the date that we require doesn't mean that they don't become compliant as they put a report in. So the number changes every day. Um, uh, currently, we have, um, so um, I think it's 145 organisations are non compliant, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sydney office, could you confirm that number, please? Do you have it in front of you? I can see uh, it. It's and the corporation manager. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so 145 currently are non compliant. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, did would you write to any of those companies saying that they intended to publish their name on the non compliant list? And of those written to, did any um, then? You know, hastily pull their socks up so that they could avoid such a um, public naming. We write to every organisation who uh, has a report outstanding to us on a regular basis mm -hmm. and at regular intervals uh, that is specified under the Act. So it happens every year. Uh, generally speaking, most employers are very um, proactive in once they receive, once the CEO receives such a letter. Unfortunately, many of those that are non-compliant at the moment are what we would call serial non-compliant organisations. So they've been non-compliant for a number of years, mm. and despite all efforts, they won't. They they're not interested in complying with the act. Could I ask on notice for you to provide us a list of those um, long-term non-compliance um, folks? I'm, I know you put that in your various reports, but perhaps. Um, if you wouldn't mind assisting us with just collating those those sort of worst offenders. Um, I had asked the Parliamentary Library to analyse the number of non-compliant companies who were still receiving Commonwealth Government grants. And because of the slight disjunct with reporting times, it was a difficult comparison for them to make. But it seems as if there's 30 companies um, that continue to receive government grants, even though they're not meeting their Wajia reporting requirements. Has Wajia done any analysis of um, uh, how many tender documents require compliance with Wajia reporting? Um, look, we work very closely with, uh, we have procurement principles in place and we work very closely with the Department of Finance and other departments on those procurement principles uh, every year. Towards the end of the year, uh, we I write to the secretaries of every department, alerting them to the fact that there are a number of organisations that are non-compliant and the fact that some of them may be uh, may be doing business with them. Uh, I would have to say, on the whole, the secretaries are very um, responsive to that letter and do whatever they can. And we have, on occasions, seen employers very quickly contact us in order to comply. So 
Uh, we also write, um, uh, last year I also wrote to the uh, offices of the Ministers for Women across the states as well to advise them of uh, organisations that were non-compliant at a state level. So we, we do a lot to try and uh, ensure that we get high compliance rate and that those who are non-compliant um, are being held to account in terms of government contracts. Thank you. And just lastly on that point, is Widgia consulted by government when government plans a tender or a contract to a company that has failed to comply with Widgia reporting requirements? Has government come to you actively and um, discuss the matter? Uh, not to me personally. I, I wouldn't have thought so, Senator, but I do know, I do know that in most situations um, the tender documents have a checkbox that says, are you compliant with the work document? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I, I would ask um, Ms Beath, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, as part of the process, we have See there, but I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm afraid we're not hearing your audio in a in an audible way. Um, so I'm sorry about sorry about that. Would you mind no. popping that in writing and sending that to us? We're hearing Ms. Lyons quite clearly, um, but I just didn't catch that last uh, contribution. So if you wouldn't mind popping that in um, yeah, on, notice. Uh, on notice, that would be great. I'm just conscious that I'm um, quite almost to the end of my time. Um, just a quick question uh, that I notice in the budget papers as a reference to own sourced revenue of 130,000 for Wajia. What, what does that relate to? That relates, Senator, to the fee um, that is paid by organisations who apply for an employer of choice gender equality citation, and it literally covers the administrative costs of administrating that program, which is quite laborious. Okay, thank you. And then just lastly, um, from me, your upgraded uh, reporting program, which I understand is uh, hopefully due to be completed, uh, I think it's early next year, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong on that, and will facilitate uh, voluntary reporting by the public sector and other small and medium organisations, which is a, a move that I strongly support. Um, given your strategic priorities to expand your reach and impact, have you got a plan around encouraging voluntary reporting? And will you be advocating for the mandatory extension of the reporting um, to the public sector? So a couple of things there, Senator. Firstly, uh, the new system will go live on the first day of reporting next year, which is the 1st of April, 2021. On the issue of voluntary reporting of the public sector, uh, the agency has um, been in touch with a number of federal and state government agencies, uh, and they are very interested in voluntary reporting. Uh, we have currently have a list of uh, over 28 uh, federal and state government agencies who are keen to report into us on a voluntary basis. We will be doing a pilot, a voluntary reporting pilot, um, over the next um, six months or so, and we have some organisations already, uh, agencies signed up or, or, or have provided us with interest in completing that. So. I would have to say that uh, interest is uh, very keen at this stage at uh, a state and federal level. Thank you. And just that final part of the question, will you be advocating for the public sector to be um, mandatorily required to report? It's my understanding, Senator, and you would have to seek um, legal advice on this, but it is my understanding that the Commonwealth cannot mandate that state agencies reporting to us. I mean Commonwealth agencies. We're working, we're speaking um, regularly with the APSC on, um, on, on the federal government agencies reporting in. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much, Ms Lyons, and your team also. Thank Thanks, you. Chair. Thanks, Senator Waters. Uh, if there are no further questions for Wajia, I thank you very much for your time and your evidence today. And Minister, thank you in particular for persisting through those technical difficulties. Uh, we're very grateful for that. Thank you, Chair. Can I thank the officials as well? It's difficult to do this remotely uh, and uh, difficult to even be in the room when you're 
when your minister and other officials are not. So uh, I just want to thank the team from the Office of Women and, and from Wajia. And I want to thank the committee for bearing with us, Chair. Thank you. I think we got there in the end uh, imperfectly as it might have been, but we got there in the end. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Witnesses. Um, thank you, the committee uh, is now moving to the National Drought and North Queensland Flood Response and Recovery Agency. Um, we'll just have a short suspension to allow the Minister, Senator Seselja, to return and join us alongside the Witnesses. Okay, the committee will now resume and I welcome uh, back Senator Seselja as Assistant Minister for Finance representing the Prime Minister uh, and the Honourable Shane Stone, Coordinator General and Officers of the National Drought and North Queensland Flood Response and Recovery Agency. Uh, Senator Seselja, do you wish to make an opening statement? I do not, Chair. Uh, and Mr Stone, do you wish to make an opening Just statement? Just a very brief one. That would be appreciated. Um, Senators, my name is Shane Stone and I'm the Coordinator General for the National Drought and North Queensland Flood Response and Recovery Agency and Chairman of the Agency's Advisory Board. Senders, we know it's been a tough year. When I last came before you, the nation was reeling from the bushfires and still in the grip of drought across all states and territories. While we're heading into lockdown, we had little idea of how COVID-19 would affect our nation and the world. We've now seen how things have played out, and I must say that for rural and regional Australians, whom my agency largely represents, it's brought about some unique and complex challenges. Every day we are talking to and hearing from rural and regional Australians, whether they be farmers, small business people, harvest contractors, local councils, or any one of many Australians living outside of our capital cities. The Drought and Flood Agency has continued to successfully advocate for the, and support regional Australians throughout the pandemic. Senators, I told you in March, we were then establishing our national network of regional recovery officers. We now have 21 regional recovery officers across Australia, with a couple more soon joining the team. These locally recruited and regionally based officers have proven to be very effective on the ground network, particularly as cross-border travel restrictions ramped up and they are my eyes and ears on the ground. Our successful formula is turn up, listen and then act. The regional team provide information to people wanting to access Australian government assistance measures that will suit their individual needs. They link in with other regionally based staff across all levels of government to find opportunities to collaborate and are a crucial source of real-time information about conditions on the ground. In addition to the great work being undertaken by the regional recovery officers, I've also undertaken extensive travel to drought impacted regions in all states and territories, with the exception of Western Australia to see firsthand what is working and where there are opportunities for improvement. While this has been challenging due to the constraints imposed by the virus and the vast distances involved, it's very clear to me that the impacts of the most recent drought and worse since records began in many parts of the country is far from over. While some areas had pleasing rains, others in Western Australia and Southern Queensland are still gripped by drought, in some cases going into their eighth year. For those areas that have been lucky enough to have a sufficient rain to start restocking or plant a crop, it will be several years before they fully get back on their feet. It's important during this recovery phase, whether it be for those impacted by the North Queensland monsoon event in 2019 <coughs> or the current drought, that we have an eye to ensuring that we support individuals, businesses and communities in preparing for the next inevitable drought or natural disaster. On 2 October 2020, the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Keith Pitt, and Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, David Littleproud, announced an extra $50 million in the federal budget for the on-farm emergency water infrastructure rebate scheme. I've been a strong advocate for the extension of this very popular drought program. The scheme was a victim of its own success and under previous rounds was oversubscribed by 2,000 applications. Many times on the road, I heard from the farmers who committed to improve works, laying out funds that they don't have an abundance of and expecting to be eligible for a rebate, only to be told when they applied that the money had run out. 
I told the government that this scheme was worth investing in, and the Morrison government stepped up. This is how we continue to improve government support by getting out of Canberra and talking to people. The agency has also partnered with Rotary Australia to deliver the Drought Community Outreach Program. My team coordinates with other Commonwealth and state government departments, charities, farming organisations and health providers to deliver one-stop shop assistance events. Rotary fires up their barbecue so that friends and neighbours can catch up and make sure everyone is doing okay at the same time as receiving information and assistance. These events are happening as we speak out in New South Wales and will be rolled out across Australia as COVID restrictions ease. Seeing as the impacts of drought are far from over, and I want to reassure those affected that they have not been forgotten. The Morrison government remains deeply invested in supporting rural and regional communities. Over $10 billion has been committed to help people, small business and communities manage through and prepare for doubt. I know the regional investment corporation concessional loans help farmers and small businesses manage through and recover from doubt. We also know that money was getting out the door too slowly. So I'm pleased that after these issues were raised with the agency, through our regional recovery officers, we work closely with the Department of Agriculture to secure an additional 50 million in operational funds to speed up processing times with an extra 36 staff on board it since July. My agency has recently conducted a thorough review into the government's drought response. While our review has shown some areas of improvement, it has also shown that by and large the Morrison government is delivering on its drought commitments, while also thinking ahead and helping people to prepare for future droughts through the future drought fund. Where opportunities for improvement were identified, such as ensuring greater consistency of eligibility criteria, the work has already started. But the drought response is not set and forget. As conditions change, so does government response, which is exactly as it should be. Senators, I'm all pleased to let you know that we have released After the Flood, a strategy for long-term recovery, following the devastating North Queensland monsoon event in 2019. The strategy was delivered following extensive consultations with affected communities, including local government, producers, business and individuals. And I'm pleased to say, as part of the recent budget, the Treasurer announced a $60 million package to kickstart its implementation using repurposed funds, which are considered unlikely to be spent from the restocking, replanting and infrastructure repair program. This package includes funding to improve access to telecommunications and energy grants to assist emerging industries and expand existing businesses, mental health measures for young people and disaster management planning assistance. And I'd like to acknowledge the leadership shown by councils in North and North West Queensland who have been central to the strategy's development. I'd also like to thank the many people who contributed their invaluable insights, ideas and experiences at our round tables, around kitchen tables, town hall meetings, local coffee shops and in paddocks. Senators, uh, the strategy reflects what individuals, business and communities have told us they need. It will help guide investment that support the long-term recovery of the region and strengthen their preparedness for future challenges. It calls on government, communities, business and individuals to work together. It also provides a blueprint that can be used to guide the recovery process for other disaster events. Senator, in June, I gave evidence to the Royal Commission into the natural national disaster arrangements. I advocated for a single agency to deal with future disasters of national significance. It's no good reinventing the wheel every time there's a disaster. The Drought and Flood Agency has proven that a dedicated, experienced and agile agency with a strong on the ground presence can immediately jump in and get working, cutting through unnecessary red tape to deliver support that works. Our agency has developed strong relationships with state authorities, local governments and key stakeholders and this has been a significant factor in our effectiveness. We know that this approach works and helps communities get back on their feet faster. Senators, I'm nearly done. On a national scale, I've been concerned by how border closures have unfairly penalised rural and regional Australians, farmers whose properties straddle state boundaries, agricultural workers who live and work in the borderlands, or have children who travel across state lines to go to boarding school or even day classes. I've argued passionately for common sense to prevail. There's been some progress made, but more needs to happen as we learn to live with this virus. Senators, my agency has achieved a great deal in a short time, recently granted another 12-month funding to continue our drought work to 30 June 2022, and our flood work is funded until 30 June 2024. We've worked hard and will continue to do so. But the relationships we have built and maintained with people in the regions that define my agency and our success. We are proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with rural and regional Australians. Senators, if I could uh, sum it up uh, succinctly, the executive summary is that we walk in the shoes of those 
who are on the ground and have had to confront these major disasters. I'm joined here today by my Chief Operating Officer, Nico Padovan. I also have with me the head of my drought section, my flood section, my uh, Director of Corporate Services, who's the Chief Financial Officer, and also the Director of my Communications and Public Engagement. So they will be able to go straight to um, any of the issues necessary to give you a consistent and concise answer. I'd also like to distribute to you a copy of our corporate plan and also our annual report, which was tabled in Parliament uh, last um, Friday, I understand. So if I might hand those to the attendant to be um, distributed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Rez, are you seeking the call? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Stone, thank you for that uh, outline. Uh, it always helps to have a, uh, a uh, comprehensive uh, report that certainly reduces the amount of questions that we're likely to ask. My first question is for the Minister. Um, Mr Stone's uh, evaluation or review of the Australian Government drought response identified six uh, themes of, of shortcomings in the Government's drought response. Uh, he said that the governance and delivery arrangements for drought support landscape is complex, eligibility is complex and inconsistent, the provision of some support during drought is reactive, communication and how to access support is unclear, there's been limited review and evaluation of programs and data is not centralised or coordinated. Um, to be fair to Mr Stone, I don't want to shop him completely. He, the rest of the, it's not all negative, his report about the government's drought response, but he does make those criticisms. What, what is the government's work plan to respond to those criticisms? Well, look, there's, there's a number of things, but I mean, I'll, um, I, I might take uh, some of the detail on notice, but um, certainly the government is aware that uh, we haven't, that as a nation, <coughs> excuse me, I should say, as a nation, we haven't always uh, gotten these things right and we're always uh, looking to improve. And, and one of the things uh, that we've been doing, of course, is having uh, people like Shane Stone uh, to assist uh, with, our, with our response. But um, there obviously have been a number of reviews and the reviews um, demonstrate as well uh, the significant contribution made uh, by the Australian government to drought impacted farmers, communities and regional businesses, uh, but also demonstrates that the government's willingness to learn uh, from past experience and to deliver better assistance measures in the future. And um, uh, there's a number of uh, 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 proposals that have been uh, put out. Obviously, we, we, we respond uh, to those, and obviously the, the minister responsible uh, and the ministers responsible uh, respond in, in some more detail on that. But I can ask officials if they want to sort of add anything to that. But uh, we, you know, we obviously do take these things very, very seriously, and we're working to improve. Well, you, you said there's a number of proposals. Can you, um, I suspect on notice, um, outline what those are and what the government's response to those is? Yeah, I'd be very happy to take those on notice. And Mr Stone, some of these are, um, some of these matters are matters for government and some of them are, as I understand it, issues that the agency is engaged in working on itself. The, the, the governance and deliver, delivery arrangements for drought support and the complexity of those, rationalising and consolidating drought measures, is there a timetable for the agency developing a approach to those questions? Let me first put it in context. As the lockdown came into play, we looked around at what we might do um, usefully, given that we were constrained in our activities around Australia. And so it was me who instructed uh, my officers that I wanted a forensic examination of every drought measure that was in play. Now, these drought measures cut us across both sides of politics. Um, they have, as you would expect, um, uh, come through the system over time, and that's one of the great advantages of having the Honourable Simon Crean on our advisory board, is that um, he's able to give us some insight into what people might have been thinking about in, in previous governments. Um, it's been a challenge, um, given that the 25 programs are being delivered across 11 departments and agencies. And whilst I have a very nice letter that says I have this um, oversight, um, the reality is it's a, very much a collaboration. So we weren't marking the government or past government's homework. I want to make that very clear. 
Rather, we were looking to see um, where does it fall short? What can we do um, to strengthen matters? Um, we shared the whole report with our advisory board. Um, they came back with strong recommendations. Uh, we sought counsel not only within our advisory board, but also within the agricultural sector. And at the end of the day, I was able to put a very useful report in front of government. Now, you're already seeing various changes as things are fine tuned. I'll give you an example. The um, r regional um, rural um, financial counselling service, I think goes back to 1985, um, and it was a case of set and forget. And we have worked very closely with them to say, you are critical to the recovery of people, whether they're in bushfires, droughts, floods. What can we do to strengthen your service? What can we do to better support you? And although they're administered within Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, um, the fact is that we now work collaboratively with that department to make sure that we have a better resourced and better and more effective um, uh, counselling service that's in play. Um, that's just one example. So, thank you. Uh, so I'm interested in it because it's a, I accept your point that um, there's a range of governments and a history to this, but it's a pretty useful, I think, as assessment of some of the shortcomings in, uh, in uh, drought support delivery. So, Minister, just to be clear, I'd like to see on notice a response on each of those six line items six themes that Mr Stone has identified as where the government's... That, that yes, identified. thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Um, now, very, very could could I just thank ask you. my Chief Operating Officer to add to what I've had to say, as, Senator? As long as he's brief, Mr Stone. Are you going to be brief? I'll certainly be brief, <laughs> Senator. Um, so just very quickly, Senator, the, uh, with those six criteria, we're not developing a plan about the plan. I mean, the work to address those is already underway. So on the issue of eligibility, for example, we're working across government to come up with a standardised set of eligibility criteria. So over time, different you know, criteria for different programs have emerged. We're trying to standardise that at the Commonwealth level. You know, by early, by late this year, early next year, we expect to. Well, have then I think, that. Mr. Padavan, you've talked yourself into some homework as well. So I want something from you, Minister, and I want something from the agency about what is in the agency's control that you're dealing with on those on those questions. Thank you. Um, I'm moved to the more prosaic matter of uh, staffing. Uh, on notice, in response to a question from Senator Kitching. Uh, we've got details of the agency's staffing numbers. I appreciate there's some increases, Mr Stone, that you've identified. There are, uh, on, on that account, w one SES2 level, four SES1, 13 EL2s and 22 EL1s. Could you give me a quick outline of, it's a very top heavy arrangement, what's the for a Commonwealth agency, is there a what's the sort of justification? For this well, level for the that? justification is that we're dealing with, to start with, two uh, very complex areas of activity: the North Queensland floods and also the national drought, and that does demand um, a high level of leadership. And I've been very fortunate for those who have wanted to join the agency. That's been a a hallmark of the agency. People ask to be part of us. Now, in support of them, of course, uh, we have our Executive Director of Corporate Services, also uh, our Director of Community Engagement and Communications, and that is critically important in terms of the way that we communicate with our stakeholders. And, of course, we have our Head of Flood. So. Um, I'm not certain that I follow that this would be top heavy, um, given the expertise I demand of those who lead these sections. What's, um, would you be able to provide on notice um, an outline of, I uh, understand there's more people engaged, presumably at the EL1 and EL2 level in field officer positions, but would you be able to provide on notice um, an outline by level of, of how many people are employed at each level and also locations uh, and details of um, uh, details of, of accommodation and leasing costs associated with each location? Yeah, sure. Um, Senator, I can tell you the current staffing as at 
30 September on a head count. Um, SES 2, there's one. SES 1, there's four. EL 2, there's 13. EL 1, 22. APS 6, 40. APS 5, 1. APS 4, 2. And we have them split between our Canberra office and our Brisbane office. 51 in Canberra office, 12 in Brisbane office. And you recall when I last appeared here, I said I was determined to decentralise the way that we operated, and we've certainly done that. And I've got those regional recovery officers, uh, 23 of them, who uh, are spread across Australia. Um, well, they I can roughly accord with the map that sets out the regions for each. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I can. Uh, you still have that map? I can give you a fresh one if. No, they... it's um, here for me on the uh, oh, right. on your website. Thank you. Okay. Just want to move finally, Chair, to the question of travel. Um, total of five hundred and seventy-seven thousand and ninety-five dollars from thirty-one May. Th sorry, from establishment through to thirty-one May. That's a high level of travel expenditure. What? what why is that necessary? My job's out there. It's not here. Yeah. Um, as an agency head, I'll come I... to you in a minute because we've got a mystery question for you about your travel. But but in the broad, what's the um, what's the, 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 the rationale is to be turn up, listen, and act. <clears throat> so um, your your travel, there's a mystery in here, and in, in, uh, in some discussion in my office, there's forty six thousand dollars for airfares, forty eight thousand dollars for meals, incidentals, and allowances but $187 for accommodation. Now, now, we were quite worried. Are you, is that figure right? I'm sleeping in my car. No, I'm not. Got a caravan? <laughs> so what's, what, 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 what is going on? Um, what was that last figure? So the material provided in an answer to a question on notice number 1809. My apologies, let me turn this off. It might be my answer. It's a lovely ringtone, though. Quite, quite soothing. <laughs> might have to get it myself. Um, so, so the minister said in an answer to a Senate question on notice that the coordinator general incurred total travel costs of $104,290 in the period 1 July 2019 to 31 May 2020. Of that, $187 is said to be for accommodation. The balance for airfares and meals and incidentals. $187. Katrina, do you have an answer to that, please? Come up to the table. Thank you. I thought, uh, you know, sleeping in a swags provides a measure of authenticity, but what what is going on there? Katrina Tompkin, Acting Executive Tompkin. Director of Corporate. So that was that small figure was a one-off payment. It was a accommodation paid on Mr Stone's credit card. Normally his travel allowance is actually paid through the travel allowance process. So it was a one-off processed um, through our expense account. That's why it stands out. It's not covered in that big bucket of travel allowance. So $46,000 for airfares and the $48,000 includes meals, incidentals, allowances and accommodation. Is that... Correct. Is that how I should read that? Be a big, that sound you can hear is a big sigh of relief from my office, wondering <laughs> where it was that Mr Stone's been sleeping. Um, I don't have any further questions. Uh, I just wanted to demonstrate that that's a photo of me flying economy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Stone, props are discouraged, it, it, it happened at least, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. It, it happened at least once. Oh, yeah, yeah. Last week, <laughs> coming out of Adelaide. It's so ex exotic travelling these days. It is. But we do know you're a man of the people, Mrs Stone. That's yeah. never in doubt. People um, fly the economy out of Adelaide and business in. <laughs> Senator <laughs> Davey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for appearing today before us, Mr Stone. Um, very nice photo too, I must say. You have plenty of copies. Now, the agency was first established as a flood recovery agency that was extended to drought uh, only, I think... First week of December, December 2019. 2019. How has the um, agency been received in the community by farmers and other stakeholders? Uh, my belief is that we are well received. 
I've just sort of done a sweep um, from Brisbane to Toowoomba up to Longreach and across the Flinders Highway. And um, I hadn't been out for a while because of the, the virus, um, but I was pleasantly surprised at the people who came up to us in the street and said, I'm glad you haven't forgotten us. And that is the big challenge in everything that Australia has had to confront, whether it was the flood, the drought, and remember them that were in the flood were previously in drought. Um, bushfires, the virus, and then if you go back into central Queensland, it's now the grasshoppers. And so people do jump to the conclusion that uh, you won't care about us anymore now the bushfires have arrived. Or And it's very reassuring, we find, when we do those trips that people genuinely say, good to see you back. Um, there's always that fine line between treating people as exhibit A and you're being a bit, a bit of a sticky beat going back. But I once asked a very large group of farmers, do you get sick of us turning up? And the answer was, if you don't turn up, we don't think you care anymore. And it's important that you and the government care. And um, I note <clears throat> that you've recently piloted a communities outreach program with a series of forums. I think it was piloted in um, regions in New South Wales and Queensland. Is that an extension of what you're doing? And was it based on some of the feedback you got? And um, can, you t can you take me through the pilot forums and how they were received yeah, sure. in the regions? Um, you're referring to the programs being run by Rotary, um, Red Cross, um, Salvation Army, those programs, where we were distributing vouchers. Um, also um, cash amounts, those programs? Uh, yeah, and programs, I think your yeah. agency is currently in, uh, through the Hunter in Corindai, Scone and Merriwall, um, and Cooler just this week, so. In fact, they're out there yeah. now. Yeah. And this is all part of the seven and a half million dollar rotary distribution of vouchers exercise. Um, look, we do this on a couple of fronts. Firstly, to give some support for people who need it. And um, some people are in dire situation. They struggle to put food on the table. We have properties that don't have drinking water. The implications of that are quite profound. Um, I've had people say to me, going to the toilet now is to pick up the shovel and go out into the paddock because we, we can't flush the toilet. We can't shower. Um, the kids can't shower. The kids can't shower. The kids smell. They can't go to school. I can't do the laundry. I've got to go into town. We don't have enough drinking water. And that was before we got some of this welcome rain. So off the back of that, we knew the not-for-profit organisations were being very helpful to those people. But we also saw a mental health component. Because if we could get people to come into town to uh, meet with these not-for-profit groups, which we were funding, um, together with our staff, and also we take other government agency representatives with us, then we would be able to have a good look at people to see um, whether they were struggling, whether they needed help, to understand what their most immediate priorities were. So you're going to see a lot more of this. Um, we recently allocated two and a half million dollars to the CWA, so they'll be doing similar activity. Um, Government can't do everything. The volunteer um, organisations and base is what is the glue that keeps the country together, whether you're dealing with flood, bushfires, whatever it is. Without the volunteers, it's very, very hard. So that's what these programs are about. Um, and what's, what's the uptake? Like, how many people are, are rocking up to these forums and, and taking advantage of these um, vouchers? And well, my understanding is a very good uptake and they are getting the response. Um, some people won't come. Some people say, I don't take charity. I don't want to um, sort of come into town to be part of this. Um, some people might say, I don't, can't afford the petrol to come in. I mean, there's lots of reasons why someone would come or not come. So, uh, I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't keep doing it and supporting the not-for-profit if, in fact, we didn't think we were getting the uptake. And when people turn up, uh, do they also get 
some information about other assistance, yes, so do. the mental health yes, aspect and things like that. Yeah. So this is a way to connect with people mm. who are doing it tough. Yes. They get the, ben the instant benefit of a voucher or whatever. And it's an excuse for other government agencies to turn up. It's not just the Commonwealth. I mean, the states and territories have an important role to play in all of this. Um, and I just want to ask about, there's been an article recently, um, or not, not so recently, but in the ABC about uh, the definition of drought. As you said, we've had some welcome rainfall. Um, you know, where I live, the crops are looking fantastic. But uh, there are areas of New South Wales that are still doing it really tough. Um, and certainly, m my farmers remind me that one good harvest does not a drought break, because uh, the finances are still in recovery mode. What is your view about a consistent definition for drought? Also, and, and I want to link it back to, um, I have had calls into my office about the drought community support program, which was $3,000, but you had to live in a local government area that was designated in drought, and that was on the basis of both rainfall statistics and employment statistics, but there are other drought programs that rely on a different definition. What moves are we making to get consistency in defining drought and also defining the end of drought? So this was part of our review, and the question that I believe should be being asked is, is a drought a natural disaster? At what point does it become a natural disaster? If you've been in drought for three or four years and someone like me turns up and tells you that actually you're not in a natural disaster, you haven't had a flood, you haven't had a fire, that's a, a very big statement to say to a very distressed person because as you would be aware, Senator, um, if something is a natural disaster, it triggers all sorts of other um, payments and emergency support. But that is a function of government. Government changed the definition in 1989, in which all the states and territories and the Commonwealth at the time decided to take drought out of the natural disaster category. Now, in my evidence to the Royal Commission, I not only argue for a single agency, I also argued for a reconsideration of that. I mean, it's basically not fair. You have someone who might have been in the bushfires in New South Wales. They might have get, got burnt out right up to their fence line. Their, their, far, their neighbour might have helped them fight the fire. They were both in drought before the fire turned up. The one that gets burnt out, they got a $75,000 grant courtesy of bushfires. The person who was in drought and the fire didn't make it onto their property, situation normal, they didn't get the $75,000. And you talk about restocking, replanting, a lot of the farmers need that leg up at the moment to actually make a start again. So if they've destocked, they've probably used their revenues to just stay on the land and keep it all going. And um, of course, you don't destock if you're a cropper. Um, you're waiting for a good season, but again, you've probably spent your reserves just staying the course, and you don't have the money to go and put in the crop. So you might say, all right, well, why don't you go and get a rick loan? Um, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? I tell you what, it's an easy proposition if there is an available grant that has been you know, settled on very strict criteria, but on the basis that um, you know, it's, a, it's a hand up, it's not a handout. Does that make sense? Perfect sense, perfect sense to me. Um, but it also, it doesn't necessarily, um, Putting it back into the natural disaster trigger, there's still the question about what defines, you know, that point in time and, and you know, when, how long must a drought be before it is declared the natural disaster? If so I would have think that you would agree with the proposition that those people up in southern Queensland who've just gone into their eighth year. Mm that their situation is diabolical. Absolutely. Um, you come down into parts of New South Wales, they're in their second or third year. Um, you know, what's the cut-off point? 
I just might ask my Chief Operating Officer to make a comment on this because it's something that we've talked about at length. Um, we're out in the field, we're confronting it, we're dealing with it all the time, and it's very emotional. Mm. Now, Senator, in the first instance, we're trying to standardise the definition across government. So the, the, the point I made earlier about the 25 measures across 11 departments and agencies, but those measures use a range of criteria to determine uh, as, as you flagged, you know, drought communities program versus drought community outreach program and, and so forth. So in the first instance, we're working through uh, ABARES to come up with a standardised definition at the Commonwealth level of what defines drought and whether that's, you know, rainfall, soil moisture, plant growth, hydrological factors, socioeconomic factors and so forth. We need to standardise that and that may vary depending on, you know, the type of production, the location and so forth. But, but there is a body of work well underway on that front. In parallel to that, we're also working with the states, and some states have, have quite mature definitions. So New South Wales, for example, has the combined drought indicator. Um, other states like WA take quite a different position in terms of what constitutes drought. So you know, there are two bodies of work in this space, but in the first instance, our, our focus is on making sure we have a standard and consistent process at the Commonwealth level, so that going into the next drought, people are well aware of what the criteria will be that determine whether they're in drought or not. I think that will be a relief to, to a lot of people, just having some indication. Um, I think that's it for me. But, but at the can moment. I just make the point, at the end of the day, it's back to government, to you. Thank we can you. make recommendations, <laughs> we can yes. make observations, yeah. but um, that's the extent of it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Are there any further questions for Mr Stone or the agency? I just said a quick one. Yeah, well, certainly, Senator Scott. Um, I'm just having a look, um, Mr Stone, at the, the corporate plan, and, and thanks for providing those. It's, um, it's very helpful. I was just interested in knowing, uh, in relation to the regional recovery offices, they obviously play an absolutely key fundamental role in terms of interaction with the local communities. I was looking on page 11 of the corporate plan in relation to how the country's been drawn up into different segments. And some of these segments or geographical areas uh, cover huge areas. So I was just interested in the feedback you have from the, the regional recovery officers. No doubt you're in constant communication with them to see how they're travelling in terms of uh, providing the service across their geographical area. But I'm just interested in any feedback you have. So for example, just for the record, one area covers the Northern Territory, uh, another area uh, that uh, is in relation to North New South Wales also covers a huge area. I'm just interested in feedback in terms um, of how they're going, covering those areas. Vast um, areas and a lot expected of 21 people yeah. across Australia. Yeah. But you know we operate within the resources that um, are available. Um, I've now travelled with every regional recovery officer except in Western Australia. Yeah. So um, you get a real feel for how effective they are on the ground. I just invite our director of engagement and uh, yeah. communications, Kate Woodridge, to step up because Kate manages the RROs directly. Okay. So yep. she can give you the insight yep. as to our expectations. And best that you hear it from the horse's mouth rather yep. than me simply reciting yeah, you know, absolutely. The briefings. Hello, Kate. Senator Kate Woodbridge, and I look after the community engagement team. We have expanded the team um, as we've rolled, we've rolled out. We started off yep. with um, 15 originally, and as we see a need for more sort of resourcing in each state, we, we expand the team as best we can. So we have 21 at the moment, and we're putting an extra person in West Australia and an extra person in the Northern Territory. So, so sorry, just to interrupt you there. So when you put an extra person in Western Australia, that means Western Australia will have three. Three. You'll go from two to three, yep. right? And the, the map that you've just been given has the, the new sort of zone that we've identified as being needing more resourcing. Right. And how do you, in, in performing your role, Ms Woodridge, how do you... Um, make sure that a regional, um, and in fact here they are, here are the names, so um, that, um, that, that say Jane, who's, who's handling Northern Territory, yeah. uh, which is you know, 
it's a, a big job. I can barely get my head around how big that job is. Yeah. How, how do you ensure she's getting all the support she needs from 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 you? Uh, and obviously, the the uh, coordinator generals referred to how he's spending time on the ground with each of them, and that's that shows great leadership, I think. Uh, but how are you ensuring that they're getting all the support they need, and they're not overwhelmed by the task? Because I I can imagine it's a it's a well, I can try and empathise, but it's a huge job it is. for each of them. Yes. So, what strategies do you have in place to uh, to, to provide support to them and, 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 and provide collegiality, I guess, across the group when they're trying to deal with that huge geographic area and all the different communities within it? So, in the first instance, we've we've picked people from the region, so they have good networks, they have good links into you know state departments, natural resource management bodies, they have a, a whole sort of network existing on the ground just because they're local people. Yeah. Um, the Coordinator General is um, very strong on the fact that all people in the agency must get out and travel and get mud on their boots and dirt yeah. under their fingernails. Yeah. So we have, um, as travel restrictions have, have allowed us in more recent times, ensured that people from the policy teams get out and um, sort of support them and yeah. get a feel of what's happening on the ground. Same with our corporate teams and our um, media team. So, so we have a sort of a, a whole movable, uh, you know, resource with the other agency staff, and they're there yeah. to support those regional recovery officers, as well as the coordinator general who travels with them. Um, I've been out on the road also, um, touching the base with my team. So I think as an executive, um, we get out on the road, but also all staff across the agency are expected to support okay. that regional team. And do you have any th thoughts, and this might be a, a question to the Coordinator General, Chief Operating Officer, in relation to what the optimal size is? So you've, you've increased the number, uh, and there were questions around staffing levels, and I'm, I'm looking at this thinking, gee whiz, this is still a huge job for these, uh, for these individuals. Do you have any thoughts as to what the optimal uh, number would be if, if, if this were to become a permanent feature of how we respond to natural disasters? I think at the moment the number's almost right. I think certainly some of those states, could, um, particularly West Australia, could perhaps do with an, another one. But I think in terms of um, the resourcing for our agency, the numbers are, are pretty right. And, okay. and they also link in with other Australian government um, regionally based staff. So there's 12,500 other regionally based Australian government staff. So part of the, our remit is to sort of network with those people build a big um, database and a map of who's who's where. And as we identify needs, so somebody might want business help, so we'd call the tax office or the regional investment corporation person, and we can sort of mobilise those other Australian government staff to, to provide the services that are needed on the ground. Okay, excellent. Oh, thank you for that. They are very much my eyes and ears out in yep. the community, and they're racking up between them 10,000 kilometres a week at the moment. So uh, we're certainly out and about, yeah. Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Stone, and to all your officers for your work and your attendance here and your evidence this afternoon. It's thank you, Mr appreciate. Chairman. Can I renew the invitation to, to members of the committee who would like to accompany us on any of um, our forays mm. um, out there? Um, very welcome to, to have people on board. <laughs> we. Um, we, we do have some trips coming up, and I'm happy to um, advise what's available. Um, I think I have to follow a process um, in terms of uh, opposition members, but I've had no pushback. So I thank you for your um, support for the thank you for work that of the agency. Kind offer, Mr. Stone. Thank um, you. Noted. Uh, the committee will now move to the Australian Public Service Commission. Uh, we'll just suspend very briefly to give them an opportunity to join us in the room. Do you want a copy? Okay, the committee will now resume and I welcome Mr Peter Wilcock, Australian Public Service Commissioner. Uh, Mr Wilcock, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. 
I do not have a formal opening statement, but I'd like to table the current organisational chart for the Australian Public Service Commission, if the committee agrees. Please, yes. Uh, we have physical copies as well as, as well as digital copies to assist. Uh, with me at the table, I have my Deputy Commissioner, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mary Wiley-Smith, and I'd also like to introduce Mr. Pat Hetherington, the first Assistant Commissioner, who took up his position on the 24th of August 2020. But thank you, Chair. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Gallagher, you are seeking the call. Yes, thank you, Chair. So this has changed, I see, some key personnel since the annual report was tabled. OK. Would that one come around? Yeah, oh, uh, yes, you. yes, it has. So, so. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just start, uh, Mr Wilcott, with some questions um, with you following up from my letter to you about um, the Leppington Triangle, uh, the purchase of that land. Um, in your letter to me, you said that you became aware of matters around the purchase of this through the audit report, I think on the 22nd of September, which I think was the day after the report had been tabled. How did you become aware of the report, the audit report? I became aware of the audit report, uh, Senator, from, from media reports on, on the 22nd. So you weren't aware of it? Not before coming. then. I hadn't been consulted before then. OK. Um, so you read the media reports. Have you read the report? Uh, I have. On the 23rd of September, I received an email from the Auditor General um, forwarding me the, a copy of the, um, of the Auditor General's report and recommending that I look at it. OK. I, I, and so you've read the entire report? I have. Did you get, you've, did you get briefed by your officials on it? Uh, no, I just read it. OK. Did you seek a, you know, follow-up or advice on uh, some I of the issues to that the were raised? General. I spoke to the Auditor General on yep. the 23rd of September. And After uh, the 23rd? Yeah, on the 23rd. Oh, when he, he alerted it to you? Sorry, sorry, I spoke to, sorry my yeah. apologies. Yeah. Yeah. I spoke to him on the 24th, the next day. Uh-huh. Oh, so you read it on the 23rd. Is that right? Yep. And following his email to you, and you then called him on the 24th. Is yep. that correct? That's yes. correct, sir. And so you initiated that contact? Yes. OK. Um, what... Uh, after you'd read the report, what were, I mean, what were your initial thoughts and actions that followed from from reading that report? Well, I was I was obviously concerned by um, by, by the report and some of the allegate some of the comments made in it mm. around the uh, around um, the, the sort of his concerns about uh, the ethics of what of what happened and and the value in terms of uh, the Australian um, the Australian public and the Australian government. Okay. And the processes and culture. Okay. And so, what was the reason behind calling the Auditor General? The uh, next I, day? My, my first thought was uh, to thank him for sending it to me yeah. and bring it to my attention. I obviously take these allegations um, contained in the report very, very seriously, particularly the, um, the fact that uh, he believed the operations of the department had fallen short of ethical standards. Mm. And I wanted to ask him whether there's anything else in the nature uh, of, of uh, the report which you wanted to bring specifically to my attention. And was there? Um, no, he, he just thought that um, the, uh, he, he wanted to make sure that I was across the details of the report and the depth of his concerns. OK. So he, he left it for the report to... Speak for itself. And that contained all of the issues as, as far as he saw it from his point of view? Yes. Um, did you discuss with him things that you might do in response to receiving this report? Um, I, I took a file note. I, it's not in the file note, but I think I may have, may have said I'll be, I will speak to uh, the Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure about it. Mm -hmm. Which you did which subsequently, I, did, which I, did I think. Subsequently. I think um, I, I oh, on the 25th of September, so the day after you spoke to the Auditor General, you spoke to Mr Atkinson? Correct. Yeah. OK. Um, so it took three days to contact the Secretary of the Department. 
Um, was that because you were... I mean, why was that, I it, guess? It, I'll it, leave you to answer that rather than put words in your mouth. It may have been a weekend. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, that may have been the reason why I didn't call Mr Gachins. Um, but you might want to... You can check, check, yeah. the, check, check the accuracy of my evidence there. So. Yeah, so the 25th was a, a Friday. Um, so that's when you spoke to Mr Atkinson. But yeah. that was, uh, I think, four days after the report was tabled. Mm-hmm. Are you comfortable that it took four days to contact well, Mr. I, I Atkinson? I wanted to speak to the Auditor General first. Mm -hmm. But your first re response wasn't to, to speak to Mr. Atkinson about some of the issues that were raised? Uh, my first response was to read the report. My second response was to speak to the Auditor General, and then sequentially, my next step was to speak to uh, Mr. Atkinson. Okay. Um, did you. I asked Mr Atkinson why he hadn't perhaps come to you with any of the issues that have been raised with him throughout the course of his reflecting on the audit process and some of the um, issues being drawn to his attention? No, I didn't. Okay. Would you normally expect a secretary of a department with a, a serious audit like this underway to, to come to you and, and um, at least discuss some of the issues that were being obviously being raised with that department? I, I speak to Mr Atkinson regularly on a range, on a range of matters. Um, I assume that he, he would have just been getting on top of the report and doing his own due diligence around what he needed to do to address it uh, before he had a conversation with me. But he's someone I speak to regularly around a whole range of, a whole mm. range of issues. And so if, if a department, just in a general sense, if a department is investigating um, staff for potential breaches of the APS Code of Conduct, would you and your, the Commission normally be notified? Um, no. Uh, or in if it's like a sense it of... Escalate, like, is there serious, where they're serious? Is there a threshold? If the practice is, and it's only the practice, uh, is that if it's an SES officer who's involved, uh, they would normally they would normally advise us of this and often consult with us around mm. handling strategies. But that depends on, as I say, on the level of, of the officer who has been accused of a breach of the code of conduct. Okay, and it didn't And it's practice. Yeah. yeah, but in terms of your line of sight of the issues raised in the Leppington Triangle Audit, you had no line of sight on that until the you read media reports? Correct. Okay. Um, in your letter back to me and to um, Ms King, you said um, you, wrote, you contacted the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. I think you contacted him on the 28th of September. Th that's correct, Mr Gagins. Um, do you have a time when you did that? Do you, are you... Yeah, I, I do, because it was the morning. In, in fact, yeah. I have to say, um, Sandra, it was just... It was coincidental, but it was just before I received your letter. Right, so coincidental. Yeah. Yeah. So would you be able to take that on notice, just when... No, no, I, I, I can answer that. I, OK. I, I received your, your email and your letter from your and, uh, and Ms King uh, after I'd spoken to... OK. Uh, All right. Um, so you initiated that conversation with Mr Gachin? Yes. And you're confident you had that conversation before the letter arrived from Ms King and I? <coughs> Yes. And can you explain to me why it took you, I think it's six or seven, it's a full week, six or seven <coughs> days, to um, contact the head of the public service about a pretty damning audit report? Uh, and why he might not have picked the phone up and talked to you as well before that? Well, in, in terms of in terms of in integrity and and um, and the, the uh, and, and the public service uh, un, under the Public Service Act, a lot of that responsibility falls to me. Uh, Mr. Gaitchen is head of, is head of the public service, mm. um, but the integrity issues uh, largely largely fall to me to manage within the public service. And but that, you, you were worried enough to ring him. What did you ring him over? I just wanted to let him know that uh, I'd spoken to the Auditor General, that I'd spoken to Simon Atkinson, and that I was comfortable uh, with the way Mr Atkinson was proposing to handle the issue. Mm. I thought he needed to be advised of that. 
Okay, I might come uh, come back to that to what how you satisfied yourself that the department was um, handling it it um, appropriately at that point in time. Um, have you spoken to anyone in the Prime Minister's office or any uh, or the Deputy Prime Minister's office about this audit report? Uh, no, but, but uh, for the sake of completeness, mm. um, the um, Mr. Tudge, the uh, Minister for, for Cities, uh, rang me on um, on the 13th of October about the matter. Okay, and what was that? Call for was it to check to see if you were doing? Uh, he, he he wanted to know whether I was comfortable with the way that the Secretary for Infrastructure was handling um, uh, handling the Lippington Triangle issue. Yeah, and and was did you respond that you were? Okay. I, I responded I was. And how are you? How are you satisfying yourself that the department is handling this appropriately? Well, um, apart from um, conversations of, with Mr. Atkinson, and there are, there are more than one conversation. Okay. Uh, um, how often, sorry, Mr. Wilcott, how often do well, you speak? Well, I, I do speak to him pretty regularly, uh, and there are a number of conversations after the, um, uh, after the 25th where he just uh, in, updated me on what he was doing in terms, of, uh, in terms of managing the issue. Have you asked to be kept informed? Um, yes. Okay. But, it, but I, I'm sure he would have done so anyway. So is that an informal kind of request from you, that, or is there some sort of formal that you're no, going to No, entirely informal, in, okay. entirely, entirely informal request. So um, how, how, why was I comfortable? Um, Mr Atkinson wrote to me um, on, uh, I need to find a date for that letter, which is um, the 6th of October. Mm -hmm. Um, he wrote to me and uh, set out all the steps he was taking. Apart, obviously, from accepting the recommendations in the Auditor General's report, there were a range of things he was doing. Um, mm. uh, the, uh, independent, uh, the independent investigation around the code of conduct. Um, he um, was proposing to have Vivian Tom, who I think he's appointed to do, mm -hmm. do that investigation, who's someone we know and have the highest regard for. Mm. So there's a level of, of comfort in that. Yep. Uh, he also talked about the wider audit, audit that he was proposing. He also talked about uh, uh, the independent review of systems, processes and culture. And he also talked about a number of protocols set out in the letter that he was setting up to make sure um, something like this shouldn't happen again in, in, mm. in the future. So I think, in my view, uh, the Secretary of Infrastructure had been particularly thorough in checking all, in checking all the bases on this. Mm. So when, when he's written to you, I'm not sure if you're able to provide a copy of that letter to the committee, but it might be useful if, if you are. I'm happy for you to take that on Can I take that on notice? Notice, yeah. Thank you. Um, he's outlined a, a range of um, processes to ensure that this didn't happen again. Um, and, and if I could say, Senator, that the letter was a letter addressed to both myself and to Mr Gatchins. Right, okay. But not initiated by not a not a response to anything no, that you no. or Mr. Gatchins no. had, right? So an own initiative letter to you to outline what how he was handling it. And uh, do you take that the admission that this shouldn't all these processes are being put in place to uh, ensure that this shouldn't happen again is an acknowledgement that what's happened here is has fall well short of what you would expect from a public service well, agency? Or? I think the Auditor General made that very clear. Um, but um, again... And you're not contesting that? I'm not contesting that, no. Although I've got an open mind as to whether it's simply just confined to that particular Western, uh, Western Sydney unit mm. or, or not. But mm. the suggestion, certainly um, in the conversations I've had with Mr Atkinson, he believes it's confined to that unit. But obviously, uh, we will see. Okay, and so you have, uh, following that letter of the 6th of October, you have an informal arrangement, whereas uh, Mr Atkinson will keep you updated. Um, are you going to seek um, copies of all of these reviews and audits that have been put in place? Will you have some sort of oversight role to that? I won't have an oversight role, mm. but I, I, I'm sure that uh, Mr Atkinson would be uh, happy to share them with me. Mm. But the Commission isn't involved in any way, in an ongoing way, with uh, responding 
to the audit report or the changes that are going to be required? We're, we're comfortable with the people he's appointed to conduct the various independent investigations and audits. Um, we would obviously be interested in seeing the outcome of those investigations and audits. Uh, and as I say, I'm comfortable with the way the process has been handled to date. Mm. And uh, I have full confidence in, in Mr Atkinson on, in this mm. regard. Okay. Um, in terms with um, Mr Tudge contacting you, that's in his role as Minister for Cities, is it? Did you say? Yes. Yeah. So is he... He has some oversight role of, I guess, the city deals and things, does he? Is that his interest I, in this? I can't. I mean, I'm assuming so, but mm. he, he rang... He initiated the contact with me, um, but... Uh, uh, so that would be my understanding, but... Uh, but the responsible better, minister would be the us. Minister for Infrastructure, we presume. Well, uh, as I say, it was Mr Touch who rang me. Mm. OK. Um, and you just had that one conversation with him and you, that was after you'd received the letter, so you were able to say that and, you've, yeah. and you'd had a number of talks. OK. In terms of your powers under um, the Act, you, would, you have powers to conduct investigations into potential code of conduct breaches if you were asked to do so, is that right? If the uh, agency head or the Prime Minister requests you and you think it's a good idea? Uh, there are four sets of powers under yeah. that. One relates to investigations into agency heads. Yep. Um, and that just has to come, something just has to come to my attention yep. to, 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 to start. I have to be asked um, by the departmental secretary or agency head or the Prime Minister for investigations into APS employees. Um, then I have a broad powers to undertake a system review where there is evidence to indicate a serious and systemic um, issue under the Act. But again, the agency head or the Prime Minister would need to ask me to undertake such a review. And there are also special review powers um, which allow me to conduct a review into any matter relating to an agency or the functional relationship between agencies. But the Prime Minister would need to ask me to conduct uh, such a special review. OK. And, and he hasn't at this stage in relation to Leppington Triangle? No, but there are obviously a whole suite of reviews underway at the moment, investigations yeah. underway. So you would but you're somewhat more independent, I would assume, than the department, which in the audit report, you know, one of the things they're yeah. criticised for is the fudge they did on the internal review mm. they did of their own performance mm. as a request, a response to the Auditor General's request for information. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct, Senator, but what you've got is a, uh, an independent investigation by Dr Vivian Tom and a wider audit now done by Mark Harrison, and uh, both of them are, are people of the highest uh, regard and independent. Mm. So the, the system, I would say, is working. Mm. Okay. Um, in terms of the, um, the reviews that have been commissioned by Mr Atkinson, did you have any opportunity to comment on terms of reference or the processes, or was it you were advised once they'd all been determined and you know, the work had been commissioned? Uh, no, I was not consulted on the terms of reference. Or the, or the approach? It was sent I, to you I, as I, a I, FYI? Well, I was advised as, as, to, as to who the investigator was. Um, but they were commissioned by then, yeah, I exactly. presume. Right, OK. Um, and did, when did you become aware that the AFP were involved? Um, I, I, might, I might take that on notice, because uh, I, I think I was advised informally about that. Uh, by of days, Mr Atkinson? Of ago, by my office, by, uh, in my office. By your office, so it's people, colleagues yeah, who you co work yeah. with at the commission. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Recently yeah. or? Yeah, recently. Okay. Senator. So I can't give you an exact date for that, but obviously that was to, uh, discussed in today's in, 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 in today's. Yeah. Um, no, I was more. Of when did you become aware? Yeah. And you can't recall. It would. I can't it was, a, it time was a member of staff of the commission who told yeah. you. Do you know where they had picked up that information? No, I don't. So that's why I'd like to take that on notice. OK, if you can, um, that would be good. Have you had any contact with the AFP? Have you contacted them about no, this? No, And they haven't contacted you? No. 
Um, in terms of um, just again, in your role as um, the commissioner, um, it seems to me when I read this audit report, you don't get audit reports like this. Uh, they're not routine audit reports in terms of the issues that were raised um, by when I looked at it. There's, you know, you, you've touched on this. It fell short of ethical standards, um, inadequate response by the department to questions raised by the audit office, inconsistent with effective and ethical stewardship of public resources, probity risks, um, you know, dodgy valuations, decision makers not advised meeting and communication protocols not followed, uh, poor advice overall, um, people signing off financial statements which were clearly inaccurate, um, including at the secretary level. Um, like it seems to me that these are pretty substantial criticisms in terms of how a department is operating. Is there any follow-up work you think the commission needs to do to assure yourself that this is an isolated issue, um, that the standards that you're responsible for, the directions that you set out, including you know, ensuring good governance and upholding the integrity of the APS are you know, being protected. Mm. Um, yeah, look, uh, th thank you, Senator. Uh, clearly there are issues here which are, make for very grim reading in the Auditor mm. General's report. Um, but what I would say is the system is, is working. The checks and balances built into the system are working. Um, the, the Auditor General, ANO, and the Auditor General did a very thorough job. I believe Mr Atkinson is now doing a very thorough job in responding to that. I'm sure that uh, Vivian Tom, Mark Harrison, the AFP, will all do a very thorough job. And whether it's confined to one particular work unit or wider than that, all this will come out in the wash. I obviously take integrity enormously seriously in terms of the Australian public service. That, that is part of my role. And uh, whilst uh, I don't believe there is a burning platform in terms of uh, integrity in the public service, I think our, our standards are very strong and very high, mm. there's always a lot more that, that we can do. Um, the 30 report uh, talked about um, uh, the importance of building on the culture of integrity in the Australian public mm. service, and, in, and, and the Prime Minister and the government's response to the 30 report uh, endorsed, endorsed that aspect, and in fact it, it talked about mandatory training for the, um, uh, on integrity for public servants. So we're... And this happened a few years ago down in that unit though, okay? Because, <laughs> you know, the 30 million essentially is lost to taxpayers by, mm. by this. I, I can't prejudge what the outcome of the, of the, of, mm. of the, of the various investigations will be. Um, but you, from a systemic point of view, you are satisfied that you don't need to do anything further in terms of the issues raised by this audit report? Uh, no, obviously I, I, will, I will want to see the outcome of this. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but in terms of the issue of the Leppington Triangle land purchase, I think um, all bases have been covered in terms of the response uh, to that by, uh, by the Department of Infrastructure. I'm obviously concerned about wider issues around integrity and making sure that we, um, uh, we build our institutional integrity and there's always more you can do, mm. but that's a, that's a wider issue. And in fact, I, I have um, Stephen Sedgwick, who was a former one of my predecessors and a former secretary, who's doing a major review for us on integrity and integrity training. Mm. And he'll report to us on the 31st of October. Because the budget includes, you know, quite a lot of bring forward of large amounts of taxpayers' funds for infrastructure, for projects. The Western Sydney unit... I might quote you on that, Senator Gallagher. Hey? It's been an issue of contention. I might quote you on that. A lot of bring forward of infrastructure spending. Well, I, th I, don't, I think we're accepting it's, it's bringing forward, whether it's being brought forward in in enough haste, perhaps, okay. uh, and whether it's new money, I think you'll find... I wasn't encouraging you to You'll find it. some disagreement, but there are large... I mean, no-one's saying that this budget isn't a big spending budget with large pockets of funds being administered from departments um, in relatively, you know, speedy timeframes. Um, you know, from, from a good governance point of view, you know, how, from your point of view, how do we manage some of the risks of elevated spending levels and time pressures to deliver um, for a public service that isn't perhaps geared for getting this scale of, of, 
of money out the door mm. when we've got audit reports like this? Yeah, well, well ho hopefully um, this um, does, raise, does raise some flags. If you look at how, how uh, uh, the Secretary of Infrastructure has responded, he's setting up a whole system of protocols around this. Uh, I'm sure this is probably not the last ANO audit that might, might, might take place mm. in this area. Um, th there's a, a, there'll be lessons learned from this in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of how, uh, how the, these, these issues are dealt with into the future. Okay. I mean, the, the issue with AN audit reports, though, is they usually look backwards on things rather mm -hmm. than putting in place measures to protect going forward. But look, in the interest of time, I'm aware there's other senators here, but um, the, you mentioned the Thody review. It did recommend um, an enhancement of the, your integrity powers, which the government rejected um, as part of its response. Why, why did they reject the recommendation which would have given you the capacity to have your own motion uh, powers to initiate investigations and reviews? Do you know um, why? No, that's a, matter, that's a matter for government. But they never told you? They never, like it's, it's a recommendation specifically about your function and your role, which they've said no to. Did they consult you on it? Did they explain why they didn't think that's a good idea or did you advise them against this recommendation? No, I didn't advise them against it. But my own view is I think my powers are, are sufficient under, under the Act and any change would have required legislation which can, uh, uh, can be complex. What do you mean in terms of passage through the Parliament? Yes. Or, I don't know that there's too many problems with getting strengthened integrity measures through the Parliament. But as, as I said, Senator, I, my own view is that my powers are, are sufficient. So you don't think you need own motion powers to investigate or initiate investigations or review? Uh, I, I've got close to that in terms of agency heads. I just, it just needs to be brought to my attention that there's mm. a concern. Uh, in, in but in this instance, that would mean you'd have to have a con you'd have to have a problem with Mr. Atkinson. Yes. Which you don't have. I have no problem, Mr. Atkinson. So you are, in a sense, restrained or by your powers at the moment, because your problem isn't with Mr. Atkinson, where this didn't happen on his watch. Um, it happened prior to that. No, but, but oh, that, that's correct. But um, can I can I just say that uh, with all the reviews underway at the moment. Uh, you, have a, you still have the ability at some later stage for Mr Atkinson or, or the Prime Minister or, or, or the relevant minister to ask me uh, to do a wider review. Mm. Has anyone from the Prime Minister's office called you about Leppington Triangle? I think I t uh, might have asked you that before, but... Happy to give the same answer, Senator. No. Yeah, but, sorry, <laughs> specifically, but whether they did. I mean, if I was no, working for the they Prime did. Minister and I got an audit report like this, I would probably mm. want to speak to people about it, I would imagine, if I was Prime Minister for the day. No? They didn't ring me. Have you briefed the Prime Minister on it? On your... Uh, no, I haven't. OK. Um, and do you know, in terms of uh, Mr Atkinson coming back to you, do you know how quickly the, some of these reviews are going to report? I don't know whether there's a timeline in, in, the, in terms of, of the contract arrangements with um, the, um, the people involved, um, but that question might best be put to... Um, OK, to, uh, but you, you don't have a line of sight of that? No, I don't have a line of sight of that. Do you have... I mean, can, again, considering some of the issues that this has raised, I mean, do you... Do you have a sense of the need for urgency on, on this? I have a sense of the need for thoroughness and getting it right. Mm. And, but quick, it'll also be good. OK. All right, I've got a few other questions, um, Chair, but I don't know if other colleagues have any on specific... Thanks, Senator. I'll just check if there are other uh, questions Tim, at this stage for APSC. Um, I, I have a couple minor quite... Quick. Yeah. Um, are you looking for a break? Because I can intercede now if you are, or we can just continue with your questions. I don't no, mind. you go, and then okay. I'll. All right, um, Mr. Wilcott, I'm interested in um, your observations of how the public service has worked during COVID, and particularly um, public servants increasingly working from home during this period, um, for obviously 
for very good reasons, uh, particularly initially early on in the crisis. And we've had some evidence about that in a different place at the COVID-19 committee. And so I just want to get a, an updated view from you on a couple of things. Um, in the first instance, I'm interested in any measures of productivity of public servants who've been working outside of the office. Are there any, um, do you have any data points on that that you can share? Um, yeah, uh, th th thank you, Senator. Uh, I might just kick off and then I might um, throw to my Assistant Commissioner Purcell, who has been managing this in the, in the, um, the APSC. But obviously, uh, the APS played a critical role in supporting the government's response to COVID-19 and shifting its operational model at scale. To support, and and it's, it's actually led to some real improvements in terms of how we work as a public service, yeah. the concept of one enterprise, breaking down silos, yeah. and also being able to work flexibly at home at scale and the IT systems mm -hmm. held up. And I, I, I've got to say, I, I've, uh, I'm very proud of the way the public service has mm -hmm. responded um, to COVID-19 and, and the crisis and served this, the government and the Australian people. Obviously, the issue of productivity is a live one. Um, mm -hmm. This is a debate that not only we're having in the, in the Australian public service, but in state public services and also in the private sector. And so a considerable amount of work is going into, into thinking about productivity aspects of, of, of what, we, what, we, what we've achieved and, uh, and in terms of the sustainability of this and what does this mean in terms of the future of work. And it also feeds into the workforce strategy that we're working on at the moment in the APSC. But uh, in terms of the data point, there, there's a fair bit of data we have. Great. And I might bring the expert to the table, if I may, Sam, Please, to I talk about that. Uh, Mr. Ah, Purcell, the other end of the table. <laughs> Katrina Purcell, Assistant Commissioner, Strategic Policy and Research. Uh, so in terms of the data points, uh, the Chief Operating Officers Committee commissioned a working group uh, across agencies, 10 agencies representing approximately 65,000 employees, came together to share quantitative data points around how the APS had travelled uh, during the COVID response, in particular the few months um, at the peak of that. And so that working group identified that there was not a significant shift in productivity one way or another, um, despite the large shift of people working from home. It did look at input data, so things around leave balances, flex time, overtime, uh, and also output data, so citizen-facing metrics, how many claims were processed, yeah. uh, those kinds of those kind of quantitative measures. Uh, they found that on output measures, there was significant increase, obviously, in the volume of work that the yeah. APS delivered over that period, um, sometimes more than 50% in high priority areas. And then in terms of input data, they did find that staff were working uh, longer to get the job done. So in looking at leave balances um, and also flex time and overtime, they sort of found that there was a shift, a decrease in leave, a marginal increase in um, part time and overtime. So they did show that there was um, strong productivity uh, whilst working uh, flexibly. Um, also, that was complemented by a series of um, qualitative data gathered through in partnership with the Department of Finance, who across um, a number of agencies asked a set of five kind of engagement questions as a proxy yeah. measure for productivity. And that found there was a really strong uptick in staff engagement, real uh, strong um, sense that staff were inspired to do better work uh, and that the internal communication was effective. And so those things are really sort of positive indicators that yeah. the st that productivity has remained strong. And just to drill down a little bit on that data, was there variation between um, either departments or agencies or the types of roles? Like, can you draw lessons out that, you know, this particular department had a really big gain in productivity, others didn't? Is it available on that level? It's challenging to, to sort of quantify, I guess, um, how agencies have responded. The report that we received was largely aggregated data yep. acro across agencies, and also the nature of the work that agencies do is very mm -hmm. different. So um, it's very challenging to measure productivity for uh, policy-based yeah. uh, advice Understood. and things like that. So uh, yeah, it's difficult to, to identify agency-specific um, because there are so many um, areas of difference. Also, it's difficult to measure it um, in comparison to the year prior because we were doing so many new things in the APS, so the yep. work isn't directly comparable. 
Yep. And just coming to um, what you termed the inputs, um, so things like uh, leave, yep. um, have you noticed any trends in, for example, um, sick leave or personal leave? Is that up or down? Is there anything you yeah. can draw out of that? So unscheduled absences did fall um, sort of in the period from April to June. It fell um, from 3.1 days um, per employee to 2.3 days per employee. So that's sort of a quarter um, decrease. So that's quite a significant yeah. um, decline in that unscheduled absence. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and what do you attribute that to? Is there any analysis on, on what is causing that or driving that? We haven't done any detailed analysis. I guess it'd be a number of things. So it's also that um, because staff are, if staff are working remotely, um, there's less infection rates. People are actually self-isolating. So those things that may not normally spread through offices don't. Uh, also, obviously, there's uh, increased flexibility so that if people are caring for others, um, they don't necessarily need to take that leave. They can work that through through right. flexible arrangements. OK, I'd be interested if you can provide on notice any further thoughts that you have about that, any further analysis, that'd be, sure. um, be great. And then just onto the uh, qualitative data that you mentioned, um, because that's been one of the big questions for all employers, public sector mm. or private sector, is what's the impact on motivation of employees in their engagement with their work, on their collegiality with each other, on collaboration. Um, so you said from your brief kind of synopsis, it sounded like largely that data was positive. Is that a fair summary? Very much so. So there's sort of five questions that we can benchmark against last year's employee census around um, employee engagement. So how strong people feel committed to agency goals, whether they feel inspired to do their best work, um, effective in com internal communication. Things like internal communication, is a 19% point increase um, wow. from, from the year prior. Um, similarly, in terms of feeling inspired to do new or better things, there was a 17 point increase. So certainly over those few months um, where, the, where those surveys were conducted, that that was significant. But we're also rolling out the um, APS employee census right now, closes on November the 13th. And so that will be another data point where we can see how things have actually tracked and whether that's sustained over time. Okay, thank you. All right, two final questions then to you, uh, Mr. Wilcott, arising out of that. Um, have you formed any view then of the value of returning to work as per normal? You know, do you have an objective of getting APS staff back into the office or do you think this is a, a permanent step change? Just your, your own reflections on that? Yeah, obviously we're still working through the data as, as, as Ms Purcell was saying. Um, I'm always worried that we do well in a crisis as a public mm. service. What always concerns me is sustainability over a yep. long period of time, and, and this is not going away, um, COVID-19 and, and, this, and this crisis, at least until we get a vaccine. Um, so that, that's the first question I have. Um, the, 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 the second question is, what is the value of, in terms of, of working in an office, the collegiality, the ability to bounce ideas off people, the networks you develop. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, there's, there's no doubt that the public service has always done flexible work. I think the figure is 22% of the APS worked in some way flexibly at yep. home pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and the figures now are, are getting back towards that level. I think the latest figures at 29, at 20, at 9 October was that 28% of the APS workforce was working exclusively from home. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think what uh, employers will, will probably look for, and we've got to be thinking about this in terms of what the private sector is offering, our competitors to attract talent in, in, in the future, yep. is some sort of hybrid model where people come to the office, maybe for most of the week, but not necessarily all the week. Mm. And then, of course, one of the problems we do have in the APS is the importance of social distancing yep. and following the health advice. And for a number of agencies, including the APSC, we could not fit all our people back into the office yeah. at one time, given and social distance apply. restrictions. So there's some really interesting questions that, that mm. you raised, Senator, and I don't have um, the firm answers to them, yep. but there's certainly something we need to be thinking about. Okay, and so perhaps some more data collection is necessary then or over a longer period of time for you to come to a, a strong view on that? Yes, sir. And as I mentioned, we'll be certainly collecting it for the census this year, and yep. that's an annual annual process, so we can track that over time. Okay, and then just finally uh, to you, Mr. Walcott, um, you've mentioned here and, and also in the COVID-19 committee the extraordinary way in which uh, public servants have been redeployed to other agencies to deal with you know surging needs in Centrelink, for example. Um, have most staff now returned to their home agencies or departments, or is there still quite a significant number who are redeployed elsewhere? The, the exact data, I think. Um uh, 
the first assistant commissioner Hetherington will have, yep. but most of them have now employed, I think it's around about 400 or 300 or so who may still be at Service Australia, but uh, Mr Hetherington will, will be able to provide you the information. Uh, Patrick Hetherington, first assistant commissioner. Uh, I think it's fair to say that yes, most staff have started to return. I think the largest uh, body of people still remains at Services Australia. About 290 APS oh. is the latest data I have. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Uh, that's it from me, Senator Gallagher. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Wilcott, are you aware of instances where SES officers have been engaged through labour hire arrangements across the APS? Um, no, no, I'm not, um, Senator. Do you have no. a view, does the Commission or you have a view on engaging SES officers through labour hire? Um, in terms of, I uh, don't have a specific view on SES orders, but in terms of the use of labour hire and contractors, um, yes, uh, as, as our concern is that uh, there is a role for, for labour hire and contractors. Uh, mm. At SES level though? Um, I don't see why you'd exclude um, SES level. The Public Service Act says that um, SES or the senior executive service consists of SES employees. Do you think having labour hire at the SES level meets that requirement of the Public Service Act? I'd need to take that on notice, Senator. And take some advice on it? Yeah, I'd need to take some advice on that. There are, um, there certainly are SES officers across the APS who are like, uh, employed under labour hire arrangements. How would the merit, APS merit principle apply for the appointment of those officers and other things like the, the executive remuneration policy, code of conduct, values, all of those arrangements? How would they apply to an SES officer employed on labour hire? Well, uh, obviously the relationship in terms of the employment of someone on, from a la on labour hire is with the labour hire company, and the con and the contract will often set out um, principles which are very often in very close accord with the code of conduct principles. Mm. But it depends on on the on the specific contract. These are matters which, are, of course, governed by agency heads, and of course they're governed um, under the PGPA Act, as distinct from the public. They're employed under the PGPA Act, not under the Public Service Act. But I'd ne again, I'd need mm. to take on notice your your specific question around SES. Do you have any kind of understanding of the level of labour hire use across the APS currently? Yeah, I... Like, is it the, something um, that you've looked at? Yeah, it is. I've got some figures on that somewhere, if I can just find them, Senator, for you. I need to take that on notice, Senator. I can't find it immediately in my, in my pack. So it doesn't jump to mind no. for you? Is it, I mean, it's a bit hard. I was going to say, are you concerned about the increasing use of labour hire? Yeah. Um, we, we don't, um, we actually don't collect data around, mm. uh, around contractors or labour hire. Um, that's a matter that if that information is collected, because they're not Australian public service, they're under the, not governed under the Act, we don't collect data on them. Mm. So if, if, that, if that number is out there, it's either held by finance department or by mm. individual agencies. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask them as well. Yeah. Yeah. They'll presumably, um, they don't collect the data either across the public service. I guess the point I'm raising is, um, you know, if you look at Austender and you type in a particular year, um, you can get quite a large amount of contracts valuing quite a lot of money. For example, I think if you use 18, 19, you'll get a $1.5 um, billion, sorry, 19, 20, $1.5 billion in contracts for temporary personnel services across the APS. Um, and I'm interested in whether the Commission is looking at uh, some of the impacts of that you know, because it does have an impact on, presumably, on the, you know, on the public service as an institution. If you are having large parts of your workforce, we had the uh, Aged Care and Quality and Safety Commission before another committee a few weeks ago. They over a quarter of their workforce is under labour hire arrangements, and 
um, one of the issues there is the staffing cap, that it's been used to avoid the staffing cap. And, you know, I would have... I'm wondering whether the Commission has, has you know, any you know, plan to have a look at this and how it's changing the public service or the makeup of the public service, particularly if those appointments are made to the senior executive service, your leadership, you know. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Senator. Obviously, professional public service harnesses the skills it needs um, f from a variety of sources. And uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> a shorter term a shorter term employees or specific, particular niche skills, then it makes perfect sense to uh, go out and hire from um, from, from contractors. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we're having a discussion about having none hmm. <laughs> or some. It's what's your level of understanding of it, hmm. and do you have any concerns about the you know the the level of it, including at very senior positions within agencies and the impact that that might be having on the broader institution which you are, you know, well, a leader of? In terms of, uh, of the, the makeup of an agency's employees, that's really a matter for the agency head. And of course, as I mentioned to you before, Senator, under the PGP Act, they have the responsibility for uh, employing um, contractors. Uh, my focus is very much on capability development and ensuring that we work on the capability side uh, of the equation and the variety of ways we need to do that and we need to do better at that. But there, there is a need, I would argue, for, for contractors at, 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 uh, at a variety of different levels mm. in, the, in, in the public service. Are you going to have a look at it? For... I'll have a look at it, Senator. Thank you. I, I do think it, it works into your capability um, program as well, because I think it probably impacts that. Certainly, if you look at the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, it impacts their capability if you're hiring temporary people on contracts um, to do work that's ongoing and clearly a need for. But OK. Um, and I think it also works into your diversity strategy and a whole range of other things too, if you're just buying in, you know, people by labour hire to do permanent jobs, which it appears um, it's being done. Um, in the, again, Chair, I just quickly, I only got your annual report, I think, this morning, but Ms Smith, I couldn't leave you without um, asking a question. What's going on at the tax office? Like, what, when I have a look, you, you make comment in your opening uh, statements, we had a 293% increase in applications compared to the same period this is talking about reviews of employment actions and a 38% increase in applications compared to uh, goes on and you talk about the impact on your work. You say that the tax office actually funded a position to help you to deal with this. And when you look at the breakdown, they're the standout in terms of review of a promotion decision. 988 applications out of 1,590 came from the tax office. So I mean, Senator, I know they're big, but I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, so it's Mary Wiley Smith. I'm the Australian um, Deputy Australian Public Service Commissioner. I believe the part of the report that you're looking at at the moment relates to the Merit Protection Commission, uh, and, and so it's the Commissioner's report, not ours. Oh right, so they don't appear. Sorry, uh, I thought they, you they would. They can appear, but uh, Ms. War, who is the Merit Protection. Sorry, Commission, my is apologies, based in, is Ms. Based Smith. In Sydney. I was excited uh, about getting oh, the question. Oh yeah, Senator. damn. So can anyone answer that? Is anyone... Can we take that on notice? And there's no one here from the Merit Protection yeah. Commission. Ms. Smith, you can't tell... <laughs> Ms. Wiley but, Smith, but we... you can't tell me what's going yeah. on at the tax office. But we can take it on notice on her behalf. All right. Same all right. Time. My apologies. That's terrible. Um, all right. But I, now I do need that answer, because I really do want to know what's going on at the tax office, that they're all complaining about their promotion decisions. Well, thank we'll, you for we'll that, that information to you. Uh, and um, <laughs> we'll get you. that, question, we'll get that answer apologies. on notice. Um, uh, if there's no further questions for the APSC, I thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence this evening. Um, colleagues, we are scheduled to go to the dinner break at 6.45, um, but we are rapidly recovering the time that we lost during the day. I wonder if we agree we could get through the Official Secretary to the Governor-General now and just extend the dinner break, uh, go into the dinner break by, say, 15 minutes to 7pm.
likely that we can get through them if there's no other right. questions. All right. Well, let's set that as an objective um, that uh, they will join us now, and we will get through them by 7 p.m. and break it for, at 7 p.m. Hmm? And chair, will the break be shorter or the, uh, the break will be. We'll shorten the break by 15 minutes, so we'll come back at 8:15 as originally planned. Uh, I didn't really explicitly say, but yeah okay the committee will now resume uh, with the office of the official secretary to the governor general I welcome mr. Paul singer official secretary to the governor general and officers uh, mr. singer would you like to make an opening statement yeah just a brief one thank you that would be appreciated thank you uh, Paul singer official secretary to the governor general when I last appeared before the committee I spoke about the Governor General and Mrs Hurley's intention to continue visiting communities left devastated by the summer's bushfires. These visits are about listening to and comforting those in pain and celebrating and thanking those who are helping. They and the rest of Her Excellency's program of community engagement reflect their desire, expressed by the Governor General when sworn in, to highlight to Australians their inherent strengths, their concern for the common good, their humanity and decency and their desire for a fair go. Of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the last six months have been very different from what we'd envisaged at the start of the year. But importantly, while the how has changed, the what and the why have not. Over the last six months, their excellencies have participated in over 220 digital or virtual engagements. Through events such as calls with local government and community leaders, reading children's books with families in lockdown in Victoria, roundtable discussions via video conference with emerging leaders, staying connected with communities affected by the summer's bushfires, virtual physical training sessions with veterans, and supporting their patronage organisations, many of which are at the front line of providing direct assistance to the most vulnerable within the community. Events such as these allow the Governor-General and Mrs Hurley to continue to uplift, celebrate, and as required, comfort parts of the Australian community. They may not have been able to physically be there with the people of Australia, but there have been many, many virtual hugs and handshakes. Other aspects of the Governor-General's role have also gone virtual, including the first ever virtual receipt of letters of commission from incoming High Commissioners, and bilateral meetings with Pacific Governors-General and Presidents. And of course, where the Governor-General and Mrs Hurley have been able to physically visit or host parts of a community, ensuring events are COVID safe has been a central focus. We've engaged with the appropriate medical experts and complied with the necessary measures. I am proud of the way the Office has responded to the unique challenges of 2020 and supported the Governor-General and Mrs Hurley with their official engagements. Finally, I note this committee's ongoing interest in the Kirribilli Point Battery Precinct Stabilisation Project. The project is proceeding well. Excavation and dismantling of the stone retaining wall behind the historic marine barracks are continuing. And to date, significant cracking in the bedrock has been exposed, which if left unaddressed, would have resulted in the destruction of the marine barracks. The project will ensure that this is repaired and that the historic barracks are preserved. Restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 have caused a brief delay, and I expect the project to be concluded early next year. Thank you, Chair. I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thank you, Mr Singer. Just one question from me on that, and then I'll hand the Deputy Chair. Um, have any additional costs been caused by that delay uh, or that discovery of the cracking uh, at Battery Point? Uh, I'd have to say, Senator, that at the moment, uh, those latent conditions are being assessed. Um, there's quite significant cracking in that bedrock foundation, uh, which only vindicates the need for mm. us to have done the project at this time. Uh, I did have grave concerns for the preservation of the barracks had we not have completed mm. this project. Uh, but as we're currently assessing what the remedial strategy will be, um, it's yet unclear as to what the total cost will be, but it's somewhere in the vicinity of 3.16 million, which is close to what we had initially uh, budgeted. And you'd recall that um, the office received $1.8 million in additional funding to address this. Yep. And currently the office is wearing the shortfall through our administered capital project. Okay, great, thank you for that update. 
Uh, Senator Ayres. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr Singer, for your opening statement. Um, Morrison government's increased resourcing for your or for the office of the official secretary by more than $3 million this year. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, that's correct. It's $18.02 million over the Ford estimate, Senator. And staffing levels going from 73 to 83? Uh, our ASL is currently at 80, Senator, and the, there are an additional 2.5 uh, positions this financial year, uh, and then an additional six the following year in 21-22, and an additional three and a half positions in 22-23. It's important to note that they are temporary measures in order to deal with a discrete body of work around the National Emergency Medal. Can you set that out for me? Of course, Senator. So uh, you'll recall that after the summer bushfires uh, and the devastating impact of those fires that the government, an government announced uh, on or around Australia Day its intention to recommend to the Governor-General that the, uh, the summer bushfires be declared a national emergency for the purpose of the National Emergency Medal. And the expectation around the eligibility criteria for that suggests that there may be tens of thousands of Australians who may be uh, recognised by that medal. Uh, and that's currently beyond our existing resources to be able to administer uh, the influx, the, the predicted influx of nominations for that medal. And the funding that you refer to and the additional ASL positions over the next three years reflect the administrative and uh, resourcing required to deliver those tens of thousands of national emergency medals to worthy Australians. So that's 100 per cent of that increase allocated to that decision? Uh, the, for next year, Senator, there is uh, 2.5 million, sorry, for 2021, there's 2.5 million attributed to the National Emergency Medal. And there's an additional uh, 317,000, uh, which is uh, for the modernisation of our ICT infrastructure at Government House. Can you pro provide us on notice a breakdown of all of that? Uh, I'd be happy to, Senator. Yeah. I could step you through it now over the forward estimates, if you wish. I think um, so. So, 2.5 million dollars for that. Uh, decision about the National Emergency Medal, mm -hmm. I'm sure I haven't called it the right thing. Um, similar amounts over the forwards, or does that increase? But what I might do for clarity, Senator, is just very quickly go through it. I, I appreciate that the committee's short for time, but uh, in 2021, there is 2.5 million attributed to the National Emergency Medal. In 21-22, where most of the medals will be purchased, uh, sorry, struck, purchased and dispatched to worthy Australians is 5.5 million. Uh, in 22-23, there's 2.4 million. And in 23-24, there's 1.07 million. And that reflects the total costs attributed to the National Emergency Medal uh, over the forward estimates. In addition to that, uh, there is the ICT infrastructure modernisation for the office. And as I've already said, there's 317,000 for 2021. Uh, there's an injection of funds of 4.8 million uh, on 21-22, and that is largely to migrate the office ICT infrastructure to the cloud. And then there's ongoing uh, licensing costs uh, associated with the relevant software of in the vicinity of 650,000 thereafter from 22-23. It's $4.8 million in 21-22. That's a very big number for an agency that's got 83. I appreciate some of those staff are t temporary for the purposes that you've yes. just outlined. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to note that that 4.8 uh, is 958,000 for departmental expenses. So that includes licensing costs and, and the like. Uh, there's 3.8 million, which is attributed to uh, the front and back end modernisation costs, including the transition, as I've said, to, to cloud service. Uh, and that, of course, is in line with the Digital Transformation Agency uh, strategy and blueprint. And that really is to address three critical risks for the office uh, and its ICT. <clears throat> the first is the location of Government House is an isolated venue. Um, it's at the end of Dunrossell Drive, and there's only uh, 
I think one or two ICON cables that connect Government House with the outside world from an ICT perspective. Uh, being a heritage listed asset, there are of course difficulties uh, getting ICT access to some of those heritage buildings uh, without compromising the fabric and the, the heritage value of those buildings. And then over recent times, Senator, the office has accumulated significant what I'd call technical debt, uh, largely because we've underfunded our ICT infrastructure for a number of years. Uh, and in fact, benchmarking suggests that we've uh, been operating at about 50 per cent of uh, the costs of comparable sized agencies. Uh, and that has led us to the point where we now have technical debt that needs uh, rectification and resolving. I had a look at the um, portfolio budget statement for 2017, the year before Mr Morrison replaced Mr Turnbull as Prime Minister. Resourcing for your office in that year was $19.4 million. It's projected to go to $28 million. That's a very substantial increase over just three years, isn't it? Yeah, so it's that $28 million that you referred to, of course, um, reflects the short-term measures for both ICT injection of capital funds and licensing costs, and also the National Emergency Medal, which runs over the course of three years. The, the other uh, addition to the figure that you quoted uh, from uh, several years ago is largely a reflection of the increase in nominations that we've had for the, uh, in the Australian Honours System, uh, which of course is pleasing progress and there's <coughs> importantly uh, more work to do in that space. But that of course comes at a resourcing cost and the additional figures that you refer to uh, are largely in response to those increase in nominations. So I've got a couple of questions about uh, the Honours System. Can you remind the committee of the status of the Knights and Dames Awards reintroduced to the Order of Australia by this government when Mr Abbott was Prime Minister? Uh, there are no knights or dames within the Order of Australia anymore, Senator. And how many Australians were made knights and dames while Mr Abbott was the Prime Minister? Uh, during that period, and I'm, I'm just uh, testing the memory bank here, Senator, but of course it was the, uh, gov the exiting Governor-General, Dame Quentin Bryce. It was the incoming Governor-General, Sir Peter Cosgrove. Uh, Dame Mari Bashir, the Governor of New South Wales, is, was appointed a Dame, and Sir Angus Houston was knighted uh, within the Order of Australia. And then um, the committee would remember that um, Prince Philip was knighted as well. well. I think everybody remembers Prince Philip being knighted as well, Mr Singer. Page 78 of your annual report says under the heading, write down an impairment of assets, assets the variance to budget is attributed to medals relating to knights and dames which are no longer awarded and have been written off. Can you explain what that means? Uh, there was a, a cost attributed to uh, having the relevant insignia for those dames and knights purchased. Um, and with there no longer being knights and dames within the Order of Australia, uh, those insignia hold no value. So what's the value of that write down? Uh, I'd have to confirm, Senator. So it's in the it's in the vicinity of one hundred and thirty five thousand, Senator. One hundred and thirty five thousand. That's correct. How does a medal for a knight and dame differ from other medals in the Order of Australia? Is it bigger? Does it? come with a sword or a No, sword there's, of armor? there's no sword and there's no armour, Senator, you'll be pleased to know, but there are multiple uh, accoutrements as part of that set for knights and dames. Accoutrements? Uh, so there's a number of insignia that a knight might receive as part of their, their package of uh, insignia presented by the Governor-General. For a companion of the Order of Australia, uh, those sets are considerably less and there are less um, individual items within that set. How, how many medals, how many knight and dame medals did Government House produce? Uh, I'll have to confirm, Senator. Uh, we don't have that at hand. We'd be happy to take that on notice, but um, I Could would you also tell me when you provided on notice what it cost to produce all of those medals? Yes, Senator. Um, the annual report says they've been written off. How many were written off? It was one and 
So there are approximately two or three, Senator, that were written off. Um, so two or three... $135,000. That's right. Yes. That's extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, so, so Mr Abbott's decision was, if it's two or three, 135, my maths is, you know, circa $70,000 a medal. Uh, I, I think I'd be correct in saying it's... Um, Senator, I'll just invite our acting CFO yeah, I think to come to the table. So, yeah. Jason, do you want to... This is your moment to shine. So, Mr Chow, our acting chief financial officer. Thanks, Mr Chow. So, w I think I heard you say one medal's been written off. Yes, so we had one medal written off and four waist badge costing 80000 80, and one neck badge, fifteen thousand dollars. So eighty thousand dollars for four, four waist badge. It's extraordinary. I don't think most Australians people had strong views about Mr. Abbott's decision, but eighty thousand dollars for a. It's four of them, so it's twenty thousand. Twenty thousand dollars each. Yes. Have they been destroyed, or are they? Sitting in someone's bottom drawer? No, so in case Mr Morrison decides to come back to the idea? So it has been written off, but we have um, maintained it in our portable and attractive register. Uh, 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 can, can you give me on notice, what, what, what is it that actually... That were, were there special boxes? Was anything else created? What, what, what was the value of each of these items that... So what we can do, Senator, is, is make that very clear in terms of what a set for a night or a dame would look like and the yes. value of each set. A night, and a night set and a dame set were the same? Uh, there are minor differences for male and female, Senator. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Singer, can, can you confirm that the Governor-General has accepted the resignation of Graham Russell Lawrence, a former Anglican, Anglican Dean of Newcastle, and convicted child sex offender from the Order of Australia, effective from 23 June this year? Uh, that's correct, Senator. Steve Smith, a survivor of clerical child abuse who had campaigned for Mr Lawrence to be stripped of his award, said this when he learned of Mr Lawrence's resignation. I'm glad it's gone, but I'm disappointed he was able to resign it. At the end of the day, the man's a convicted child rapist. He should have had it stripped from him because that's all he deserved. Why was Graham Russell Lawrence permitted to resign his membership of the Order of Australia? Uh, I think it's important to note, Senator, that within the ordinance for the Order of Australia, there are provisions around cancellations and terminations. And I might just outline that process for you so we're very clear yes. about this. If the council agree that the person has a case to answer, I, as the secretary of that order, must notify that person in writing. In accordance with due process, that person may lodge an objection within 30 days after the date of the letter from the Secretary. If I do not, as Secretary, receive an objection within 35 days of the initial letter, I must write to the person and to the Council for the Order of Australia and advise that an objection has not been received. And as soon as practical after receiving the objection, the Secretary must provide a copy to the Council and the Council, after consideration, make a recommendation to the Governor-General within 30 days. And as part of that two-stage process, uh, at any time, the individual themselves have the option, and some of them wish to pursue this option available to them, to resign from the order. And, and, and that's what you're saying happened in this instance, is it? We had initiated cancellation and termination procedures uh, and after I'd written to uh, Mr Lawrence advising him that uh, his membership of the order was under consideration, uh, he elected to resign from the order. Has the current Governor-General cancelled any other awards? Uh, so there's been uh, two cancellations and... Sorry, there's been uh, one cancellation and two resignations uh, in the 2019-20 year, which coincides with the Governor-General's term. Just a time warning, Senator. Oh, oh, really, I've only got four to five minutes tops. Um, so that's Mr Lennon-George Cram, who... 
Yeah, in fact, that falls outside of last financial year. That was oh, earlier this financial year. I think Thank for you. memory it was uh, last month. Uh, but there was a cancellation of Raymond Harty and two resignations, Graeme Lawrence, who you've already uh, spoken to, and also Malcolm John. Oh, of other, so you're saying there are two, so, uh, have other convicted child sex offenders been permitted to resign their awards rather than have them cancelled? Uh, well, Senator, that is an option that's available to them as it is to any member whose membership within the order is being considered. Do you uh, think that's a satisfactory process, though? Uh, Senator, my opinion doesn't count. Um, that is what is within the ordinance of the Order of Australia. And in, on each of those particular occasions, uh, due process was followed and the individual member has the option to resign from the order. Um, and they elected to do so after the, uh, the action was taken to commence cancellation and termination. Well, Dr Peter Stewart, who's the Anglican Bishop of Newcastle, said, the process of removing honours from convicted criminals should be automatic and not reliant on community pressure. Mm -hmm. Don't you agree that it's time to review the way that this process works? Uh, in fact, it's, it's a very timely question, Senator. I th there is a body of work going into um, how cancellations and terminations can not only meet the uh, requirements of the ordinance, but also meet contemporary community expectation uh, to ensure that the Order of Australia continues to be in line with community expectation and evolves as necessary to achieve that. It, it really is unacceptable for it to continue this way. What is the timetable for that review? Uh, well, that's a body of work that's been uh, undertaken at the moment, Senator. Um, and I, I should just point out that the uh, Chairman of the Order of Australia um, has recently made it clear around cancellations and terminations that uh, all legal prece proceedings have to be exhausted uh, before the Council, um, under the current ordinance, can be in a position to make a recommendation to the Governor-General. So that is the uh, approach that the Council take and of course the Governor-General acts on that advice. Are you are able on notice to provide us with an outline of the timetable for that review and, and a likely conclusion? Uh, I'd be happy Likely to... conclusion date, I should say. Yes. Chair, I have other questions that we'll put on notice in relation to, uh, to some other matters, but thank you uh, for... Um... Thank you. I'd be grateful if you did that. Uh, if there are no further questions for the Office of the Secretary of the Governor-General, thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence here this evening. Uh, the committee will now break and will return as scheduled at 8.15pm, having made up that time we lost, uh, with the Office of National Intelligence. So you stick with me and you'll be right. We'll now resume and I welcome Mr Nick Warner, Director General of, the, of National Intelligence and Officers of the Office of National Intelligence. Uh, Mr Warner, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, I usually don't chair, but on this occasion uh, I wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes if I could, please. You'd be very entitled to. Thank you. The, uh, the National Intelligence Community, uh, the NIC, provides the government uh, with, if you like, a tripwire for when we, when Australia needs to be concerned. Uh, and in a, in a sense, intelligence acts as a, a guardrail, a guardrail to, uh, to policy. Uh, 2020 has been a tough year for the NIC, as it's been a tough year for, uh, for everyone in Australia. But through, the, uh, through this year, the NIC uh, has, I would argue, ensured that the government has been able to make informed decisions on a wide range of important issues to, uh, to Australia, uh, and including to Australia's security. Uh, as we all know and remember, uh, AGO, the Australian Geospatial Organisation, and AFP and other agencies worked through the summer uh, supporting the bushfire response. 
the Office of National Intelligence, the Defence Intelligence uh, Organisations and others in the national intelligence community uh, were tracking the coronavirus well before it was declared as a pandemic. And we as a community have been tracking all aspects of the pandemic, uh, whether it's the outbreak or outbreaks around the world, the origins of the virus, vaccine development, uh, and the impact of the virus, the pandemic, in countries in our region and, uh, and even more broadly uh, since those early days. Uh, I would argue that the NIC has been agile and it's been responsive, uh, ensuring that the government had accurate and verified information. Accurate and verified information. Information needed uh, for it to make tough decisions, the right decisions. Uh, that information coming to the NIC uh, came from both open source and from uh, covert collection. In doing all that, while we were doing that, uh, we in the 10 NIC agencies also ensured that our offices remain safe and secure, both here and overseas. And the NIC has provided uh, as well as doing that, extensive reporting and analysis to government uh, as it has navigated, as the government has navigated, uh, a much more uncertain and complex strategic environment, uh, including China. Overall, the challenges facing Australia are becoming more complex and the demands on the national intelligence community more intense. Whether we're talking about espionage or counter-terrorism through to newer challenges like supply chain, national resilience, critical minerals, rare earths, research and development uh, uh, of technology or telecommunications. The NIC is, if you like, a linchpin to gather information and intelligence and to inform policy and government. And we're doing this work against the backdrop of a more challenging operating environment for the NIC, uh, emphasised by COVID, but accelerating because of the, because the Indo-Pacific region is marked by greater strategic complexity and competition. Uh, I finish as DGNI in a couple of months, uh, having led, I think, a high performing, and as I said before, agile national intelligence community. While the challenges for Australia are intensifying, Australia now has, I believe, having served in it for uh, a number of decades, Australia now has the intelligence community it needs to successfully face these challenges. End of my statement, uh, Mr Chair. Th thank you, Mr Warner. And uh, can I thank you uh, on behalf of the committee for your very significant career of public service uh, at the highest levels and in particular in recent years in the area of national security, safeguarding uh, Australia's interests. The committee's been very grateful for your service and your cooperation uh, with this committee. So thank you very much. Uh, Senator Wong, are you taking the call? Yes, please. Um, Mr Warner, I, I also want to um, put a couple of things on the public record um, uh, in this committee hearing. Uh, I think given the time frame, unless I get another Senate estimates, this is your, probably your last one, which I'm sure you'll be Thank very you. sad about, right? I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I want to express my personal appreciation and on behalf of the opposition, our appreciation for your work over many decades, public service to the nation. Um, uh, you are someone who is uh, always been dedicated to delivering um, Australia's national interests across the broad spectrum of um, portfolios within which you've worked, you know, defence, foreign affairs, intelligence roles. M much of it is, has been behind the scenes. And um, yeah, I think um, that kind of um, loyalty and leadership, loyalty to country and leadership uh, is uh, the sort of patriotism um, uh, that really needs to be uh, honoured and recognised. Um, so I also want to thank you, so I do that today. Um, I also want to thank you for your engagement with the opposition. Um, the access to briefings that um, you have enabled, uh, at a, as you said in your um, 
statement, a time where I think uh, having understanding uh, the assessment of um, the NIC consequences uh, has been very important uh, for the polity, including the opposition at this time. Uh, and uh, we've certainly appreciated that. Uh, and I place on record that I think that is a, a very important function uh, that uh, ONI has um, provided uh, to um, the opposition as well as to the government. Um, you also recognise in your statement that the changes, the structural changes to the um, intelligence community, um, which are pretty critical, are, are critical at the time where Australia is adjusting to probably the most challenging circumstances since the end of, the world, of world War II. Um, uh, and I've asked some questions about that, but I wanted to start at the outset by just making those comments on the public record. Um, obviously not many people here to hear it, but I hope, um, um, I hope you do. Thank you. Much appreciated, both your comments. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I first wanted to uh, actually go to a point that you and I discussed on a previous occasion, which is the importance of um, the intelligence assessment being... I'm just going to get your hand so I can accurately quote you. Um, intelligence assessment and advice being non-partisan, and you and I had a discussion about this a couple of years ago, actually, uh, and you, you made the point that you will always ensure that this is the case. I just wanted to, to um, ask you again to expound a little as to why that is so important. Uh, really, I'd, I'd hope this, uh, the answer was, was self-evident. Uh, for governments of any political persuasion, anywhere in the world uh, to make the right decisions about complex and challenging uh, policy questions to do with national security. Um, you need to have clear, precise and pristine uh, assessments based on the best intelligence collection that that country has. Uh, that's as much the case for Australia as it is for any other country in the world. Uh, and I, I think, you know, in my long time working in intelligence, that has always been the case in Australia. You know, maybe the intelligence collection or assessment hasn't always been as good as it should be. Uh, but as, as far as I'm concerned, it has never been um, tainted, corrupted uh, by, by any political um, bias. That's the way it is, has been, that's the way it is now, and I'm sure that's the way it will remain in future, and it needs to. It's certainly the, 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 um, uh, the risk of uh, that not being the case I mean, it has been, some might say demonstrated, has been discussed um, uh, in other jurisdictions. Um, certainly, um, there's been public discussion about that in, in relation to um, the United States intelligence community and uh, some of the discussions about the origins of the virus. Sure, there, there has been public discussion, but I hope you'll understand that I'm not going to go into I, I, a... I reference public discussion deliberately. Very, very I, I, I'm, I'm actually not... Asked, I wasn't actually going to ask you about the content. My point was that it has become an... It became an issue of public discussion and political contest. Yeah, and it's very important in a democracy like Australia's that that not happen. Mm. I mean, it's very important that there be a robust discussion. Sure about national security, including about the uh, role of, uh, of, uh, of the intelligence community. Uh, but it's very important too uh, that the intelligence advice and assessment going to government, as I said, is pristine. Mm -hmm. What you do with the advice is might be contested. Contested. OK, can you... I, I wonder, uh, you, you again referenced this in your opening, um, uh, 
are you able to give us a bit of a, a, a an assessment of how the establishment of the NRC and the transition from ONA to ONI has gone? Yeah, sure. I, I think I did this uh, last time, but I'm yeah. happy to uh, update the the committee. So it was a long time ago. Now <sighs> we miss we skipped a round of estimates. So. Uh, Much we, might have we, happened. We all missed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started, uh, as did Paul, uh, Paul Taloni, in ONA just less than three years ago. Uh, and we uh, transitioned ONA to ONI just less than two years ago. Not a very long period of, uh, of, of time. Uh, I think we have, <coughs> I personally think we've done remarkably well to change what was a very good uh, intelligence assessment organisation and had been for 40 years into something that retains that very strong capability but now has what we call an enterprise management uh, element uh, which um, is implementing the, uh, the, the newest part of the ONI mandate to integrate and coordinate uh, the rest of uh, or the entirety of Australia's intelligence community. So we've built up staff, we've recruited some of the best and brightest uh, from uh, around Australia, including from the uh, intelligence community. Uh, and we've built the structures that now allow us to much better uh, uh, put to government the, what we think should be the priorities for collection and assessment uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the structures that allow us to better evaluate the intelligence uh, community. And then with, on the assessment side, and uh, you've heard me say this before, uh, always strong, just as strong now. Uh, now what we do differently is we give the government each working day uh, um, a very short document on the most important intelligence that has come to Australia in the past 24 hours uh, with a short and precise, uh, succinct summary of what it what it means. I think that document has become the go-to document in government and the bureaucracy, national security bu bureaucracy, uh, since we began it just over a year ago. So I think the changes have been quite uh, profound for Owen I. Uh, and for the NIC, if you'll remember, we used to have the Australian intelligence community of six agencies. We now have the NIC of 10. I think bringing in those four other agencies and entities uh, has been important for them, but also important for the uh, the rest of the intelligence community. We're getting a lot better integration. We're getting a lot better cross fertilisation and a lot better understanding of the roles, mandates, activities of uh, of each of the ten agencies. Bottom line, we're getting a bigger back a bang, and we're getting a bigger bang for our buck. Which was the objective. Um, thanks for that. Um, are you able to? Um so one of the concerns, obviously, that was raised through this process was, uh, I mean, obviously the NIC um, uh, kind of spreads across a number of um, portfolios, um, and you know that there was some comment about how how would that integration work and how would the coordination work and you know the person in your position, you know how how um, you know, does the fact that some of the uh, NIC agencies reside in other portfolios, how will that affect um, that coordination? Um, so I wonder if you might respond to that. I mean, uh, you know, how you think progress on that front is going. Is it five out of 10 are in home affairs? Yeah. So, you know, the fact that that's a different portfolio, different ministers, different, you know, heads of department, heads of agencies, um, whether you, how do you think the, that those sort of structural challenges are being dealt with? So it really is a complex uh, structure that we've been given to, uh, to work with. Uh, so of the 10 agencies, or the 10 agencies work to four portfolios and, uh, and ministers. And as you say, five reside uh, in home affairs, three reside in, uh, in defence, one in foreign affairs, and uh, we work uh, to the Prime Minister. Uh, so when, when we are looking for um, efficiencies or 
how do we how do we uh, optimize language training for the intelligence community? We're not just dealing with ten agencies; we're dealing with uh, portfolios, a, a number of portfolios, and a number of uh, of ministers. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we have uh, solved this, we've cracked it, uh, and this is a perfect uh, construct that is working seamlessly now. Uh, you know, I, I think, well, I was going to say, you know, this is probably a 10-year uh, project, but probably like any bureaucratic process, it's, it will evolve, uh, you know, through the years, through the, through the decades. Uh, but it, you know, again, bottom line, it's much better now than it was when we started three years ago. Uh, it's just we're going to have to continue to be focused. We're going to have to continue to uh, work on ensuring that it is as seamless as possible, that where there are um, um, bumps in the road, that uh, we can navigate them in a, in a commonsensical way it's heading in the right direction. Okay, so given this is your last estimates, would you like to proffer some uh, options for structure which might optimise oh, coordination? I, I, I think the structure is, uh, is okay. It's, it's just because there are overlapping responsibilities and mandates and authorities, uh, it's a matter of ensuring that they're, uh, they're, they're gently interlinked uh, and and work sensibly, um, and we're we're getting there. Um, the separation of you know the, the sort of hope commissions principles around the importance of intelligence and policy determination remaining separated. Do, do you, are you satisfied that that, uh, that principle is, continues to be able to be observed in the context of the structures that we, we now have? Yes, uh, I, I am. I don't think there's been any uh, diminution in, in that. You know, if you, over the last couple of years, uh, particularly in respect of uh, China, there's been a lot of media commentary about what are called security agencies, which I presume mean intelligence and security agencies, uh, taking control of policy. Uh, it's a load of baloney. Uh, <laughs> policy continues to be made by, uh, by government, by ministers, by the prime minister, uh, on the advice of policy departments, uh, not on uh, advice, uh, not on policy advice from intelligence agencies, because that's not our role. What intelligence agencies do, assessment agencies, is provide uh, that pristine assessments that we were talking about before, that informs uh, policy uh, formulation uh, and, uh, and options that go to government. Sure, but we do have uh, departments which have agencies which are members of the NIC, therefore policy departments which also have, an, uh, I suppose, an intelligence or an assessment function within the same structure? Well, uh, so the Defence Intelligence Organisation sits within uh, the Defence Department and under the CDF and yep. the Secretary, uh, but I I promise you, I've never seen any. No, no, uh, I was. I, I, but, I, there, I but there's nowhere else where where that fits. So ACES sits within the foreign affairs portfolio, but the director general of ACES doesn't report to the secretary of foreign affairs. He reports to uh, to the minister of foreign affairs. So, again, yeah, no. any intelligence functions within home affairs. So home affairs have. I used the word entity before. So there is an intelligence entity in uh, in home affairs that is part of the of the NIC. Um, <coughs> uh, less clear to me uh, exactly the role uh, of that uh, of that well, not the role uh, the specific functions of that uh, that entity. But uh, as far as I've seen, what's sorry? it called? Uh, the intelligence division, I think. Okay. Home. And what, is that, what does it do? 
I said I don't have. I can't. I can't. You'll have to ask uh, Home Affairs okay. that uh, that question. Uh, but I haven't. I have not seen over the past 22 months uh, that uh, um, entity providing policy advice to to the government. Okay. Uh, but there's not a separate line of report as there is with the other um, entities that you described? No, so it's part of the yeah. department. Which is unusual. So it works to the secretary, works to the... Yeah, minister. which is unusual in the community, isn't it? Uh, just thinking of, of the other nine, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, oversight. So the... I don't know, are we supposed to say IGIS or IGIS? Inspector oh. General of Intelligence and Security. I think uh, I think in that agency they say Igus and I say Igus, so we can. Well, I always used to soft G because it's general, not g not general. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, the Inspector General, yeah. the oversight function. Um, uh, was it the case that the Lestrange Mer Mer Merchant Review uh, yeah. did? Uh, recommend the additional NIC agencies come under the re remit of the Director General of I Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. Believe so, but right. I wouldn't mind taking that on notice. But I think so. Uh, I, I don't think yep. that's occurred. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm okay. sorry. I was going to ask you about so risks associated with that. Have, so have to take that one on notice. But the risks, so. or whether or not it was recommended. Oh, the. Rec Recommendation. It was. It was Thank one you. of the recommendations from them. Uh, you know, yes. it's his last estimates. I'm seeing. I'm. I'm chancing my arm about <laughs> whether he's prepared to say this is a risk and the government could fix it because then they might fix it. So, what, could you? Yes. Well, give well me do, the you, do you do you have any concerns about the absence of Inspector General oversight in respect of half of the NIC? Again, I think this is a complex question because there are, uh, of those four new agencies who came into the NIC, uh, some of them, uh, let's say Austrac, uh, have uh, functions that are not intelligence. Mm. And so I think, I think that's, the, that's the issue. How do, you, how do you handle that? You wouldn't want the IGAS my view, uh, having oversight of functions that are not intelligence functions. But, <laughs> okay, but that's a question about how you draw up oversight powers. I mean, do you think there is risk where there is no oversight of intelligence functions? I think there should be oversight, <coughs> sorry, I think there should be oversight of intelligence functions. Right. And what oversight is there for, is it, sorry, it was four out of the 10, not five, I, I misspoke. Four out of the 10 don't have any? No, four, four, no, four out of the 10 were brought in yeah. to join the AIC. And do not have IGIS, uh, IGIS I, oversight? I think that's right, but I don't know. So do you think that um, the current oversight arrangements are adequate? I think this is still a matter before government, and I should probably uh, stop at there that point. There you go. Chancing arm didn't work. Eh? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there's also um, this issue was also the subject of or discussed in the terms of reference of the oversight, so in terms of reference of the, the review undertaken by uh, Mr. Richardson. Do, do you have any, I assume you have some knowledge of the final, of both the terms of reference and the report? Uh, I do. Did you have, did O and I or yourself personally have substantial input into the report? Uh, o and I uh, certainly contributed to, uh, to the discussion, um, not to the report, you know, as such. The report was uh, Dennis Richardson's, uh, but we were involved in the okay. discussions leading up to, uh, to the issuing of his report. 
Oversight legislation was one of the aspects of the terms of reference, of, reference for the Richardson review? I think so. Yeah. And was it addressed to your satisfaction in the report? So I think that report is still before government. That well, wasn't my question, though. And therefore, I don't think I can okay. comment about on the report. Uh, did you have any ONI secondees in the Secretariat for the duration of the review? This is to Mr Richardson. <coughs> uh, we did uh, for a period. For a period. I'd have to get the exact um, oh, just, frame. Just, I'm having a little trouble with the understanding what happened with the Secretariat here. So we have a very experienced former public servant undertaking a review. Um, uh, AGS presumably had a fair bit of, or Attorney General's had a fair bit of engagement in it, but presumably you would have wanted a secretariat for a review like this to pull in people from, with different backgrounds, different experience within the intelligence community. Did, did that happen? Uh, to my knowledge, yes, it did. <coughs> Why were you only there for a short period then? Uh, no, um, we had different people going in and out during the period. I, I can't remember exactly how many people we had going over. Okay. Um, I can definitely take that on notice. Sure. Why don't you do that? But and it, can you give me the detail of the different people going in and out? But I'm also interested in why that happened. Sure. We can yep. do that. Um, okay. Um, Mr Warner, your uh, 18th of December, did you say? Yes. Give you time to do your Christmas shopping, right? If you can get to the shops. <laughs> um, are you, can you tell me what is the process for appointing your replacement? Oh. Uh, I'm sorry to ask I, you to do this. Is, I, that, is, that, too, is that too confronting? Uh, I guess it's a well it's a decision by uh, government uh, as the position works to the prime minister uh, I'm sure it would be uh, his decision as I understand it uh, uh, the government would advise the leader of the opposition uh, and the uh, nomination if that's the, not the wrong word uh, would have to go to exco to be signed off is the, the consultation with the Leader of the Opposition, is that convention or is that no, in the Act? I think it's in the Act. I think it? it's but in it's the only Act. But it's only advice, not... It's probably... Cons your word is probably right. It's probably consult rather than advise. Yeah. But we can... Well, we are checking. Sorry, I should have looked at this, but I've been doing other stuff, so I didn't look at the provision. You Sorry, take me a few minutes. It's okay. You know your name tags are so small I can't see them from here. Sorry. Holy heck. That's a tactic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here, it, here it is here. Um, before a recommendation is made to the Governor General for the appointment of a person as the Director General, the Prime Minister must consult with the Leader of the Opposition in the House of the Representatives. Hmm. Um, uh, so I appreciate it's a prime ministerial appointment. I actually just wondered if there's been any process that you can tell me about about how that will occur. So prior to the statutory consultation, no. Uh, sorry, nothing I can tell you. 
I shouldn't have given you that out. It was very kind of you. It's my last time at Another, Anything you could tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, last time we had um, a discussion uh, about... Um, Uh, I think people, a number of officers, were well, there two officers acting uh, in... the position of deputy and you were reassessing that position? Uh, two Sorry, uh, I'm just trying to remember. I'm you, you want to go? I'm, going, I'm just trying to find the hand side on it. Sure. So there are two deputy director general positions. Yep. Uh, Dr. Taloni uh, has one on the enterprise management side, mm -hmm. uh, and the other uh, has been vacant for some period of time. Uh, and I've had two uh, very experienced and fine officers uh, rotating through that position. Through the second? Through the assessment deputy position. Right. So two officers, both on, there was one on an ongoing, non-ongoing contract that we discussed last time, and then there was another one as well? No, they're both uh, ongoing. Uh, but they rotate through the position, sort of, you know, month by month. We discussed um, a non-ongoing contract in October 2018. Is that a different... We discussed that in October Yes. 18. Um, sorry, you'll have to give me more. Uh, it was in relation to Mr. Shearer that he was at that stage on a non ongoing contract. Oh, I contract. see. Okay. I'm just uh, trying to so, understand the. Yeah, so as you know, Mr. Shearer left to uh, uh, go to the Prime Minister's office as Cabinet Secretary. Right. And so you have two others permanent who've been rotating through assessment. That's right. All right. Thanks. So I assume, given you're leaving in December, you, you're not, or are you intending to appoint a deputy to the assessment role? Prior uh, to so you? The last Senate est estimates, I think, what I said was <coughs> I had a, um, before that, I had a plan to fill that position, uh, but the individual wasn't able to fill the position because of personal reasons. Um, and since then, we've had COVID intervene, uh, which really has uh, made it next to impossible, at least for the last you know, six months or, or more, to go through a normal, rigorous uh, process. <coughs> and then as we started to come out of uh, COVID, uh, it seemed to me that it wouldn't be, um, well, it wouldn't be the right thing for me to uh, fill the position that I should leave that to my successor. Okay. All right, that's, I think that's all I have at this point, Mr Warner. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Wall. Uh, Mr Warner, just before we let you go, um, just one last uh, set of questions from me. Can I ask you to cast your mind forward a little bit? Um, you and your colleagues in the intelligence community have commented frequently, including before this committee, about the unprecedented nature of foreign interference and espionage threats that Australia faces. Um, can you be so bold as to share your expectations for uh, the future? Is that a trend that's going to continue? Is there any reason to think it would abate? Senator, I don't, I don't want to leave my last Senate estimates disappointing you, but I think I'm <laughs> going to do so. Uh, you know, I think these these are properly matters for Director General Security, uh, for for Mike Burgess, for uh, for ASIO to uh, to address. Um, when you asked me a similar question last time, uh, I uh, quoted back to you uh, Duncan Lewis, uh, I think, and all I could possibly do this time would be to quote uh, back to you Mike Burgess, but I think it'd be better if you ask that question of, uh, of him. Sure. Um, I noticed in your opening statement tonight and also in response to questions from Senator Wong, you mentioned China by name. Um, does it remain your view that that's the principal source of those threats to Australia? 
again, I'd prefer to leave that to, uh, to Mike, uh, I think. Okay. Fair enough. Don't, please don't blame me for trying. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your attendance okay. to the committee, uh, as always, and your service uh, to our country. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the you. committee will now uh, briefly suspend. Uh, actually, no, sorry. No, why don't you take a break now? Yeah, well, that's a good su a suggestion. Yeah, we, we are due to go to the ANAO, uh, let's, but we also have a scheduled break. Why don't we just take our scheduled break early and let's say at, um, at 10 past nine rather than quarter past nine, we'll start with ANAO. Okay, since we're all here, um, the committee will now resume and I welcome Mr Grant Hare, Auditor General for Australia and Officers of the Australian National Audit Office. Mr Hare, do you wish to make an opening statement? No. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wong, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mr Hare, can I unsurprisingly go to audit number nine of um, 2020-21, which is in relation to the Leppington Triangle purchase? Um, <clears throat> I want to go to the referral point, to the AFP point, but before I do that, I wonder if you could uh, take the opportunity to step the committee through the key findings in this audit report. And also to tell us what instigated the audit. Um, I might start with what instigated the audit, and I'll hand over to my colleague, Mr Boyd, who mm -hmm. might go through the findings. Um, uh, we, the audit came about as a result of um, work we were doing in the financial audit of the Department of Infrastructure. Uh, during the financial audit, we um, came across a transaction uh, in the normal course of our work on asset valuation. Um, the asset valuation work identified that there was a, a procurement of some land early in the same year, which was subsequently written down from the purchase price of around $30 million down to around $3 million. Um, we thought that was a significant movement within 12 months, so we uh, asked for some information with, res with respect to the the reasons for the write down. Um, during the, the course of the financial audit, we sought additional information from the department on that um, transaction. Uh, we were satisfied with the accounting of the transaction, that is, the valuations that had been done for the land uh, were accurate, so the financial statements of the agency were signed off as being a an accurate reflection of the financial position of the entity. We had some ongoing concerns with the nature of the transaction. And um, in a closing letter with respect to that, um, those issues with the purchase of the land, we uh, raised a um, recommendation to the department that they undertake a review because of issues with respect to probity and integrity that we thought the, um, that that had arisen in the nature of the, the transaction. Um, we followed that up, uh, received a report from that review, and um, I formed the view subsequent to that that it was worthwhile us undertaking a performance audit of the, um, of the land purchase. Mr Boyd might want to run through the key findings. Ryan Boyd, Executive Director, Australian National Audit Office. So, Senator, there were three criteria we applied for the audit, which is set out in the audit report. The first one was an appropriate acquisition strategy developed. We concluded that an appropriate acquisition strategy was not developed. The strategy that was put in place stated it was about incentivising an unwilling seller to d dispose of the land, whilst at the same time saying there was goodwill to be capitalised upon. We felt the strategy overstated the benefits and didn't actually attempt to address the costs. And as it turned out, the acquisition strategy that was approved wasn't actually applied in any event with no approval for a, further, for a different acquisition strategy, which departed from a compulsory acquisition to an agreement, acquisition by agreement. The second point... I mean, it did seem a little odd, didn't it? I, I have read the report, but it's a contradiction in terms. We want to incentivise an unwilling seller and we want to capitalise on the goodwill of the seller. Indeed. And so there was a package of transactions designed to incentivise this unwilling seller, which included realigning the Northern Road, 
the um, lease back of the land which they were pur purchasing, which based on their own yeah, forward-looking plans w wasn't needed for 30 years. So it did seem to us that the compulsory processes provided by the Lands Acquisition Act, which allow, you, allow the Australian government to acquire their land and then you can sort out how much you're paying for that over time through a separate process, but you could still acquire it when you needed to. It, it didn't seem to us the Department properly identified why it is that was not an appropriate approach to take here. One of the risks, as we saw it, was that the agreement by acquisition approach adopted meant there was less visibility of, of that approach because the compulsory approach required the Finance Minister and the Finance Minister's Department to be involved, and we felt there would have been some benefit from that in this transaction. The second criteria in terms of the findings related to whether an appropriate approach was taken to valuing the land. We can step through the detail, but in essence, our conclusion was that the approach that was taken um, succeeded in inflating the value of the land, which simply led to the Australian government paying more than was warranted in the circumstances. There's a range of reasons for that, everything from the nature of the instructions issued to the value of which the value were pushed back on, mm -hmm. but was given clear instructions, this is the way you get to go about it. So in effect, it wasn't actually a valuation we felt, felt was appropriate for the purposes it was used for. And part of that ref was reflecting the valuation itself. It wasn't actually a point valuation because the valuer wasn't allowed to undertake the inquiries you would normally expect a valuer to undertake. So they, they weren't allowed on the, onto the land. They actually did a drive-by, which they weren't supposed to do, but they did that. Um, so you didn't get a full speaking valuation, if you know what I mean by that, which means that you weren't getting much in the way of specificity about what the land was actually worth. So you had a very wide, wide range of around four to five million dollars between the upper and the and the lower range, the department used a midpoint as if that had some science to it, which it really didn't. And the final criteria we looked at was, were the decision makers appropriately advised? And we found consistently that the advice to decision makers who were within, within the department, as well as the advice provided for information to the relevant minister, to our, from our perspective, was quite inadequate. In particular, it, it did not state things it should have stated and it was not complete in addressing all the things it should have addressed. And that particularly became the things around not identifying the fact that the Australian government was paying significantly more for this parcel of land than roads and maritime services than New South Wales was paying for part of it. And also when you look at other valuations of that land, which I think there's a there's figure 4.1 in the audit report which sets it out, shows you that the valuation the department used, and this is, this is not a criticism of the valuer, because as I say, the valuer was doing what the department instructed it to do, even though the valuer was raising some objections with that. It gave us a valuation which was 22 times what RMS was paying for, for one portion of the triangle for the roadworks. So and 22 times the, 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 the per hectare. process of continued engagement and instruction by the department with the valuer resulted in, amongst other things, a valuation which per hectare was 22 times what the New South Wales government paid. That's correct, Senator, and also many multiples, any of the other valuations. So there's a series of, of valuations of bits of the Leppington pastoral company land which we looked at, including some valuations the company itself had obtained, and all of those showed nothing like the two. Essentially, we ended up paying around $2.4 million per hectare for land that other valuations were saying yep. was, was worth around $120,000 per hectare. OK. Um, <clears throat> Our findings, um, when coming to it, towards the conclusion of this audit, I decided to have a consideration of it, looking at some of the frameworks in place in the public sector about the proper use of resources and in particular related to the ethical use of resources. So in that context, looking at the, the frameworks in, under the public, um, the, the public, public service commissioners, um, directions and under the Public Governance and Performance and Accountability Act, we came to brought, we also included a conclusion that the um, decision making and some of the processes of engagement with the audit office through this uh, weren't consistent with, the with uh, effective and ethical stewardship of public resources. So that was a, a more wide ranging conclusion rather than going to the specific audit criteria. What do you mean by, Mr Wood, there are plenty of questions I could ask you, but I first want to go to the, the phrase that you use, unethical. When we read the audit report, and it is notable, like it's a striking term to use, 
um, and it's used a number of times in the report. What, we, what do you mean by unethical? In the context of the work that we undertake, um, we try to draw upon frameworks ex which exist, which set out the way in which uh, the public service is meant to operate. And in this case, I had regard to two issues. One was the, as I said, the directions put out by the Australian Public Service Commissioner, and in particular those which relate to ethical conduct under section 14 of the Commissioner's directions. And um, so some of the key points there that um, I thought some of the actions within the department um, with respect to this transaction didn't meet the, uh, the standards established under that framework were around acting in ways that model and promote the highest standard of ethical behaviour, having courage to address difficult issues, acting in a way which is right and proper as well as technically and legally correct or preferable, and reporting and addressing misconduct and other, other unacceptable behaviour by public servants in a fair and timely and effective way. With respect to the definition in the um, Department of Finance glossary for how they, uh, that glossary defines ethical in its use in the Public Accountability Act, which goes to a requirement under the Act for um, public servants to, uh, in the use, in the proper use of, of resources to act ethically as well as efficiently, effectively, and um, economically, it goes to uh, behaving in an ethical manner, being in a manner which is consistent with what could be expected of a person in a similar situation, or who would under that a person in a similar situation would undertake a similar action, or um, approving uh, the commitment of resources based upon the facts without being influenced by personal bias. So it was some of the, the frameworks that have been established in the public sector around uh, what ethical means. Um, that we draw upon. Well, in referencing unethical conduct, or did you, in the course of undertaking the audit, uh, identify any conduct which you regarded as potentially criminal conduct? There was nothing that came to our attention in the audit evidence which directly um, would have gone to criminal conduct. We've been told today that the matter's been referred by the Auditor General to the AFP. So perhaps you can take this opportunity to explain to us what actually has occurred in relation to that. And um, during the course, as we're coming to the completion of the audit, um, getting to final draft when, of the audit, when we had uh, the overwhelming amount of evidence pulled together, uh, I considered that evidence and it seemed, it appeared to me that there were uh, gaps in the evidence which could lead to a view that, um, that the, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get the exact words that I thought. While you're doing that, Mr Hare, I know you don't need much assistance in this uh, forums, but as Senator Wong has noted there is a, a police uh, referral that's occurred. So I'll just ask senators and witnesses to be cautious in their commentary in an appropriate way. I think what I... Claim from the chair. Pardon me? I, I assume you're not trying to make a PII no, claim no, from the chair. Senator Wong, I, I think that's a fair observation Are as chair. Mr Hare. Um, what, what, what I think we came, found, came to a view was that the information there, there was information that we found which we couldn't explain and that was suggestive suggestive of the fact that the Commonwealth may have been defrauded. And having come to that view, as I said, we didn't have direct evidence of that. Um, I thought it was in the public interest for me to provide um, information to the AFP Commissioner in accordance with subsection 36.2 of the Auditor General Act. So we don't refer things to the AFP. I contacted the um, Commissioner, uh, raised the issue with him and um, under the Act made available uh, evidence that we collected for the Commissioner to consider. So what did you 
you come to that view? What, I don't... contacted the Commissioner on the 10th of July. 10th of July? Yes. So prior to the audit office report being tabled? Yes. And prior to the section 19 yes. draft report? And um, uh, does, do the questions that you identify arise in relation to conduct of only one individual or is it possible that they relate to conduct of more than one individual? As I said, the, the issue was not so much that we identified conduct which um, was fraudulent. We, I think a plain reading of the report, there's a whole pile of sequences of actions which we couldn't explain. Um, we could hypothesise various different um, assumptions of what may have happened, but it wasn't clear to us why it would happen. I felt that in that circumstance, the best course of action was to provide that audit evidence to an investigatory body, the mm -hmm. AFP, to look at it and make its own decision. Did you, did you want to finish? I'd finish? That was finished, yeah. okay. Okay, so in other words, you've got questions that can't be, that you were not able to answer, which gave rise to the possibility of defrauding. You're not in a position to um, indicate to me whether that's, they, they, those issues arise in relation to conduct by one or more individuals. And so, but in all the circumstances, because the, the questions are unanswered, you decided it was best to give it to an investigatory body. That's Is that correct. a reasonable That's correct. assessment? Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so was it the 7th of July? 10th. Sorry, 10th of July. I spoke to the Commission on the 10th of July and um, wrote to him and he was, uh, we delivered a letter to him on the 13th, so it was Friday and Monday. Right, so you referred it in writing? As I said, I didn't refer to him. My, in writing, I set out that there was a number of issues which um, had come to our attention and that I was, uh, I was under Section 36.2 of the Act making available evidence that we had collected for him to consider. Uh, okay, so that letter was written subsequent to the telephone conversation with the yes. Commissioner? Yes. Right. Yes? Yes. Yes, sorry. And uh, s since then, have there been interactions between the Auditor General's office and the AFP? Yes, we've had interactions. And again, it's largely in the relation to providing evidence is our inter sure. interaction. So, so, so evidence that was obtained through the audit process? That's correct. Senator Rona Mellor, Deputy Auditor General, the distinction that the Auditor General is making is that this provision in the Act, because audit evidence is treated as confidential, does enable him to provide yes. information and he disclose it. For Correct. that purposes, yeah, yeah, no, I, I understood what he was saying. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Has the Commissioner indicated, well, I assume by conduct, given that evidence has been provided subsequent to your letter, that there is an, an investigation underway, whether or not that goes anywhere is obviously a matter for the police. I couldn't say whether they've commenced an investigation. Right. So you can't tell, you, you don't know that. But they have... The status from, tell me the status from your perspective. You, 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 you talk to the Commissioner, you write, you write a letter, um, there, there, has been, there have been interactions from the AFP and the Audit Office in which evidence obtained through the course of the audit have been provided to the AFP, correct? Yes. What is the status of the investigation? I think you'd have to ask the AFP. No, that's fine. I was wondering, from your, to your knowledge, what is the status? What do you understand the status of it to be? Um, we will ask the... the uh, I, I couldn't tell you whether the status is that they're sure. considering whether to undertake an investigation or are undertaking an investigation. But I, I don't think... Okay, I fair enough. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, 
I assume, or did you reference any particular offences that may have been committed as a, uh, in the context of either your discussion or the letter? I think, as I um, said earlier, that I um, indicated that some of the, um, the issues uh, were suggestive of that the Commonwealth may have been defrauded. Right. I think that's... So, uh, would it be correct to summarise that you, you, you came to the view that there was a possibility the Commonwealth being, may have been defrauded and therefore you felt it was appropriate to, write the, to refer the matter to the AFP? I, I felt that we couldn't go any further with the powers and the role that we have to follow it through and it seemed to me that that was a reasonable um, course of action to take. Uh, is it unusual for you, or is it commonplace for you to refer to the AFP matters that you discover in the course of an audit? Um, I, think, I think it's unusual. Um, I don't think we're aware of any other circumstance, although I have referred matters to other investigatory bodies during the course of an audit. Have you, but the, this is since, since you've been the Auditor General of Australia. Is this the only matter that yes. you've referred to the AFP? As I said, I, yeah, referred is in the definition of what I described it as. Yes. Okay. Um, can I ask this question? Um, I'm conscious others will. So I'll try to just go through this. Um, I asked questions of the Department of Infrastructure today. Um, which you may or may not, Mr Boyd, have had an opportunity to consider. There are two things, or a number of things about that I wanted to put to either you or Mr Hare. The first was there seemed to be, from their perspective, an assertion of some inconsistency between the Audit Office signing off on the 1819 financial statements and the comment or the comments in the report about the failure to provide appropriate information. I can't remember quite how you described it, but it's the... Um, the reference to the CFO and the Secretary's response to your request for information. Um, are you able to um, just confirm with, explain what you understand happened in relation to the 1819 financial statements? I think I might be being oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wasn't trying to. Mr. Boyd isn't the financial auditor. Oh, I'm so, sorry. I thought yeah, it was it was he, he was, was involved his, in the report. He was involved in the performance audit. The um, the of course, this is only the financial audit process, isn't it? Yes. Well, they seem to have taken a different understanding of the result of the financial audit than I understood from the audit, the performance audit that has been undertaken. As I said um, at the beginning, well, during the performance audit, the issue of the um, the the markdown in the price in the valuation process came to our attention and we sought additional information with respect to it um, to understand why that had happened. The issue for us was not one of whether the valuation that was in the financial statements was correct um, because we accepted the valuation process which led to the, the current. Our, the issue that our financial audit team was considering was more the nature of the transaction and which was unusual um, and in the context of our normal audit work it's a matter that uh, an unusual transaction like that is something that the financial auditors are required under the standards to follow up. So we were following up that process and sought information from it, um, uh, from the department with respect to the transaction. It didn't bear upon the uh, the audit report that we issued, because the financial statements were a true reflection of the position of the entity, um, but because we thought the transaction was unusual, we sought information and we raised a finding or a recommendation in our closing letter uh, suggesting that a review be undertaken. Um, in the audit report, we raised concerns that um, as is normal with an audit, we, we require a representation from the department's accountable authority saying that they've provided us with all the information um, necessary and with, which has been requested in the context of the audit. Um, with respect to this transaction, the performance audit has demonstrated that not all of that information was made available. 
That it, and in particular there we're referring to the final instructions that were given to the valuer. Oh, that makes sense. So, so any inference that the department was trying to, or misunderstanding that they might have had about the financial statements um, and your comment on that, uh, I think is dealt with in your answer, which is you were, one is an assessment of the financial position of the um, department. It's not whether or not the valuation, the, what they actually paid was appropriate. That's correct. Yeah. Um, um, the um, second point, um, oh, I'll come back to that. Um, another aspect of the evidence today, which was came towards the end of um, the questioning, and I didn't have an opportunity to follow it up as much as I would have liked, was evidence about what the department had already budgeted for in terms of potential sale price prior to valuation. So I asked what costing assumptions were used for the purposes of essentially constructing the budget for the project of which and this land acquisition was obviously one component. Uh, and the evidence from the secretary was that he was going to take it on notice, but the costing assumption um, uh, was in the order of $30 million. Um, which is surprising because I think that appears to predate some of the questionable valuation process. So and I just clarify with you, Mr Hare, or whomever might, or maybe this is Mr Boyd, whether that was something you came across in the context of the audit? So, Senator, in the context of the audit, yes, the department did address whether they could afford to pay the amount that they were proposing to pay for the triangle from within the budget that had been provided by government. The government, the budget provided was broader than just for yes. this land purchase, and there was sufficient money in there. But as to how that budget was put together, no, there were no other valuations of the land. No, no, but were you? But but the in putting together the budget for the project, the, the broader. I can't remember what it was called. It was it called the Western Sydney something project at that point? Yeah. Whatever that line item was, there must there were costing assumptions, including in relation to land acquisition. Did you ever come across what costing assumptions had been used in relation to land acquisition for the Le for Levington Triangle? No, Senator. Right. Would it surprise you to learn if if the evidence today is correct that 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 thirty million was already factored in? Was well, I say? The analysis we did showed that the department examined whether they could afford to pay this amount from with from that budget, not that paying this amount was consistent with an element of the budget set it, you know, identified for land purchase, because mm. as we understand that budget, there was no amount identified to be for land purchase. Mm. Well, it wasn't quite what was explained to me today. Anyway, I'm sure this, hopefully this will be clarified on notice because it does seem unusual. Um, uh, can the Parliament be confident that this department, not you, infrastructure, uh, has um, not handled other land purchases in a manner sim similar to Leviton Triangle, where, as you identify in both your opening evidence, Mr Boyd, and also as is identified in the report, that the three criteria were against which you assessed their performance were, were not met? I think it's difficult for us to comment outside of the audit work that we've done on and if we haven't done audit of other transactions then um, it's it's quite difficult for us to comment. Well, well I mean there are, but there are what I'd put to you I suppose is there are systemic weaknesses which I think are disclosed in the audit. Do you not agree? It's yes. Yes. Um, pro but one thing I would say there senator is we did because of the nature of the findings around the valuation mm. approach, including the instructions given, one of the things we did do was, was look at some of the other instances where, you know, Melbourne is the most recent one, where the departments had to do something similar to see whether their approach to valuation was similar to what we saw here. And one, one of the things we, we do note is that the approach taken for the Leppington Triangle was very different to right. what we saw elsewhere 
the department, yes, the department doesn't do this every day of the week, but this isn't the only time it's procured land, and it won't be the last time we would expect, given the nature of its, its business, but certainly the approach here with Leppington trying to how, trying all about how they went about not only procuring evaluation, but the nature of that evaluation with the instructions being given was very different with the triangle compared to the others ones we looked at in the department. Well, this is multiple engagements in relation to the valuation. Being one of the differences. Well, th that most particularly, I guess, from our perspective is a concern around the instructions given to the valuator, valuer, the fact that you would instruct a valuer and are saying, and this isn't a criticism of the valuer who actually, as I said earlier, did push back to the instructions they were being given to instruct a valuer to, assess, to apply what in their own language was speculative industrial rezoning potential. Which didn't eventuate. Well, the problem is it's, it's very hard for, for this land to be rezoned industrial given both the current legal constraints on its use mm -hmm. and the expected future use on the airport because for very valid reasons you cannot be mm -hmm. constructing industrial buildings at the end of a runway where you need high intensity mm. approach lighting and, okay. a, and certain public safety zones and so forth. So, yeah, this, is, this isn't land that can be used for that. It's not land that can be used for residential purposes either. Does it, does this... Half an hour mark of your questioning. I've got a lot of senators lining up to ask questions as well. Can you give me an indication of how much time you Why don't you give me uh, on this, I'll try and do it in five or ten, and then I'll, I'll, afterwards I'd like to, before they, before the, he got the commission, the order to general goes, I think we should go to his budget. But on this issue, just give me five or ten, I'll, I'll finish my. Okay, all right, okay. well then just let me clarify who the senators who do have questions. Senator Patrick, you have questions? I have questions on number of issues in one supplementary. Okay, Senator Waters, you have questions. I think Senator Rice was with us and did have She's questions. She's going to come back when we let her know. It's a good okay. time to do so. Senator right. Seward, thank you. And coalition senators, I know Senator Scar indicated he might. Senator Reid. Yep. Okay. All right, we're going to have to do our best. I think we're really, really okay. close for time here. Oh, really quick. Uh, oh, sorry, Senator Watt too. I don't want to forget you up the back uh, there. I'm, I'm a passive observer. Okay. Oh, good. First time ever. I was going to say, it's unlike you. Sorry, Senator Wong, please continue. Um, <clears throat> so in relation to the um, uh, behaviour of or the conduct of the department in relation to other land acquisitions, were, were there other land acquisitions where we had meeting people, you know, people at their homes or meetings in coffee shops, non-document, with, with a failure to document that you've, you've identified in the report? Indeed, I think it's probably need to clarify, Senator. It wasn't only with the Leppington Pastoral Company where the department was having such meetings. So our, our concerns in that area wasn't just how it was dealing with this one particular mm -hmm. landowner. It was it was broader than that. There was you know, one other landowner in particular where you know, the coffee house sort of meetings was was far more common than with Leppington Pastoral Company even. And in particular, fail, including a failure to document what, what occurred in those meetings. Well, the, the problems were, were multifaceted from our perspective. Is, is it was typically one officer would have a meeting where it was, wasn't clear what official business was actually being met to be discussed, so there wasn't an agenda. We were generally identifying that these meetings were happening through, if I call it like tertiary sort of evidence, where you'd find reference to meetings having happened in emails or calendar entries and that sort of thing. It's not that they were formally recorded as a meeting was going to happen, what the purpose of that was. There were no records made of the meeting mm. as to what was discussed, what was agreed and so forth. It so this, um, and I'll only ask, it, this was on the public record, is the, the, the other you know, is the other landowner that you're referencing in, these co in, in, the, in this coffee shop reference, was that the um, Ms Waterhouse? Yes, Senator. Oh, okay. Um, but these, you know, this method of behaviour or this mode of operating um, applied particularly to those involved in the Western Sydney projects. That's project. what we're, we're auditing there. Yep. We've, we've ordered this department many times over many years, this sort of these sort of actions aren't something we've commonly observed. Okay. Um, do you think the scan this reveals a weakness in the Commonwealth land acquisition framework? I'm, I don't think we're necessarily positioned to go that far. Sure. It's certainly from our perspective, okay. illustrates some fairly significant weaknesses in how this department 
was acting within that framework. Any concerns about finance's performance? Well, finance weren't particularly involved in this, particularly once it moved away from being potentially a compulsory acquisition, which would need the finance minister's involvement. There was some engagement with finance in settling the acquisition strategy, which, as we discussed earlier, was then departed from without further approval. But the key decisions being made here, which led to, from our perspective, you know, the Australian government paying more than it should have in the circumstances, those were things which have been prosecuted within the infrastructure department, okay. not with the finance department's involvement. Uh, in the scope of the audit, did you identify any areas of concern that fell outside the scope of your audit function, other than the areas of potential criminality that you've referred to the AFP? I don't think so. I think we've included everything yep. in the audit report. Okay. Now, in your opening statement, Mr Board, you talked about uh, the package of incentives which were um, generated by the department and, and, and given by the government to incentivise this, uh, this un unwilling seller, which included the favourable northern road alignment of the airport boundary, the favourable placement of intersections on the northern road, the purchase price for Leppington tri Triangle, 10 times uh, 30 million for land valued at three, the Leppington tri Triangle lease back price, land valued at less than a million, and the Le Leppington lease term 10 years with another 10 year option and an underpass for the use by use of the landowner. So it's quite a reasonable package, all funded by, Commonwealth, by taxpayers. Um, I want to ask about only one of them at this point because of time, which is the Northern Road alignment. Um, did, you looked at the decision to change the route of the Northern Road alignment as part of this project, uh, this yes, audit. Do you know why the decision was taken by the, by the government? Can well, you ascribe it? The landowner it? wished to have the, the road realigned to where it ended up to be, so it was something the landowner wanted, and it was the department agreed to do that on the basis that it would create goodwill on the part of the landowner, which it said would help with us then being able to actually acquire the triangle land. Other than this ostensible goodwill from this seller who we paid ten times what they should have been paid for, is there any discernible benefit to taxpayers from the realignment of this road? Well, if you look at the audit report, Senator, you'll see that there's, there's, it's brought with some risks to the taxpayer. You'll see that we're talking there about how roads and maritime services were quite, quite keen to make sure the department understood that it needed to accept the risk that came with this, because now you had the road coming closer to where the end of the second runway will be, which, as I say, then starts to bring risks about both with the high intensity approach lighting but also the public safety zone which needs to be around the end of a, a runway. So there's extra risks involved in that, yes. I asked if the, you can discern any benefit to taxpayers. Well the only well the benefit the department identified was this goodwill and I think yeah. as you can Apart see from the audit, from audit report we don't we don't agree that there was any goodwill necessarily generated and certainly from our perspective it wasn't demonstrated when you look at the terms of the transaction which then arose from that. So there's no, there's no benefit to taxpayers? We couldn't identify any senator. Who took the decision? The decision was made within the department. Was, there decision, was this decision uh, at any point provided to or was this decision at any point made or engaged, involve any engagement with the minister's office or the minister? So the relevant minister received two, if I call them, four information briefings. Right. One at the end of January 2018, the other one I think on the 25th of July 2018. Both of those were for the minister to note that the department was going ahead right. with the transaction. And as a consequence of this road, taxpayers also built the underpass for the landowner's use. Yes. Uh, which I think, is it correct that the, it's in the order of $10 million? Well, that was the estimate. We asked the department in the course of our audit what it actually cost, because that was an, an okay. estimate, which was quite a high yep. figure, we thought. Their advice to us in June of this year was that they couldn't tell us what the actual costs were. So have you been able to reach a conclusion as to whether there's, there's been value for money as a result of the taxpayer funding and underpass for this land well, order as a result of the road being realigned? Well, part of the challenge there, Senator, is the only... The, the reason that 
there needed to be an access was because we leased the land back to the landowner, which again was part of the package of incentives. So it's quite a circular argument that we needed to give them an underpass to access the land that we'd purchased off them and then leased back to them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate your patience. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Wong. I'll go to Senator Waters next and then Senator Patrick. Thank you very much, Chair. Hi, Thanks for being here uh, so late in the evening and for all of the ongoing good work that you continue to do with limited resources. Um, can I start off with resources? Uh, your annual report notes that the number of performance audits that you completed in 1920 was, uh, was 42, which was below your target of 48. Um, and you also note that the number of audits would continue to reduce if you didn't get some supplementary additional uh, appropriations. I understand you wrote to the PM proposing a more sustainable basis for ANAO funding, but it looks to me like the funding has been cut. Um, do you think the recommendations in your reports have contributed to the government refusing your request for additional appropriations? I, I have no view on that or no way of forming a view on that. Our, um, there was no change in our, in our budget um, and forward estimates in the, in the budget process. OK, well, look, I want to ask about that because, I, I, you know, the error is possibly mine, but the overall resources in ANAO in 1920 were 112 million, but for 2021 and 98 million. Um, so I don't understand how that's anything other than a cut. How would you describe that difference in resourcing? So the total numbers um, that you're quoting there include uh, accumulated unspent appropriations. Ah. Uh. And... Uh, between uh, 18, 19, 19, 20, we've consumed um, those uh, uh, prior year appropriations in a number of ways. Uh, we needed to move buildings, which meant we needed to fit out okay. uh, accommodation for our staff. We also chose to uh, invest in IT, um, data storage, and some new tools uh, for forensic audit analysis. Okay. Those uh, spends we, we see as one-off investments in yes. the business. Uh, we use current year appropriations for current year work and uh, through prudent budget management over a number of years, the audit office has accumulated uh, unspent appropriations. Um, part of the unspent appropriations need to be preserved for provisioning for staff. So about $13 million of the $24 million that remains um, needs to be preserved to manage staff provisioning. And uh, the remainder, so about $10 million, um, will, will be spent on investments to improve quality, productivity and efficiency. Uh, not on current year work is our plan. Can you say that last bit again, please? So, because the, if you like, it's it's money that we've saved from the past, yes. and our financial strategy is to use that money to make investments in the business uh, to improve quality, to improve productivity and efficiency, mm -hmm. um, such as IT developments, uh, new methodology in uh, in software, etc. Uh, rather than spending it on the annual work uh, that the government funds through the, the annual appropriations. Okay. So, so with the amount that we've uh, provisioned for staff provisioning, which every business does, yes, uh, there's about ten million dollars left in that. So, when you read those two numbers, the, the hundred twelve down to the ninety eight, that explains the bulk the of that. Yes, is uh, the reduction in prior year uh, accumulated reserves. Our annual appropriation this year, general appropriation if you like, uh, reduced by $661,000. Okay, so it was a cut, but it was a, a smaller um, quantum, correct? It was, uh, it was built into our board estimates, so it wasn't a change in the budget context. Okay, okay. So given that um, on, the, on that sort of stasis of base funding, um, that you weren't quite able to reach the target of audit reports, what are you anticipating in terms of your ability to reach those targets for workflow in future? In our um, portfolio performance statement, we're forecasting that in 2020-21, we'll uh, produce 42 audits, uh, falling to 40 in the following year, and then by 22-23 down to 38. 
23-24 down okay. to 38. Um, As a result of a static budget? Static budget and the, our businesses, we do two major things, financial audit and performance audit. Um, we're finding the cost of performance audit, uh, sorry, of financial audit growing. Uh, financial audit's mandatory. Um, the, our legislation and the public uh, financial management act says we have to undertake those. We have to undertake them at a certain quality standard. So um, that we have to, there's not a lot of discretion in there yes. for us to, uh, to, to drive efficiencies in that side mm -hmm. of the business. We have in the last few years undertake a number of actions to, to reduce the, the cost of our finan financial audit activity. We uh, last year uh, did a rebasing of our risk approach to financial auditing to mm -hmm. generate some savings, but there's only so far you can go in that without it starting to um, affect the quality of your yes, audit work. Yes, I understand. Okay, so you've had a small reduction in funds, but it's really just the absence of additional funding that's going to constrain your future outputs. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Now, can I move now to um, your investigation into the ANGI program, the Underwriting New Generation Investments? What's what? Where is that at, that investigation? It's not underway at the moment. It's not? We haven't commenced. Oh, okay, so it's due to, st it will commence, but it hasn't yet? Um, I don't, we haven't made a decision, I haven't made ah, a decision whether okay. that's starting yet or not. That's right, yeah. I, uh, what's the time frame for when that decision will be taken? Um, there, uh, our, the process I undertake is on about a quarterly basis, we look at what the next uh, set of audits is, we'll start and we'll, we start working on them. Um, I, I can't say whether there's a time for it to start on or whether it will ever happen at this stage. Okay. It's on it's on a list that we've produced of potential audits. Yes. Um, that list that we put out every year, our annual work, work program, always has more audits on it than what you we will end up undertaking. Do. Yes. And so I can't say that that will that audit's going to happen. Yes, I understand. It might not make the short list, but yeah. it's on the long list. That's when good. when do you make the decision about what makes the short list for the next quarter? When do we do? November. 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 Do, do you have a specific date? No? Okay, all right. Cool. Um, and well, we make a decision to start working on things to decide whether we're going to do them or not. Um, so it's not, we, do, we don't get to November and say, here's the next batch of six we're going to start or ten we're going to start. Uh, we commission our, our audit processes. Once we decide that we're interested in starting mm. an audit, we get a team to start um, investigating what the scope of the audit is, and mm -hmm. then when they do a scoping, we make a decision on then on whether, whether it goes take through. It so it's yes, long list, short list, short Preliminary list, then real deal, go, then yeah. go because okay. right, sometimes we find when we're doing the scoping that actually there isn't an audit topic to there yes. worth doing. Yeah. Yes, understand. Okay, so it's at that very, very early stage. Um, my colleague and leader of the Greens, Adam Bant, wrote to you in May requesting that you have a look at the grant to Delta Energy under that UNGI program. Um, they're the owner of Vales Point. Um, given the close relationship, both personal and financial, between uh, Trevor St Baker and the Coalition Government, have you looked specifically at that grant? We haven't, and no. we would, uh, if the Auditor General decided to go ahead with... Sorry, if the audit, Sorry, it's Lisa Rowder, Group Executive Director of Performance Audit. If the Auditor General decided to go ahead with that UNGI audit, then that may be something that we would consider As in the scoping of that. of that audit. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so you haven't actually... I've got some detailed questions here, but it sounds like if you haven't considered that issue um, just yet. Um... Are you aware, um, noting that, uh, I'll press on in any event, are you aware that the uh, recipient of public funds was um, apparently told prior to the government actually making a decision that they had received money and, that, and he then told the newspapers. So the owner and News Corp knew about the successful award of the funding but the government insisted a decision had not in fact yet been made. I agree, does sound very strange indeed. Has, has, 
have you had cause to look at that? That was the subject of the letter that Mr. Bent. Um, that's how I'm aware about. of it from yeah, that letter. From that letter, yes. Yeah. That's, okay, that's so the only information that we have. All right, haven't had a chance to consider that further. That's right. I'm just really putting a pitch in for the need to do an audit. Well, that's it's fine. You know, it sounds pretty stinky to me. <laughs> <laughs> Indulge me. <laughs> Senator Waters, mindful of the fact you have two Greens colleagues who also want to ask Thank questions. You. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll just move to my last tranche then. Uh, you recently reviewed the AEC's administ administration of the donations disclosure um, database and noted significant shortfalls. The AEC um, uh, did not share your views. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still stand by the findings in your report? Yes. How did I know you were going to say that? Okay. Uh, you. Reporting on the implementation of the lobbying code found that little action had been taken in response to your previous report recommendations. Have you had any response from government, pardon me, to indicate that action might actually be taken this time around? Mm -hmm. yes, there is, uh, Senator, there is commentary in the Attorney General's uh, department's annual report, which was tabled in the parliament last week, um, on the timing that uh, is anticipated for the implementation of the changes that were recommended. Oh, OK. Yeah. I'll go, I can go and look that up. But yeah. in essence, are they now accepting your suggestions? I reckon I read 50 annual reports in the <laughs> last two weeks. Um, there's just a positive statement about action that's being taken by the Attorney General's Department in response to that follow-up audit. OK. In your view, is it? Uh, have they adopted enough of your recommendations? I, I don't, don't think we've view. got to that you stage. Haven't where thought about it. The Deputy Auditor General is just commenting reports. that it's in the annual, the okay. annual report. Um, Okay, the comprehensive audit of the government's response to um, both your and parliamentary committee recommendations is proposed in your 2021 work plan. Um, but do you have any preliminary observations about how your recommendations have been acted upon to date? Um, well, that's the second in what we have to be a series of audits, follow up audits. Um, so we tabled one earlier this year, and um, in that, what we identified, broadly speaking, was that the processes in place in departments for um, following up on our um, recommendations was quite good. The processes for following up on parliamentary recommendations was not as good. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. In your midterm report, you said that the impact of an audit can be difficult to assess, but shouldn't be measured only on the high-profile reports, such as sports rorts, which my colleague will be asking you about in due course. Um, and you said that the fact that independent external audit exists and the accompanying potential for scrutiny improves performance. Do you think that the uh, static funding to the ANAO will re and, and the consequent reduction in your ability to do audit reports will reduce this system-wide deterrent impact? Um, I, I believe that our, um, a, an audit program of what, what we had been targeting of around 48 is a good sized program for an audit office to uh, have a comprehensive investigation of the a sector the size of the Commonwealth public sector. Um, will it change the incentive effects of audit? I would think so. I, I couldn't comment on how much mm. it would affect it. Could the same be said of an integrity commission, that its mere existence has a, um, an improving effect on conduct? Um, I think it's, it's difficult not to um, in, to have a view like I have with respect to the impact of audit and not say that uh, other e the, the existence of other integrity agencies, whether it's the uh, proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission or the other e existing entities that exist for that purpose, including the AFP and um, other inspectors across the, the Commonwealth, they have an impact um, because people know they're there. Mm. Or with other committee members. Thank you, Chair. I've got one final one, if you don't okay. mind. Thank you. Um, one of the audits proposed in your 2021 work plan relates to the use of evidence and data in policy development. Um, what motivated that? Have you uh, seen concerns or, or, or seen evidence that there's been a reduction in reliance on evidence-based policy making? Um, 
I, I think policy developments are a key function of the public sector and evidence-based policy development is seen as, a, as an important component of that. We have done audits in the past which have uh, raised issues in that area. But on balance, I think when we look at the audits that I've been involved with in the Commonwealth over the last five years, policy development wouldn't be the highest area of concern that you'd say that we would have identified in the quality of work in the sector. Um, okay. But that, that um, the lack of evidence that something is bad doesn't mean that we shouldn't go in and audit it because sometimes the audit can share good practice as well as point out bad practice. So yes. it's, it's an important area of government activity. Yes, okay. Well, look, thank you very much for your time tonight and your work. Thank Thanks, you, Senator Waters. I'll go to Senator Patrick and then Senator Scar. Thank you. Just a couple of supplementaries uh, initially. Um, uh, Auditor, you um, mentioned the word defraud in relation to the Leppington Triangle. Um, that were the sort of uh, observations that you made that caused you to at least inform the commissioner, police commissioner. Um, obviously, that's uh, using um, uh, wrongful or or criminal deception to obtain an advantage. Uh, you might be aware of uh, Lord Lord Denning, uh, who, who uh, uh, of of the High Court in the UK, setting the standard. That fraud unravels everything, and that no judgment, no contract, no transaction can be allowed to stand in the case of fraud. Do you? Are you of the view that the Commonwealth might be in a position to plead and perhaps prove uh, defrauding to the point where this money could be returned to the Commonwealth? As I think, as I said at the beginning, we didn't find evidence of fraud. What we identified were was a elements of the transaction which we found difficult to explain, and the reason that I uh, contacted the AFP. Um, on this was because that um, it was suggestive that fraud may have been involved. So I can't speculate beyond that. We, did, we didn't find direct evidence of criminal behaviour. What we found was what we put in the report, which is right. a whole pile of information which left open questions which I didn't believe we could go to. The AFP, if they felt uh, that the evidence uh, passed the test that they would go there would be in a better position to deal with it. So, Did the strange behaviour exist on the Commonwealth side or on the side of the landowner? The issues that we dealt with was the procurement processes of the department. Okay, thank you. I'll move to my next uh, uh, supplementary in relation to Senator Waters' uh, contribution. Um, in actual fact, um, You've said your audits will go down to 42, 40 and 38. Is it not the case that your standard benchmark or um, historical average is something like 48? Is that, is that normal? That's the number that we, we've been targeting for most of the time that I've been here. Our numbers have, have been at the high 40s, 50s over the last decade okay. or so. Section 53 of your Act requires you to make your recommendations, uh, uh, your budget recommendations available to the uh, to the JCPAA. Now, of course, I'm a member of that, so I'm just really getting putting some things on the public record. Did you provide that submission to the JCPAA? Yes. Okay. Did you make it the JCPAA aware of the effect? Because this is 20, a 20 percent reduction in your audits. Did you uh, draw to their attention the fact that there, there would be such a reduction if, you, if your budget submission wasn't um, uh, accepted? Yes. Did you draw that fact uh, to the Prime Minister's office when you made your submission to the Prime Minister? Um, our submission was based upon the same information that we provide to the JCPAA. So I presume that means, yes, you drew the Prime Minister's attention to the fact that the number of audits will decrease from 
a standard of 48 down to something uh, that, that is 20% less? Yes. Okay. So eyes wide open in, in terms of the government making their decisions. I can only talk about what we've done. Sorry, can I just ask, did you get a reply? Oh, no. So, because this is the annual report letter, I think Senator Waters has asked you about. Sorry, the report you, the, the, the letter you reference in your annual report. Uh, you've now had two senators ask you about it. Has the Prime Minister responded to your letter? No. Only through the budget. Um, the letter was a budget process letter. Okay. Um, I just want to switch to water, the strategic water purchases. Um, uh, in the in your audit, uh, you found that of the purchases you examined, all of the purchases were made at a price that was less than the maximum valuation. Is that a fair um, uh, statement in respect of what you found? Uh, Mike White, Senior Executive Director, Performance Audit Service Group. Um, I think I think the words we used were maximum allowed. Okay, um, I'll just go to uh, Kiora and Clyde, uh, colloquially known as the Watergate purchases. Um, in your audit report on page 20, you state that the purchase price per megalitre is $2,745. Um, are you familiar with that? Correct. Okay, I have the valuation that was provided by Colliers for that particular property, uh, for that particular water purchase, and uh, it took me uh, a couple of years to get it under FOI. Um, it it makes, makes it very clear in the summary where it talks about the valuation that the nominal value of per megalitre was $1,500 per megalitre, and the valuation range was 1,100 to 2,300 megalitres per, per um, to, to, sorry, 1,100 to $2,300 per megalitre, which is uh, well short of the $2,745 uh, per megalitre paid. So I'm just trying to understand how you, and I'm happy to table this, uh, this valuation, if you if you require it, it's obtained under FOI. Uh, we, we have a copy of the valuation. You have so. a copy of the valuation. So how did you come to a conclusion, noting its valuation range is well short of um, what was paid, that the uh, th that the, co the the department paid underneath the maximum valuation? The report also discusses a, a range of factors that would influence uh, future sales prices and talks about an expectation of a premium of between 10 and 30 per cent that could be expected uh, to apply to the sales. Okay, so, so that's, that's in the, the Collier's valuation. There are a range of statements, there are a range of baselines in the front part of this document that talk about you know, um, performance of the of properties, and I note that this, this particular property had performed really poorly compared to others in the region. Um, it, it simply made the suggestion that there are, op there, there are um, circumstances where you might find valuations against properties uh, at a premium, but there's no question that uh, the final conclusion of the valuer in his summary, where he talks about the valuation, considering all of those factors, gave a valuation range of $1,100 to $2,300 per megalitre. So, so I accept that in this document it says, it talks about premiums being paid. It talks about a whole range of other things. It comes to a conclusion, $1,100 to $2,300 per megalitre. And that range is directly correlated to the analysed sales in the tables on the previous pages, which lead to discussion, which also talks about the absolute minimum price that would be expected for the last historic sale of $2,300 would be higher in a future period of time. So reading the report and analysing the tables of sales and the expectation of a premium 
was what we read the report to be saying. Okay, I wonder if you could re-examine that. I mean, I just at the end of the day, when you get a valuation on a house, on anything, there are a whole range of things that might be talked about. Then the valuer presents his his his, his or her findings, and in this inst in this instance, it's really clear what the range is. I wonder if you could perhaps re-examine that, um, and and uh, come back on notice as to whether or not you think. Uh, an error has been made in the way in which this has been read. We have done some additional analysis since the report. The previous report tabled a smaller range, and I think that was in February 17. The report you're looking at was in March 17, sorry, May, uh, February 16 to March 17. There the original two valuations that were made, the, the one was in September, and the, the, the second one. Uh, was uh, a little bit later, but both came up with the same ranges. Uh, there was a previous report from the prior year that we were referring to. We looked at that. That report also included an expectation of a premium between 10 and 30 per cent, and within approximately five months, the Boone Gargle sale for 23 had, 2300 had actually occurred. So it was an increase of 39 per cent, so over the premium that was actually expected. So, I mean, why didn't you take some of the other um, factors that were involved in the, um, d the uh, description as to how the valuer had come to his or her conclusion, such as the poor performance of the, of the property in terms of uh, you know, its return on investment over the, uh, over the years prior to the sale? I haven't seen anything in the valuation report about a poor performance from the property. Um, okay. Well. Certainly there's uh, information on the public record um, uh, that, that goes to, to that. There were some previous valuations done within, the, uh, within that particular valley. Um, did you look at all of the valuations or simply the ones associated with, with the department's purported due diligence? We looked at the two valuations that were provided in terms of assessment against this sale. Okay, the, the other... Um, I put it to you that, that no reasonable person could, could somehow extrapolate what is clear in the valuer's report as to the range of the, of, the, uh, of the valuation. I think it might have been suckered in by the department in terms of um, how they might have interpreted it. I think the statements in the report are very clear when it talks about Boone sale at 2300 would be the absolute minimum that could be expected if it was sold again. That's outside of the range that's provided in the conclusion because it reads into it the 10 to 30 per cent premium that's expected. Uh, the, the range actually uh, goes up to 2300. The report actually also says that that would be the absolute minimum that you could expect and that future sales would even be higher than the Boone Gargle sale. All right, we'll go to um, uh, the, uh, the other... Just several other senators lined up. How much longer do you think you need? All right, um, maybe I'll come back around if there's time. There will not be time, I'd be very surprised. Okay. Um, I've got two... Uh, just one more, one, just, just looking at one more uh, water purchase. Um, and this is the, uh, uh, the low Bidji uh, supplementary flows. Again, the auditor came to the conclusion that it was, uh, you know, in effect, represented value for money or was within the price range. Um, the price paid in this instance was for uh, was $370 per megalitre. Previously, the Auditor General had done a report on the Nimi Kiara, um, where it was very concerned that the Commonwealth had paid $175 per megalitre. Did you reference that previous audit when you looked at that particular sale? We were certainly aware of the report. Um, are you, when you looked at that report, um, oh sorry, when you looked at the purchase, uh, Dor had used a desktop valuation uh, that related uh, to Murrumbidgee supplementary licences. That's how it came to the conclusion that it was paying the right price. However, 
under the water sharing plans, you're not allowed to transfer water from that valley, from the Murrumbidgee to uh, 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 to the Low Bridgie, uh, Bidgee area. I'm just wondering why you accepted the valuation methodology of the department taking valuations from one valley and using it in, an, in another. I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Okay. Perhaps if you could examine that and uh, come back to us, I'd be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Patrick. I appreciate it. Okay. Senator Scar, and then we'll go to Senator Seward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Hare, I just wanted to uh, get clearly on the record uh, a statement I think you made to Senator Waters in relation to a line of questioning on the budget, and that was, and I took down your comment as follows, that there'd been no change in the ANAO's budget in, a con in the context of a budget. There'd been no cut in appropriations in the, in the context of the budget. Um, looking at the forward estimates. Our forward estimates from the estimates that were available um, earlier in the year to the budget hadn't changed. That's correct. So there had been no change? No. So there had been no cut to those estimates? Um, to what was expected across the estimates? There was no change from what we were expecting in our budget to what was in it. Right. So you didn't get, you weren't successful in terms of the request for the supplementary funding. And I, as you know, I'm on the JCPAA as well as Senator Patrick. Uh, but there was no cut from That's what you were expecting across the Ford estimates. That's correct. Thank you. Um, our, our Ford estimates had our budget falling from 1920 to um, 2021 by 600,000. That was built into our Ford estimates. It's uh, before the budget, that's how it is after oh, the budget. It's a, it's a last budget cut that uh, remains in it's, place. It's the combination of what happens in budgets over decisions yes. over a number of years. So I wouldn't like to say it's a last budget cut. It's, a, it's the combination of impacts of efficiency dividends and indexation adjustments and um, savings measures across a number of years lead to your Ford estimates. So, so whilst I know Senator Waters is trying to have another crack, the reality is that there was Senator, no there was no cut across the Ford estimates from your perspective in the current budget. That's correct. Just to Thank the work you. That he does, that's all. So just, 20 just moving order, just order. Senator Waters and Senator Patrick, your questions were heard in absolute silence, and with respect to other senators, I ask you to extend the same courtesy. Just in relation to the efficiency dividend, uh, could you please outline the steps which the audit office has taken? Uh, to build in some efficiencies in terms of your costs? Um, I think there's a... My recollection is, from sitting on the JCPAA, you've taken steps in relation yeah. to introduction of data analytics... We've done data... and how certain, certain functions... We've done... Uh, introduced data analytics to try and drive the efficiency of our audit processes. We've... Um, we have a very seasonal workflow, particularly in financial audits, so that we've tended to rely on contract in um, staff, which is quite expensive compared to uh, permanent staff, so we've tried to move towards having a higher percentage of permanent staff uh, doing our financial audit work um, and, and in, in the downtime using them for other performance audit type activities. Um, we've done a, undertaken, a, as I said earlier, a risk re-risk assessment of all of our performance audits to make sure that we weren't over auditing, sorry, financial audits to make sure we weren't over auditing in order to uh, drive down costs. Um, when we moved from the, our previous building to the new building we moved to, we reduced our uh, footprint significantly in order to drive savings in our accommodation costs. Um, it's a combination of addressing efficiency across the whole of the business. So, so I understand, Auditor General, you've, you've got a particular philosophical view based on whether or not the ANAO should be subject to the efficiency dividend. But just, just parking that to one side, notwithstanding that, mm -hmm. in terms of the in principle argument and independence, uh, the ANAO has still been very successful 
in terms of identifying efficiencies and taking appropriate action? Is that a fair comment? Um, I think we try our best to utilise every cent of taxpayers' dollar we receive in the most efficient way that we can, as you would well, expect of us. Certainly my, my observation from sitting on the JCPAA is you do an extremely good job of that. Uh, just in terms of the increasing costs of audits, my understanding is that uh, some of these cost pressures that are on you and your team are uh, as a result of changes to accounting standards. So uh, the expectations in relation to some of the financial audits have, have changed as a result of the accounting standards and other things which have increased the complexity. Is that a fair comment? It's one of a, a number of factors. Um, there's been changes to how we go about valuation, valuations, lease standards, etc., which when, when you're changing standards, it adds additional costs. Um, there's been, I think, an increase in complexity within the financial audit field generally. Um, we, we're doing a, a lot more complex valuation work now than what we've done in the past. Um, that's, a lot of that's driven by the complexity of government. Um, the, the, the government is probably more active in utilising its balance sheet now than it was, say, a decade ago. Mm. And when you're doing that, it requires uh, a lot more effort in valuation effects. Um, for example, uh, this year in our audit of uh, the Department of Infrastructure and Communications, um, the NBN for the first time was brought onto a, a cash flow basis of valuation in the, in the accounts of, uh, of infrastructure, which required us to do about I think over 200,000 in additional valuation work in that department compared to the previous year. Right. And as I understand it as well, there's, there's a bit of a systemic issue insofar as the fees you get paid or the ANAO receives for doing certain mandatory audits, they don't all come back to the audit office. Some of them go into consolidated revenue. So whereas your costs might be increasing because of that complexity. Yep. The fees you're receiving in relation to some of the mandatory audits, in fact, go into consolidated revenue. Is that correct? Um, for GBEs or government business enterprises, generally the, they're required to pay a fee to us, unlike uh, yep. the rest of our mandatory audits, and we don't have a, a revenue retention arrangement with respect to that, no. So, so for the GBEs, those audit fees going to consolidate revenue, they don't yeah. come into the ANAO? That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. So to the extent uh, the accounting standards, the financial structuring, et cetera, is putting cost pressure upon you, you're having to absorb yeah. that cost pressure as opposed to receiving revenue which you can use to offset against the costs. Yeah. Is that for that, correct? For that component of our work, yes. Right. Is that the sort of issue, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the sort of issue that needs to be considered as part of a 10-year review of the Auditor General Act? Is it under the Act that, that that mismatch occurs between the revenue and the cost, or is it some other policy issue? Um, the revenue retention is, a, is more of a budget issue, I think, rather than an a, uh, Audit Act issue. I think one of the, the challenges that I, that I would see with... Um, with considering moving the ANAO onto a cost recovery basis is how that plays off against uh, independence in audit. Um, I'd be concerned if we were put in a situation where we were into a more client relationship with the entities that were audited rather than focusing primarily on auditing for the parliament. Um, so I'm not certain that's the funding issue, how the audit office is funded in terms of cost recovery uh, could be an issue picked up in the JCPAA review of our legislation. Um, it would need to be associated with changing the budgetary arrangements as well. It was a really interesting comment you made, um, Mr Heron. I just want to make sure I understood it correctly. You were saying you would prefer to have a more client-style relationships with these GBEs, was that right? No, I said the reverse. No. Oh, the reverse. Okay. You've... I, I would prefer that the Parliament funded us for our activities and we audited for the Parliament rather than being into a client relationship right. where it may change the incentives of how our work... Indeed. Okay. Understood. Thank you.
Sorry, but, but, but there is this issue, there's this real systemic issue that the complexity yes. of what you're having to do in relation to these mandatory audits has increased and that has nothing, well, to some extent has to do with government actions but it's, it's, it's really driven by accounting standards, uh, the complexity of the, the transactions which are auditing, etc. The but then the funds are going into consolidated revenue for, what, approximately 40%? No, it's, it? um, it's less than that in terms of revenue. I could get that for you. I don't have right. it in So, um, for ANAO financial statements audits, uh, just under 70% of the total number of audits and approximately 40% of the total audit fees charged are contracted out to firms. Um, 199 of the audits get done that way. Um, the contracting out uh, tends to be in the DBE space. Um, you're absolutely correct. Complex asset and financial transactions, um, accounting standards changes, increase in the number of entities. So when a new uh, GBA yeah. or corporate set up to conduct a specific piece of business. Um, what what, we've, sorry, sorry to interrupt you sorry. there, Ms Mellor. How much of a change has there been in the number of GBEs over time? Could, oh, you could take that on note. Specific yes. number. So it's about, sorry, coming back to your question, it's about $4 million of our revenue comes from, um, is that section seven? No, that's oh, that's a different, no, sorry. We do other work that. by arrangement that no. we can keep the fees for, um, which is no, only about sorry. $4 million I was, worth of I was work. reading the wrong number. Yeah. It's okay. Oh, we'll right. come back to you with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not something that flows from the Auditor General Act, this, no. this mismatch between the, your increase of, in cost because of the complexity versus the revenue going in the consolidated revenue. No. Right, okay. All right. Are there any other systemic issues that would arise through a potential review of the Auditor General Act that, that affects uh, our... could address some of, these, some of these issues of the increase in complexity? So presumably when this review uh, occurred 10 years ago, or where it, whenever it occurred, it was done in a partic particular context at that point in time where there was less complexity. Now the review is occurring in the context of greater complexity. How, how should that bear on the um, process? In the past, the implications of reviews of the Audit Act have tended to expand the mandate of the Audit Office rather than anything else, which have led to increasing resourcing pressures. So. Um, expanding it into our, the work we now do in GBE performance audits was, uh, I think, came out of the review. Yeah, but with then. by request. Um, so there's really the, the budget issues tend to come from the mandate issues. Um, so the scope of work that we do, mm. um, because the, how we do the work is set out in standards. Um, and largely we adopt the Australian or international standards for, for auditing and that, that drives the, the way we do the work and um, some of the complexity comes from the, in the financial audit side, it's the, the auditing standards. In the performance audit side, um, some of our cost drivers there are about the complexity in evidence gathering as much as anything else. So we, we do a lot of, um, Compared to five, ten years ago, we do a, we collect a lot more data because entities have more data uh, on issues. And it's just 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 in relation to that point, it's there's there's more data, but at the same time, as you referred to earlier in your testimony, you're investing more in terms of data analytics. That's right. Which hopefully assists you to go through data and identify the key data? Well, we need the data analytics because there's so much unstructured information that we need to get to an audit conclusion. So we rely a lot more now on email records rather than documentary records or email records to access documentary records because so much data is unstructured, which means that we need sophisticated uh, data analytics tools to be able to, you know, get five terabytes of email data and pull out the records from them. So, so just my last question, I, I know other senators <laughs> want to ask questions, but isn't it then the case that if the, if the entities, whether or not they're a GBE or whatever they are, if, if they were more organised or more structured in terms of their data, 
uh, set up to make it easier for them to be audited, yep. that would be one way in which your cost could be addressed? Yeah, and we, and we are looking at that. We've, um, particularly during the last few months with COVID-19, we, we're getting more direct access into entity systems, which is lowering our transaction cost with entities, because if there's a number of entities where we're constantly in their IT systems, and that means that we don't have to do uh, the cost of transacting with them, asking them for information, um, is reduced because we can just search on a, a real-time basis and we're finding that a, a significant improvement in the efficiency of our work. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Seward. Um, I wanted to first address an issue around the COVID-19 Commission and then I've got some questions around your audit um, report on Services Australia. But I wrote to you in July um, asking about the possibility of an audit into the um, work um, done by the National COVID-19 um, com uh, Coordination Commission. And you wrote back and said you, 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 can, you would consider that in the COVID, in your consideration of other COVID-19 related audits. Subsequent to that, the Commission's been converted now into the National COVID-19 Advisory uh, commission advisory board, and I'm wondering, does that change the ability, your ability to do audit of their processes or activities? No. No, it doesn't. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I presume that's still under consideration. Um, yes, we've included it in a, an update to our annual audit work program of potential audits in the COVID-19 space. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. I wanted to go on then to the, uh, your recent um, report on Services Australia systems redevelopment, managing risk while, trans while planning transition. And I'll say from the outset, when we start talking about technical systems, my understanding is fairly limited. Um, but you, may, you make a number of points, and I wanted to go to the area first of um, cyber security risk. And I will note that that comes up as a broader issue in your mid-term review. Can you just uh, expand a bit on the risks posed by not having a uh, cyber security risk treatment plan? And you make the point that in the December 2018 CIO group, operational risk management plan asserted that there is a risk that customer personal and official information is compromised. And of course, that's the issue that I'm very concerned about. So what is the problem and is is it likely to get fixed in the near term? Um, in relation to your first question um, on cyber security, so the issues were that there were some control requirements that are required under the um, public of the PSPF, also the, I, the information security manual, which the department weren't fully meeting all the requirements of, which is so part of the essential four. Uh, so we raised a finding in the audit that um, Services Australia did not apply an appropriate framework to manage cyber security risk. Uh, and as it did not cyber security risk assess or accredit all elements of the system. So there were controls in place, but we felt that there needed to be a level of assurance that the department sought for itself, that all of the cyber security requirements were being met. Um, the implications of that, given it relates to Services Australia systems, um, which hold public yeah. data, um, is, is the risk of potential threat, I guess, to, to those systems um, being corrupted. And is that, I mean, this is a report that you've just done. Yes. Um, September 24th from memory, um, or, some, or around that time. 24th of September, you got it So right. is this still the current situation? that that hasn't been addressed? I mean, I know that you've got... Yeah, so once we complete the audit, we, we don't obviously keep auditing. So um, that would those recommendations are sitting with the department. Uh, the department agreed to the recommendations and therefore we would expect that they would take action on those, but we haven't gone back into the department. Um, but cyber security is something that our financial statements team will look at as part of their, their normal course of business. So. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things. I do note that they'd said that they'd do other things that they have failed to do in terms of undertaking this transition. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
what time frame do you understand that they've undertaken to fix this particular problem? Um, we have not been given a time frame on that. That would be something to raise with the department. Uh, we, do will be. <laughs> uh, we do have further audits on the audit work plan of the Services Australia systems. Yep. Um, so in, it, whether in, at a point in time in the future that we pick up on those audits, if the Auditor General decided to, um, that is something that we would look at. Okay, thank you. Could you give me an understanding of, given my extensive non-technical knowledge, <laughs> non-extensive, I should say, um, what level of risk is this, that this hasn't been done, given also bearing in mind the other comments that are made more broadly about cyber security in the midterm review? Um, do you want to take that? Yeah. The, the government's established a, a mandatory framework for departments to implement with respect to cyber security, and we audit against that framework, and hold agencies to account for meeting the requirements set out there, which is the mandatory four elements and having strategies around the remaining four and the essential eight and a number of other issues. Um, what we identify usually are uh, weaknesses in some of those elements. Um, it's unusual that a department isn't aware of that when we when we're reporting it, um, and we're reporting the actions that they're taken. In the normal course, uh, most of the time, the entity would have um, other controls that they're putting in place to try and uh, deal with the risk, to minimise it while they're trying to uh, to uh, fix the, the, the substantive issue. Um, of non-compliance non with the framework. So I wouldn't like to go to talk about what the degree of risk is. I think that's a matter that you might want to address more okay. to the agency itself. I do note, uh, I did note in 2.30 that despite identifying significant uh, strategic cyber security risks and assessing the generic operational cyber security context, risk context as high in 2018, Services Australia did not cyber security risk assess, certify or accredit all elements of the welfare payment system as required by PSPF. Yeah. So what we're saying there is that they've, there's a number of actions which they're required to do under the framework. Um, they, that's effectively just saying what I said before. Yep. They've identified them, but they haven't done it yep. yet. Yep. Yes. Yep. So is it fair to say then that it's still high? That's their assessment. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. It's fair to say, well, did you say anything to suggest that it's not still high? Well, I, again, I think you'd have to ask the department yeah. where it's at yeah. right now. Yeah. Our audit, uh, while we tabled this audit in September, um, that's, it was probably valid at that time. Yeah. I don't know what they've undertaken since then, but. But the transition of systems was very much still in play when we, when we undertook this audit. Um, and we, but at the same time, that since this, they were dealing with COVID issues as well. So there were a number of things that yeah, had been I put do, on hold. Yeah, I, I do take the point about yeah. COVID, but this, this just didn't happen from March this year. No, no, this no. was an existing issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, in terms of then procurement, because you also address the issue of procurement both in here and in your midterm report, in terms then of the process, because I note reading this that some things have been dropped and discontinued through the process, mm -hmm. does that point to either changing technology and the approach that's taken or a failure of the, process, the procurement process? My understanding from um, the team who undertook the audit was that the, the understanding of what the system that was existing could do and the ability of a, another um, product, if you like, that could be developed um, wasn't going to necessarily meet all of their needs. So it's not really a failing of the procurement process. Um, at the audit report pointed out that there was perhaps insufficient documentation of the business requirements and what the existing system delivered for them to accurately articulate that in order to find a product that then met all of their business needs. So as they went through that process, they realised it perhaps wasn't going to meet all their system needs, so they went to look at 
what they might retain from their existing ISIS system. And that's delayed, as I read this report, that's delayed the transition? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I will stop now. I do have more questions I'll put on notice. I've got one more in terms of data mitigation, uh, migration, mm -hmm. and that's obviously really important to get the system to work. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, I noticed that the department's agreed, are you confident, again, that that is going to address, that the, that the current circumstances are such that they will be able to make, carry out that agreement? My understanding at the time in working with the department is that they were working through what the best option was for them in terms of where the central repository of data was held and in which system that would, it, it was of less risk for the department to hold that. Um, so the department has agreed to all of the recommendations and it was a, a positive engagement on the audit. Uh, so I think the issue is that they need to make sure uh, as we put in the recommendation, that they govern, plan, resource and risk manage the data migration in order to preserve the use and value of the existing information in future welfare payment system. The decision as to how that happens and using which technology is a matter for the department. We didn't dictate in which system that has to occur, more so that they make sure that the, it is risk managed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Seward. Uh, Senator Rinnick? And then we'll go to Senator Rice. Mr. Here, how are you? Um, are you familiar with the Section 5131 of the Constitution that says when a government compulsory uh, acquires land, it must do so on just terms? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, the reason why I asked that before was that your CEO asked, said that the land at Leppington, you couldn't build on it, you couldn't zone it for high rises or put residential houses on it. Given that uh, the family had owned the property since 1951, they'd bought that land before there was ever talk about a airport being put out at Badgerys Creek. Is that correct? That's correct, isn't it? Um, I don't know how long they've owned the land for, so I, I, okay. I'll take what you said as being factual. Yeah, so they have. They've owned the land since 1951. Now, that matters because they owned the land before there was ever any talk about having an airport there. So that means it had to, had to talk about an airport being put at Richmond, right? That land there today would be worth a lot of money potentially for residential um, development because it's wedged between Liverpool, Penrith, and the Blue Mountains. It's some of the last flat land that's 41 kilometres from the Sydney CBD. So one acre is 4,000 square metres. So you can put eight 500 uh, you know square metre blocks on the on the um, one acre, and if you're going to value it at $3 million, 30 acres, that's $100,000 for one acre, that's $12,500 for a 500 metre square block. So that's how you've valued it, right? No, Senator, that's not right. Okay, tell me why. So, Senator, first thing is, do you have a copy of the audit report in front of you? Uh, no, I don't, but I've so read parts of I, it. So, when you get a chance, if you go to figure 4.1 yep. on page 74, yep. you'll see the ANO didn't commission any valuations. It's not our task to value the land that the Australian government purchased. Right. We look at nine valuations. Valuations were obtained by Roads and Maritime Services. Yep. Four by the Department of Infrastructure in the Australian government. Yep. There were two from the New South Wales Value General. We also look at two from the landowner. Yep. But the Australian, but the Australian National Audit Office didn't obtain any valuations of the land. All the valuations were obtained by other parties and looked at by us. Okay. So that was based on the assumption that, uh, and I'll stand be corrected if you didn't say that, that you couldn't build high rises on it or that you couldn't build residential land well, on each it. Of, well, the thing about valuation is it has to look at what is, what is legally permissible use of the land. Yeah. And the Leppington Triangle cannot legally be used for residential housing. After, because of the rezoning, because of the airport rezoning. Under its current, rezone, under its current zoning, it's zoned for rural. Yeah. But because, the, because the, the airport's going to be built there. So this comes back to just terms. This no, is what no, I'm talking it's, about. It's, it's, we didn't speculate yeah. in this report. We reported on the valuations that were undertaken by various parties yep. and the nature of the valuation that was undertaken uh, by infrastructure which they based the purchase on. Yep. And we comment on the 
the nature of the valuation that was done for the purchase compared to all the other valuations that were done. We, we're not, we don't speculate about what the, the value of the land might be in some other scenario. That's not, that's okay. not within our brief. Okay, so let's come back to the valuation. So I've hopped on the website yesterday and had a look at property around uh, Badgerys Creek and a similar uh, five acre block in Brindelli. Brindelli. Uh, five acres was valued or listed at 5.75 million. So that's five acres at 5.75 million. And then if you look at the Medich deal, that was where about a thousand acres was sold a few years ago. That was sold for allegedly over 500 million which would value a similar parcel of land at, say, uh, 30 acres at about 15 million. Again, so, so, so we're looking at residential sales, or in the case I think you're talking about now, is it what's on the market, which isn't necessarily what it's sold for. Yep. But as, so as I said before, none of these valuations are ours, but as a professional valuer has to look at, part of what you have to look at is what is legally permissible use of the land, which looks at its zoning, but also in this case, what they were asked to do was speculate. I, I accept what you're saying there, but my point is it's about just terms. So had, had, this, had the this, family bought this, the land... Senator, if, if yep. this land was procured as a compulsory acquisition, yep. then there would have been a process of valuation and compensation yep. gone through. And if that was done, it would be very clear what the outcome was. Okay. And the parties would have went through and... Um, gone through the, the appropriate process to determine what the compensation was on top of valuation as required under compulsory acquisition process. That's not what was undertaken here. Okay, so, okay thanks for that. So this second runway that is proposed to be built in 2050, okay, if you didn't buy the land now, would it not cost a lot more later on? Um, it wouldn't cost more if the... Um, you're, you're asking a question about indexation as much as anything else sure. and the yeah. time value of money. Yeah. Um, other things being equal, theory would say that the market has built that into the price and no, it wouldn't cost a lot more in um, current value terms because a market price is a market price and it builds in to all of those factors. But then there's speculation on top of that which changes things. So I, I, I can't, and that, and I can't answer I guess, that question because yeah. it's a highly speculative question. Yeah. And I guess that's my point, is that ultimately it all comes down to the market and a willing buyer and a willing seller. So it's very difficult to put a but to be very you know, clear, price we've... on something. Because I, I've just given you two prices there that are much higher than the three million. It's, um, I think it's very clear that the from our audit report, although this is an audit report of the Department of Infrastructure. I think it's clear from our audit report that um, the seller was keen to keep using the land for the purpose that they'd been using it, and you've said for a long period of time, yep. and their perception of what that was worth to them might have been different from what the market uh, valuation of the land was. Yep. Um, so, yes, but that's not what the audit was about. It wasn't about what the um, purchaser uh, its implicit view of value was. It's what yeah. how the department went about yeah, coming to a conclusion. Yeah, that's fair enough. I'm not questioning the compliance side of it. I'm questioning the valuation. Well, we can only use the value, valuations that other people have done for that land under processes which are standard processes for valuation. We yeah. can't look at it from the other side of the equation of what someone else might value that at. And as we right. said, he... The a professional, a professional valuer engaged with the agreement of the landowner, was actually suggested by the landowner, yep. that valuer was actually pushing back on the department saying, the instructions you're giving to me yep. aren't instructions which allow me to give you a proper valuation, which is why I referred to that figure. And the point of that figure was to show that this valuation, which was because of the steps the department took, not because of anything wrong with the market valuer's work, but yep. the steps the department took inflated the value of the land. The valuation oh, of the land. Yeah. Okay. Comes Rice sure. the Is that okay, Senator? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, Senator Rice, uh, just, we'll just check we can hear you. Yes. All good. Thank Please you. proceed. Chair, so I'm taking it out into to 11, 11 minutes. Uh, I don't know if you'll get, I'd like to ask a couple of questions at the end. So um, let's go for seven or eight 
minutes and we'll see how we go. All right. Okay, look, I, w I wanted to use this opportunity to sort of wrap up everything that we have learnt throughout the year about your audit of the Community Sports Infrastructure Grant Program or Sports Rorts, because there's been a lot of evidence over estimates and over our select committee. So I just wanted to run through the chronology with you and see whether you just to lay it all out. So confirming some key dates and times. So starting on the 18th of October 2018, there was a letter sent from Minister Mackenzie to the Prime Minister seeking extra funding for the program that had an attachment, a file titled Copy of Electorate Divisions of Applications. Yes? Yes, Senator. Yeah. And then on the 9th of November, there was a meeting scheduled between Minister Mackenzie and the Prime Minister for the 20th of November. Yes, Senator. Following that. Yep, then we have on the 16th of November, Mackenzie's office sent a spreadsheet of projects and electorates to the Prime Minister's office, arguing for extra funding. Yes, Senator. And then on the 19th of November, Minister Mackenzie met with the advisers in preparation for the meeting with the PM. And after that meeting, the advisor prepared four pages of talking points titled TPs for meeting with the PM. Yep, there was also on the 19th another book version of that spreadsheet. There were two versions. One was for $30 million program, one, one was for a $100 million program on 16th and 19th. And yep. I, and so in, right. the, in that document they recorded, they have analysed the applications and they identified 705 projects in marginal and targeted electorate. That's right, Senator. And there's a, direct, there's a direct quote in your report that notes a priority on marginal and targeted seats. Yes, Senator. And as you said, they also set a spreadsheet to the PMO that day with a list of projects if we had a hundred million if they had a hundred million dollar project program. Yes, Senator. So, so then on the twenty eighth of November is when the meeting actually occurs between the Mackenzie and the PM, and then there's a letter after that meeting, dated the seventh of December, that thanks the PM for the meeting with the Minister, recorded an understanding there'd be extra funding and referred to that meeting between Mackenzie and the PM. That's right, Senator. Yep. And this all happened before the round one approvals were finalised later that, that month. R round, yes, later that month. Yep. So essentially what the story seems to be is that Minister Mackenzie pitched to the Prime Minister an increased funding for the program, and a key part of that pitch was it would let them fund projects in marginal and targeted seats, and then the funding was subsequently expanded after that pitch. So, so yes, the... Um the talking points document we talked about has two scenarios, one for $30 million, one for $100 million. We yep. can't speculate. Yes. Senator, as we've said in various meetings, we can't speculate what happened in a meeting. We can only look at the documentation that occurred. Exactly. Exactly. You've just got all these elements of the story and it's up to us to, to, to draw connections as which I can do that if yes, that you, know, you can lay the evidence out for us. So look, moving on to round two, um, on the 28th of January 2019, when the Prime Minister's office sends a request to Mackenzie's office. And in response on the 1st of February, three days later, um, the then Minister Mackenzie's office sends them a file titled CSG Successful Project Round 1 and 2. That's my recollection, Senator, yes. And so then on two days later, again on the 3rd of February, the PMO tells Mackenzie that the Prime Minister hasn't had a chance to look at the list yet. I recall that, Senator. Yes. It seems to prompt the Prime Minister because then on the next day, on the 4th of February, then we've got the Minister approving the list of projects for round two. I think round two was approved on the 5th of February from memory. Yes. So again, we've got the PM requesting a list of projects. A few days later, it can't be approved because the PM hasn't looked at it yet, and then a couple of days later, we then have it being approved. So again, a, a coincidence with timing of the PM's involvement that, yes, there's no distinct, you can't put, you put the evidence necessarily together, but there are the elements of a story. Do you I'm agree not, with that? I'm not certain that, um, I'll just check with Mr Boyd, that we've got we can draw the same conclusion that you can about something being done because of the Prime Minister or being delayed because of them. We've, we've just set out the, the documentary evidence. That's right. Yep. 
Yep, at which people, you know, the Australian public can draw their own conclusions from the evidence. It would be nice to have more evidence, but the government has refused to give us any further evidence. But look, I'll just quickly move on then to round three, which was, you know, pretty complex. Hopefully I've got time, a few minutes left. So 3rd of March 2019, the PMO asked Mackenzie's office for a list of unfunded projects and which ones they think will be done by MP. Yes, so such a list was requested, yes. Yep, and then on the 4th of March, the Mackenzie's office starts a round three spreadsheet and sends a version off to the, the Prime Minister's office. Yes, a, ver a version was transmitted. Yep, and then on the 6th of March, the Prime Minister's office sends their wish lists for Gilmore, Higgins, Macquarie and Stirling to Mackenzie's office. Yes, wish lists were circulated. Yep, and then 10 days later, or 12 days later, on the 18th of March, Mackenzie's office then sends another version of the spreadsheet back to the PMO. Yes, there are, there are a number of versions circulating within and outside the Minister's office. Yep, and then on the 25th of March, a week later, the PMO sends back a copy of the spreadsheet asking if a particular project will be funded as, a, as it's a coalition priority and listing another project as being on their wish list. Yes, there was, there was interaction in that, of that nature, yes. Yep, and then on the day later, the Prime Minister's office tells Mackenzie's office that it expects Mackenzie to seek authority on the projects. Yes, there was a letter, letter which mentioned that, yes. Yep, then the 4th of April, that's the date that's been written on the brief approving the round three projects. Later on, after the 4th of April, we've got on the 10th of April, um, Minister Mackenzie writes to the PM with the planned round three project and then they email backwards and forwards over the 10th of April, the day before the, elect the elections announced with um, and they finally settle on some of the projects that you've got the project in the Kennedy electorate will be funded through the community development grants and a Kuyong project will be funded through the community sports infrastructure grants. Yes, that was one of the changes on 10 and 11 April. Yep, and so that email from Mackenzie's office agreeing to the substitution, that's 7.13 on the 11th of April. And then on 8.27 a.m. on the 11th, the first time we got a hand copy of the brief that was supposedly signed on the 4th of April. Just a time warning, Senator Ross. Yes, yes, yep. Senator. Yep, and then Mackenzie's office emails to the public servants at 8.46 a.m., which is after Parliament's been prorogued. Then there's emailing backwards and forwards between Mackenzie's office and the PMO throughout the day. And then at 9.10 that night on the 11th of April, they include Grange Thistle on the list of projects. Yes, it was a late inclusion, as were some others. Yeah, so despite a brief dated on the 4th of April, it wasn't sent, we didn't have a finalised brief, a finalised list of projects until the 11th of April, after lots of backwards and forwards between the Prime Minister's office and Mackenzie's office, that where the specific project would be included. It's just worth emphasising, Senator, there was no list attached. When that signed briefing was circulated, there was no list attached to the briefing. So if you like, the list of which projects were being approved to be covered by that, that, that briefing was actually something which was circulated then subsequently. Yes. And I'm that's sorry, right. Senator Ross, that's really time. Okay. So just in summary then, that we're clear backwards and forwards of all three rounds of this engagement between Mackenzie's office and the Prime Minister's office. You, you've touched on some of the interactions, yes, Senator? Yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Senator thank Ross. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you. And um, Mr Hare, just one final uh, couple of questions from me in the very brief time we have left. I just want to revisit this issue that we've discussed in previous rounds of estimates of the issue of parliamentary privilege and the work uh, of the ANAO. Um, have you had any further thoughts about the merits of a memorandum of understanding along the lines of the one that the AFP has with the parliament and ANAO? Um. I think the, the nature of our work doesn't go to the same issues as the AFP goes to. Um, we audit the executive, not the parliament, and, um, and almost all of our work is about the administration of government. Mm. So the AFP's memorandum largely deals with... Um, their jurisdiction with respect to 
officers, of members of parliament. I mm-hmm. think that's correct. It's sometimes since I've read it, so I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, you, you do, though, in the course of your investigations, interview members of parliament and their staff from time to time? We interview um, ministers from time to time and their staff, and we collect evidence from ministers and their staff in their administrative or other functions for the executive. We, yeah. we don't go to matters of parliament, to my knowledge. Well, as you know, in our system of government, uh, you can only be a minister if you are a member of parliament, yes. and staff who work for members of parliament can potentially be covered by parliamentary privilege. Uh, I think there is potential for interaction between parliamentary privilege and your work in the same way that there is for the AFP, maybe not as often uh, as it is for the AFP. We, we, in our correspondence, we, I sent you um, mm-hmm. some legal advice that we've, we've had with respect to the intersection between parliamentary privilege and our work, and what we try to do is work on the basis of that legal advice, and that's how we, we deal with that issue. Uh, um, by keeping ourselves away from it, by, by dealing with the matters that are within our framework. Uh, yes, but that's only one half of the equation, of course, because uh, your legal advice might give you a view of parliamentary privilege, but the parliament might have a different view of parliamentary privilege, and that's the value in a negotiated memorandum of understanding well, between the parliament uh, and an agency like you or the AFP. In um, the JCPAA has considered this issue in the past. Um, uh, what was the report? 419. 419. And their consideration was possibly the reverse to what you're talking about. There were some suggestions made in an inquiry into our legislation, into our legislation the one 10 years ago, I think it was, um, that our powers weren't strong enough to deal with ministers and their staff. Mm. and they were provided with some evidence from the audit office at the time, including the legal advice that we put to you and mm. and concluded that they concluded that the framework was robust enough and appropriate for our activities. Yeah, oh no, I, I do anticipate it could be an issue on both sides of the coin. It could yeah. both be an impediment to the important work you do as well as a potential trespass on the, parliamentary, the privilege of the parliament. And again, that's why I think there's merit in a negotiated MOU that settles those issues or clarifies those issues from the perspective of both entities involved. Um, my, my only thought was, is maybe that's something that the, the inquiry of the JCPAA is going into our legislation may deal with. There, there are a number of issues with respect to parliamentary privilege that w- well, we've faced recently, which we'd like the committee to deal with. Um, and not least the, uh, in the context of our audit on Hawkey and the, um, uh, the litigation that was commenced with respect to um, uh, effectively uh, trying to prevent the tabling of an audit report. I'm, I'm not talking about the audit, the Attorney General's actions, which mm. are under the Act, but there was a we were, there was a piece of court action being taken, which went to whether uh, our audit reports are subject to parliamentary privilege and therefore can't yeah. be uh, litigated in, yeah. in court, and yeah. and whether it's appropriate for an entity to try and get a legal injunction to us tabling an audit report, uh, a paper that's prepared for the purpose of parliament. So there's issues like that which we'll be putting towards okay. the the JCPAA. I, I, uh, in the context of the review, that that might be an appropriate place to deal with it. Um, I, I think that's I, a fair point, and given the hour, I think let's not just continue the conversation too much longer. Okay. Um, so, so thank you. Uh, if there's no further questions for the ANAO, I thank you very much for your attendance and your evidence here late this evening. Uh, and that concludes the committee's examination of agencies for today. We'll be resuming tomorrow to continue our examination of the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio. I'd like to thank all ministers and officers who have given evidence to the committee today. I'd also like to thank Hansard Broadcasting and the Secretariat for their assistance. And I now declare this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee adjourned. Thanks. Thanks.